Good morning, duelists. Welcome to day two of the Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series live from Dortmund. We had a very long old day yesterday. I'm going to say that was about 14 hours worth of dueling. So by the final round, duelists were getting tired. But nonetheless, the duels were getting very fiery and intense. And we had a very interesting, very, very exciting game to finish it off yesterday. Remember, that was nine rounds out of the 12 Swiss. So today, we have three more rounds of Swiss before we get into our top 64 cut. We are currently working on the pairings as we speak. So while we wait for that to get finalized and we get you into round 10 to be starting today, I'm going to hand you over to our wonderful commentary team, Sebastian and Leonard. Guys, how are you doing this morning? How are we feeling about the second day of YCS Dortmund? Thank you, E to the D. We are doing fine. <laughs> Sebastian, how are you? I'm doing absolutely fabulous because today is the day. Yesterday, everything was only a little bit of Actually only starting, only, but only today, no, yeah, I mean, it was great, but today we're going to crown a new YCS champion. We're going to crown the YCS champion of the biggest European YCS championship ever in Europe. And that's definitely something I'm really looking forward to. Yep. And honestly, I woke up today and I was already in such a fantastic mood because just Yu-Gi-Oh! sparked energy into my body even though that's not my regular time to be really in, in, <laughs> that is true i know that action mood but i'm in a Yu-Gi-Oh action mood today but i would say we should look into some statistics again yeah. maybe we should have a quick look at the deck breakdown we had for the whole event yesterday i to, love me some statistics absolutely i'm also a very very much a statistic hat we saw that we had 28 percent of ishizu telemans going to the tournament which is not a lot however the conversion rate of the deck we said it yesterday already is absolutely crazy it's massive actually i just have checked the uh final yeah. standings of yesterday after the last round of swiss which was round nine yesterday we still have three more to go so there's a couple of things that can still change but i just looked through the players checked with their lists and it looks like the first 20 players actually were all on Ishizu Tielemans, so I can already spoil it, but after day one, this deck is performing really, really, really well, so I'm pretty sure we can expect a lot of Ishizu Tielemans to make it into the top cut, and uh, I'm really already looking forward to how the top cut breakdown is then going to look, because that will be qu quite interesting to see. And directly after the first 20 players, we are having the next deck, Sprite, being represented. We have seen Sprite in the featured yes, uh, yesterday quite a bit. It did not really always perform that well. It seems like Tillman really have the edge on Sprite. It looks like it for sure. you you got to rely on playing cards such as Dimension Shifter, even in Sprite yeah. at the moment. And you don't really want to do that necessarily, because then you cannot set up your most powerful tool, which is totally awesome. Yeah, before Magnificent Mavens and Darkwing Blast, it was a fair fight. Sprite and Telemans, yeah. they were both in a good spot. They could both only rely on the engine. They were competing equally with each other. But now Sprite is actually going to take that Dimension Shifter from decks such as Exosister and Floanderies, yeah. which we also saw on the breakdown. That was their main win option back in the day. But now Sprite has adapted that, basically. And they are also running that. And they're quite literally <laughs> right after the 20. She's here because of the yeah. first, 21st place after uh, Swiss yesterday was actually a Sprite player. And we also looked over a couple of other deck lists. We saw that there's definitely some Exorcists still in competition. We know for a fact there's also still a couple of Fluander Rees players still going strong and definitely having ambitions to go deep into this tournament. Oh, even with cool cards like Seal of Oracle. Oh, yeah, we've seen that. That would look, that would look really, really cool. Yeah. I want to see that, actually. Oracalcos, actually. Yeah, and also I really hope we may see more Black Wings? That was so much fun <laughs> yesterday, honestly. All the Black Wing cards, just getting flashback to the old times where we played Black Wings ourselves. I, gotta be honest, I would have just loved to see the Kali Yuga on the field. That would have helped probably for him I winning. I think this card would have helped. This is an absolute boss monster that basically skips your opponent's entire turn and yep. then you can just OTK like in the good old days. Absolutely, absolutely. But we saw it. Again, I asked you that already yesterday. But since we have a new day today, I'm going to ask it again. What do you think, besides Ishizu Tielemans, is the deck that is most likely for you personally to win this event now? Apart from, Apart from Ishizu Tielemans, yes, please. It would be 
pendulum, Draco Slayer. All right, so you stay, still stay with what you said there, right? Yeah, I mean, in round two, it did not really show up. Not really, Gotta no. be honest. Uh, Typhoon had a little bit of a tough time there. Yeah. However, Federico Mecozzi... Oh, yeah. He showed his class really again. Well. He, yeah, I think he ended sure. on X1 as well. Yes, yes, I think yes. he won the last round as well. And, uh, I mean, with players like those two piloting the deck, I mean, he... Those two were YCS finalists <laughs> yeah. already, so there is a high chance of it ending in the finals. And really? Relatively high. It, it felt <laughs> like the Draco Slayer pendulum strategy was very popular at the top tables. At least like yep. round seven to eight, when we yep. were wandering through the tables, uh, it looked like they are really uh, showing up. We really had like four to five of them still going strong. Uh, and on the other hand, we of course saw quite a few Floor on the Reese players. So for me personally, also, Emre Kisilat is winning the last featured match yesterday. I think I will change my mind. And yesterday I told you that I would oh. go with Naturia. But I'm kind of going with the flow on the re-stack now. I feel like this might be the contender. Number one here for Ishiza Tielemans. And therefore, maybe the birds go and finally I mean, take the first title, right? It's, they haven't taken a title yet, so it would be about time for them. I mean, they have won national, national championships. championships. You're right. But uh, no ice yes, yet. yet. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think there was no YCS title. I'm, I'm pretty sure. sure. But, um, yeah, the deck has been really successful yeah. in the past few formats. Actually, this deck is like a deck that always sneaks into the format, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Like, it has never been like the deck to beat. No. However, everyone is afraid of the birds. Totally, totally. And, um, for example, in Utrecht, we had first place and second place after Swiss being Florian de Ries players. A lot of Italians are still going strong with the deck. A lot of other players have adapted and also picked up the deck. Yeah. And that's why I'm pretty confident in the Florian de Ries strategy for this event. But we got to see. Maybe we can have a Florian de Ries versus Pendulums final. That would be pretty, pretty dope. Uh, but that was a lot of strategic to start the day yeah. off already. Why aren't we having some fun as well? Because I've heard that the featured match still takes a little bit of time to set up. And we've seen guess the cards over the course of the day yesterday. And we always played it in the bag. <laughs> and yeah. we were like, is there any chance we could actually actively play this on stream against turns each out, other? Turns out there is. There is. So uh, why don't we just play a little bit of guess the card with our voice in the background. We make a little bit of a competition out, uh, competition out of it. And uh, yeah, let's get into guess the card. There we have it. Okay, okay Leonard. So this is uh, this is for all the honor, okay? Yeah, of course. And I can't tell anything yet. I don't yet. know yet. But this one, I'm going to. Oh yeah. Oh, okay, okay, we're getting there. Okay. Uh, this, like the thing on the right, could be an indicator for Sprite Smashers. I don't want to lock it in yet. Yeah, yeah, you, you can. Oh, you know, that looks like a dinosaur a little bit. Uh, that to is me. true. We haven't decided on the rules. Just if it was a dinosaur, oh! I think I know. <laughs> oh, we have a special we have guest here. here. What do we think it is? Oh, oh? this is the Aurora, Aurora whale. Oh, I think you're right. Very Wh good. White, white Aurora whale. White right? Aurora whale. I think this it's could white Aurora. true as well. Now, gentlemen, I will say that we've actually got our first pairing. Oh, I have it even here better. For you. I don't know if you want to mention what the decks are. Yeah, I'm, I'm super happy. I, I, I just read the name. Before and one you of say them it, though, there's a slim chance that maybe one of our duelists isn't here, so we're just it's double checking. A dolphin, by the way. Absolutely. Uh, oh, it was or a white or a dolphin. Oh, it's a dolphin. You were almost there. Yeah, and I can already, as we are playing Gas Card, spoiler you, we're going to have another deck in the feature match area, which we haven't seen all weekend long, so you can definitely look forward to that. Absolutely. As we are still guessing a couple of cards here to actually get to that featured match, first of all. Do you have any idea what this could be? Already? Yes, I have an idea, but I don't want to share it yet, because otherwise you're just going to take it away from me. That is a fair point. And I feel like... I feel like... Yeah... No, my idea was totally wrong. <laughs> not going to lie. Oh, this is a Destiny hero. You think so? Shouldn't have said that. Oh, I mean, yeah, true. Yeah, the D-belt. Yeah, yes, the D-belt. Oh, oh, it's dangerous. Des it's Destiny hero dangerous. dangerous yeah. It's Destiny hero dangerous. Right. I'm pretty sure it's Destiny hero dangerous. I, I know my Destiny heroes when I see that full artwork. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I know it too. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's, that's, a cup, that's a point to me, right? Did you get a point for the last one? Not really, right? It wasn't no. the Dolphin. So it's 1-0 for me. And Ed, you're, you're still like, uh, you're quite silent back there. <laughs> Don't worry, I, I'm, watching, I'm watching you guys really quite stringently guess these. I'm <laughs> constantly keeping an eye out for if our two feature so duelists I'm for round 10 could be there. Oh. Now I'm not thinking Gallus anymore. Yeah, we, we can guess as much as we can, right? There's no, no wrong guesses. Just no. if we have a guess, just uh, fire it out. I mean, there is wrong guesses. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Trishula, Dragon of the Iceberg. Dang it. Oh, 
Oh, they had that. That could very well be Trishula. But is it the original Trishula? Yeah. Yes, yeah. 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 Classic yeah. Trish. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. That's the equalizer. I know my dragon chest plates. Is Trishula a dragon? It's called Trishula, Dragon of the Ice Barrier. If it wasn't, that would be a huge I mean, mislead. I mean, Bryonic isn't a dragon as well. True. There it is. It's a dragon, Bob. We got okay. it right. Trishula, Dragon of the Ice Barrier. Alrighty. What do we have next? I'm, I'm very, very confident I'm going to get that one. I'm not. Okay. Oh, good heavens. This could be anything at this point. Also, I, I was so hyped about the pairing you handed me over because the one guy is playing an amazing deck, as I just said, and the other guy is a good friend of mine, and I'm super happy for him to have him in the future match. Ah, yeah, that's okay. super nice. We'll have to see what ends up happening in that. Round 10 will be starting oh, as yeah. soon as we can get it to you. Oh, that's Spellbook Magician of Prophecy. Wow. Oh, that's a good one. Good job, well, Straight Basti. away, Basti. You are I, showing I, up I, now. I you are usually so, so bad good at this, at this. game. <laughs> <laughs> usually you are horrible at this. <laughs> I've learned my lesson. I did my homework, and here I am guessing. I was card gonna say, you, are, you have studied at home. <laughs> There's a little peek behind the scenes. When we're sat backstage watching this happen on the stream, we are all shouting at the screen trying to guess what it is as well. There's Absolutely. a whole bunch of like 20 of us trying to guess it. Yeah, I mean, it's a fun game. It is. Just uh, cool to remember old cards you haven't seen in a while in the tournament okay. environment. Okay. Okay, Leonard really wants to equalize once again here. Oh, oh, I think this one, this is one we could get. I'm pretty sure I know this somewhere from. It's green, black, gray. Oh, yeah, it's all. Oh. Is it the Draco Slayer? No, I think it. I, don't I have a get. I think it might be Lavas, like a really old card. Yeah, it, it looks a little bit a like really Lavas. Yeah, Cyberstein. Yes. No, I don't think it's Maybe. Cyberstein, to be honest. No, I, don't I don't think know. it is now that but I look at it. it. It looks a little bit... It, it is, is Cyberstein! Cyberstein. Okay. It is Cyberstein! What's the name? One for Ed! Ed. <laughs> Good job! I Ed Templer, ladies and gentlemen! <laughs> we have the Cyberstein. We actually saw this card in the feature match yep. this weekend. We did! Something yeah. Kit Colors for 5,000 life points. Yeah, yeah 5,000, yeah. <laughs> Good old Cyberstein. There, yeah, look at go. that. One I mean, point for Ed Templer. He's really muscling, huh? He, he's really... Cyberstein Hitting the gym for sure. <laughs> He's a machine. <laughs> he is a machine indeed. A literal oh, machine. Okay. Oh, uh, this could be Magna Mood. That's a wild guess, not gonna lie. Is it maybe a Dragoon? It looks like more of a machine to me. Uh, yeah, yeah, fair like enough. Rather Artifact something? Could be. Like So far, I couldn't tell you anything about it, to be honest. Um, 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 um. Oh, good lord. It's still, it looks like a machine for sure, but we have a lot of machine cards in Yu-Gi-Oh. Oh, wait, in Invoker, XX Saber Invoker. You're right, it's, not, MX Saber? it's not in, yeah, you're absolutely right, it's Invoker. Haven't seen this one in a while. Yes. Who, who could tell that. why? Who, who could tell why we haven't seen this little guy this in a while? This card was okay <laughs> with Zodiacs. And it's totally on the forbidden and limited list. Absolutely. <laughs> in the forbidden section. But yeah, that's two, two, and one, right? Yeah. Two, two, and one. I'm surprised I'm on the scoreboard at all here. I am not. I'm absolutely not either. And now they give us a dinosaur card so you could equal... That's not a dinosaur, I will say. I can dream, Sebastian. <laughs> I can dream. Is that a dinosaur? No, it's not a dinosaur. No. If it was a dinosaur, I'd know. That's when it zooms out and it's a dinosaur, mm, and I've really I messed think this up. This is either a cool coat or a machine. Okay, let's... And Oh, this, is, this looks like the it might armor be an of armor. a magician. Yeah, it might be an armor as well. Yep, armor of a magician. Armor magician. <laughs> oh, 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 oh! oh. It one. looks like Zikutor, the gladiator beast. Wow, that would be wow. that would be wild. It could be. I, I, it, it is. I think it's a gladiator beast. Oh, oh it's, it's remember it's it's toys. Yes, you're right. Toys. Oh. <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> sort my thoughts. <laughs> Nothing like a good sport, eh, Leonard? <laughs> it's uh, Abyss it Toys. It is Mermel Abyss to you. So, three, <laughs> two, and one. <laughs> Sorry, no. Bestie. Oh, hey, there we are. There we are. We were on the screen. So, now I'm coming back. I'm coming back and... Oh. Uh, yeah. Ooh, okay. Conductor Tyreno, just in case that I get it Don't you dare Ed. steal <laughs> this from me. <laughs> is, is there pink in Conductor Tyreno? I'm not really sure. Oh, it's Chaos Form? Uh, that's Collapse Serpent. What? It is Collapse Serpent. It is 100,000% Collapse Serpent. I'm, I'm betting against it. Yeah, 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 that's no... 
Let's call up server. <laughs> <laughs> Such confidence. No, wait, 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 no. No, it's not, it's not. It's actually wait. not. It's actually, I think, it is it's call up server. It is call up <laughs> That's no good. Just to let you guys know, we are keeping an eye out, and by the looks of it, our two feature duelists have made their way to the table, which means we may not have to be guessing cards for much longer. Let's do one more. Okay, yeah, at absolutely. Least one more. Let's That's do the one decider. More. Okay, the no, decider. No, the one why, that wins, why wins, wins it all. Golden golden cards. From me. The one, one that wins, wins, wins it all. That's the rule now. That's the rule. Okay. That's the rule. Please, Ed. Ed you, I, please I'm be a dinosaur. I'm banking on you. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, for something sake. dark. I will. I will say it's the attribute bit dark. I will say it's dark attribute. Is that half a point already? No. No. <laughs> Dark arm dragon. <laughs> wow, you brought that very far. Oh gosh. No, the background doesn't fit. I think. Wow, this. I think I know it. I think I know it, but I cut. It's yeah, on the tip the name, of my tongue. The name is not really clicking yet. It's not for me. Oh, oh it's uh, not. It's vision. Oh, the the elemental hero vision, mask hero vision. Mm, masked hero. It is a masked hero. I think it's vision. You might. It, it, is it vision? Is if it's vision, vision then you've won here. Adoration. Oh. Oh. I was so far off. Well, that is going to have to be it for us on the guess the card. But I'll leave game, you two guys. to it to carry on for a little bit, and I'm going to head over to the main stage for our feature. Oh, there's another. Don't one. go anywhere. Oh, oh, we can, okay, we can uh, still guess a little bit. I mean, um, do do your thing, Ed. But we're we're having another tiebreaker yes. here for the no, actual victory. we are not <laughs> for the actual <laughs> actual victory. A Borlo dragon. I will say Borland dragon, just in case. Just in case it's not the Borlo load, but the Borland. But it looks like Borlo load. I will say. It looks like both. Gotta be honest here. It looks like big hands, that's for sure. Big machiney hands. Machiney? Is that even the word? I but I bet it's a machine. Sure. Oh, I think it's uh, Borel Sword. Borel oh, Sword like Borel Sword. <laughs> How are there so many Borel extra deck monsters? I mean, Borel it's four, Sword right? Dragon. Yes. And this is the decider. I have bested Sebastian. And oh, we are going I, to. I just no, got we are not going to have We're going to have another no. tiebreaker. We are going to do this for fun. It's not a tiebreaker at this point no, anymore. No, 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 it's I'm another not going to let you take this. I will this tell you, me. it's another tiebreaker. It's another tiebreaker. The people in the back said we can't see Sebastian losing, so let's give him another chance. <laughs> so, what's this? Hmm. I think this, I will give you a hint. That looks like a crystal. <laughs> I'm a okay, fair so sportsman. Much. Crystal Wing, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, Crystal Wing Synchro Dragon. What is yeah. this? This is Crystal Wing Synchro Dragon. You One, sure? One hundred percent. How would you know? <laughs> no, no, no. You're not looking it up here. No, no, no. I, no, no. I already gave the answer. Yeah, and this then you crystal see it's wrong. Dragon. You said it looked like a crystal. I said Crystal Wing Synchro Dragon, and then you say, how would you know, Sebastian? <laughs> I have the artwork here, and yes, it is Crystal Wing Synchro Dragon. <laughs> So, you defeated me thrice in tiebreakers. Congratulations, you're really Thank the card so guesser of my heart. <laughs> <laughs> you could do this professionally, <laughs> who would have thought? But yeah, um, I would say enough of the fun. Let's enough. throw it back over to the hard competition. We're going back into tense Yu-Gi-Oh! gameplay, and I see that there are players with that, so let's throw it over to the feature match table and our host at Templar. Thank you very much, Basti. Yes, finally, we can begin today's festivities. We are now in round 10 of the Swiss jewels you're seeing here at YCS Dortmund. We have Philipp Nihus and Nicholas Schneiders, who are going to be battling it out in our first feature match of today's coverage. Gentlemen, we're going to be doing a high roll to see which one of you is going to be going first. Who would like to roll the dice first? Okay, that's going to be a four. And that is a three. So who's going to be going first? Okay, Philip's going to be going first, so this is going to be a very exciting one. I hope you guys are strapped in, ready for our first feature match today. We're going to hand you straight back to our wonderful German commentators. Guys, take it away for this first duel of today. Welcome back, I guess. <laughs> Here we are again. <laughs> we missed you. <laughs> yeah, now, as I said, we're going to get into the tense action, but of course it's still fun, obviously. It is still fun. It's what we love at the end of the day. We're also just two guys that love Yu-Gi-Oh! and that love to watch Yu-Gi-Oh! all day long. And now the real action starts, though. We cut down the playing field from 2,500 players 
to just over a little bit over, I think, 250 or something around that player mark we still have left in the main event. And uh, pretty much all of them have a shot to go into the yep. main event. But those two guys, I've heard it already, are on an X to one record. So there's no more drawing, no more losing allowed for those or two. Or you're out. They have to win three rounds in a row. And therefore, we already have a bubble match here in the first round of today. And I would say we talked enough, so let's get over to the table. Let's get over to the action. Let's start this day off right with a nice little featured match. There we have them on the top, Philip Nihus, on the bottom, Nicolas Schneiders. And as you can already see from the deck types, we're going to see Ishizu Tielemans once for Philip, but we are going to see Dragon Maid, Dragon Link in the hands of Nicolas Schneiders. Oh, not only Dragon Maid, there is another There's engine that I'm quite more. familiar with. Oh, yes. I can already tell you that this card here is going to be. We're going to see wrong card. Yeah, we're, but <laughs> we're going to see your favorite field spell of all time and the one you love to resolve in, a, in the most optimal way possible. I have Dragon Ravine. I've just recently learned that you have to discard to add a Dragonity card, and Nicholas is running quite a lot of those. He's actually running quite a big Dragonity engine. Yeah, he's not just playing a small package or something. He's really going in on the Dragonity cards. I would say there's even more Dragonity cards in his deck. Then we see Dragon Maid cards. Yeah. So, but I think the biggest engine is actually the Bistiels, and this is why I showed you guys Magnum Hood in the first place because this card does not search a Bistiel monster yes. in the end phase. It works very well in an all dragon deck. Any yeah. dragon monster, I think Dark Dragons. Um, no, I don't even dragons. think so. It's just dragons. You can even search Cypher in the end phase or something. I'm pretty this sure. This is really, really strong. Yeah. So, but let's get into the action of this game. We saw that Philip started off with terraforming, getting to Pearl the Rhino. Optimal start for him. You want to have the field spell in this deck. And then he followed it off with Caldo effect, discarding Mudora. So he already has a yeah. shuffler to Ishizu effect in a graveyard too. And he now mills the Kalbeck. The question though is, or he rather he discarded it with Shiren. Do you want to mill? You don't know what your opponent your is playing. Your opponent is on 60 cards, so oh. the chances of him playing Tierlemans is not. It's, it's we are milling. Look, we are milling. Oh, oh we rock. see Baby Rock. Oh, look, he sees it right from the get go. He sees he's playing versus the Dragunity deck, and he's loving himself. Oh. Philip is excited about seeing Dragunity cards. And Armorgram is actually a really valuable resource that. Nicholas is playing as a one-off in his deck, and this card can special summon itself from the GY by banishing two Dragon-type monsters from the GY. And then when it hits the field, you count how many equip spell cards you have on the field and negate monsters on your opponent's side. So this is not a card you want to mill your opponent. Nope, in a 60-card deck, quite an unfortunate hit there for <laughs> Philip. But what did, he de what did he mill for himself? There's another Kalbeck, he already uh, triggered and Kalbeck. Another one, Saranir and Scream. He can actually go for Scream, which is quite decent. Yeah, but he didn't trigger any nope. of the Tillman's names. So there's no access for him at all, right? He could go into Redoer to trigger the Shiren, Just, I guess. Play it. I mean, we have let seen check. players yeah, cut let me on check. Redoer. That's absolutely true. There I have his list. In terms of rank fours, there is no Redoer at all. So he does not even have that line available to himself here. That is quite rough. I mean, he also has the Rhino Heart in hand. We know that because he searched it earlier. Oh, you're right. Yeah, true. There's always a way. There's still a way for him. The hand of Nicholas is looking good. I have seen triple tactic talents, something that looked like a Gamma. I don't think he's playing Gamma. I didn't but, see Gamma uh, even. Uh, then it must probably be a Dragonity card because those artworks are greenish as well. So, Philip now searching for the good old Salik. And we see that Philip also has a bestial in hand. And honestly, we've talked about this quite a bit when we saw Black Wings live on stream. Those are a, this is a rogue deck with dark monsters. And Dragon Link or Dragon Maids do have a little bit of the same issue. They also play yeah. a lot of dark monsters, so the also popular Bestial monsters are hitting that deck quite well, but there is a Bestial monster on the side of Nicholas. He's hitting the one Tielemans name that Philip wants to resolve here, and he's chaining his Mudora. 
And okay, so you at least get that Dragunity monster out of the yeah, graveyard. So Armagram yeah. is not there anymore. He That's wants good to at get least. Get rid of Armagram, anyways. He does not want this Serenir to hit the board because he sees his opponent is playing dragons. This is not only a monster with 2,500 attack points. This also has quite the useful type, and also the effect of this card is really important because it can actually just send Lubellion from the deck to the GY as soon as it, as it hits the GY That's itself. True. That's true. Oh, but wait. He could have also, in this case, shuffled back one of his Telemann's names. He did that, so he could trigger Pearl or Rhino to pop one of his monsters yeah, on board, which would Shiren be Shiren now. then. So he does still have a line to actually keep on playing here. If he sees it, and I'm pretty sure he does. I mean, he shuffled back his own Telemann's name, so there has to be... Does he see the line? The I Pearl or Rhino don't pop? really think oh, that he sees it. Oh, oh no. no. He, he is did not go for dark it. Play and in his opponent's GI, there is a Magnamut milled. True. So he gets access to more bestial so cards himself. Actually, this leads him to a line where he can go for a sprite sprint and try to get his place through the Merly. Oh yeah, you're and right. Now he also gets a Druze Womb in the end phase, which is arguably a That's bit better. That's even better. You're right. You're totally right. So that Pearl Rhino pop there wasn't even necessarily needed. And look at him. He goes for the sprite sprint line, and 100%, I can guarantee you, he's going to send the Merly to finally get his first fusion summon here off in our round 10 featured match of day two in YC's Dortmund 2022. You don't know that yet? He could have... Okay, now you know it. He could have <laughs> sent Herald of the Arclight. Orange Light. Sorry. Could have sent Orange Light, but I'm not really thinking that it would be the route here. <laughs> and, uh, but one interesting decision, he is running Herald of Orange Light yeah. because people were really going back and forth on that. Not really sure whether to run it anymore or not. Uh, but he does, and he also is playing double Divine of the Herald, so he really values his fairy package in here. How many Agidos does he play? Let me check on that. I do not see any. There's one Agido. One Agido at the top of the list, and Leonard Koenig, you can't see it, is smiling at me. <laughs> he told me right from the get-go, oh yeah, you're only going to play one Agido, and yes, Philip listened to you. <laughs> he heard your call, so he's only he's on a, one Agido. He's a good kid. He's a good kid. He is indeed, he is indeed. So, we use Kid Carlos Effect on field, special summon out the Merly. That doesn't work, you have to summon to a different zone. Yep, yeah. Now, there we go. And even yeah. though we got interrupted already, we can still go on, go for the Mill 8 play, be all so powerful. We Mill Diviner, which is a pretty good yeah. reborn for the Sprite Elf when we get to it. Let's see if we can hit the Shiren. We don't hit the Shiren, we can actually hit the. Uh, use the Rhino Heart. However, I don't know how useful that will be. It is. I mean, it, pro bit. it provides you another level four body, right? Yeah. That would be quite cool. He cannot go for an Elf with his Sprint because it was Link Summoned this turn. Yeah. I'm show you guys again. That's true. Let me check. Is he playing Gigantic? I don't think so, though. I don't think he's nah. playing the Very Gigantic standard. package, and it would be really good at this point. Absolutely. So, Philip really going through. His options here, really thinking on what to go next for. He, he has milled a bunch of the Shufflers. He, I think he has multiple Mujoras no. now. He definitely has Caldo as well. So he's not short on those. And versus Dragon Link, versus Dragon Mates and Drag Unity, that could definitely be an option. I think those will help. Yeah, he does trigger it. And he discards a Sully that he searched yep. earlier on. So he probably just gets Huffness here, right? For the yep. opponent's turn. Huffness seems like a pretty good get here. Now he. Chain blocks the Rhino Heart. Has he not already activated the Rhino Heart? Ooh, I think so as well. Yeah, for sure. Rhino Heart was the card that made him play in the first yeah, place. That is true. But the Salik could resolve, so we yeah. don't even <laughs> have to shuffle this now. Yep, the Salik is resolving. We are searching for Hafnis indeed. Yeah, that Hafnis is a really good interruption in the opponent's turn. Especially when you have so many names in your deck. Yep, indeed it is. So. I still don't see how we're ending on a fusion monster, oh, right? I don't think he needs a fusion monster. What he can do is go for a sprite elf under the sprite sprint and then summon back the herald, try to mill five for Agido if he has it in the deck still. Yeah. And then go for a Baron with oh, the Rhino. Yeah. Heart. Oh yeah, and you're right. I think that you don't have to prioritize Dweller. I mean it's good in the matchup, of course. However, you have two of the shufflers in your GY, so yeah. it is not. And he goes your for the diviner. Priority. I think he goes for exactly the line you were just anticipating. He's searching for Agido. Is it somewhere in there? Oh no, he just wants another shuffler. Fair oh, so enough, he hasn't though. built Caldo yet, maybe. He, he started with Caldo. He for sure already has one Caldo, but he wants more Caldos. Okay. <laughs> he can't wait to have more Caldos. 
And um, I mean, both of them would have worked, right? Both of them would have made the Diviner a level yeah. six monster to that provide access to Baron. But the only unfortunate thing in this moment is that Elf does not protect anything. Absolutely. Oh, and now Kalo is being used. And he is shuffling back some traps, I suppose. Most likely, yeah. He does Maybe. not have to shuffle back the Druze one. Oh, oh he wants more access to field spells, so he gets the terraforming back. He wants to have access to his extra deck a little bit more again as well. Therefore, putting back the dog. I mean, this is really good. This deck is so good with its resources, and you, you I mean, you basically play every card in your extra deck only once, so you really want to have access to them all the time. Also, you will not be able to resolve two Kalos in the next turn, so it makes sense to just shuffle back some resources and be able to use this Dark against the Bestial deck yeah. again. We saw a very cool card at the top of this extra deck as well. He's actually one of the few players in Ishizu Tielemans that is running Axis Code Talker. Ooh. Yeah, that's a cool card to just end games very quickly to go for a big push. And uh, we see the effect of Magna Mood. Actually, of Nicolas Magna Mood is now resolving because Philip in between reborned it with the Dark and therefore he just got himself a Druze Worm now. And I'm pretty sure he also had Magna Mood right from the beginning in his hand as well. Yeah. So Philip now with both Shufflers in the graveyard and two different Bistial names in his hand as well. So there's plenty of interruption for his opponent here. And also the Hardness. Yeah, you're right. That's actually a yeah. really, really strong end board war. However, there. There is Droplet and Triple Tactic wow. Talents, two of the best spells in the game when you're going second for Nicolas in his 60-card deck and four monsters that he can just use. So now he... Ooh. We're starting it off. Ooh. Wow, with the Wyvern Burster really as well. Start. That is really a strong start. He instantly links it away for Striker Dragon. And yep, he can even resolve oh, the effect of Striker Dragon. Oh, but he has the Collapse Serpent in hand already. Ooh, he only announces the Striker Dragon. Yeah, you're yeah. right. There's then that wasn't the best draw to be fair. You don't want to see them in a pair. No, you only want to see one of them. They are limited to one, so you could always only search the other one. But when you have both of them, there's no searching happening at all. So also if the Havness does not hit a fusion monster or the fusion monster gets targeted by the Sharonier in hand of Nicolas, you still have the option to use Caldo or Modoro to shuffle them back but and mm -hmm. actually resolve the Palerino. You could actually try to just pop the re uh, boot launcher here. Uh, the boot sector launch for sure. Yeah. You could. On the other hand, you could also just shuffle back the monsters from the graveyard, to be honest. Because I think he left the rocket recharger in the graveyard, right? Maybe that was a little bit of a misstep from Philip because he could have anticipated that Boot yeah. Sector launch to come down quite early. And you don't want to have your opponent, uh, you don't want to see having him rocket monsters in the graveyard, so he can just easily rebound them for free. What we have seen in the past with the Drangling deck is that Boot Sector launch is such a key component to the deck because when you are going second, you can just for free rebound monsters from the GY. I mean, now at this point, we are getting rid of. The yep, he is taking out the Rocket That's Recharger right. now. And this deck can play through boards easily. Dragonling can just like pull so much out of their sleeve. For sure. So he's also recycling some other stuff from him yeah. from you his own graveyard. You don't want to put the Merly back because you need that one for Elf for an extra interruption. Yeah, but Magna Mood is going to go back to the deck. Yeah. Don't let your opponent get to your Magna Mood and the GY. Don't let him get yeah, to that. But, but definitely makes dark. sense to, to put back one of the names. I think he yeah. put back... Sha no, he put back Hafnis, oh, right? And he actually announced the Perlerino after Boot Sector launch, already announced the effect, so that doesn't really do anything. Okay, you can hit the Striker Dragon, which is fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. But is that really... It's, it's just a body at this point. I don't think that this was necessarily worth it. But still, but still Nic Nicolas that, doesn't yeah. look super happy about it all. I mean, the good thing for Nicolas is talents. going to be Talents, for sure, yeah. because Talents will usually bait out the negate. Oh, but he just instantly uses the Droplet, yeah, sending genius. Monster and Spell. So there's no responses being possible from Philip, negating yeah. Sprite Elf and Baron, and massively hindering the opportunities here for Philip. But as we told you several times already over the course of this weekend, this Ishizu Tillemans deck is so great because you have so much potential in the yep. graveyard as well. There's still a Mudora in the graveyard and there's two 
this still monster's in the no, hand as well. he wants to see the hand, oh. or does he want... I think he wants to draw, so he is... No, he just... We already cut the deck, so he's just going to draw two cards, which is kind of good for Philip because now he know there was no good follow-up on Nicolas' side before that. But the there is the wow. bestial Lubellion now for Nicolas, discarding itself to now search for another card in his 60-card pile. What is he finding here? For which option is he going next? <laughs> it wasn't in that half, so we got to check the other one. And now this is getting more and more interesting, to be honest, because we know that Philip also has a name in hand. We know he has at least the Druid's Worm. I think he has three cards in hand. So you said there might have been another Magna Mood? I'm pretty sure there was Magna Mood, and now there's Druid's Worm as well. Oh, and there's Pala Dragon Mate now! Finally, we see the first Dragon Mate card here from Nicholas. And this, we, we were wondering, why would you play Pala Dragon Mate when we looked at the list? But it's actually kind of decent because you can just send to the graveyard Dragon Mate tidying. Yep. And then whenever that Pala Dragon Mate is leaving the board, you can reborn it with the Dragon Mate tidying. So you just have two bodies instead of one. Exactly. So it's actually quite cool. So this card is really strong. And also, it does not lose to the Bissels, but now Harvness is activated. And there's Merlin, 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 being Merlin hit. Diviner and hitting and the Agido. Agido is huge at this situation because now you can ensure five more mills for Philip. And now he has to. I think Nicolas has to react to the Merli. You probably have to, yeah. He did search himself the Magna Mood. And then the question for Philip will be, if he is reacting here... Oh, looks like he's not... Okay, Philip is considering whether he can even use the effect of a Guido here, counting his deck. He doesn't have the comfort of a 60-card deck, so you would rather uh, be very, very, very cautious with milling. But still, as you said, I think you have to activate it, and he is announcing a Guido as Chainlink 2 here. The deck is being cut, so I don't know if there are any responses. I mean, he has... Yeah, hand, yeah, very on, on the Merli. It is absolutely happening, and yeah. there is the Magna Mood being chained, and I don't oh, really like that the decision of Philip. Already. Yeah. He should have gone for these uh, Druids. Now his opponent know knows that he has another Bestial in hand. That is crucial information. Yeah, but you just don't want to share this information without any need, because he yeah. could have... The Druze one would have done the exact same thing. It, it's cool that you can search for another Bestial in the end phase with the Magna Mood if it is resolving yeah. here and comes to the field, but... I think in this specific situation, you much rather want to have that knowledge advantage. Also, what do you think of waiting for a Lebellion effect with the Druid's Worm now? I also can see that, but we are now milling and we see Merli, Hafniz and Salik. The Merli was already used, so we only can trigger the Hafniz. But and the Salik. Yeah, of course the Salik, but the Salik is not really doing that much for us in that situation. Of no, course, we can trigger it, but that's just another resource. That is true, but I am not sure if Nicolas is going to win the game in this round. So every extra resource counts. You're right. And we see that Nicolas actually got to mill his Star Leech Seifert, which is another resource in the graveyard. And also, Philip just quickly reading up on Dragunity Glow, which was also milled. And this I mean, card does not do anything in the GY. It just adds a Dragoonity card level 5 or higher, level 6 or higher. Not so quick. It actually oh, it does, does something in the, the graveyard. GY. Right. But uh, let me just double check what it was. Yeah, you, you, it only works with a Dragoonity in the Spell and Trap zone. So it yeah. doesn't work right now, but there is potential for it in the graveyard too. So he is announcing Hafniz and Salik still. Nicolas is trying his luck with the Magna Mood, and of course, Philip knows. The thing is, if he uses Druid's Womb here, there's actually no space left on the board, but he can fusion away his Huffness on the field, so it's not that bad. I mean, the target will be the Huffness, right? So I don't think there will be any fusion summons happening. Ooh, you're right. Even though he can prevent this, it oh, will he still... Oh, this is really good. He actually goes for the Mudora now, tries to not banish all of his t element names for the grind game. And I mean, he knows there is Lubellion, he knows there is Glow on the GY and Star Leech Cyphered, so why not use your Medora for this oh, you instead could, I, of using the I think Bastille. you also really want to hit the Dragon Mate Tidying, yeah. right? Because that's another resource. Oh, he really is scared can be of the Glow. And he also milled a Palo. Oh, he milled Palo as well? That's huge! Then he will definitely chain it. That's so. a lot of resources adding up here for Nicolas, yeah. to be honest. This could turn into a going second victory here for Nicolas. And now one thing I do not especially like about going for Modora instead of the Druis is that Pala is a wind monster. You can't In prevent In this it. situation, you could have banished your own Harvenus with Magna Mood. 
activate uh, with a Drew Swim, and then have Mudora to chain to a possible Dragon Maid tidying. Yep, I do agree with you there. He is now resolving Saldik to search himself the Telemans Shiren. But Shiren, as we said, is just another resource for the next turn. But we gotta wonder, is Philip even getting another turn here? Because Nicholas really has not stopped yet. No. And look at him. He is now revealing that he drew into both of the baby dragons. He's summoning Black Dragon, Call Up Serpent, which you successfully identified in the card guessing game. And you were absolutely sure that this was not Dragon Collapse Serpent. It is both. <laughs> now I know it is. So he has two dragons on board. And we know that dragons can really do a whole lot with two dragons because there's Dragoon tonight, Romulus, yeah. and I'm pretty sure that's a link to he's about to summon, and that would bring him to the most powerful field spell <laughs> of his whole deck. And that is, of course, the Dragon Ravine. And Dragon Ravine in this specific deck is not only able to send dragons to the graveyard, but it can also just search for Dragoon cards. It cannot just search for Dragoon cards, you will have to discard a card for a cost. I okay, have to tell you. I will give you that. But there is the Dragon Ravine now. But we know that the cards in Nicola's hands don't really do anything at this point because it is a Serenir, it is a Magnamood, and it is I one see card Rocket that I remember. Tracer. There's Rock Tracer, Tracer in there Tracer, yes, well. I saw Tracer, but you cannot normal summon and Boot Sector Launch is out already. What did he normal summon, though? Ah, the normal the summon Power Dragon Yeah, yeah, now I remember, you're so right. So he still has some resources to get into place, but the cards in his hand won't be too strong. He is discarding the Saronir. And Saronir can actually mill the Bellion, right? Um, yes! That's, that's true. That's it's actually true. a really good discard. Indeed, that's true. And maybe we're just going to search for the Ramos here. Yeah. And yes, Dragunity Ramos is being added by the Dragon Ravine. And we're going to send the Bestial Lubellion via the Saronir as well. This is huge stuff for Nicolas. He's doing a lot out of very little. He could actually be able to snowball into a big board here, maybe summon the Boral Sword Dragon, which we also had in the card highlight earlier, but it's kind of funny that we had all the cards in here. Is, um, he, is he not running Access Code Talker? Um, he is not running Access because Code Talker, no. Because Boral Sword Dragon is able to deal a lot more damage than Access Code Talker. However, there is a big board on the field for Philip, who also banished the Lebellion now with the Jewish Worm. And it is going to be hard to OTK Philip in this turn, because this is a wall of monsters there. Let, let me tell you something, he's not even running Boral Sword Dragon, as I just checked. Oh. There's so many Dragoonity cards in his extra deck, but he didn't fit any of them in. And the only uh, big boss monster is Boral and Dragon. But also, like, this a cool a little one. option I saw in here, Usually only uh, in later stages of the game, but Scarlight, Red Dragon, Archfiend actually could be a that board wipe here very well true. indeed yeah. as well. But if you trigger, okay, Havn is already triggered, Druid Swim will trigger. Actually, Scarlight Dragon is really good here if you can get to a level 8 and then have follow up plays, because I don't think it will be enough to take oh, the game. But there is God Dragon Pisty, first of all. It's also interesting because Sprite Sprint actually is pointing to one of the zones that Nicolas has, to the middle zone. Right now, he cannot capitalize on that yet, but maybe he gets to a scenario where he could actually use that for the effect of Pasty. That is a good point. So he oh, has another Dragon Ravine, and this card is not hard once per turn, so he can actually just discard the Rocket Tracer. Later on, summon it back with Pisty, and now search for another Dragoonity card, or send one from the deck to the Juwine. I think he could just get out another Ramos, and Ramos can special summon itself yeah. to the board. Okay, he goes for Legatus, but that's the same thing. He can also special summon this guy out, and then he goes for another Link monster, and then Pisty will be able to actually special summon something back. Look, there's Legatus being on the field. And he, of course, also summons back the Ramos. He is and going he goes strong for now. A gay dark, but he does not have the Mist Valley level two monster in his deck anymore. And I don't. The baby rock is already in the graveyard. You're right. So let's get up gay dark. Once per turn, you can add one level for lower dragon or winged beast monster from your deck to your hand. Then discard one dragon or winged beast monster. So the small combo with the Mist Valley baby rock does not work but he can still search for a Dragon Monster that could be a good resource in the GY. However, it has to be level 4 or lower, so no Armagram for him. The thing is, let me tell you something. He went for Legatos for the first time, but he could go for Remus here, and then Remus also has the ability to special summon itself and from... And he went for a completely... Oh, oh, he just searched for, for the Chamber Dragon Mate and put it back to the graveyard. 
and there are no more traps like chamber uh, like um, Dragon Maid tidying in there. Yeah. And therefore, that's just a card that doesn't really do a whole lot right here. One thing I could see here though is he could just go into triple a link three, too. which would be triple burst yeah. dragon, and then that guard dragon pissy could actually come in handy. Let's a lot see if of goes effort. Right. Yeah, it looks like it. It looks like it. Does Philip have, have an answer to the borrowed and dragon? Uh, that is a also a question, question I'm asking too. myself. So we are using the effect of Pisti, trying to get back the Magna Mood, finally resolving it, and now he will get another Pisti in the end phase as well. Really, really cool stuff. And he is going for the Link 5 summon of his biggest boss monster in there, Barrel and Dragon hitting the field. And that's a very good question whether Philip even has an answer to that. And don't forget, this card can attack all the monsters on oh, the opponent's yes, side of the field. It can, and the monsters like Baron and Elf are actually half, so this is going to deal a lot of damage. Is this even damage on board 1500 for Baron so it's 2000 damage it's it certainly damage on board but it could be game on board even yeah you're right 2800 on the elf if I'm not mistaken it should be 2100 on the sprint which is already a lot and 1000 on the magno ever are we 100 damage off of game wait a second <laughs> that could be the case let's see first of all he's going to negate the sprint bow and reborn one of his dragons Oh, okay. Looks like we. Oh, yeah. We are reborning. No, what's, what's oh, going on? Oh, we are here? taking this step oh. back, apparently. So there must have been uh, something wrong with this. Magna Mood is apparently banished. So he couldn't summon back Magna Mood, apparently. Oh, he couldn't even go into the triple burst, by the way. We are at the Romulus stage of the game again. <laughs> we are at the Romulus... Wait, Romulus has left the field since forever, right? Yeah. Oh, no, not, not that long ago. So we, we just rewind it a little bit here. Yeah. But let's check. Triple Burst Dragon uh, needs two plus monsters except tokens. Yeah, we got that. Yeah, in theory, that's possible. But, oh, he has Legatos in hand now again. So, so uh, let's read Legatos again, okay? Let's Guys. just double check on the Gardas, you're right. Be patient with me and Dragoonity cards. There's Viremos hitting the board. Okay, okay. So now we just go for Triple Burst. So I think we, we just didn't go into the Gay Dog, right? Yeah. We, we left out the Gay Dog part now. We're still going to be able to summon back with Pisty. And at the end of the day, I think the result is just yeah. going to be exactly the same here. He's going to go into Bower and Dragon. And now, for the second time, he's actually summoning the boss monster of his deck, Bower and Dragon. And that can attack. And yeah, I'm still pretty sure that he's monsters. going to win because he's dealing close to 8,000 damage. And then actually can probably activate the effect of Rocket Tracer afterwards to go into Sc Scarlight. You're right, that could be the case, yep. And yeah, the Rocket Recharger has been shuffled back into the deck. The target for Rocket Tracer was out of the deck already, but Mudora did Nicolas a favor and put it back to the deck. Yep. Are what a performance here by Nicolas going second into the best deck of the format. He's yeah. really going strong here versus this Ishizu Tielemans deck. I like what I'm seeing for sure. And we said it earlier, and we will say it again. Dragon Link is not to mess around with with only like one or two bodies on the board. If you gave, give them one or two dragons, you are in for a bad time. And we are going for the Borrowed Savage Dragon. When it attaches a big Link monster, it can actually get more attack points than the Borrowed End Dragon. So this could still be game. Let me... I'm very curious. So First of all, over sprint. It's we're running over right? Sprite Sprint. So this is the first damage being inflicted to the life point of to the life points of Philip. We're also running over Elf. And Which I think should be 2,800. We are 49. Philip sees the riding on the roll. He's already looking over to his life points block. His sheet of paper is not looking gorgeous right now. It's going down and down and down. And we are. There's taking over Baron Magna leaving the field, Magna Mood leaving And two. this is 100 life points on <laughs> Philip. And now Sarni will be sent to the graveyard. Try to send Borrel and uh, Borrel Load Savage Dragon. This one will negate. What and we a have massive one turn here, Nicholas. by Nicholas Schneider. with the Borrel and Dragon. The crowd is going wild. Absolutely deserved victory there and deserved round of applause by the crowd. What a game we saw yes, there. Yes, absolutely. We were quite impressed by how good Philip kept on going, even though yeah. he was not really milling the names he wanted to see. And he still ended up with Baron could, and multiple interruptions. He could fusion summon in this game because of Sarony, because of Magnum, because of everything. Yeah. And 
the bestial engine those are the most popular dragons we have right now in the game because yeah. every other deck also is playing them but here we have a pure dragon deck dragunity cards dragon made cards all, all the, of all it together the dragon archetypes and we don't care we just want dragons in this case, it was actually a bad thing for Philip that he had a big board because <laughs> Borrel and Dragon was there saying, I'm yeah. going to do damage here, there, and always as there and as well. Don't forget about Forbidden Droplet halving the oh, Baron yeah. and the Sprite. I mean, Droplet and Tactics is pretty good if you are playing a deck really like that can OTK For sure, for sure. So that was a long game, but a really, really nice and It was a game. rewarding one to watch. Absolutely. But let's see what would be the side deck options that we could bring in here. I'm looking at Philip first because Philip will be the one going first. Is there something we can really look forward to? Oh, I, I do think so. You, what are you liking here? Tell me about I it. I like uh, triple copies of skill drain. Oh, the skill could be drained here in this game number two if he activates it for sure. And there's Dragonling, that would definitely be a good card to bring in for sure. And uh, yeah, all the other options don't seem very suitable for the matchup. They're more of going second options. Yeah. But speaking of going second options, let's see what Nicholas could bring in here. One card that I haven't seen in ages, there's Forbidden Shadows in there. He's like, hey, those Forbidden Droplets work really well on my main deck. Maybe we should go with more Forbidden cards. Yeah. <laughs> forbidden Chalice, not really that strong at the moment because there is Sprite Elf that can protect monsters from being targeted. True. However, Absolutely. if you summon Elf in your main monster zone, this does not stop your opponent from chalicing. But so that's totally not it. He's also no, bringing no, no, in Triple not. Dark Ruler, Triple Lightning Storm, gamma. Triple Gamma plus the Driver. So his side deck is... Called by the Grave is also an amazing card going second if you are not even in the mirror match. I don't like it that much though. Because all the shufflers just dodge the call by the grave and then it does yeah, not... But you still get rid of the effect. You can still chain it to the effect of... You can yeah, also bait out do. the shufflers if you want to. You can just call Mudora or Keldo in your draw phase. The card is really flexible. Yeah, it's not that great going second though, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> you, you can you can say in chat whether you like it or not. But I'm not the biggest fan going second for gold by the grave. But your opinion is valued in here as well. <laughs> this is the same space if you want called by going second. You're, you you're can have making it. <laughs> me freeze right here. You're making me freeze. So what I'm thinking is, Nicholas is playing 60 cards. He's playing so many cards to side in. He might even side out one entire engine of his deck. You're right. I mean, there are so many, so you yeah. could actually get rid of some. It will definitely not be the Bestial engine, I will tell you I that. I wouldn't think so, no. <laughs> because this is very, very good versus the Shizu Tielemans. And that's probably the reason why this deck even is that good in the format right now. Him still going strong here in the tournament. And uh, without the Bestial engine, I think he would have a way harder time. But um, it, I could actually see the Dragon Mate engine going out going second. Or the Dragunity engine. Both of them seem to be very good going first, but maybe not as strong going second. We're going to see what happens, though, right now, because the players are ready. Game two of round number 10 starts now. Let's head over to the table. There we have them. Philip will have the chance to go first. Let's see how he is using it. Maybe he also lets his opponent go first and thinks maybe I can break his board. Now he will side in so many board breakers, but uh, this would not be a hand you want to go second with. So we are activating Scream. Philip is indeed going first. You were right about that. And, and he starts combining. it off with Shiren, discard Shiren, and the mills will be Instant, Instant Fusion, Halfness, and Mudora. And Mudora which Those mills are not too bad. Mill, yeah. Those mills are not too bad. So we're probably going to trigger the Scream here and also the Halfness. Yep. Oh no! He, did he point towards the Scream? Didn't look like it, right? Nope. Okay, so we're not resolving Scream. Maybe we're just waiting with it. Maybe you want to chain block something with it. Maybe the kit colors actually. That, you yeah. could actually chain block the kit colors here if you like. Yeah, one, indeed, two, yeah. indeed. Chaining one is a kit colors. Chaining two is V scream. Well, and let's see what we're hitting here. Halfness. Oh, he pointed at the halfness earlier, right? Yep, yep. The halfness yeah. is resolved already. So look, he may he takes himself a note. Halfness is done. Let's see what we can do next. He at least hits the Merly as well. But we are of course also going to resolve the effect of kit colors first. I know you are an expert in forgetting to <laughs> activate the effect. I did that to once search with because colors. you were talking so much, Basti. Stop it. I'm a commentator. <laughs> it's my job to talk <laughs> about Yu-Gi-Oh! So why would you <laughs> be mad about that? He's searching for Tielemann's crime here though with Kit Colors. 
Okay, so crime is being searched, as you just said. We are shuffling again in this. We are in for, for a long term, guys. Also, crime would have really helped Philip last game, right? If he would have had crime for the droplet, it would have been huge and probably it would have been game winning for him there. But he didn't have it. Didn't have enough to also set up one of the Tillman's traps. Searched for Saldik in between, but then had to discard it later on. So it really didn't make it for him. What, what I really solver. like about this version of the deck is that you don't always immediately activate all of the effects that you are milling of your Tillman monsters. You can be a little bit more patient with the deck and wow, we are hitting Scream and Chiron. Uh, also Heartbeat, but this one is not too important right now. I think, didn't we use Chiron already? Because we started it all I off with... I think we used the Havnus. So it's either one or uh, it's a Havnus or Chiron. And we I mean, both, one of so them will be able to resolve. But really I think here. He, he pretty certainly started all off with Chiron, this got Chiron. Yeah, but I, I think then correctly. he milled the Havnus and then activated the Havnus. All right, so he's still able uh, yeah. He's still able to resolve the Chiron. Fair enough. So Chiron and Rhino Heart are announced. Or was it Scream? Uh, both. He, I mean, he, he searched for, for, for crime, so yep. maybe he has Salik in there already as well in his hand, so potentially there's no trap anymore to be He's searched. Cutting Merle. I think, I th I think, think he didn't he announce Scream. Salik. He, I think he pretty much, I'm not really sure he announced it. Okay, perfect. There is be Salik, all right. So he has double trap, and I think that's definitely good. I think in a quick second, though, I saw that Nicholas has Lightning Storm in his opening hand, so... That would already be a pretty... Yeah, there is Lightning Storm indeed. Would be a pretty good way to already bait out the crime, at least. I really want to find out if he wins the game. If not, I'm going to ask him personally in the, inter in the interview. Um, what he sided out for all these going second cards. Like, if he really is about siding out an entire engine. Yeah. And I mean, it's always rough with 60 card decks. Yeah. The side decking process becomes a lot harder because you are going to More see options. your side deck cards less often because of the pure amount of cards you have in your deck. The probability goes down to see the cards you're putting in because 15 out of 40, who would have thought, is a higher percentage than 15 out of 60. <laughs> I, I, even myself can do that more often. <laughs> so, let's see how Philip is going on. He summoned Rule Colors. Having rule colors on the board actually is quite good because that also prevents a couple of bestial plays for Nicholas. That is indeed true. But he would have probably already activated bestials on one of the effects that Philip used. There's Merle coming down now for Philip resolving. I think we're going to see Gurura, and this is going to be all of the T elements GY effects for this turn. Going much better for Philip yeah. than it was in game number one. But looks like Nicholas actually has brought in board breakers to support his going second matchup, and uh, therefore it's still not that great. I mean, he had board breakers in the main deck already. Yeah. He's he's running that droplet, and he ran that droplet in game number one. Oh yeah, he had a really good droplet coming down there. So he's triggering Garua, of course, getting another draw, and yeah, multiple traps in his hand. He has crime. He has Salik. So his setup is great because oh, he can also now rebound the diviner. But I don't think that he has Modora and Kaldo. Nope, I'm pretty sure. He, he just has, has Modora, Modora, he now checks and he is going to send a Kaldo. And this one will be a Baron or an Abyss Dweller. I mean, I mean, okay, Diviner won't be an Abyss Dweller, obviously. However, you can still go for Dweller, which is really good in this matchup. Nope, he goes for the Baron. It does make sense. Yeah. Game one, it was dropleted, but your opponent cannot always have dropleted in 60 cards, so I do understand that he goes for the Baron again. Baron de Fleur, plus two traps set, and the roll colors. A lot of negation being present here on the deck. Let's see. Oh, there's another droplet wow. again. His sixth card again was the Forbidden Droplet. Nicholas gets to see dropped it two games in a row in 60 cards, and that could be a huge game winner for him. Prime is going to be a big win against that though because you can't even chain forbidden he just scoops it wow he just scoops it i think he does not have the cards to play with this if he destroys all the monsters shiren is going to trigger all colors is going to trigger so you effectively get half of the cards back you can chain the elf and summon back the merle so you get yes. two fusions immediately you can't chain 
droplet if there is a crime. True. Crime would crime be changed to a so droplet good. later on. So this board was actually lightning storm and droplet protected. But this is so good for Philip because yeah. now we have 10 minutes left for yeah. the last game. So we might actually get to play it out quite properly yeah. and therefore both of them have a chance. Also, I really like the decision of Nicolas to scoop early here yeah. because both of them are already on the draw. Yeah. So drawing here is it's not, not for an them. No, They're both out of the not. tournament if they draw. Therefore, they have to win right here. And he makes the decision to just go into a game free, go into the decider rather quickly. And we have already talked about the Scarlet on Nicolas' side. Oh, but yes. there is a hand interaction called Spooky Dogwood. Oh, yeah. Let me check. Is he running it? Oh, he is. We Ghost see Ghost and Spooky, Spooky Dogwood, Dogwood Philip. on Philip's side. And if he opens this one, this will put Nicolas turn to a stop. Really oh yeah, quickly. oh yeah. You don't want to give your opponent no. a bunch of life points okay. when you In are this close combo, to time. You're going to up oh. your opponent to 100,000 life points. You couldn't even end the game ever yeah. with that. I mean, Borel and Dragon would help because he's quite big. But yeah, but you would still need like 10 turns for yeah. it. <laughs> Indeed, and he probably doesn't have those 10 turns. And I'm really, really hyped for this. Day two instantly starting off with a strong match. Yesterday we had so many already, yeah. yeah we had so many great matches and again we're starting it off like that. We see that the rogue options really are putting yeah. up a fight to the best deal uh, for the best deal Ishiza Tillman stack because I can tell you most of the Ishiza Tillman stacks in the field are also running the Bestial package. Yeah, most this Bestial do. package is not to be overlooked. I think Magnemut and Druizum are the most played cards in the tournament in different aspects. I think Druizum is really interesting. That's the a one cool in the most here. decks, and Magnemut is the one played per most copies. And also, it's really not only between the Bestials, it's really the most played cards in all yep. of the tournaments. Yep. So the Bestials have really taken over the tournament landscape. They are staples. They are absolute staples and everybody is on them. And it's quite funny. As you said, more people have decided to play Druidswurm, yeah. but in total, of course, because Magnamut is a generic searcher, more people yeah. are playing copies of Magnamut. How many copies of Bistia Magnamut are we going to see here in game number three? Let's get into the action again. So we are going. We are drawing one, two, three, four, five cards for both players in the opening hands. And we are going to see game three of this first round. It is a bubble match. Whoever loses this cannot advance to the top card anymore. Oh, Whoever wins this Philip still is opened, in competition. I can tell you one thing. Philip opened triple Kelbeck. I mean, one Kelbeck is cool, but triple Kelbeck is quite a stretch, to be honest. That is definitely rough. Ramos is being discarded and it's going to search the best field spell, Dragon Ravine. Yep, your favorite field spell of all time is being added to the hand. And it's also being activated right there. We see he has the White Dragon again. He has Saronir. And he has Chaos Space. Oh boy, the hand of Nicholas looks good. Oh, and he's discarding Tiding and... <laughs> I mean, he's discarding and milling cards already, but there is no special summon monster on the field that Kalbeck could bounce. Not yet, nope. So he is adding the Legatos. Legatos special summons itself to the field. That also triggers the Ramos in the graveyard, which is also summoning itself back to the field. And that's getting banished when it leaves the field. And there is the Gay Dog. He could potentially go after the Gay Dog here, right? Yep, that's what he's doing. Oh, he's oh, there's one Halfness at least in his hand. Oh. So Halfness is his hope here. Halfness is the on hope. Keldo is strong on Magnamut, not so much, but Rhino Heart. Oh. But I don't think that he there can trigger no the Rhino Heart. This is monsters. so huge for Nicolas. And Philip is not looking too happy about it. Nope. Very, very straight face right there. Doesn't look like he could resolve the Rhino Heart at all. And yeah, his, his face is telling it. His face is telling it. He was really banking on that halfness to hit something useful. There's the, rock, there's the baby rock triggering in the graveyard. Will Special be summoned summoning back to the field. And then we can go for a start of strength in this set. Oh, as well activate. he's instantly oh. going for the yes. Kelbeck as well. This is so, so strong. I mean, Baby Rock will still be sent to the field or a special summon to the field, but Gay Dark in the extra deck is not really where you want to have it. The thing though is, you. Oh, he. he oh, that's quite oh, aggressive Philip is from going Philip. in here, but I think that this is absolutely necessary at this point. I mean, you only have six minutes left on the clock, yeah. so you rather want to end this turn quickly. And he <laughs> hopes that he could end this right here, that he 
is stopping Nicholas completely, but we saw chaos space in the hand of Nicholas, so I don't think he's done yet. <laughs> no, he also has the White Dragon Wiper Burster, which is not a problem because you can banish it for a collapse servant that you are searching afterwards, and then you can just put it back under your deck with the chaos space to even draw one more card. So, yeah. I'm totally sure that Nicholas is this able is to play to on hard. here. Philip, look how he's looking into the camera. <laughs> he's, he's just hoping. He's praying to the Yu Gi Oh gods, please, please let that be enough. Let him stop playing. But we saw it in game one that Nicholas is absolutely capable oh, to play through a bunch of stuff. He is not going to be too happy when he sees this Chaos Space. Let's see his reaction when Chaos Space hits the field. There it is, Chaos Space, and Philip, what does he think? Yep, he's giving a thumbs up. He knows this is going to Tough take one. a whole lot longer now. And he's searching, of course, for the Call of Serpent. Is there a chance that if Scarlight hits the field and re resolves, that Philip can actually do something with the Harvness effect? I mean, he can't gain life points, so that's already a pretty, dis pretty big disadvantage. But, let's see. Deck is being cut, drawing a card. So, oh, this that Dragon Link. I want to play Dragon Link now again. <laughs> <laughs> it's commentating on those Honestly, matches really makes me get all the cards in the Yu Gi Oh universe. <laughs> Honestly, every time I watch Dragon Link play, I'm like, I really want to play yes. this deck. But when I pick it up, it just does not do the same things <laughs> I see on the featured matches. You should have a talk with Nicolas then, though. He is definitely putting that deck to work. And yeah, yeah, of course, the card is at the <laughs> bottom of the deck. Where would it be when you just put it there? I have a hot tip where the card could be. <laughs> yeah, so he's summoning out the White Dragon now again. Why the Brewster? And we're going to see the Link to summon. Are we going into Romulus again? Cool thing about this deck, normally when you are hard drawing your Dragon Ravine and Dragon Link, there's no more target for your Romulus anymore. Yeah. But this deck luckily so plays multiple copies. of the Dragon Ravine. By the way, Dragon Ravine in here. do you think that Nicholas would have had oh, more he plays? Can, he can even search for Glow. The thing is, it doesn't limit yeah, you to field spells. True. You can just search for Dragoon to Glow. That's also quite powerful here. But yeah, go ahead, Leo. What did you want to say? If he kept the Keldo and did not use it on the rock, like Baby Rock does not really do anything on the field. It that's, is not even a dragon. I thought, that's yeah. the most important part of it. It's not a dragon. You can't go into Striker Dragon. If he kept the Caldo for the Chaos Space discard to not let him have a light monster in the GY, would he have passed? I think so, right? I mean, yeah. I'm but you pretty sure. Maybe you I'm can't sure. know that your opponent is going to drop a Chaos Space as his last option. Of course, but I mean, you are probably sure that his options are very limited. This there is, a, is card. a card you even used in your Time Wizard duel yesterday. Yeah. Armor Mistletane. Very old and OG card from uh, Dragunity Legion. Was that the na name of the uh, structure deck we had back I in the day? I think I'm pretty so. sure, right? But I'm confused. He's not attaching Phalanx. There's no Phalanx, yeah. There's no Phalanx in his deck list. That's probably the reason why. Oh, we are going for a Bayage. Oh, Atom. Oh, we are wow. going the for OG. a Heretic card. Heretic. This card has seen a little bit of popularity lately again due to the. Um, Thunder Dragon Bestial Thunder list. Dragon Bestial deck, but here in this deck it of course also makes a lot of sense. So now Saronir is detached and actually immediately triggers. Magnemut is being special summoned and now already tributed for Lubalion and this one is going to activate Branded Beast from the deck. That is indeed true. Nicolas getting a good setup here, but yeah, there it is, Branded Beast. I love how the Bistier cards and the Branded cards are actually working so well yeah. together because Branded Beast and uh, Branded Regain are actually two really, really powerful cards. Let me just check, is he also playing the Branded Regain? Doesn't look like it. At this point, I no, think that Branded not. cards work with every deck. Apparently they do, yeah. Oh, he's going for oh, he's Seal going now. for Seal. This is not the level 8 Scarlight place we were, we were anticipating. Thinking about, is Philip actually getting a turn here with one minute left on the clock? I think we're in the end phase. Yes, we are searching for Drew Swamp. Philip is actually going to have a turn here. And he has two monsters on board already. So Philip rather hurry. And also, he doesn't really need to hurry that much because 
They're both on 8,000 life points. But as we oh, said earlier... The draw is an out for both players in indeed. this tournament. And he cannot only normal summon another monster, because there is a bounce, it will special summon another monster, and Branded Beast is going to pop something. Oh, so Shiren, Shiren is being activated. Started all off. Now we are in a hurry. Kalbeck is being sent to the GY, but you can't really activate this now, can you? It will take too much time. You can just use the Merly, and oh, we are activating oh, He's triggering Bobo Bam. And There's Druid's Bomb on the Merly. This is going so fast now. Mudora is going to send back the, the Merli and we are looking at the opponent's GY. 40 seconds on the clock. This is going to probably end in a draw. I'm not going to lie to you guys, but there are ways for Philip to win this. 30 seconds. Hurry up, Philip. You need to deal some damage now. Also, one thing, I'm pretty sure Philip might oh, even have an option as well. as well. He's running Volcanic Scattershot in the side deck. And close to timeout, as we were in siding before game three, I'm quite sure that you would even bring this card in going second, yeah. right? Just hitting it randomly off of a Halfness Min on your opponent's yeah. turn or something. That could really pay off here. And we may be able to see Philip take this one here. With eight seconds left on the clock, we are very likely going to end up in timeout here in this main what, phase of Philip. What he still should do is. Oh, well, he's milling now. There is the timeout announcement. Are we hitting the scatter shot immediately? Is the big question. No, nope, we are not yet. Philip, ah, not really liking it. <laughs> so, this would be a draw right now. And I think Philip asking his opponent, do you have any. No. I think if Philip does not have an option, if Philip has no scatter shot in his deck, he would have already offered the handshake. Yeah. But the fact that he keeps on. Sorting his cards there in the graveyard and going on, I think it is pretty likely that he has scatter shot. And let's be honest, there's a pretty easy access way for scatter shot, which is Sprite Sprint. Yes, he just needs to get a level two monster on board or a link two monster on board. You can already bait off the seal. We are checking Kaleido Heart again. I think that he sent two Aqua monsters and the nope, he <laughs> did not send two Aqua Monsters, he sent two Rhino Hearts, That's which is impossible because you need one Rhino Heart and two Aqua Monsters. Rhino Heart is a warrior. Indeed it is. And so now we are trying to target the Heretic Seal of Heretic Spheres of Evenly Heretic Seal of Evenly Spheres. Okay, I will check this. Heavenly, Heavenly Spheres. spheres. <laughs> this was one. But wrong. there's another very popular card with Evenly in its name, so you didn't uh, totally confuse something. There. Heretic Seal of Heavenly Spheres. There we go. Absolutely. So, he is going after the Kaleido Heart. And Nicholas, of course, has to chain it here. Yeah, that's what he's doing. And he is chaining it. Now the big question is, oh, nice. He actually just shuffles it back because it tributes for a cost. And that's can't really activate the new of chaining. Philip. Philip, you genius. Philip is pulling it off here. So, if he would have a battle phase here, it would be so much better because he could just go into it right yeah. now, but now he has to find himself a way to actually get to that scatter shot. And a card is still bounced here, so is there a dark type in your opponent's GY? I think we have seen a Magna Mood. Oh, we are he actually uses discarding Mudora discard Kalbeck. Kalbeck. But we did mill with Kalbeck already, yeah. right? So... Oh, we are going into a Link to Dark is summoned to the extra monsters of That is our dark way into Sprint, though. That is our way into Sprint, my friend. First of all, we're getting Magna, Magna Mood, also of cool. Of course, in the end phase, we activate the effect to get it in the end phase. Sprint there is, is activated. Bright sprint. What are we, are we special volcanic summoning? Scatter shot? I think he passed the scatter shot. No, there it there is. There is the scatter shot. And Philip wins the featured match to still be in contention for the top cut. What a match. I was so sure when Nicolas yeah. was going into game three with a couple of minutes left that he, he, would, be able, that he would be able to just completely yeah. do everything. And we were like, yeah, he still has Kale space. That must be enough for him to do yeah. so much stuff. But his end bot in the end then was Branded Beast plus the Heavenly Spheres. And that's honestly not that, not that much, I right? can tell you why. There go is ahead. no Absol Router in his decklist. So he True. cannot go for a Dragon Ravine route where he just searches for Rocket Tracer, activate Boot Sector Launch. You're right, you're right, yeah and then just go for a level 8 Synchro. True, Absorado was like one of I mean, the hardened soul there, cards. There should there. be some Dragoonity routes to go into a level 8 Synchro, right? You would think so, yeah, absolutely. But maybe he sided out some of the Dragoonity cards. On the other hand, so we he's only seen... siding uh, going second cards, so what kind of going first cards would he side in? That's not really that anything. That is indeed true. Maybe Drama and Guy... Uh, drama and Gaiva. Drama, yeah. <laughs> drama and Gaiva. <laughs> drama and Gaiva, guys. Drama and Gaiva, no. Gamma, Gamma and, and Driver, Driver uh, of for an Ash onto Chaos Space, but nobody, not nobody, but Ash has fallen out of popularity. It's not really there anymore. I don't think it's going in going first. Probably not, but what an insane and intense start to the day. Yeah. 
And actually, this was the second appearance of Philip in our coverage over the course of this weekend. Oh, right. Because I had him for our Naturia deck profile on Friday. He, last minute, decided what to a still little joker. decided to run the Ishida Tielemans deck for the event. I can understand why, to be honest. Very powerful deck, it, it as we just saw deck, once yeah. more. Uh, but uh, he will be very happy to still be in competition now. Really, really, really great game. And uh, really two likable guys. And also even the fist bump after yeah. that ending with the Volcanic scatter shot. But yeah, you would have to side in the scatter shot every single time when yeah. you are close to time, even when you are going second with that deck, right? There's that just no true. choice. It's just a too important win condition at this point. And uh, I gotta be honest, I'm really proud. This was my Baron, by the way, on the field. True! Fun fact! <laughs> he got it from me. So <laughs> he got really it from happy. himself on Friday, so Philip wouldn't be here without you. <laughs> exactly. The best Baron in the field right now. He wouldn't be here without you. Yep, everybody was shaking. He, he actually was with us here yeah. just before we started the featured match, just before we decided on the yeah. featured match. And we were like, yeah, maybe you are going to get a featured match at some point. And then it was just paired versus yeah. our Dragon Link guy, versus our Dragon Maid guy. Immediately. And that actually worked out for him. He was beating, he was defeating him here in that. But let's let's recap for a second. Sure, go on ahead. This game three, because I think there were very few interruptions. I mean, there was Caldo and Cal Beck. I yes. mean, that, that is actually good. But why don't we go and hear from Philip what he thought of game three? Give it over to Ed. Hello, guys. I am here with Philip, who's just won round 10. You're now 7 2 for 1. This is going well. You're heading for that top cut. This is one of those bubble matches where whichever way this was going might have separated you from the top cut. How do you feel? Uh, well, I, I honestly, I feel quite tired because the night was quite hard, because last, uh, last night was quite long, but I'm very happy to have, I was able to win the match, yeah. You did have to work very hard, especially at the end there, and watching your brain work as you managed to work your way towards that scatter shot was very exciting. But we'll come back to that. Let's go through the game. So game one, we had some pretty standard tier plays to start with. You responded to the Dragon Maid with the Havnis, milling Merle and Agido, and then milled Havnis and Siliac. There was so much interaction. And then Nicholas sort of ended up dealing with Baron, Sprite Elf with Forbidden Droplet. There was the Triple Tactics Talon, and then the Borrelend. So that was... Quite, quite a heavy moment. So how did you feel during that? Um, well, it was quite a tough one because he had like a few bestials which were able to interrupt me very good. But I was still able to pull off a very good board, I thought. Uh, still having like two bestials in hand, I think. But he just managed to play through and go for the Borderland OTK, which uh, kind of surprised me, to be honest, because I never seen those Dragoonity cards before. There you go. Sometimes that, that little bit of a little bit of bad luck could just end up with that. But it was very exciting seeing all that happen. But you were right, you built a really amazing field there to try and deal with it. But sometimes it just doesn't work and something will come out to surprise you like a Borrel End Dragon. Game two, you built a huge field. And there was Baron, Rule Coloss, two set cards, a sprite elf on the scream, and then him having Lightning Storm and Droplet in hand just wasn't enough to deal with it, and so it ended in a scoop. So at that point, you didn't have much time going into the third round. How were you feeling at that point? Um, well, it was like eight minutes, I think, but I was like, I was thinking I might be able to take it home because I knew I have a lot of interactions in my deck, like a lot of hand traps, which do, um, which I thought like maybe interrupt him uh, enough to stop him. But the thing was, my hand was quite awful, to be honest. I had three Calback in hand, one Mudora and one Hafnus. And then I moved the Rhino Heart of Hafnus and I, I just felt like, damn it, I do not have any tier name in my hand. So I was quite feared that he will burn me for time, but luckily I was able to interrupt him just enough. And then we got into the third and final one where it was a lot of plays, a lot of interaction, and then the desperate, <laughs> the desperate moment of looking for that scatter shot. We weren't sure you were gonna get it, thought it might have been a draw, and right at the end it came out. Talk us through all the steps you were trying to go through just to get to that scatter shot. Um, okay, yeah, it was actually, his board was just like the, the Seals Pass he had and the Branded Beast. And I knew I would have, like, after I milled the Caldo, I knew I would be able to interrupt the special summon effect of the Seals because I was, like, feared of Grand Tusk Dragon, which could pop two cards on my field, meaning I wouldn't have been able to go into the Dark into Scattershot line. So I just thought, like, yeah, after the point I milled the Caldo, I had it, I thought. But I was still feared he has, like, one Bishel or one interaction again, because then he would just... His beast would have been live again, but I thought he would use them earlier, and I was lucky to mill and uh, to have a second Medora in hand, so meaning all the bestials were dead as well. 
So it's heart of the cards and then the brain that is required to make those cards work. Congratulations, a really, really solid round 10 there. Only two more rounds of this Swiss, and we might be making the top cut. Are there any decks that you're slightly worried about going up against in these last two rounds of Swiss? Um, I wouldn't say worried, but I did play a lot of mirrors by now. So I'm like, it's kind of normal to play the mirror for me by now. Um, but I, I'm a bit feared of some like anti strategies which might come up. Like Dex playing, he played like four, uh, 60 cards, but Dex playing 40 cards and then nine bestials also are very scary to be honest. If you have a lot of dark monsters in grave yet you want to resolve. Well, we'll see what ends up happening. Best of luck. Congratulations again. Don't go anywhere, guys, because we've got the last two rounds of Swiss coming up before we get into our top 64 cut here at YCS Dortmund. Don't go anywhere. Welcome to your coverage of YCS Dortmund. My name is Ed Templer and I'm going to be your host for the weekend, but allow me to introduce your coverage team. Leonard Koenig, Sebastian Lemka, Alberto Morazzi, Ed Templer, and Marcello Barbary. We are your coverage team for YCS Dortmund 2022, and we are very excited to be bringing you guys some amazing coverage. Don't go anywhere. We've got plenty of features and content coming right up.
four player duels. Cross dual fields. Cross dual monsters. Cross dual spells. Cross dual traps. Cross dual teams. Cross dual strategy. Cross Duel Fun! Cross Duel! Cross Duel for everyone! Cross Duel for the world! Friend or foe, four duelists cross wits. A new era of dueling. Four player card battles. Cross Duel. Four duelists face off on a crisscrossed battlefield. Summon monsters and set spell and trap cards to defeat your opponents. Simple, beginner friendly rules for any duelist. Will you work together or claw your own way to victory? Optimize your strategy in real time. Class with fellow duelists in a battle like never before. Yu-Gi-Oh! Cross Duel.
and Elemental Hero Neos for new adventures in Yu-Gi-Oh! Power of the Elements. New heroes, new strategies, new enemies, 100 new cards. Yu-Gi-Oh! Power of the Elements. Nine cards per pack, each pack sold separately. Welcome back. Just two more rounds remain of this Swiss portion of YCS Dortmund, and we're here with the penultimate one. Round 11, very excitingly, we have Yuri Landsman versus Lucas Randegger, and we're going to kick straight in to this duel. Gentlemen, we're going to do a high roll to see who's going to be going first. Who would like to go first? Okay, that's a nine. Uh, that's five. Who's going to go first? You're going to go first. Okay, Lucas is going to go first. So I will hand you guys over to our wonderful German commentators, Sebastian, Leonard. Take it away. We've only got two more of these. Let's see what happens. Thank you once again, Ed. Here we are once more. Round number 11, the second to last of the whole tournament. And again, we have two players in the area here that have two losses already. So a third loss might be the end of the tournament run will probably be the end of the tournament run, right? Yep. X3 is probably not going to top, right? Might Maybe a couple, be... but not the ones that lost in the second to last round, gonna most likely. It's pretty much a bubble match. Definitely you don't want to lose here. You can't afford to lose and to get the risk into your system because then you are even more likely to lose the last round. And yeah, we have the two players already being shuffled up and ready to play. So let's dive into the action. Round number 11, let's start. Again, Here guys. we are, and do you see that? On top of Yuri yeah. Lanzmann's name, what kind of deck does he have there? He is playing stun, guys. We have already again scouted the best decks for you guys, and this one is a throwback to the past, not it because absolutely is. he's playing cards like Dragoonities, which were released ages ago. No, 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 no. Something quite different, a different approach for sure than yeah. that. We, we see some uh, Gravekeeper's Commander, really old card, or Commandant, rather, than Fossil Diner Parisevolosaurus. That's actually... F Fossil Diner is really, really cool. We have stacked in some new cards, like Kashtira Fenrir. We have Inspector Border as well, and we also have a card that I'm not the biggest fan of, but it has found its way into many main decks of Rings to the Doomed. Indeed, indeed, yeah. So, some pretty interesting stuff. Very certainly a deck that wants to win the die roll because there are quite a few trap cards in his deck. He's running cards such as Solemn Judgment, so he would have certainly preferred to win the die roll here. That wasn't happening because Lucas Randegger won the die roll and is starting things off here with his Ishizu Tielemans stack. So Kid Color summoned, Search Effect activated. Searching Can't for Tielemans Crime makes sense because he already has the Sullivan Graveyard, so there's probably no other trap he could search for. Well, and Rhino and Crime is a really strong start against such a deck. Absolutely. 
That's what a, okay, you would be able to search for another Salik because he's actually running double Salik, so that would be Ooh. possible, yeah. Yeah, quite an interesting it choice. It is a good mill. For sure it is, yeah, but usually people have been cutting on the Saliks, just running one and one crime, so you have the diversity in trap cards. Well, let's see what he's milling here. We are going for the mill eight play. That is very commonly seen in the Ishizu Tielemans deck. The combination of Merle and Kit Kalos adds up to eight cards being milled. And let's see what we're triggering. I think he might not activate Kalbeck because he does not know what his opponent is playing. Oh, this hand is a bit odd of Yuri, as we have already seen. He is run. He has drawn the one of Ecclesia. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, he's playing two, oh, to two. be fair. Okay. But, but still, yeah, drawing that is not really the, the best case scenario. You much rather want to get your Nadir Servant to resolve yep. and search it out from the deck. But that's not going to happen in that particular scenario here. There we are seeing the roll colors, and I gotta be honest <laughs> with you. Roll colors probably not going to do too much versus this deck, right? No, he doesn't really play any card that's special summon. Yeah, that's monster. not really his thing here in this tournament. <laughs> Yuri Landsman solely relying on normal summoning big monsters and impactful monsters. I mean, there's one exception. You talked about it earlier, Kashira Fenrir yeah. being the one he would special summon, but still. That is not something that could be stopped by Rokalos. I mean, he has Crime and he has, I think, Kaldor and Modora already set up in the GY plus Pearl Reino, So I think you don't get a better opening versus Gravekeeper Dina stun. Indeed. So oh. we also have Keldo, discard Keldo, searching for another one. Probably going to go for Kelback here. Yeah, we go for Kelback. So another card that's not too great because great I mean, this, yeah. this could act theoretically bounce one of the uh, Fenrir's that he's going to summon, but still, then he could just summon it back, so it's also not the best. You would have to wait until your opponent also summons another monster next to it. And look, I, I, I think he's probably going for Dweller here. He's scared of the mirror match, <laughs> he summons out the Abyss Dweller, another card that's not very useful in this matchup. And I think this helped Yuri to even get to this yeah. standing right now. A lot of people are expecting mirror matches all day long, and they are preparing for it in a certain way, and Yuri just comes in here playing a bunch of traps, and he starts it off with the Cosmic, so the crime is not going to be a problem anymore. That is really strong. What you could have also done is target the Palerino because getting a pop in every single turn of the game from now on is going to be really, really strong. Maybe he has double Cosmic Cyclone. That could be the case because he is actually running triple in the main deck. So he just wants to go after both of them. So you want and to prime that, right? You because really want to activate yes, here. Yes, yes. You want to resolve one of your tier effects. Oh, oh, he's actually discarding the Kalbak. I think he might want to activate it. Yes, of course. When you see that your opponent is okay yeah i mean you have dweller on top of it so what your opponent is milling even if he's on ishizu t elements is not really mattering because he's not going to be able to trigger it and there he sees the new solemn judgment and nadir servant offerings to the doom and lucas face <laughs> when looking at the graveyard of yuri is like what am i facing here i haven't seen those cards for a while no, i'm really happy i won this dice roll Absolutely, yeah. That Solemn Judgment could have been quite cool going first. And now you know you can just freely activate Agido as well. Oh, did he? Oh, yeah, he milled the Agido to... one of Agido. Absolutely. Let me see. Is he on one Agido only? I mean, you assume because... Yeah, okay, you saw it. Yeah, he's also on one Agido. That seems to be the, um, the trend, the decision that a lot of players have made. Another Fenrir being milled, and as you can see, he is on triple Cosmic Cyclone, now milling the other two, so he has no immediate answer to the Pearl Rhino. Haven is milled for Lucas, so I think he can trigger that one as well. And but now we first of all resolve the Shiren. Yes, indeed. But I think Yuri's hand must be still okay-ish, right? Otherwise, I would have preferred yeah. him to just scoop, because you don't want to give your opponent the information that you're on that yeah. kind of a deck, when you don't think you would be able to win game number one. So yeah. there must be some quite impactful cards in his hand still. What he can do here is activate Necro Valley have it popped, activate another Necro Valley if there is one, and then set Fossil Dyna Pachycephalos or... That or could be the way. Fossil Dyna Pachycephalos. Yeah, that's the actual name of the card, you're right. So maybe double Necro Valley, and I mean there are multiple ways for him in his deck to get to Necro Valley, but I see offering... I think he doesn't have double Necro Valley, and he rather has double offerings to the Doom in his end. So I don't know how this is going to... Offerings to the Doom only destroys monsters, right? Uh, yes, indeed. And you have to skip your next draw phase for it. 
But I think he has command, commandant, and and necro valley. I think. This oh, he one does will have necro valley. Be answered with a Palerino pop via Modoro. You have Caldo. to, otherwise the Caldo and Modoro are just not working anymore. Yep. Lucas knows his things. He knows how to out this necro valley. He instantly responds and tries to get rid of the necro valley instantly. And I mean, that's going to be successful. That will be quite successful. But did you see? That there is also commandant in the hand of him because that would I mean I don't know. Yeah, that would mean a second. That he could get a second Neko Valley. And then setting the fossil dino. That, that could be is huge. Actually, that uh, would be a way to out. actually get into the game-winning position here that he wants to have. Yuri Lansman maybe even going second with that kind of a trap deck, with that kind of a stun deck, is going to and be able to pull this off. <laughs> Surprising. Uh, faces here on the screen, not really, but we see that he's now again reading up on the Pearl of Rhino, and Pearl of Rhino is just going to pop the Necro Valley. And what's next? Oh, we I have double offerings mm. to the Doomed and Ecclesia. It's we have Ecclesia. talked about the Ecclesia. Can you do something with the Ecclesia now? Not really. I think you I would have special summon it. He wants to get rid of the Sprite Elf, first of all. But Honestly, actually, the Dweller is quite good here because. Once you get to like Nadir's servant or something, or oh, send a monster from the X ray right. to the GY, Versus you cannot use Entis. It's awful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It actually is stopping a dear servant to really be the powerful card yeah. it really is. So that's actually tough for Yuri. Who would have thought that Abbas Dweller is putting in work versus stun? That's definitely not something to be expected. What a good all rounder card. And that brings Yuri to pick yeah. up his cards. Lucas Ramdegger taking game number one here in the 10th. Round feature match, 11th round it is. I'm very 11th sorry. 11th round. Lucas just had the perfect answer to the stun deck that he had no idea he was going to face. Absolutely he not. He just went for a pop on the Necro Valley, and before that. <laughs> Your brain apparently froze, but uh, there was not even that much happening before that, to be honest. Yeah, true. There was one cosmic cyclone on the crime, but crime, that didn't crime really, plus the pop. Didn't crime really change pop, a whole yeah. lot. But that's what I like about the She's a Telemans deck as in general as well. Because that field spell, that Pearl of Rhino, is so good versus all the back row, versus all the rogue decks, because you can just constantly, basically every turn, trigger the pop effect of Pearl of Rhino on your own turn, in your opponent's turn, doesn't matter. The Shizu can just your always make a life. Dimensional barriers you. You use your Kaldo, you use your Mudora. Doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. You can just work very well through back row, and you saw it right there. Necro Valley would be impactful like crazy. It would just totally stop the whole deck. Pop. But you could just instantly answer it. There was Pop. no way. And, but the thing is, because this field spell is so good, a lot of these Shizu Tillman's players oh, have prepared. actually decided to not run a whole lot more back row removal in their side decks. Yeah. So that could actually be helpful now for Yuri when he finds like more stuff to side in in his side deck now. And I'm just going to look what he's going to bring in here. We're seeing Dark Bribe. I think dark bribing a Pearl of Rhino is actually worth it. You don't want to have that card resolve. Yeah, I mean, you deny the search, so it is actually quite fine. But then Thunder King Ryo could come in here, one of your all-time favorite cards. Thunder King Ryo is really good. It also denies the search. However, it does not deny the pop after all. Yeah, that's but true. You could also the tributing effect of Thunder King Ryo is not too good versus tier elements. I mean, yeah. it helps versus exceed summons or synchro summons of Baron. But we are going to see if any of those come in or happen in Game 2 of the Round 11 featured match. Let's go back to the players. There we have them. Game number two lining up. And I just looked at the deck list of Lucas, and he has made the decision to play additional back row removal. Double twin twisters. He is running huge. the double twin twisters, which could be very helpful in this matchup. But and especially in all, this matchup, because you can discard the Kalberg and Targido, and you can just safely mill. And now the Grave Keeper. Look at this beautiful old card. A card that we haven't seen in ages, I want to say, was discarded to search for Necro Valley. So the Grave Keeper monsters of Yuri gain 500 additional attack points. Yep. Not only does and it defense. bring you to the best card in your deck, which is Necro Valley in this current format, but also when you our normal summoning and another Grave Keeper's Commander. It will be quite big, as he just mentioned. 2,100 attack points it would have after the boost. So kind of nice, kind of a big beater. And when your opponent's monsters are not doing anything because Necro Valley is on the board, then having a big beater yeah. can certainly help. 
So, and we are going with Prosperity after he, he just sees Negro Valley and Commandant again. There's Solemn Judgment, that could help. Fenrir is Fenrir also Fenrir. great. Oh, he does not even want the Fenrir. He might the actually have one already. He just wants to go for Judgment, and this is a good pickup. Judgment is great. So, the Twin Twisters in the world oh, of Lucas would be Inspector worse. We have Inspector Border, and this is indeed stun. Oh yeah, this is stunning to see here from Yuri Lanzmann. He's really piloting his stun deck to a really, really good start. And let's see what Lucas can even do about that. In case you forgot what Inspector Border is doing, because it wasn't in the feature match area recently, uh, this is just allowing each player to only resolve as many monster effects as different extra deck types are on the board. So if there's one link monster, you could just use one effect per turn. So if there's a link monster and a synchro monster, it would add up to two. True. But uh, right now, there's only non extra deck monsters on the board, and therefore no monster effects can actually be activated. I would have loved to see normal summon inspector border activate card of demise. That would have been a flashback for sure. But well, he's playing a lot of monsters in his decks, and also Dogmatica Fleurdelis, and those are cards that don't really pair up well with card of demise, so he decided to not take the draw three. Yep, indeed, indeed. I think well, part of prosperity is, is just better. Yeah. You just can target the card yeah. you want by revealing the top six cards of your extra deck, uh, by, of your main deck. Normal Summon Shiren it is, but... And Normal Sh Summon Shiren is even bigger than Inspector Border because Pellerino has but one effect that the can Dogmatica be Punishment! No. And that Dogmatica Punishment might as well out the Shiren and the Pellerino here. Oh, but he's not even going for the Entis. He goes for the good old Titanic Clad. And in this kind of a deck, you can even use the graveyard effect of Titanic Clad. But no, you can't. Didn't. There's no monster on the field that allows him because of <laughs> Inspector Border. He could have you're just right, you're also right. not used the Entis. He can just pop a card with this. And now he's attacking for 2,000. So the big problem here is that Hafenis also runs over Inspector Border easily with 2,100 attack points. Maybe this is the oh, most relevant effect. Oh, and there's Scream now the as well. So that's even more monsters running over the Inspector Border from there on. Right, because when a monster is normal or special summon, it reduces the attack points of your opponent's monsters by 500 as well. This deck has an out to no, everything. There's Dark Hole and Skill Drain. Oh, Both and cards that would have yeah. also been an out to the border. So it looks quite good here right now. And what's this next? That's Crackdown, crackdown. from Yuri Lansman. So that guy is changing sides now. He's taking over the Rhino Heart. And he's Does punching he go for, for an overlay now. He could actually go for a rank 4 Exceeds. I wouldn't recommend on that, to be honest, because yeah, true. Just that Inspector obviously. Border effect is still quite powerful. And yep, he decides to put the Rhino Heart into a defense position, attacking with Inspector Border. 4,000 life points. Giving Clock it back over. And very importantly, he has another back row, because we know the one back row that has been sitting around there probably is Solemn Judgment. Yeah. And he needs something else. And, and you could even consider yeah, to judgment with normal yes, summon now. Absolutely, because then your monster but does he not lose attack he points. Didn't. He still has maybe he has dimensional prison set. We don't know it yet. I mean we can't. I can do know, know that because it's not in deck list. It is dogmatic punishment, punishment for you Rhino Heart is going to get destroyed. And there is another solemn judgment. So once Lucas goes for another normal summon. It will just be destroyed. This game is so simple. Yuri is just trading trap card for trap card for every normal summon that Lucas has to offer, and he's probably going to go into the battle phase once more to punch for 2,000 again. And 2,000 plus 2,000 plus 2,000 is 6,000. 6, so you it's are only so one, good at math. One more attack left to actually seal the deal and here for another Yuri. Another set card. Yuri does not care about anything. He just goes for, yeah, I have protection and I have protection plus judgment. Let's see, does Lucas have more to offer than a normal summon here, or is it again just the attempt of a normal summon? You know what, I would have liked Lucas to set a Rhino Heart at some point, because you will find more monsters that can attack over Inspector Border, but you are losing if you don't build up a defense. This is, this is some basic UBO stuff right now. You have to consider that if you have a monster with 2,100 defense points, you're likely not to lose against Inspector Border. That's true, absolutely. So, Lucas really... For the last time, maybe considering his options here in this game. Oh, he goes instant for instant fusion. fusion. He is halving his life points. I mean, he goes down to 1,000 life points. But on the positive note, he's actually giving himself the option to activate a monster yeah. effect because that will be a fusion monster on board. And Yuri is really considering to judgment this, I think. He doesn't want Lucas to use monster effects here. But, Kid but there's Kid would be destroyed in the end phase, and it cannot attack. So Yuri does not consider this monster a threat in this moment. 
And I think that's fair. Oh, but Heart there's Telemann's heartbeat. Valley, and this one is immediately judgmented. We are just slamming judgment. And now he has, no, he has Salik set. Oh, no, it's, uh, for a second I thought it's Imperm. But he it's can. crime! Oh, it's, it's, it's crime! Oh, because he paid the life points. It but it's double cost. judgment oh. for double Yuri judgment on the crime! And we have a game three here! Old man says no, no in this case! Double no from the old man, and Yuri Lundsman equals the score. What a game we had here! Wow. What a game indeed. We are getting the instant fusion off to activate Heartbeat, protected by crime. But there were two judgments in this scenario. What a game! Old school Yu-Gi-Oh! really shining once more. The stun deck with all the old cards taking one game here from Ishizu Tielemans. Border. The Border. Yeah, it Border. was adding up. It was adding up. So really, old versus new and old can still compete here in this case. And now it will all come down to that final third game where again, Lucas of course will have the advantage of going yep. first again, which is a huge advantage. And which we, we can check just so. Yuri's side deck now because of he course. will have to of have course. some cards for going second here. Oh, and there he are. Does, some. He does. He is, uh, first of all, bringing in uh, Dino Wrestler Pankratops as a going second card. I Strong. don't love that versus VT Elements matchup necessarily, though. Yeah, I mean, Fenrir is a little bit better. No? Yeah, it's more of a sprite matchup card, I would say, in general. Uh, but then after that, he has triple evenly matched, which I like a lot more. I think evenly matched Very is really strong. decent. It at least baits out the um, crime or the Baron yeah. negate, because I'm pretty sure that Lucas is going to focus on Baron now. You want to have negates as many you as possible. You don't want to focus on Dweller in this matchup. Not really. We saw that Dweller actually is kind of nice versus the Nadia Servant, but still I would say that Baron is most likely a yeah. little bit better. And uh, therefore, it's good. And also, you don't really need your battle phase. So sacrificing your battle phase to bait out the crime yeah. is actually quite nice. And you will always be uh, taking that trade. And then a singular copy of uh, Kurikara Divincanate. I'm interested in why you only decide to run one of it. But in general, it's a good card too. There has to be a way to search this. Otherwise, the one-off would surprise me. I mean, there is another one-off in his side deck, which is Pankratops, but we know why he is only running that yeah. once. <laughs> Indeed. He's indeed. running two copies of Zombie World to win the Fluandry's matchup. This yeah. card is really an out to the deck. Yes. And he's but playing to we right. are now ready. The players are again shuffled up. So please, let's get into this game three of our round 11 featured match. I think Raigeki is going to play a major role in this game. Oh, he's also bringing in the Raigeki, sure. That could also be a card here, you're right. And, yep, I think they're getting the sign that they're allowed to start. Nice little sportsmanship there. They are having a fist bump before this final game. Maybe the last game for one of those guys in the tournament because they are playing a bubble match right here. We're starting it off with Kel Do discarding Agido, so we will be milling cards here instantly. Just imagining milling triple Necro Valley on the opponent's side. Yeah, that I was going to say, this could be huge. Like, actually, the milling factor is helpful because you can also calculate better with the cards that yes. you probably has in hand. Let's see. Okay, there's Crackdown. Terraforming, basically one less Necro Valley. Yeah. And the double patchy. double patchy. So it is really unlikely that he has another patchy if he sets a monster. Sharon is going to Oh, and he milled Kalbeck as well, so we continue to mill here. That's huge for Lucas, hitting that Kalbeck there as well. So, there's Fenrir. Fenrir That's Necro a Valley, Necro double Valley. Necro Valley in there. That's Fenrir tops and offering to the doomed. You said it already. Yeah, <laughs> only one Necro Valley left and not even the option to search with terraforming anymore now. That's crazy. So if he gets to Crime or Baron, he could just negate the terraforming. Oh, no, the Necro Valley. That would be quite big. I, but I saw it. He has the last, he has the last Necro Valley in his hand, so maybe oh, Yuri is still is good epic. to go. Maybe he's still good here. This might still be his win option in here. So we are going for Kid Kalos. Of course, Kid Kalos, as we know, is going to search. I'm pretty sure he's searching for crime. You really yeah. want to have crime yeah, he, here. You need crime in this scenario. What? He, okay, okay we're so searching maybe, for maybe he already has one. That's, that's a he possibility. does not, as it seems, have access to Palerino, which would also be really good. You could oh, search yeah. for a Scream and then pop your own Scream or pop your own Kaleido Heart during your combo and then send Scream to get another Trap card. So those would be really so useful. So what are we milling here now with the eight cards we are about to mill? There's Skill, Skill Drain, Drain would down. Be really okay. 
heartbeat. Also heartbeat not great. Mid is not great. That's I mean, only you can seven always cards. shuffle it back. <laughs> could, could you please mill another card? Thank you, sir. Does he play Diviner? Yes, we saw him actually uh, milling a couple of Diviners already. I oh. think he's playing okay. two of them. So it's really unfortunate. Oh, it's only for him one though. It's only that one. he did not mill it this time because he really wants to access this Baron. Yep, you will need the tuner. Interestingly, interestingly enough, I think he's playing Diviner, but he's not playing any Herald of the Orange. Right? I was going to cool. say the same thing. We have yeah. barely no. seen any Diviners this event. Uh, you mean uh, Heralds? Heralds. Yeah, Heralds. yeah, yeah. We saw them in the uh, Madolche list, but yeah. there it makes sense because you have yeah, so course. many more fairies. Uh, but here in this Telemann Ishizu deck, they are actually not running it that much anymore. Which is actually really interesting because when we looked at the lists of uh, YCS Pasadena the last weekend, everybody them. basically was on it. This is a more rogue-focused pick in the deck because you can actually answer a dimension shifter, but you don't want to prepare for rogue if you want to win the entire event. Yep. And we already saw, I think Yuri has Rageki plus Necro Valley. If Lucas will not be able to set up the gates here, he might be in trouble versus Yuri Lanzmann and his stun deck. So we are cutting the deck again. Having a hard time cutting the deck, but this happens <laughs> from time to time. We are nervous in this scenario. Yuri really wants to top this event with his stun deck, and we are going to go for a Kaleido Heart. Kaleido Heart is a really sticky monster and it's also a big one. Indeed it is. Which is arguably more important in this matchup right now. Yep, it is the game three of their bubble match here in round number 11. So definitely where the nerves are getting to yep. you. If nerves aren't getting to you at this point, there's probably no time you are getting nervous. Oh, he's having time to redo out. This is insane. If he picks up a trap card on the opponent's turn, he can actually shuffle back or put to the top of the deck the Necro Valley of Yuri. And but he I also mean, has evenly matched, by the way. Oh, he has evenly matched as well. That's crazy. But the thing is, there's Raigeki. We know there's Raigeki. So, okay. first of all, that Raigeki is probably going to go down. Oh, and if there's no well. crime, then... We've got to see, is he hitting a trap though? He, he is. is hitting First the of all, hitting the punishment. punishment. It is all going according to plan for Lucas now. So how many outs to this entire board does Yuri have in his hand? We have seen Raigeki, we have seen evenly matched. We have so seen the Necro Valley. Is this enough? The thing is, if he goes Raigeki and that baits out the crime, then he can easily just go battle phase and resolve the evenly match. Yeah. And that would be huge for him because that does out the entire board here in that case. Honestly, I actually would go for um, even the first, first maybe? maybe. Why do you think so? Because that 100% certainly outs the Redoer? Do you focus on the Redoer more maybe? I mean, Redoer will return in the end phase either way. But you get rid of all the monsters. I think like Salik and Crime, like if there is a Salik set, Crime would be activated either way first. You, you don't really care about that, right? You want to get rid of all the monsters and then maybe it depends on your hand as well. Normal summon Pari. Could be the case. We know there's only one more Pari left in deck. But he oh. has Nadir Servant as well. Another very powerful card. Is that going to be a card that Lucas needs to answer with Prime? He and decides not to. This Redoer could be a Dweller right now. Yep, but it's not. It is Redoer and that Nadir Servant is now going to resolve. And let's have a look at the extra deck. There are a couple of different options, but he decides to go with Vientis. So he, I, I think he's either going after... Oh, he cannot go after the Redoer because of Elf, so he has to go after one of the back rows, right? That is a good point. Yes, yeah. he is going and after the back row. what is he hitting? Does, oh, this looks like a spell card. Is oh, this it's called, called by the by Grave, the grave. On the end is, Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. It's, it did its job. And I mean, this is what Called by the Grave was for, right? Just yeah, I mean, the, it's just a one-for-one one trade yeah. in that case. It's fine. Entis still did his thing. It just yep. got rid of the back row, even though it was negated, but yep. it didn't and really evenly happen. matched in the battle phase. We are and criming that is this. Crime, Absolutely. Of course. And now, okay, we will not activate Necro Valley before we do the Raigeki, because there is a time thief. Oh, we first of all go for it. Oh, so of course. There will Let's be a couple mode. more cards. Lucas is trying to hit another Necro Valley, but I can already promise you guys this That's is not, not going, going, going to happen. That's not going to happen. Uh-uh. There is no Necro Valley left in deck because I mean, the I last haven't, I haven't seen it. I'm just fully trusting you at this point. I hope I didn't mistake it. We again milled double Cosmic Cyclone here, though. And we have milled Scream. Maybe the Dear Servant just looked a lot like huh. Necro Valley. Let's hope that's not the case. I'm really hopeful that Yuri still has the Necro Valley here. <laughs> 
Yeah, that yeah, is there's Necro Valley. Necro Valley. And offerings oh, to the Doom offerings as to the well, Doom and that might important. be really good yeah. here. That might actually be really good, because it could take care of more stuff that's about to come. But what is the monster in the hand of Yuri? I couldn't tell yet. So, we are actually using the effect of Kaldo now. Why would we do that? What's, what's the reasoning to exactly do it here? To get your heartbeat back for the next turn, maybe to get a Pearlerano back. But why here? What, what's the reasoning of actually doing it right now? Because it looks like we're still uh -huh, at the end of the uh -huh, battle phase, you know? Uh -huh. yeah, I, I know what you're saying. I hear you. No idea. Yeah, I, I don't know either. He just wants to secure that happening 100%. And he's searching for Shiren <laughs> with the Sully. <coughs> so... Let's see what he can do with that. And I also saw a purple card in the hand of Yuri, so he would actually, with this monster, have protection as well. I think it is dogmatic punishment. So we are, first of all, going to fusion summon, though. There's the kid colors coming down. Okay, now I understand. When yeah. he is fusion summoning and fusion summoning, it is very valuable oh. to have that heartbeat back in oh, your main yes, deck. Right. So you're just going to be able to search it right now. So that Caldo was absolutely necessary to have access to heartbeat again. And there he searches it. So that would again then be an out to the Necro Valley that Yui so desperately right now yeah. tries to set up there. Very well played. And now you can actually normal summon. I mean, you can just chain offering to the Doomed. It's a quick spell to time thief redoer. Maybe he's playing this card for exactly this scenario that is going to come up. By the way, I know the monster. It's going to be Ecclesia, of course. Yeah, true, because we added it. We yeah. have to do Servant, for sure. We can oh. normal summon the Ecclesia. We are starting it off with the Ecclesia here. Interesting. He doesn't go for the Rageki first. He maybe wants to give Lucas a chance to use the Redoer first. He maybe wants to bait out the Redoer. Yeah. Oh, and he goes for the Fleur. This is actually Ooh. a lot of attack points there already. He is out of the battle phase, so this is not going to do too much this turn. I think he's going to activate Necro Valley now. Time Thief Redoer will be changed in just a second, but we will have offerings to the Doom answering the Time Thief Redoer effect, destroying it. Therefore, it cannot, by effect, detach the Trap card to shuffle the Necro Valley into the deck, or put it on top of the deck, rather. Oh, he... Oh, he... Oh, he I mean, he could wait yeah. with the Redoer. So, he actually has to activate the Raigeki now, and Lucas is thinking. I think he announced the Redoer. That's going to happen for sure. And he's considering maybe more shufflers. Oh, and he's summoning the Fleurdalis to negate the Redoer. That's Perfect. even better than he offerings to the Doom. He does not even have to sacrifice his next draw phase. This makes so much sense. That is actually really good. Lucas, it makes sense now that he wanted to resolve the Ecclesia first. So now the Redoer cannot do anything anymore. And the whole board of Lucas gets wiped. And there's only two more monsters left on the board. And they are on the side of Yuri. And the crowd is absolutely loving it. And he is also having a Dog Marketika punishment in hand. Three ha cards for Lucas. He has the oh, heartbeat. We no, 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 already, no, 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 my friend. We are not doing this today. So two cards are being set. We know one is Dog Marketika punishment. Heartbeat can get get rid of the Necro Valley. Is there a solemn judgment? No, we know the other one is Offerings to the Doomed. Yep. He has not we activated it. Nope. It's Offerings to the Doomed and the other set card being... Dogmatic Punishment. Yes. So this one could actually still go really oh, bad for because he this, also this has Dark the Darko. Lucas, Darko and that's what is activated. Down. Now Yuri is out of resources as well. What a match. Heartbeat is being activated. Harvness is discarded and he will not have a response to the Harvness effect. Doesn't look like it. Oh. No, Necro really goes to the deck. Yeah, yeah, that's what happens indeed. Harvness will resolve. So, how quickly what, what can, he, what can he summon though? Again, yeah. What can he summon though? He was not able to recover all of his fusions. He cannot recover the Kid Colors. Has and he has Garura already. He has to summon something weird. Jekyll's the Palea, maybe, right? Oh, he can just oh, chain the Of course, of course. Well, of course. We have all of our extra deck cards every time, all the time in our deck. Yep, Lucas definitely knows what he's doing. He also wants to get back the Pearl Rhino. This is actually a pretty cool way to, to tell your opponent yeah. what you are targeting, because you're not really moving a graveyard, but you're yeah. still showing what you're targeting very clearly. I like that a lot. Just pulling those cards up a little bit. That is indeed true. The Dark Hole also did not do too much. Both those monsters don't really do anything on board. However, it was really cool. Absolutely, I loved it. I love that. Monsters were getting destroyed back and yeah. forth. Dark Hole, Rageki, all the OG cards coming down here in this featured match. 
but now it really is back on Lucas, and we know offering, I mean, offering Super Doom and Punishment in a simple game state that we had last game. They would put in the work, they would be great, but here there is so much gas that is coming from the Shizu Telemans deck, so many monsters that are supposed to be summoned, I don't know whether that's going to be super strong. And do you like offerings to the Doom that much? Because in a simple game state, you're surrendering your next draw phase. Yeah, but when you have Inspector Border on board already, that helps. Yeah, you know, that you that just... is an advantageous game state at this point. Yeah, yeah but it's true. simple still. Yeah. It's simple. But right Fair. here, there are so many effects to be resolved for the Telemans players. So I think those simple trap cards, I mean, one of them being a quick spell card, are maybe not the way to win it. Do it's you kind of chain? Fun. Caldo, okay, no, you don't. Could have chained uh, Caldo to the effect of Kid Colossus and heartbeat, get a heartbeat again. I like it, actually. I think I would have done that. But he wants more monsters. Maybe even wants to seal the deal right here. Maybe he already sees a line to go for game right now. So the Kid Colossus is probably going to activate the effect tribute itself and summon back the Kaleido half Heart if it is allowed to. And yeah, the Kaleido Heart is definitely still in the graveyard. So that would be something he could do. Yep, he's already targeting the... Uh, what means targeting? There's no targeting with Kid Colors, but... It targets itself. Yeah, okay, okay, you're right. There is targeting happening, but there's no targeting for the monster in the graveyard of hand. And there is the Kaleido Heart coming back to the field. He's trying to go after the offerings to the Doom, and yeah. Yuri doesn't even activate it. He hey. wants to have his top deck. Wow, five tier element cards milled. Yuri needs a top deck. He knows at this point I cannot win this game without anything in hand or on the field. And now Lucas is really popping off. It looks like he can be able to seal this lead. I think he, he will struggle to actually go for game through that Dogmatica punishment, but still then, what is Yuri supposed to top deck at that point? Like, one yep. card. This stun deck relies you on having, like, multiple cards that yep. prevent you, uh, your opponent from breaking that super powerful monster being Pachi or being the Inspector Border. But just a single card being drawn from the top of the deck, for this deck, is kind of tough to be, like, a heart of the cards moment, to be honest. The only card I can imagine would be really helpful right now is Kashtira Fenrir, to be honest. But we already milled at least one of them, maybe even two of them. I think we milled two, and yeah. now we have another normal summon. This is uh, 7,500 attack points on board already. There's still Dogmatica Punishment. I know, I know. <laughs> However, Murley is activated, and I think we did not recover the Garura, so we might see a Chain Keldo, because Garura is dealing a lot of damage. That would be true, but on the other end, we can also just go for Dracostopalia, because it would be enough damage for yeah. game anyways and um, therefore I think it would also still be fine. We see Yuri is also running Garura for Tr different price. reasons. Yeah. <laughs> for different reasons, he values this card very much in his extra deck as well. But uh, let's see whether Lucas is going to be able to go for game here in this particular instance. One set card and a dream for Yuri. Yeah, and I mean, he's going for his extra deck right now for a reason. He needs to activate the Dogmatica Punishment and he looks what his best option to send would be can send the Entis, however, Entis could only then, or Dogmatica Punishment could only then target the Rhino Heart, which is not optimal. Absolutely not. So, Also, each of the monsters that you remove can just come back via its own effect? Indeed, yeah. <laughs> That's what you realize as well, I think. Like, every single one of those is not really going to help when you do destroy them by card effect. So, that's not really a board you oh, want to punish. Oh, and he is going for Muddy Mud Dragon. And this way, he basically seals the deal against the deck because now you cannot target the water monsters on the field. And if you target the darkness monster on the field, it will just summon itself back. This Luca likes its game, and Yuri actually surrenders the game. Lucas takes this game 2 and 1. Fantastic display of skill here from Lukas Randegger with his Ishizu Telemans yeah. deck. What a grindy game. Stun decks want to get into that grind game situation, but he was successfully breaking the board. He didn't have enough to follow it up, though. He didn't have a strong monster on board that would really yeah. um, stop his opponent I mean, he from had playing. Two strong monsters on board, but there was a dark hole and they both fell into it. They are strong in terms of attack points maybe, but you really in this deck need strong effects, strong effects that really apply like uh, properly on the field. Inspector Always helps Border, in Yu-Gi-Oh, by the way. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, that's that Matica board was not really 
the game changer right there. No. But I mean, he had Dark Wolf for every board he could create anyway, yeah. so it was not really that. So offerings crazy. to the Doomed did not really perform too well in this game. I mean, it would have helped against the Time Thief Redoer. Yeah. However, he played around it pretty well with the Flodelis. I liked it a lot. For sure, for sure. What do you think? Like offerings to the Doom. I know you're not a bad, uh, you're not a big fan of this card, anyways. But what would be the specific card you want to target with offerings to the Doom? Because there must be a reason why you are exactly running this card. What would be in this meta game the card you want to target with it? I think actually Time Thief Redoer. Time Thief Redoer is a pretty good one. You're right. Can we come up with anything else that is just really instantly outing? I mean, you can just usually go after. Yeah, it doesn't help versus Nightmare Phoenix, which. To be fair, nobody really is playing anymore. <laughs> but yeah, I, I can't think of anything else, to be honest. I mean, Fenrir, maybe? If your opponent's having Fenrir, this could Fenrir be a really big problem for your deck. It's, it's a 2,400 yeah. attack points monster, which That's is true. a thing. Which yeah, absolutely. It's <laughs> really threatening. But I'm, because I don't really agree on playing triple offerings to the Doomed to only target Time Free Redoer yeah. when we know that a lot of Ishizu tier players actually have cut. On but the I mean, Redoer. the card versus you is really strong. So let's say if you are playing 12 rounds versus Ishizu tier, you are going to face it six times. I mean, and yeah. people are going Some to make it because they know they will attach reasonable. a trap. Yeah. So most likely the journey of Yuri Landsman here in this tournament ends with a stun deck. We hoped he would get one further round, and I think he. I'm pretty sure he will still be playing the yeah. last round. But it's quite unlikely to get into the top card with an X3 standing. I think. X to one, as we featured last round, they will be most likely uh, safe to be in. Yeah. But X three players really have to sweat and really have no guarantee of getting in at all. And I think there only a couple only be of them. Few players, yeah. Only a couple of them will actually make it in, and most likely the ones with a really, really, really good tiebreak. So I think Yuri really has to say to Lucas, Lucas, please, you have to win this last round for me as well, because you might bring my tiebreak up as well, so I could sneak into that top 64 as well. Might I be the way to I would love to see Stun in the top 64. I can't same. lie here. Absolutely but we same. have also seen that the Ishizu Tielemans deck is incredibly powerful against it. If you don't win the dice roll with Stun, then you're in for some trouble if you're playing against a really well-experienced player, because Absolutely. like Lucas exploited all of his options. Yeah. He just used every single pop, every single negate that he had, and he just played it For out sure. perfectly. But speaking about stun, there's still a couple of other stun variants left in the tournament. Uh, of course, I, I, I know you love that strategy as well, but there's still some uh, Mystic Mind variants also yeah. at the top tables. We also saw some that. pretty cool ones, to be For honest. For sure. Yeah, I we'll like them as well. They are pretty creative. They done, they've done yeah. some innovative stuff, so definitely something to take note as well. They definitely are still in contention in the tournament. No, I think no burn decks. No, they not are, even bad. I, I think there's one burn deck. Also. But also. Uh, they are playing Telemann with uh, the Kalbeck Agido Ishizu engine. Okay, Shocker, I know. I mean, uh, and, that is also some... Runic cards plus Mystic Mind, so they are trying to deck out you. I mean, that is also a thing, yeah, but that's not the one I was talking about. We, oh, no. we also still definitely have Mind Burn. We also still have uh, Runic variants, just pure Runic Mystic Mind decks. Those are becoming more and more popular before the introduction of Ishizu cards, to be honest, but he is still in there fighting, so maybe he's making it to Top Cut as well. So definitely a, c a couple of counter picks really to the meta game in general, and I really think they have a good shot of actually making it because they came to this tournament being prepared for Ishizu Tielemans. And they are playing versus Ishizu Tielemans non-stop, so the plan somewhat works out. And this I think they are really struggling versus rogue decks, usually. Yeah. This is really cool. When you know in a tournament there's one deck really dominant, yeah. then you can prepare for it. And we Absolutely. will hear from Lucas how he prepared for a stun before this tournament. Hello, guys. Yes, I am joined here by Lucas, who has just won round 11 so congratulations you're up against a stun deck when at what point did you realize that you were against the stun deck because in the first game you were building into things like dweller and things which against the stun deck probably weren't the the thing people were expecting so at what point were you suddenly going oh i'm against a stun deck um i think i was as soon as you played the very first card oh, really? yeah because uh yeah i think it was pot of prosperity i'm not sure anymore but uh, it's not a card that you would play in like tournaments. So yeah, it was pretty soon that I realized Dweller is not very effective. 
I was going to say, because people were wondering why you did that. But I suppose if you're not totally aware of what you're up against, it's probably quite a safe bet, especially with the mirror matches and things this weekend. Duel is always a safe option. There were quite a few things. Yuri went second, and there were quite a few moments where you just sort of did everything right there. Rolkalas and Sprite, the Pellerino popped the Necro Valley, bringing back the Medora. Like, you had very much control over the first game. So even though you weren't sure what he was playing, were you feeling confident? Uh, yes, because if you can go first, set up your field and the opponent has no response, then uh, yeah, you are in a pretty good spot. And then let's talk about game two, because Yuri sort of set up that inspector border. It's a difficult, and the Necro Valley, that's a difficult field to deal with. He was controlling everything with his back row and with that border control. You tried to pop the Necro Valley, that got solemned. You tried to negate that with the crime, and then that got solemned. I don't know if you could hear with the headphones on, but the crowd were the loudest they've been all weekend at that moment. What was going through your mind at that point? Um, I thought if he only has one solemn judgment, I am still in the game. I had a, a plan how to win it, but yeah, the second one was super strong. Super strong. And that was you scooped at that point. Then we got into game three. You had some good mills. You were depriving Yuri of one of the Necro Valleys. Then you used the Time Thief Redoer. You got the Dogmatic of Punishment off the top of his deck. Called by the Grave on Entis. You were accumulating lots of ways to get around those stun options, which really happened when you dark hold the field. You cleared the Necro Valley with Heartbeat. So you were clearly setting up for those moments throughout the duel. And then you had the amazing Raigeki, Fleur, Necro Valley led to the clearing of the Ashizu against you. But you still managed to build an amazing field off the back of that and go for game. So were you trying to remain composed and were you trying to think through everything you could do? Um, you have to st uh, stay a bit composed because if you just go all in without any thoughts, you will just lose to something like uh, even a mirror force. I don't know what uh, I didn't know what he was, uh, what he had in his back row, but I thought, uh, well, two fusions were already successful. I had a level four, so I can just just summon the mood dragon. I think all his back row targets. So if he targets uh, Kaleido Heart with Crackdown, that's okay. It's not very good, but it's okay. But uh, if he has Dogmatica Punishment, he can only use it on Kaleido Heart, which revives itself. So I was pretty sure it's game, unless it's a Storming Mirror Force, but it's, that doesn't see very play. Yeah, and it worked out all for the best. It seems like you managed to keep composed, got it through to the end. And now what's your current score at the moment? I'm currently 9-2. 9-2, so that's all pretty good. You've got one more round of this Swiss to play. At this rate, you're going to be in the top cut. So are you feeling confident for your last game? Um, yes, but I'm not sure if uh, I would make it with 9-3. So you've got, got to hope for the win? Yes. Oh, yeah. hope, Obviously. Hope for the win or hope for the tiebreak. Well, we'll see what ends up happening. Best of luck and congratulations on winning this feature match. Don't go anywhere, guys, because we've got our final round of Swiss coming up very, very soon. But before that, we're going to do a quiz. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. I told you we'd be doing a quiz. So here we are. Some of you who've seen some of our other YCS coverage may have recognized that we've done a bunch of different quizzes. Sometimes it'll be a specialist kind of quiz where we talk about specifics. But then some of you may remember that we have this very quick fire back and forth style quiz that's basically like a game of Yu-Gi-Oh! Tennis. Basically, I will be asking whoever wants to start or whoever wins a rock, paper, scissors, a topic like name a dinosaur monster. They will then have to name a monster. It'll get thrown over to you. It'll get thrown back. It'll get thrown back until someone gets it wrong or can't answer within time. We have official adjudicators behind the camera to make sure that this is officially being done properly and that the answers are entirely correct. There's a lot of cards and frankly, I don't have the ability to judge all of these for myself. So making sure that we get it double checked is always healthy. So gentlemen, Basti, Alberto, I'd like you guys to do a rock, paper, scissors for us so we can see who goes first. Ready? Rock, paper, scissors, go. Okay, that's a draw. Rock, paper, scissors, go. Okay, so that means Alberto is going to be starting and I'll be knocking it over to you and we'll go back and forth until one of you cannot answer. Are we ready? No? Alberto's very nervous about this game, but we'll see what happens. Here we go. Your first question, gentlemen. Name a counter trap. Begin. Dark Bribe. Red Reboot. Solemn Judgment. Solemn Strike. Um, uh, Tearless Man's Crime. Solemn Scolding. <laughs> Time. I had to give you, I was giving you a nice couple of seconds. I saw the cogs turning, but that means we're going to give that one point to the Germans. Gentlemen, rotate. It's time for our next matchup. Right, Marcello, Leonard, here is your question. I did it to you first, so am I going to give it to you first this time? No, 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 no. We always start it with you. Okay. Name a zombie monster. Begin. Zombie master. Uh, Il Blood. Plague Spreader Zombie. Uh, Mizuki. Goblin Zombie. Arking Revived Adas. Uh, uni zombie? Um, oof. Oof. Ah, eh. Uh, uh, Revive King Hades. I just said it. I just said it. I just said it. I just said it. No, no, I said Revive King Hades. I thought you said Italian stuff. No, I literally no, 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 said Revive King Hades. Maybe that's just my ears then. Can I get some Kaiser drink? Yeah. Uh, wasn't. <laughs> if we double and say the same is in a, the or point, case, let's, keep, let's going. keep going. Uh, uh, you have to go. Um, no, no. A bunchy, necro bunchy? Well, yeah. Zombie wolf. Yukoki. Zombie tiger. Um, gonna probably uh, uh, red dice zombie dragon. Pyramid turtle. I said it. Okay, right. That's one point to the Italians then. God, well, here we go. One, one a piece. This is a very intensive game, but we're now back to our first two. So I'm going to throw this one over to you. Your category, name a Link 1 monster. Begin. Link Uribo. Link Uribo. Um, <laughs> uh, Link Spider. Seven Great Bay Links. Time. Okay, the Germans get another one. Our adjudicators are not only laughing, but they're pointing and laughing and going, ah! <laughs> that is not what you need for the self-esteem. Okay, we go on to our next question. Right. Leonard, mm -hmm. name a quick play spell begin. Offerings to the doomed. Mystical Space Typhoon. Sky Striker Honor Drones. Runic Tip. <laughs> Runic Destruction. We couldn't repeat the same archetype, right? Good do, point. Do we have the same rule for this event? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> okay, a different one. Cosmic Cyclone? Super Polymerization. Uh, El Shadow Fusion. Forbidden Droplet. Branded in Red. Twister. Um, 
Uh, branded and high speed. Oh, it's branded. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, Interesting. They managed to worm their way into your brain, and then you can't help but say the one that we've just done. But it's fine. So that's. Is that now 2 1? 2 2. 2 2. Ooh. Two apiece. Now, here's the question Do we do this as a decider? Oh, something just went in my ear just then. I don't know what it was. It's my, my talk back microphone. Someone's screaming at me. So. Do we do this as a decider, do we think? Because it's now two apiece. And then we'll come back and we'll do another round of this later to try and see what happens. Okay, right, the deciding question. I'm gonna do this for one of our adjudicators who picked this very category. Name a Dragon Maid card. <laughs> Dragon Maiden. Dragon Maiden. What did he say? Dragon Maiden. A Dragon Maid card you, was a question, right? He said Dragon Maid. Okay, uh, Dragon Maid Changeover. Uh, Dragon Maid Chamber. Dragon Maid Parlor. <sighs> the look of distress in Alberto's eyes. <laughs> Three, two, one. That's one for the Germans! Okay, so that means, unfortunately, <laughs> The Italians did not manage to take this round, but we will be back with more of these. The Germans have taken round one. We're going to have to see who's best at the quick fire, quick round, quick fire quiz questionnaire. It's got a long name because that's irony for you. <laughs> so we're going to be right back because very soon we're going to have the final round of Swiss. And then after that, more quizzes. Isn't it exciting? Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to the coverage of YCS Dortmund 2022. I'm here with uh, Chris LeBlanc. I don't think you need uh, much introduction, but of course we'll still go through it. Uh, first of all, it's great to see you and great to see you in Europe first time. So how does it feel? Uh, it feels really great. Um, definitely a different environment. Uh, I really appreciate um, all the Europeans for making me feel welcome. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's been great so far. For sure, and uh, you should feel welcome. We catch each other a couple of times uh, back in the US in the past years, but uh, it has just been incredible to witness your, you know, your return, your comeback into the game. Uh, and uh, of course, the story, we have to mention it, just uh, over a month ago, you became a four-time YCS champion. And the craziest thing is 10 years uh, since your first win, right? So what a journey in Yu-Gi-Oh! Like. It's insane. How, how was that experience? How does it feel? Is it different from your first win? I definitely felt like my, my first win was like the most memorable up until this moment, like when I won the fourth one, because it was like a, a huge milestone for me. Um, I felt like it was it was a lot different playing like today's day and age than it was playing back in the day. A lot more cover like the coverage is great. Um, Konami really does a lot for the game and, and the players. So I think that was what really like uh, meant a lot to me. For sure, and uh, we were just having a quick chat before this interview, and we'll get to experience the differences between, of course, our setup and the one in the US, which are both doing a great things for the game. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you on stream as well, playing and showcasing your uh, your plays. Uh, we have seen how you, ever since the start and the cars came out, you were a pretty big fan of tournaments, I want to say, but you still showed up uh, uh, your own style in Minneapolis with a deck that not many people saw coming, with sprite cars in it. Uh, and you were saying uh, just how you adapted your deck for uh, last weekend. Unfortunately, losing on the bubble. But what do you think of the current uh, format and just meta today? I think the current state of the format very skillful. Uh, it takes a lot of thinking and preparation. Um, it's a lot of key points uh, in your plays. You can't really make mistakes. Um, if you mess up like one time, it'll mess up the whole flow of the game. So I, I think it rewards a lot of better players. Um, I think it speaks that uh, Hani Jawari just had one YCS uh, Pasadena. So I mean, it just even shows like the first event with the Shizu tier, a great like a great player yeah. ha has won. So you know, absolutely, there has to be some skill, of course, involved in there. But we all already knew that. Uh, so we'll be curious to see how uh, European players will adapt uh, this weekend to the trends, of course, as you mentioned. YCS Pasadena, everyone had to just witness it and adapt maybe their decks this weekend. Uh, do you expect uh, some major shifts in like deck building? Of course, still Ishizu tier being the deck to beat, I would say. Or are you afraid of like some uh, tier two, you know, other decks that are flowing under the radar? What do you think? I definitely think there's going to be a higher representation of um, Flunder. Uh, but I also think that uh, mm -hmm. foreign events uh, in general, like especially uh, European events, have definitely spoken out where like Josh had just won with Sprite. Yeah. And it just shows that you don't need to play tier, which is being considered as like the best uh, engine in the format. And he's still he's still destroyed that event. Like Absolutely. he showed that you can you can just play a consistent deck and still come out on top. So I think Anything could happen going into this event, especially with how many players there are. Yep. I think it's it's going to be a, a great tournament regardless. Absolutely. And uh, you did mention Joshua, so I got to bring this up because, of course, again, another player coming back and winning his third title. But you really didn't let him uh, enjoy the <laughs> win. You got the fourth and you basically tied. And you mentioned, of course, Billy in your interview. But do you have a message specifically maybe for Joshua? Or are you trying? What's your goal, I guess, in Yu-Gi-Oh! Going for the fifth win, uh, world championship, maybe, you know, a lot of different things in your mind. So I would say um, I think Josh definitely uh motivated me a lot and I feel like that's where like my win actually came from because him tying me in uh, YCS wins was a huge thing for me yeah. I'm like wow it's like a weird feeling when somebody catches up to you and you're like oh I just I want it so much more and I feel like it had a huge impact on Hani uh, for him Absolutely. to win yeah, his event um, and honestly like my goals for Yu-Gi-Oh obviously to go to Worlds because I've never been but um, just to keep playing and enjoying the yeah. game I think that really matters way more than, uh, to me than winning any like specific event Absolutely, and it's great hearing this from you. And we have interviewed a lot of these players who, for example, on top of my mind, Rafael Nevin as well, who pretty much go to every event, whether they are in <laughs> South America, US or Europe. So hopefully we'll see more of you from uh, European events. And uh, we'll, of course, wish you a lot of good luck for the event. Uh, we'll see how it goes. And if you decide to <laughs> come back visiting us for other events, uh, this was Chris LeBlanc. Thank you guys for being with us. We'll definitely catch him on stream playing. We'll be back.
quite soon with more action from YCS Dorman. <laughs>has tons of new monsters and the return of black wings they're back for a whirlwind of destruction 100 new cards for decks of all kinds dark wing blast nine cards per pack each pack sold separately Come back. So this is the final round of the Swiss rounds here at YCS Dortmund. After this, it all comes down to that top 64 cut as we edge ever closer to that number one spot, taking home the Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series title this weekend. It's very exciting. So we're going to kick off with this final round to make sure that you're all satiated before that top cut. So we have Lars Junginger versus PL Peiris. And this is going to be a very exciting final. So... Without further ado, guys, could we do a quick high roll to see who is going to start? Who would like to roll first? PL's going to go for the roll here. That's a four. Lars. And that is a seven. Who's going to go first? 
Okay, PR's going to be going first, so I'm going to hand you guys over to Marcello and Alberto, who are going to be your commentary team for this final round of Swiss. Gentlemen, we're nearly there. We're nearly in the top cut. Take it away. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to round 12. As I mentioned, the last round of Swiss before joining top 64. It was a long day yesterday, a lot of duels from all over the world. And now there is one match remaining to have this final list of 64 contenders. And we chose a bubble match. Both of these players are on X2, which is already an incredible record. They might even be in uh, with a draw for sure, but maybe even if they are kicked out in this match, uh, some X3 might sneak in, but regardless, great performance from both players. Uh, both really experienced uh, with like 10 plus years of experience on the back uh, but before talking specifically about them uh, i just want to say uh, as we know some uh, men just want to watch the word burn and <laughs> this is exactly <laughs> what we are gonna do because surprisingly enough uh, both are on x2 so nine and two with mystic mine kind of burn strategy so it will be a mirror match they try to target uh, tier elements pl is on actually just straight up mystic mine burn with ojama trio ojama duo and uh, you know the cauldron and some of these uh, solemn judgments to protect these cards his opponent instead is again on a Mystic Mind strategy, but instead of burning his opponent, uh, he wants to deck him out with runic cards. Uh, I think uh, this will be definitely an interesting uh, matchup uh, where Mystic Mind is actually useless yeah. in the matchup. Uh, and uh, they both have a solid win condition, as mentioned, because uh, the uh, PL would usually have a really bad matchup against runic sprite. But there are no sprite cards, it's just straight up runic with just six cards to, you know, try and banish some cards off the top of the deck. But if Pial manages to resolve the Cauldron, then That's he's it. basically on a clock. Cauldron of the old man, just like we want to see it. Without further ado, our players are ready. As you might have picked up, Lars won the title, but decided to go second. Our players are ready. Let's find out the winner of round 12. And here they are, as mentioned, this will be a long, long one for sure. And a nice handshake, just like we want to see you. And I think here also makes sense uh, that Lars uh, made Pilia go first, especially because in this kind of matchup, uh, you really want to have uh, the sixth card because the Mystic Mine basically is not going to do his job. But then here PL starts uh, things off uh, with Pot of Extravagance, uh, giving him a huge advantage uh, by going first. And uh, I think even though the deck strategies are very similar on one hand, on the other hand are very you know different from each other, especially because like the runic cards from Lars indeed uh, put your opponent into a deck out strategy. Instead, Pial prefer to play the good old cards or Jamas uh, with uh, one day of peace. Yeah, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, part of Extravagance is a great card, but it's actually not really ideal against a deck that wants to deck you out. Uh, but of course, you really want to get your hands on the Cauldron, which is the most important card in this matchup. And unfortunately, Pial doesn't have it at the yeah. moment. So this is the key card of the deck, but already we see an Ojama duo being used uh, and Lars, you can see a little grim on his face, uh, definitely not so this coming, uh, but we might see a rivalry being flipped uh, or a Gozen match from Pial and it is the rivalry. This deck, funny enough, uh, is actually the winner of YCS Brazil uh, a couple months ago. So it is a deck that shouldn't be underestimated. And as we have uh, commented it previously, most tier decks just play one out. Uh, so it's actually quite tough to fight back. Yeah, especially because I think uh, if these guys uh, will find their way to secure their spot into the top 64, 
having very few outs, if not one, in the Shizu Tiroven deck, it's a problem, because how do you deal with that? Absolutely, and here already we see one of the runic cards, uh, which uh, is not gonna make PL happy, of course, uh, but he just saw Sphere Mode, Mystic Mine, uh, and so, as expected, we know this one is gonna be quite a long one, nonetheless. And I think uh, the, the, their deck strategy is on one end similar, but Lars is on three Pot of Prosperity yeah. and one Extravagance, while Pial is on three Extravagance and one Prosperity. Um, I think for this kind of match on the Prosperity, uh, like gives you the opportunity uh, to select the, the, yeah. the, the better one out of the, the sixth. And uh. here we see the one copy of Extravagance picked up potentially by Lars. Uh, uh, Dark Bribe, of course, great option, uh, but outside of this, really, uh, on the one hand, uh, I don't know if I want to say I feel bad for them because of uh, the deck they are using, but uh, I kind of do because this deck makes a lot of sense against Tier Element and playing on the bubble against the same exact deck is so unlikely, so I'm pretty sure both uh, could have made it to the top 64 if they just played against Tiers here in round 12. So definitely an unfortunate uh, one. But here we see Abstract Goblin uh, again. Uh, not really gonna matter. It's it's gonna be a race essentially to get to the Cauldron from PL and to get to the Runic cards uh, from Lars. So let's uh, let's see who is gonna be the faster one to achieve that. Uh, but at the same time, the more PL digs uh, into this deck uh, without finding the Cauldron, the better it is for Lars because his win condition is decking his opponent out. So whenever he's gonna draw more cards, uh, I think Lars is super happy about that. Yeah. And I think also here it matters uh, how many useless cards they are going to draw because, like for example, Lars has the Wind Dragon of Ra in the main deck. Yeah. So all these cards are uh, not useful, like also the Dimension Shifter. For sure. And we can guess that this is uh, pretty much going to turn uh, into a game where at some point they start to discard their seven cards in hand, uh, uh, which are not going to do much. Uh, are they both playing uh, old copies of Bribe and Solemns? I would guess yeah, so, right? They are. Uh, yeah. So if they start setting those up, we might actually get to see a uh, play in which they just, uh, as we can see here, pick a. Oh, but that's Prosperity. Wait. Prosperity shouldn't shuffle the cards, but put them uh, in the bottom. Yeah. So yeah, they are fixing it right away here with double Mystic Mine, putting top on the bottom. Which is good, by the way, because you don't really want to draw the Mystic Mine in this matchup, so. Yeah, it's, it's great <laughs> to just put them on the bottom, uh, but um, as mentioned, uh, essentially we could get to a point where they both have like triple solemn or bribe face down, uh, and I think it's really bad for PL that he has the rivalry because that's yeah. a useless one. Here goes with the duality. Let's see if he finds this way, but no, he gets to see the extravagance. And yeah, this is uh, pretty much gonna be uh, actually what we expected. Uh, I'm actually surprised by Lars because, as mentioned, PL only has three copies of Caldron, yeah. and that's his only win condition for this matchup. Uh, but Lars has a lot of runic cards, and the fact that he still hasn't played a single one uh, is quite unlikely. And here we see duality. We cannot quite tell which cards were revealed, uh, but Lightning Storm uh, mm. in the main deck, of course, not going to be that useful since he has some Ojamas, but. That definitely something that caught uh, the attention of PL uh, in the main deck. Uh, I think another Solemn could be really good, but Runic Destruction is also a great option. And uh, I gotta give the advantage uh, to Lars uh, here with this setup. And he picks up a second copy of Solemn Judgment. As mentioned, what you wanna do in this matchup is just to set up uh, four cards alongside uh, Solemns and Bribes. And then uh, you just have more counter traps than your opponent. Uh, counter traps which you're not too familiar with, right? From oh. the last quiz we did. <laughs> oh my. Someone give me a new partner, please. I need to win some quizzes. Funny enough, I like, uh, they're my cars, right? I mean. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, Alberto always goes on to how he loves the stun decks. Uh, he always plays Eldlit and this kind of decks. And then. <laughs> and then losing and then, miserably. Yeah. 
<laughs> you couldn't even name uh, Solemn Warning. Warning. I mean, oh my God. Which you activated yesterday, by the way, not that many <laughs> days ago at our little time Wizard Tournament. But back to this one, as expected, again, uh, looking for the Cauldron. Uh, but here we get to see Ojama Duo. Makes sense. Uh, you really want to free up your space. I don't think Lars is interested in, uh, you know, having uh, something to do with the. Uh, as mentioned, uh, if you deck didn't win at Rio, maybe there were more guessing. Uh, is he playing, uh, you know, just the cert? Uh, uh, but since the deck list was published, uh, of course, I think Lars has a pretty good understanding of what kind of deck uh, uh, PL is uh, using. And so there is no reason to negate uh, an Ojama duo. And here also, I think uh, it's going to be very difficult because uh, if PL gets to see his cauldron, he yeah. knows that Lars has true copy of Solemn Judgment and as well. And here we see the first uh, runic card, uh, which is going to banish the top card. Hopefully not a cauldron. Uh, is he even playing uh, one fountain? That's my... No, he doesn't. He doesn't play fountain. Wow. Not even fountain in the deck. Uh, just wants to use the Mystic Mine. Makes sense. Uh, maybe the one copy could have been cool to draw. Oh, and the banish of the cauldron. Wow. Lars uh, eating uh, the best, and you can see Pial shaking his head. This is so unlucky for Pial. <sighs> you saw this coming, huh? Yeah, I mentioned <laughs> it, uh, uh, and unfortunately it did happen. And this is huge, because there are only two other win conditions for Pial at this point. And uh, we know two Solemn Judgments are face down from yeah. Lars. If he has double solemn judgment with a dark bribe, for example, yeah, uh, that might be tough. And here we see duality. Are we gonna get a cauldron? Uh, not, no cauldron whatsoever. He might have to pick up either the one day right away or the extravagance. He's thinking about it, but what an unfortunate uh, meal uh, from the runic tip. And yeah, he picks up the extravagance, uh, just gonna be able to, uh, I think, manage uh, free from the extra deck, yeah. if I'm correct, but yeah. Still, basically an upstairs goblin for next turn. And uh, yeah, I think he's pretty much done uh, for the rest of this turn. Uh, let's see if he wants to discard something or if he already has six cards in hand. Still, Lars, a very familiar with these uh, heavy trap decks as we remember at the european championship he got top four this year with alter guys absolutely and uh, more than this just mystic mine which uh, has been uh, a really strong option this weekend uh, we have seen a lot of different uh, ways to use the card uh, both uh, by uh, you know, these kind of decks, relying on it entirely. We have seen it in T elements, which I think makes a lot of sense. For example, Lorenzo Roma was using it with Beat Cop, uh, because when you get Bestial, the idea is uh, your opponent has a monster, and then you can uh, use Beat Cop, not just to protect it, uh, but to activate Misting Mine going first, which I think uh, was a very smart uh, inclusion in the deck. And now, again, Pial trying to pick up the Cauldron, uh, and I see a Dark Bribe in yeah. there. But what's really costing him uh, at the moment is the Rivalry. And now he sets another card, which could actually be risky. Because if he doesn't have another card that he can flip face up, this game is over. Yeah. Uh -huh. And let's say Lars. Because honestly, if you're Lars, do you activate a card for the rest of this duo? No, I mean, you can just pass uh, and continue doing it and then... Uh, it's like if we are actually looking at PL decklist, what I'm thinking is the only face down card could be another draw, which is kind of likely, and then uh, it could just be the one Metaverse. But if that's the case, then PL just threw the game out of the window, uh, which would surprise me uh, quite a bit, but... Maybe he just uh, wasn't paying too much attention to the to the game state. But that would be terrible because, okay, he does have the Metaverse. So as expected, uh, the only card that he could have activated from face down was the Metaverse uh, alongside one of his other cards. But does he not have any field spells in deck? Uh, let's see. He's activating it, okay, yeah. 
Luckily, does gonna pick up a Mystic Mine. Not really interested in using it at the moment. Uh, gonna shuffle his deck and look for one of these two cauldrons, but he's getting really, really close to decking out, uh, especially if there are a few couple of runics from Lars, uh, who is uh, kind of having a good time, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's just here chilling. And here is the cauldron. So let's see how many counter traps are going to be activated, because uh, who has more counter traps is actually going to uh, win this duel, I believe. And there is no response, no response. from Lars, really. Just going to okay. try and use the destruction uh, to just pretty much use the counter traps afterwards. Uh, let's see if there's gonna be a response from Pial. He's debating, of course, uh, gonna try and use. If they both have free counter traps, uh, then this is gonna be the end of the duel, I believe. Uh, let's see what Lars decides to do. I think you solemn. are forced. Yeah. In, we know that he has double solemn judgment, but this uh, is really turning into a long, uh, long chain. And here is the first solemn. Uh, is there gonna be another one from Peel? He needs two face down counter traps because uh, we know Lars has another solemn judgment. Uh, let's see. I think he doesn't have it. Uh, oh, really? really? No, he's definitely considering it, uh, but we know there is another one, so he needs another. And there is the bribe. Here will be another solemn judgment, most likely from Lars. Let's see the consideration. Gonna count the cards in the deck. What a duel is turning. <laughs> wow. Uh, looks like that Lars has more cards than PL. For sure, deck. for sure. And here will be activated maybe a second solemn judgment. And another dark bribe from Lars. <laughs> Is there gonna be a final counter trap? But we know another Solemn is there from Lars, so he is gonna be the winner of this chain regardless, uh, which is really bad for Pial. Yeah, he was hoping uh, that Lars didn't have at least a third judgment or a dark bribe, but this is not the case. And uh, yeah, PL drawing a card out of the Dark Bribe, knowing that uh, another Solemn Judgment will be there from Lars, who gets rid of the Cauldron. And now PL needs to find uh, another way around. Yeah, this was so tough, especially because it Ooh. means... Oh my, wow! Wow, this is basically over. I think PL might as well pick up his cards. What an unfortunate way for him to end this duel with two cauldrons banished. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have to keep in mind uh, the time on the round that's left. Uh, because as mentioned, there are 30 minutes remaining. Uh, but this is uh, really, really tough uh, for both. Uh, wow. What an unfortunate way to just m banish both cauldrons. That's uh, yeah. This was, was, was very unfortunate. Yeah. And yeah, here runic tip. Uh, as I was mentioning, uh, um, basically there are a little less than 30 minutes left on the round. Uh, but although Pial at the moment doesn't really have a win condition left, is uh, uh, not really interested in picking up his cards because uh, uh, we have to keep in check whether they are gonna deck out. Of course, I can already tell you, Lars is winning this game 100%. But uh, if he doesn't pick up his cards, uh, he can potentially sneak in a draw later on. And with a draw, I think they are basically guaranteed uh, top cut. So yeah. they, they are not too interested in uh, scooping up right away, I believe. And at the same time, I think this makes sense because while PL deck is renewed, Lars deck is definitely something we have not seen too much of previously so PL wants to check every single card in his opponent deck and uh, might as well yeah which it. I think makes sense especially because like you saw that he's playing runic cards and also going into side decking uh, you want to make sure uh, you're siding it correctly especially because like uh, against your strategy uh, runic cards are very annoying because uh, basically you want to set up the Cauldron uh, play, uh, but with Dark Bribe, Solemn Judgments being around, uh, and also the Runic cards is not easy. And uh, now, uh, yeah, this is what we are witnessing. PL wants to see every single card Lars is playing. Uh, 
you don't want to mess this up, especially because no. this is the last round of our event. And after 11 rounds, uh, you are one step closer to getting to the top 64 cut. And to be honest, uh, there is one more card which I'm interested in talking about, which is the Lava Golems uh, uh, in both players' decks, uh, which uh, are much better for PL since he has these Ujama cards, of course. So that's also a way that he can deal damage to his opponent, I believe. Because the Ujamas cannot be tributed for a tribute summon, but uh, a Lava Golem is not a tribute summon, you know. Let's see, uh, as mentioned, uh, uh, this uh, is getting... Oh, and it gets rid of... Uh... Yeah, because he activated the destruction. Wow, and one of the Lava Golems is actually gone. Uh, few, few cards left uh, from PL, who can see is just smiling. Uh, unfortunately, paired against uh, what seems to be almost an impossible matchup uh, for him. And uh, yeah, he's just gonna discard the Lava Golem. Uh, And yeah, now <laughs> PL is left with no cards in his deck. <laughs> and yeah, he is pretty much ready to pick up his cards. And game one goes to Lars and his runic mine deck out deck. What a game one. Definitely not what we expected uh, going into this round 12. But we mentioned how there were a lot of decks, uh, a lot of decks going on, and especially a lot of decks trying to counter Tier elements, Ishizu, this is one way to do it. This is super annoying, especially because now the Ishizu tier element decks are not playing so many interruptions. So yeah. Only the heartbeat is on top of my mind, if they're playing it in the main deck. Absolutely. And then talking about the side decks, sometimes they do play either Cosmic Cyclone or the Twin Twisters, but it's... Not uh, even that popular. Like yeah. We have seen plenty of duelists this weekend just having the one crime and the one heartbeat as outs and that's it. Which, sure, you can shuffle back with the Shizus, but essentially, if mine resolves, the Shizus are uh, useless. So, the only other way to do it is set up the Perle Rhino with the Shizu card, but then again, that's only one interruption, and in decks that just focus on using Mystic Mine multiple times, uh, that's really tough. Uh, so, as was was saying, uh, it's kind of unfortunate that they had to play in this matchup uh, uh, on the bubble. But now, what's gonna happen is that we're gonna go and take a look at the side decks. So, Pial is the one who is uh, uh, might go second and get an additional draw if he feels like it. He really needs to draw the Cauldron. Honestly, Chu getting banished that early, it's uh, very unlikely. But he has a few interesting cards. Uh, among them, we could see RP Feather Duster, Cosmic Cyclone, and especially Curse Seal of the Forbidden One, uh, which is gonna be an interesting counter trap, uh, which you could have named uh, as well. <laughs> but uh, yeah, on the other hand, his opponent uh, was already maining Lightning Storm, yeah. which is huge, and he sides uh, the three copies uh, in total, alongside RP Feather Duster. Pop up, which is an interesting card, probably not for this matchup though. But he has three cursed seals of his own. So very similar side decks, but Lars with uh, three lightning storms that are the main differences in the deck list. Uh, I think still I give the advantage to Lars, uh, but we gotta admit, if uh, PL goes first with a cauldron and he set up, you know, a couple counter traps uh, or a curse seal, because uh, if you curse seal, against the runic destruction that's huge yeah. Yeah. huge so that could actually change the game significantly let's see what these guys decide to do in the very end uh, i see that they are taking out the copies of lava golem uh, makes sense especially from uh, lars i think pl could have kept them in because i was as mentioning uh, you can tribute the Jama tokens for lava golem uh, which can give you potentially an additional win con especially when they are forced as in the previous game to activate multiple solemns but i think uh, without further ado there is not much to say anymore about uh, this side deck pattern so let's go back to game two and find out who the winner will be
and here they are so as mentioned now let's see if PL wants to go second this is the biggest decision for him uh, again as mentioned both on a 9 and 2 record as you can see on the screen just one draw pretty much guaranteed away from top cut and I think uh, Lars is gonna go first uh, let's see no, oh, it's okay. Pial who decides to go first. He really wants to pick up his cauldron and wants to be the first one who sets one of his counter traps. And extravagance is a great way to start things off. As mentioned, he really wants to pick up the cursed seal to be using against the, the runic destruction. I think, I think this makes sense. A lot. Yeah, I agree with it. After the side deck, it does make sense. What does he eat? RP Feather does it, and there is the Curse Seal. So that could be a really good one. And he picks it up right away. Curse Seal can stop all free runic destruction from Lars. So that's huge already. Good stuff. We saw it. Uh, we saw it coming. Uh, I think this is very good, especially inside decking against uh, current format. Uh, basically, you disrupt your opponent's strategy. And Pial has multiple traps in his hand, not a surprise. I'm surprised that he still goes and set the rivalry. I really don't like that from Pial, because you want to set as many counter traps as possible. Why waste one of the spaces for the rivalry, honestly? I don't think that makes much sense, but let's see. He sets five uh, solid uh, opening uh, by Pial, but let's see if there will be Maybe Lightning Storm plus Feather Duster. Yeah, that mean. could be huge. So first of all, we get to see an Ojama Trio being activated by PL. Is there a response there? Let's see. There is not much. The large food chain to this. Or the, at least would make a ton of sense to chain to this. And yeah. It resolves, so we get to see three lovely YCS tokens being summoned by Lars. Uh, and I think he also has the Ojama duo. Not that it matters in this matchup, by the way, but... Yeah. Yeah. He's gonna use the Ojama duo as well. Uh, yes, so Ojama duo plus Ojama trio. This is another win condition of the deck. Uh, since he has the rivalry, whenever he activates uh, then the rivalry, everything is shut down. But this does not make any sense uh, when you're up against uh, a deck like Lars. So I'm surprised that these cards are being kept in uh, and that Lava Golem is sided out because what are you even uh, doing with these kind of cards? Yeah, because they do not work against Lars' strategy. I mean, it's of course uh, not easy to decide what to side out because basically yep. you're playing a mirror match and there are not so many cards to side in, but still uh, this doesn't do much, honestly. No, it really does not. And uh, I would actually be interesting to see if there is any cute option in the actual deck from Lars, but he's gonna go right away and banish them. Uh, um, I mean, Prosperity is an interesting target, but I don't think you are ever negating that with the Curse Seal. You really wanna negate cards uh, such as uh, the Runic Destruction, which is the best by far. And of course, uh, what uh, these Ojama tokens accomplish uh, is they make Lightning Storm useless, which is great. Here we already see a lot of different good options by Lars. He could take this uh, in a lot of different ways. Even the bribe uh, seems like a very good option, to be fair. Dark bribe, I think, seems, uh, seems good. Yeah. Because honestly, as I was saying, I kind of like the others, but... He said he picks up the Curse Seal, and I think that's also very scary because when you activate Curse Seal against the Cauldron, that's GG for PL. So that's a huge way to start this game. Both players setting up their side deck, the Curse Seal of the Forbidden One. So that's huge. Let's see. I think PL really needs another face down. I don't remember if we saw that. Was it Dark Bribe or am I? Oh, but only Ooh, one only set one. from Lars. Okay. That's definitely on the weaker side. And we see the extravagance once again from PL. Great pickup here. Gonna draw two more cards. Of course, 
not really interested in keeping any of the others. Uh, let's see what he picks up. Uh, it's Cosmic Cyclone, which is a huge pickup from Pial to force out the Curse uh, Seal. Great target because he only plays one copy, so that's actually a huge pickup here. And we see the duality. Does he find the Cauldron? That's the best card he's looking for. He does not, but there is an RP and a Solemn Judgment. I think Solemn could be the best by far, but he picks up the RP Feather Duster instead. Understandable, but again, I really would have liked that Solemn face down. I think uh, that's your main priority in this matchup. But once again, not finding these cauldrons uh, that he's really looking for. And now, with three spells in hand, uh, play is back to Lars. Interesting. Uh, Pial not using his cosmic, uh, doesn't want to lose uh, in time, although there are 17 minutes left uh, and just passes back. Looks like Lars uh, cannot find any good uh, interruptions apart from the curse seal he picked up earlier. And now Pial activates the Port of Prosperity and Lars is considering if activating but doesn't make sense to go with the curse seal. Yeah, uh, especially because this is just going to reveal three cars again trying to look for the Cauldron. Does he find it? Uh, he, oh, that's four cars. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that was, uh, that was the fourth card. Yeah. Yeah. So he reveals three cards uh, again. Uh, gonna probably pick up the one day of peace, I would guess. Uh, definitely the best among those. Cannot activate it right away, but he will put the rest on the bottom of the deck. And yeah, just uh, as mentioned, uh, still trying to find these cauldrons, which just doesn't, are too shy to come out of PL deck. Very unfortunate uh, to not pick them up either in game one or game two. Wow. Because now he's basically gone through half of his deck. Yeah, takes time to make a good soup. No. Yes, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Uh, looks like, by the way, Lars is not picking up any Dark Bribe or Solemn Judgment. Maybe now he did. Yeah, so a phase down again. We know RP Feather Duster is there, which uh, I think is going to come down from PL right here, right now. Is there going to be an RP Feather Duster? Things start with one day of peace. Uh, and there is a chained metaverse, interesting, by Lars. Not quite sure why he wants to use it now. I would have waited for the RP to just force things out by your opponent, but maybe he doesn't want to draw the one copy he kept, I would guess, and uh, this is just going to shuffle his deck. Again, PL looking for the Cauldron and doesn't find it. Finds a Solemn Judgment and Ojama Trio instead. That's really unfortunate by PL, uh, who passes back to his opponent with just the Solemn Judgment face down. Yeah, so Lars uh, pick up a card uh, once again. Uh, and uh, soon enough, uh, it will be a matter of understanding whether uh, they are able uh, to actually win this game or they are interested in just picking up cards and go to game three because that's also an interesting consideration because uh, if Lars uh, oh okay that's why he didn't have anything going on uh, yeah. he discarded two demise of the land and it the mystic mine discarded a couple of cards uh, back from the end uh, and now plays back to PL again looking for the cauldron not Cannot stress enough, but here maybe he picked it up because we see the RP Feather Duster. There is no reason for Lars to chain his own card, I think. And yeah, it resolves uh, without destroying it. You can see both of them smiling out. Uh, and did we find this cauldron? Uh, let's see. Doesn't seem like it is finally found. So the cauldron comes down from Pial, and this puts a huge clock on this opponent who might just decide to pick up his cards at this point. Uh, Lars needs to find uh, his own copy of Harpy's Feather Duster, but 
It's quite unlikely that PL doesn't hold any copy of Dark Bribe or Solemn Judgment, which yeah. we saw earlier. It's definitely a tough one. Uh, as mentioned, the Cauldron can activate one of two effects. You can either gain life points or deal damage to your opponent. Uh, and in such a matchup, uh, it's not even obvious which effect uh, might be better. But essentially, when you start dealing life points, uh, you can set up uh, a kill in uh, very few turns uh, than you would expect as the damage is incremental. And by the way, during your standby phase, you keep getting, you know, these yeah. counters. So it's uh, it's a lot of counters. So now he pick up a card. I think it's like maybe seven, uh, uh, seven turns or something along those lines where you get enough damage to actually deal 8,000 yeah, life points. But I think PL instead decided to uh, gain. Yeah, he gained the life yeah. points instead. Definitely an interesting decision there. Now he puts up uh, the second counter. And my only worry once again is this rivalry, which might uh, be a little too much uh, for PL. Uh, at the same time, now it gets to maybe gain life again. I honestly think it's much better to deal uh, damage. I, I get that you get an incremental, but like when your opponent's strategy is decking out, you just want to deal damage to them. It doesn't matter if you are at 20,000 life points, you still deck out. Well, in seven uh, turns, I believe it is. Do you think is he may be afraid of, uh, you know, having few life points uh, with Solemn Judgment, given that he lost game it's one? It's possible, but again, even then, uh, your opponent at some point will be forced to use Solemn Judgment. So maybe what he wants to do is just gain enough where he can use his Cosmic, we know he has in end, without uh, being below 8,000. Because essentially now he can already gain a thousand, and then uh, even if he activated Cosmic, he would still be on 85. Um, but I still think it's better to deal damage, because as I was saying, uh, essentially what you do is uh, within eight turns, I think you win the game, which I can do the math for, but it's, uh, it shouldn't be too complicated. Because now another counter will be placed yeah. upon the cauldron, and uh, Lars, the only response that he might be holding in his deck is uh, the Arpis Feather Duster. Um, Absolutely, yeah, as I was saying, uh, all you need is uh, seven uh, turns to win with cauldron. So I think I would have uh, gone for it, especially because if you have the curse for the runic destruction, that's just game, and you can see now that Lars uh, is uh, actually starting to use a different effect. Uh, it looks like PL started um, to inflict damage to his opponent, and he will slowly reduce Lars' life points with the Cauldron. Lars gets the Pot of Prosperity on the line, trying to find his own copy of Arpis Feather Duster, which I think we are not going to be seeing anytime soon now. Yeah, and I think the strategy is just having at least more counter traps than your opponent in order to really let the Arpis Feather Duster resolve. Yeah, as mentioned, uh, this is actually an interesting uh, uh, little niche interaction, uh, which is essentially uh, that whenever you activate Pot of Extravagance or Pot of Prosperity, uh, as uh, most of you know, you cannot draw cards for the remaining of the turn, which actually makes it so that if your opponent has a Dark Bribe face down, they cannot activate it, which is obviously something that only happens in this matchup, but it's huge to keep in mind, because uh, we know how this can turn into how many cards are there face down in terms of counter traps.
and now Bial continues to gain life points and uh, Lars is just passing back uh, to Bial which is going to add more and more counters turn after turn yeah I, I still continue to think that Lars last solution in his deck is the Arpis Feather Duster yeah, and now we actually get to see PL uh, playing around with this damage and gaining, which I honestly uh, don't quite understand uh, why you wouldn't just go for the same one uh, over and over again. Uh, I think dealing damage is always much better. So I'm a little confused just by this decision from uh, PL. Let's just see. As mentioned, play once again is back uh, with uh, PL getting more, more. And now they're still continuing uh, PL with gaining uh, life points and then uh, reducing Lars. Now he's going to need another die roll for his counters. Looks like uh, Lars cannot find his own copy of the Arpis Feather Duster. And here we see finally some action from Lars as well. We have seen enough uh, and will try to activate uh, his uh, runic card. We know that there is a curse seal face down. Uh, let's see. Yeah, because we know that um, PL has the curse seal of the Forbidden One. Um, of the Forbidden Spell, sorry, but... Uh, I mean, uh, on the destruction is very powerful. Let's see if decides to activate it or not. But it doesn't. Interesting. Uh, wow. It actually doesn't. Okay. It doesn't try to negate it. That's definitely an interesting decision by Piala. Because I think Piel is uh, uh, standing in a good position now because like his, uh, his life points are way over than his opponent ones and if Lars were on the point to activate a Stolen Judgment he would be in uh, like basically in trouble because it's only on 5000 life points left and here Piel activates his own copy of Cosmic Cyclone on a random one let's see what is going to, to banish. He has the curse sealed. Uh, Lars is probably going. Yeah, he doesn't know that his opponent is playing just the one copy, as we know, which means that actually negating it is completely useless. Uh, And looks like uh, maybe Biel will soon set... Oh, he has another one. Yeah, and he has another... He has another one. That's why he didn't activate any of his interruption on uh, the runic destruction of yep. some Lars. So now good play by Biel recognizing his options. So let's see if there is a response from Lars. And here comes the Dark Pribe. Uh, Dark Pribe on uh, the Cauldron activation. 
Let's see if there will be a response from PL. He can't afford the solemn judgment because he gained this much life. So even with the solemn, he, he's still ahead in life. Is there going to be another solemn from Lars? Definitely thinking about it with only three minutes remaining. There is a solemn judgment activated from Lars as well. Are we getting yet another one from PL? This is going down to the wire. Let's see. Doing some math, of course. And I think it made sense that uh, PL decided to gain life points with the Cauldron because he didn't want basically to waste his life points. So now he's sitting in a position in which he can afford basically to activate another one if he's holding it or not. He doesn't go for it, uh, so both the Cauldron and the Solemns are gonna be sent to the graveyard. Uh, PL picks up a card uh, and now life. Uh, is only 2500 from Lars uh, and there is yet another Cauldron uh, phase potentially in the deck uh, for Pial. Let's see, he picked up yet another card. Uh, let's see if he has anything going on or if he's just gonna set maybe a Dark Bribe face down. Uh, uh, has a few options going on, doesn't want to set too many useless cards, uh, sets one and play should be back to Lars any moment. So Lars picks up a card, is now gonna try and deck out his opponent with some runic, but he discarded I think another copy of runic destruction, which is also an interesting decision by Lars. Yeah, play is back right away to PL, once again trying to pick up his Cauldron. Doesn't seem like he did, but he might go for Upster Goblin. And I think he has Dark Hole as well, Ooh. which can deal a lot of damage to his opponent, because I'm pretty sure the tokens deal 300 each, right? Uh, yeah. 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 So Dark Hole can actually deal 1,500 life points whenever activated by PL, which means only 1,000 life points away from winning this duel, potentially. I mean, he's holding into the Upstar Goblin, and then he could activate the Dark Hole afterwards, which will make sense. And now there is a duality from Lars. We can't quite see which cards were picked up, but uh, he doesn't look too happy about it. Uh, gonna shuffle it up, give it back to his opponent. And as mentioned, there are very few seconds left on the round, which means this one might actually end up in a draw. Let's see. And here comes the Arpis Feather Duster. <laughs> actually, a little bit too late, I would say, but... Yeah, and we know that there is uh, the Forbidden Face Down. Dark Bribe is gonna be activated by PL to negate the Feather Duster. Let's see. Does he have anything else going on? About 10 seconds left uh, on the clock uh, for Lars. Uh, gonna go and discard the terraforming in the end phase. Uh, so now PL picks up a car and time is called. Uh, I believe this is basically now gonna be guaranteed as a draw. But let's see what our judges' final decision will be. And yeah, there goes the handshake. Uh, the duel ends in a draw. Let's go back to us for the post-match discussion. What a match uh, and uh, what a duelist matchup we had. Uh, of course, both uh, trying to target the tier and the Shizu deck, most represented deck, as we have seen in the deck breakdown for YCS Dorman. If you missed it, you can find it on our official social media pages. Uh, but just as a spoiler, we have pretty much 25% of the field, uh, so a fourth of the field playing Shizu tier. And I think uh, both of these guys have a huge matchup uh, against the deck, uh, which means uh, that now that they are almost locked in for top 64 with a nine win, one draw and two losses record, uh, I think everyone in the top cut is gonna be afraid to play against uh, either of the two. But what can we say? Game one, they both try to play out their strategy. We mentioned it from the start. PL strategy is the Cauldron. Just damaging, damaging, and within seven turns, he has enough damage to deal 8,000 life points. The strategy from Lars decking out, and what happens is they both don't have too much going on 
at the beginning, but then uh, with two clutch meals off the top, Lars banishes two copies of Cauldron, and that's just too much. He decks out PL, and that's the game. But in game two, it's the opposite thing. It is PL who finally sets up the Cauldron, gets ahead in life, which, by the way, seemed like an odd decision, but in the end, it paid off for two reasons. One, he had the knife life points to activate Cosmic Cyclone and clear the Forbidden Spell. Two, he had the knife life points to activate Solemn Judgment and still be on 6,000 life points I had in time. So I would say congratulations to both. They played it really well and now are basically guaranteed a stop in the top 64. Thank you guys for being with us. For This was the last round of Swiss, round 12. So in a just matter of seconds or minutes, we will find out the top 64 duelist for YCS Dormand. Who will be the winner? Just keep watching to find out because we will be back soon with the top 64 match. Keep watching.
Well, hello. Do you have a moment to talk to us about our Lord and Savior, Mystic Mine? Well, here we are. So we're not going to do a post-match interview because that was a draw during that last game. So instead, here we are with a specialist quiz. You've seen us do the tennis back and forth one that we were doing earlier. We'll be returning with that later on. Instead, we're going to have the first of a series of four different bouts of a specialist quiz. These have all been made especially for each of the commentators. They've picked an archetype. So do you want me to read out what the archetypes are that you guys have picked? Sure. So Leonard, you've picked Trickstar, Monarch, Sky Striker, Orcust, and Lightsworn. Basti, you've picked Sky Striker, Virtual World, Sword Soul, Tri Brigade, and Altergeist. Yeah. Okay, so what we're gonna do, because only one of them can take part in this, because it's a 10 question questionnaire, we have to retain an idea of the score, and then we're gonna be sort of doing a, a big announcement, getting you all on here and going, right, in fourth place is. It's gonna be quite tense and quite fun. But right now, we're in the midst of the between stages of Swiss and Top Cut, so we've gotta kill a little bit of time. So what better thing to do than a quiz? Gentlemen, a rock, paper, scissors to see who of you is going to be taking part in this here quiz. A shake of the hand. Okay, good extension, a good extension of sportsmanship there. Okay, ready? One, two, three, go. One, two, three, go. Ah, okay, so you are gonna be going first, right? <laughs> okay, Leonard, you gonna stay for the moral support? Okay. Right, I Basti. Mean, I actually lost. <laughs> I have your questions right here. So we're going to start with your Sky Striker questions. Cool. Remember, no clues. You're just here for moral support. Okay. Question one. No, no pressure. For your Sky Striker question, yes. how many drones appear on Sky Striker Mecha Hornet drones? I can tell you this is an expert question. <laughs> These are going to be quite hard because they're quite specific. You think you know until you're put on the spot on camera in front of lights on a stream. I think it's more than one because the card is called Hornet Drones, so it's uh, multiples. Very astute of yeah. you. Yeah, so we're going there, we're getting there, I think. And I'll, I'll just go with 11. 11 is incorrect. The correct answer is there are six drones that appear on Sky Striker Mega Hornet drones. So, your second Sky Striker question. Which three digit code appears on Sky Striker Mecha Widow Anchor? There is a three digit code on Widow Anchor, as I know. <laughs> Let's assume it's WID. Quite a good guess. It's incorrect, though. The numbers are 0, 6, and 1. <laughs> Nearly there, I guess. So that's currently nil point. But we will move on to question three, one of your virtual world questions. Oh, okay. Oh, very good. Okay. What two types of virtual world monsters are there? Psy, Kick, and Worm. Correct. That is one point for Basti. Your virtual world ones might be going well for you. They're good, 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 good. That's what we'd like to see. Okay, your second virtual world question. Name three virtual world gate cards. Kowloon, Qinglong, and Xuche. Correct. That is an extra point. So you are currently on two points. So we now move on to your sword soul questions. So let's see how many of these points you can maximize. Complete the name Sword Soul Wat Long Yuan. Strategist. Is correct. There were two answers there. It was Strategist or Sinister Sovereign Qixing? Yeah, that's Okay, right, okay. Sounds like food. <laughs> yeah, it does actually. Yeah, I love a good quiche. Right, so now we move on. So, how many points is that for you now? That's four points? Three points, three points. Okay, we've got to make sure you keep and remember if you'll score, because I don't think I'm going to remember. You're going to be scorekeeper? Okay, that's a good way of doing this, actually. We'll stick with that. So your next question, we now move on to your tri-brigade questions. You're three points in, and we have one, two, three, four questions left. So you get a maximum of seven points out of ten if you get oh. these right. So your tri-brigade question. What are the different types of tri-brigade monsters? Beast, Winged Beast, and Beast Warrior. Correct! Okay, that's four points there for Basti. Now we go on to your second tri-brigade. This is 
What was the first booster to contain Tri-Brigade monsters? Slightly harder question. You're going to have to ponder this for a moment. Do you in the chat remember the first booster pack that released Tri-Brigade monsters to the TCG? Which will it be? I feel like it was Phantom Rage. It's correct! He's, he's doing pretty well. So is that five points altogether? Okay, five points. Not bad, not bad, not bad. Okay. Now it's time for your Altergeist questions. Boys, Which Altergeist monster has the highest attack? Urbanshi? Is incorrect. It's Memory Gant. <laughs> of course, of course. So that means you're now at six points still? Five points? Five. Five points, okay. Another Altergeist question, your final question. So see if you can get your sixth point here. Which monster appears on Altergeist Protocol? I think it is Marionetta, isn't it? It is not. It is Melisseek, unfortunately. But that means you have five points. So a five point, that's not bad. We'll see what, how that ends up going. Now, do you think we have time before the next round to do Leonard's one? I'm getting a nod behind the camera, which means we're going to do the best two out of this. Okay, so we're going to see what happens here. Scorekeeper? Yeah. You're going to be scorekeeper. So remember, you have five points. You could have anywhere between zero and ten at this point. Let's just go through what you've got. You've got Trickstar, Monarch, Sky Striker, Orcus, Light Sworn. I think that's all of them, right? Okay, let's go with your first Trickstar question. Which monster appears on Trickstar Reincarnation? It looks like Rose Lover. It isn't. It's Holly Angel. Not a great start, but don't worry. There's still nine more questions. Still plenty more time to go with this, so we'll go for your second one. Trickstar Light Stage has three effects. What are they? Add a trickstar monster from your deck to your hand. You can target a back row, a spell trap on your opponent's side of the field that is set, and it cannot be activated until the end of the turn. And in the end phase, it has to be activated. If it can't be activated, then it will be sent to the GY. And every time a trickstar monster activates or deals effect damage to your opponent, it deals 200 more. Correct! That was pretty good. That's actually a very good effort. So that's your first point and your trickstar question. So, Len, we now move on to your monarch questions. What is the name of the Storm Vassal? So we have Mithra as the Thunder One. I'm gonna say Torsten. Is incorrect. It's Garum or Garum, okay. however you want to pronounce it. So we move on to your second Monarch question. Which set contained the first Monarch to be released in the Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG? I am thinking it is the Zabok one, AST, Ancient Sanctuary. Correct. Very good. So that's two points currently. Thank you for scorekeeping. That's making things a lot easier. Now we move on to your Sky Striker questions. Uh, yes, yeah, Sky Strikers, yes. Which three digit code appears on Sky Striker Ace Hayate? It is obviously 607. It is obviously not. It's actually a zero, zero, 004, but I appreciate the confidence that you said that with. Should have known that. Right, your next Sky Striker question. How many Sky Striker spell cards have an effect that destroys a card? So right now I'm thinking two because of Afterburners and Jamming Wave, but give me one more second. I'm going with two. Correct. Three points. Okay, so you still got... You have four more, which means you could still currently beat Basti if you get all of these right. But let's see what happens. Your Orcus question. Which Orcus monster has the highest attack? Orcus Trion. Correct. Okay, there's four. There's four points on the board there. Your next Orcus question. What are the two different ways to summon Dingirsu, the Orcus of the Evening Star? You could hard summon it by overlaying two level eight monsters, or you could overlay it on a Orcus Link monster. Those are correct, that's five points. So basically you have two chances here to get more points than Basti if you get both of these right, or either of these right. So, your question, your light sworn question. What color are Judgment Dragon's eyes? Red. Is correct. 
So that means you are now in first place out of two. But there's one more question. In fact, I've just closed the document, so g give me a sec to find it again. <laughs> this has all gone hideously wrong. At least we know that you're winning. This is incredibly poor timing for me. I don't know what the hell happened. It just closed, and now I can't find it again. We go to the specialist quiz. I was hiding it so subtly behind my, behind my card until that one moment. Or I probably wasn't, but we're about to find out what the final question is. Here we go. Leonard, your final Light Swan question. Complete the name. Orcus the Light Swan Druid. Correct! So that is seven points for Leonard. Five points to Basti, which means next time we do this, we're going to have to see what the Italians get. And you guys won't know. I won't tell them what you got. And then we'll do a ceremonious reveal of what the top prizes are. There is no prize for this other than the knowledge that you did your best. So stand with us for a little bit more because we are going to be back hopefully fairly soon with the top 64 top cut of YCS Dortmund. Don't go anywhere. Hello and welcome to a very special little event that we're doing here during your coverage of this YCS Dortmund 2022. In front of me, you may see two familiar faces. Now, these are Marcello and Alberto, two of your commentary team, who are going to be taking part in a fun little thing. So we're taking part in a Time Wizard 2011 format mini tournament between the commentators. Right now, the two Italians are going to face off. Then, in the next match, which you'll see later, the two German commentators will face off, and then whoever wins both of those rounds will face off against each other in a grand final. Now, in front of our two duelists, there are four decks. They have no idea which decks these are. They're going to pick them randomly, and they're not allowed to look at the cards until they draw their first hand. It's going to be very exciting, and to make this quick, this is a best-of-one tournament, and also there's 15 minutes on the clock, so this is going to be snappy, but this will fill some time while we wait for some of our feature matches to get done. So, guys, why don't we start with a dice roll, and then we're going to see who gets to pick their deck first. Marcello is going to roll first. What have we got there? That's a five for Marcello. Alberto? Okay, right, so that's 11 for you. So which deck are you picking, Alberto? Remember, you cannot look at the cards. You must select the deck. Rolling for which one? You're getting two, okay. So then now it's time for Marcello to roll to see which one he's gonna pick. Five. Okay, right, their decks have been selected. So while we wait for them to shuffle, I'm gonna pass you over to our German commentary team who are gonna be facing off in the next round. But for now, they're gonna give you guys a little bit of analytics. Over to you guys, take it away. Thank you very much, Ed. I'm so hyped that we are doing this. I'm extremely excited to finally play Time Wizard at YCS. We always miss out on most public events because yeah. we have to cast. Okay, it's not really have to. It's, it's not. We have love to. to cast for you, but now we can actually play those tournaments as well here yeah. while casting, which is fantastic. So we actually have the advantage because we are going to see how they play their decks first, and then afterwards we're going to play our semifinals between each other, and then we maybe have a little bit of the groove going again. Yeah. I know you are a big fan of the Tango Plant deck for that format, but. I hope you're not getting that, because then my chances are pretty slim to win. But in general, I'm super excited which decks are going to be there, because we don't yeah. know yet. We don't know either. And for now, we are friends <laughs> in this match. We are friends, but we are going to be enemies on the table. <laughs> so both players have put out their starting hand before them, so we can go right into the featured match. Alberto Marazzi versus Marcello Baveri. What a stack tournament it is. Indeed. As you can see, Time Wizard, September 2011. One little thing that will start it off is uh, very unique for older Yu-Gi-Oh! times. You will be able to start with a sixth card in your opening hand, or at least you draw a sixth one, even as the first player to start. And now, look at their faces. They realize what kind of decks they're playing. This is fantastic. And Alberto starts it off by drawing a card. And can you see what he's playing? Oh, I think he's playing Worms. 
Oh, worms, that would be I fantastic. I think I saw W Nebula Meteoroid. <laughs> that would be so much fun. Yeah, it looks like worms. And look, he's reading them. I see Kataros, I see Sex. I think, yeah, that is really the case. He is on worms and he starts it off with Upstart Goblin. I love it already. Oh, Sex was such a crazy card. Indeed, indeed. Because it can send Yagan? I think it was Yagan. <laughs> it's, I'm it's so happy. It's <laughs> even fun remembering those, yeah. But we see a very powerful card for that. Um, specific format in his hand already. He has, we saw the morning and now he has access to Thunder King Ryo as well, which is oh, crazy and too. Dimensional Prison. Newer players won't know, but actually Dimensional Prison as a trap card banishes an attacking monster and this is... <laughs> and look <laughs> at Marcello. Marcello can't understand what's happening. Marcello and he is having a Ryo. breakdown over Thunder King Ryo. He is not looking too happy about this and I think from Marcello's reaction, Alberto can see that normal summoning... Oh. Oh, 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 oh. We don't want this to happen, that normal no. summoning Thunder King Ryo is a good play. Maybe also because Alberto doesn't really know what his cards do. <laughs> uh, so. I, I think so as well. That was a pretty smart move by Alberto. He doesn't know really about the um, good old warm cards maybe anymore. And now he just decides maybe to normal summon that Thunder King he just added to his hand. Would be kind of good. And Alberto is really turboing through his deck. Also, it does not look like Marcello has the best hand. I don't think I have seen a monster. I have seen Mind Control and Pot of Everest. Mind Control could help, though. Mind Control yeah, could that be is good. True. If he draws another monster, then he can go into Oh, a he <gasps> plays the Karakuri deck. We <laughs> saw that earlier. Marcello plays the Karakuri deck. And we were joking because we know that this is one of the decks that is popular in this format. And Karakuri cards never really were that much in the spotlight. So maybe we would have to read up on a couple of Karakuri cards, actually. And there we have the first one we saw in his opening hand there. Well, it's he rather drew for turn. I think. Inashichi. You want to see my favorite Karakuri card? Go ahead. I'm please. Going to I, I, I want to know. It's, it's not I didn't ask, yet. but I want to see it. <laughs> it is Karakuri Soldier MDL236 Nizam. Let's go. That's a beautiful card for sure. So, Marcello is considering his options, and it looked like he passed. He, he at least was, was throwing it back over to Alberto. But those guys have to be aware of playing. 15 minutes best of one, so they should definitely not waste too much time here. He should get into the action, otherwise Alberto and his uh, big beat stick there is going to do some damage here. Oh, that so looks like Al a set two pass Marcello to Marcello is setting two, and this could be a storm from the bottom for Marcello, uh, for Alberto, because storm was legal in this format. Happy storm. Thanks for giving me that information again, Leonard, because I wouldn't have remembered. <laughs> I would have not remembered that. Oh no. Looks Wait. like Battle Phase, and there comes Fiend of Shane by Marcello. No, I'm, I'm, actually, guys, I'm going to bring up every card that is activated in this match. Let's just remember and appreciate all the old cards we're seeing here. Fiend of Shane. Such a fantastic card. Just, uh, It's very similar to Fogblade, to be honest. Like uh, that's uh, It basically is Fogblade, yeah. Indeed, actually it is. But it's the just monster not... can be attacked. Yes, indeed. And oh, there we see it, wow. Wormsex, and Marcello also has to read up on it. Yeah, and Wormsex is a card you really want to Fiendish Chain, because you can now send Yagan, and I think Yagan special summons itself. I don't know if it does if you have a monster that is not a worm. Let's check. Let's if the only monster, check ah, if the only monster you control is Wormsex, so that does not help him at all, as long as this Thunder King Ryo is oh. a solemn warning is activated that brings up Mar marcello's life points down now significantly to <laughs> Back because double up stuff was activated so yep. it was basically a free solemn warning that alberto gifted him here of course he is trading a card one for one alberto is setting two cards and and look i think marcello just realized that red worm sax would have not done too much there right no. now so maybe the true. solemn warning was a little bit preemptive there from him that maybe was a little bit too quick there. He assumed, yeah, that Yagan is going to come down, he's going to snowball too heavily off of that, but uh, it could have been pretty easy for him there. And so look at the next track, Marcello playing the OG Utopia there. Do, do I love you know, it. I think Marcello activated Solemn Warning because Alberto would have had the chance to look through his entire deck with, while activating <laughs> Worm Sex. So he does not have information on what cards he is playing. Potentially, yeah. And also, I mean, he would have had access to rank 4 plays, of course, because that would have been a second rank true. 4 monster on the and board. And there is warning on Inashichi, and Inashichi... Uh, <laughs> adds, oh, this is actually a really good card. It adds another Karakuri card from deck to hand, so it makes sense to solemn warning that. Absolutely. However, Marcello... I mean, this was not a key card for, uh, Alber uh, for Marcello, and Alberto just bought himself some time, but he can't really apply too much pressure. I mean, Marcello is still sitting at healthy 8,000 life points, yeah, and, and Ryo, Alberto even being down to 7,000 now. Oh, and there's the and next one, Zaxbo. And there was a spell card set for Marcello, and I doubt that it's Forbidden Droplet. Absolutely, that should not be the case. Otherwise, we would have to check back on the oh, decks and once again. Oh, now we can check. Oh, he's oh. playing 
the Reptile Trap card and wow, the, and the Worm one. King. And this is important for us because, because now we can check the deck as well, by the way. <laughs> we can spy on their decks already to maybe um, get the best of us uh, in the finals, then. Honestly, I'm going to try to not show too many cards when I'm looking ah, through my deck. Okay, okay. You're already trying to figure yeah, out the perfect moves for, for this I specific think format. I is trying to mill cards that he doesn't really understand. <laughs> <laughs> he has a very, very special way to deal with it here. <laughs> he sends Worm Katharos to the graveyard right there. Yeah, and I don't think that I can show you guys. No. So, Worm Katharos is sent to the GY, and now I think that was just a quick punch, or he didn't even attack me. I think he... Oh, he, he's considering oh, yeah, he an exceed summon, attacked. maybe. Oh, he attacked. Oh, oh yeah, we oh. see with the life points. Machado down to 6,200. Only nine minutes left. I mean, that's still more than half of the time we started with. But, uh, oh, Machello now having a quick look through his extra deck, finally. And he says, oh, this, look at that. Buraido, Burai, the cool, good old ultimate rare. Beautiful Karakuris you see there. And you also, know, a couple of fusions. You know what's not ideal? That Thunder King Ryo was Fiendish Chain, because Thunder King Ryo tributes itself for cost. Oh, yeah. And then Fiendish You're Chain right. doesn't work anymore. So you can actually use the second effect of Thunder King Ryo when it is Fiendish Chain. Which is very good versus <gasps> the synchros we saw there. Oh, and it is the best single card in the Worm deck that came out in Extreme Victory, the set of Tour Guide from the Underworld. Change all face down monsters on the field to face up defense position. During the end phase this turn, change all face up light reptile monsters you control to face down defense position, yeah. then draw one card for each I, I, I just realized he, he cannot activate that legally because he needs to uh, put face down monsters. He needs to flip up monsters for this card to resolve. Oh, yeah. That's what I just figured. True. And yeah. um, we, we should definitely. Yeah. Oh, that looks like a scoop. No, 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 no. He just activated MST on it and Alberto couldn't chain. Ooh. Okay, okay, we realized, realized and he couldn't chain. Okay, all good, all good. And there comes the next Karakuri monster. Maybe Marcello now gets his stop I going. Don't remember. It's Ninishi. Good old this is the one that Ninishi. lets you normal summon another monster from your hand oh, to the field. And this where could are you snowball. Going to normal summon monsters from. Yeah, of course. And now uh, Ninishi also has that neat little word on it being tuner. So yeah. this card could lead into some synchro summoning here. Don't forget the Ryo. However, Marcello can bank on Alberto not knowing that he can, in fact, tribute the Ryo. I, I think Alberto knows. I will have to go with Alberto here. He probably knows that he can do that. But maybe Marcello... Oh, he has <gasps> machine duplication wow. on the Ninishi. That's a power play right there. I mean, he can, of course, go after one synchro summon with the Ryo, but <laughs> what is he doing after that? Yeah, because oh, every one boy. of these Ninishis can activate the effect once per turn to normal summon another monster. It's not even <laughs> going to be an effect that's No, no, no. You can only summon. gain that effect once per turn, though. That's the last sentence Well, of the I cards. did not read the card right. But I would have been scared to activate machine duplication there, even because I wouldn't oh. have known whether I play free Ninishi, to be honest. But yeah. he was lucky enough to find free Ninishis <laughs> in here. Marcello has free on board now. Wow, Machine Duplication machine is such dupe. a power so card. Good. And now he can actually, if he has another monster, bait out the Ryo effect with a rank 3 exceeds. If he's playing rank 3s, yeah. I hope so for him. He probably is, though. What is your favorite card of all time to Machine Dupe? Spiral Quick Fix? No. <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> would kidding. be a good it's one. Actually, it's actually a Cyber Tile. For me. Oh, that's pretty cool as well. Mine would be Card Trooper. I, I think thought so. We're probably not going to see any of them in the feature match area for this specific event. Why is Utrecht and also not in this time wizard? But maybe and there is the mind wow, control now. We as forgot well. about it. We saw it in the beginning. And now we will have to check the Karakuri Synchro Monsters have restrictions wow. to them. Summoning restrictions. Oh, he summons Black Rose. Black okay, Rose so needs Dragon is hitting the board. He just searched for a level 7 Synchro and he probably. Yeah, was it a restriction for yeah, the Bura? Yeah. You need the non tuners. So we are attacking with the Black Rose over the XX. Already? No. Such an iconic monster being summoned here. That's and crazy. Ninishi is actually really good in attack position. I know it has zero attack and 1,900 defense points, but, but when it gets attacked, it changes the position. And how much defense has it? 1,900. That's good enough for most of the monsters in the game. Absolutely. Here. That's really good for Marcello. And I think he will have now the chance to actually get ahead of life points. And with the clock ticking down, that could be already a pretty, pretty good way to go. But we saw Alberto somewhere in between drawing Dark Hole for turns. So this card could definitely pop up as well. That is true. I think we are still in Marcello's turn, though, because he has not attacked over the XX. Do, do you think he could maybe fight OTK here? If he oh. has other Karakuri monsters, <laughs> can, pretty likely. He can go right? for Baron. <laughs> <laughs> that would be quite funny. <laughs> Funnily enough, Black Rose Dragon actually a card that has seen some popularity again lately due oh, to uh, nice. it being played in Naturia yeah. right now as well. 
So kind of a comeback for this oh. very old card. There's the Leviathan, wow! And now we are going for the big damages. So 2,500 and 2,400 crashing onto the Wormxex, but the Dark Hole in Alberto's end is really going to be a bad surprise for Marcello. Indeed. Marcello really relies on this push, maybe bringing Alberto in an unwinnable position. But Alberto already knows that he has a Dark Roll in hand. And he drew the Dimensional Prison for turn up. But now, let's look at the face of Marcello. He knows. He doesn't oh, even he blink. Is not happy about he this. doesn't even blink. He knew something like that was coming. And now Alberto, being down to 3,900 life points, it's on him. And look, uh, Marcello smiling. But there's only a set monster. Oh, yeah, he's only setting one. We are four minutes away from time. Jello is uh, looking kind of good still, even though he just got hit with the Dark Hole. And he has the wow. Everest, bro! Pot of Everest is really strong. He's probably playing multiple machine duplications. I don't know if this card was at one back in the day. So you can actually summon back all the Nishis. That's crazy. You just take all the Nishis. And I mean, in general, just the draw too is so powerful. Yeah. Because we have simplified the game state quite a lot by now. They are down to quite few cards and just Getting two cards for one now is really, really good for Marcello. That is actually the case with many of these games in Time Wizard formats. You have many cards that trade one for one. For example, Mind Control, Solemn Warning, or something like that. Players don't want to commit too much to the board if something like Dark Hole is not forbidden. So uh, you get simplified game states a lot, and then drawing two and reshuffling your resources helps. For sure it does. And I think he drew into more Karakuri monsters. Oh, yes, and once issue. again, the one that he really wants to see because it fetches out another Karakuri card from his deck. Oh, and, and now he can finally see his own deck. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, it is loaded. Imagine he had drawn a Cyber Dragon as well. Oh, there it is! There it is! There is Nizamu! I love this card so much. <laughs> Let's get it up again. It's not important here, but Nizamu is Maybe he's searching card. for it. He's, yeah. He has Quick in hand as oh, well. Quick is such a good card as well. I love Karakuri's, man. I'm impressed by us how, how well we know the names of Karakuri cards from 10 years ago, honestly. Same. <laughs> That's really cool. Look, he, also, Alberto going through his extra deck, we see Steals from Roach, and he's going with the Cuckoo we were just talking about. So quick uh, destroys monsters by battle and then special summon something, right? Yeah. Yep, yep. And I mean, it really depends now on how big the defense position oh, monster is. for Alberto is. <laughs> Let's see if Alberto knows his Worm Yagan. Marcello. Yeah, but the thing also is, <laughs> do, do we have a tuner on board if he would normal? Oh, Inishi is a tuner, but he doesn't, he, he doesn't have, have a normal summon anymore, right? Yeah. No, and he also does not have a level 6 uh, synchro. Oh, it would be level 6, never mind. Yeah. Oh, oh, he's trying! Wow! He's running into the warm cutter, which activates as a flip effect. What, something we don't something, see regularly right? anymore. And what is he going to search for now? He's considering the warm king. Oh, that was... Honestly, that was kind of foolish of Marcello to attack there with yeah, the Karakuri. Right, because it only has 500 attack points. Yeah, that's not really strong. And there is the dual terminal Warm Carteros being able to resolve the effect now. And also that actually helps Alberto in terms of life points, because yeah. he has to hurry up to get his life points straight here over Marcello. But uh, Marcello actually helped him with that. <laughs> Maybe Marcello doesn't want to play in the finals with Karakuri again. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Oh, and we are seeing another power card of the game. We are seeing Gen X ally Birdman, oh, wow. which is such an iconic card. This card upped the power level of many decks back in the day. But Alberto, please don't read your extra deck right now. You only have a minute left. You gotta hurry up. You have to find a way to seal this right now. Marcello will probably otherwise take this victory in a timeout scenario. One minute left to play. Birdman is being considered as well. He has Xex and Yagan on the field, and now Xex oh, is there almost is another one. Now he can mill immediately. Marcello reading up the card again because he has probably not seen it in the last 10 years. Maybe same 11. to be honest. Same to yeah. be honest. Oh, there is a heavy storm set for Marcello, by the oh. way. Oh, let's, let's get silent about it. <laughs> <laughs> Building also, up some tension. Worms always are, set, are an archetype to me that I specifically connect to Hidden Arsenal as a set. Yeah. Because they were first released in Hidden Arsenal. And I just, I feel like all of them have been released. And there, but there comes the Birdman by bouncing back the Zax. Oh, and let's see if there is a way for Alberto to take this back. And he is going to summon a Synchro Monster that I have never seen in my entire life. I know is it's German, it's Dry Arm, but Dry uh, Arm. Tri Arm or something. Uh, Tri Force. Tri Force it is. Okay, Tri Force. Let's check this card. Oh, this is a lot of text. <laughs> but I mean, it has 2,500 attack points. Good thing for Marcello. I think 
every Karakuri, if it is attacked, goes into defense position, so he should not be yeah. uh, facing any damage with this battle. But, oh, we see the clock has gone down, and by the looks of it... I think we're playing with the old time rule, maybe? I honestly don't know. I have no idea. But I, I don't think so. This will be for the judge to decide. Indeed, yeah. So, clock is down. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the judge just informed the players that we are now in timeout, and they will figure out how we're doing with this. How are we? They're looking through the graveyard. They're figuring out. Oh, wow, his drive was just reborning, right? Oh, wait, 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 it wait, wait, looks like it. It looks like it. Light once per turn, you can select one light monster and you give it special summon in face down in position. Face down deep oh, it's, position. It's the face down Ryo. Really strong, Alberto. Okay, really look, look, yeah, we're yeah. playing extra turns. We're playing extra turns. Very Fantastic. Cool. So, Marcello really sense. has we can't to. Have draws. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Marcello really has to find a way to deal with this now. Because yeah. otherwise, next turn, Genex Ali Triforce is just going to apply a lot of pressure. And on top of that, okay, first of all, let's heavy go with the Heavy Storm on the Dimensional Prison. That helps for sure but he needs to find a way to deal oh, there's Kuik over the Ryo over the Ryo he should have said something else Kuik can now special summon out I think it's just Inishi no he has Ninishi as well he can special summon the Ninishi and then he can go into the powerful Karakuri synchro monsters I want to hear from Marcello later whether he has ever played Karakuri himself or whether he just comes up with all the crazy stuff right there on the spot so it is, I'm pretty sure that Marcello has played this deck before. So, Bure is summoned to the field, maybe, probably. Looks like it. It is oh, sitting is there on top of his extra deck. Card with his weapon thingy in hand that I don't really know what it's it is. It's a character thing, you wouldn't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we're checking the graveyard again. Marcello. Maybe going for maybe Black we Rose. Also just go for Black, because, I mean, you don't really want to want him to special summon monsters from his GY all the time. So, But Bure can, as a quick effect... No, it's not a quick effect. No, no, it's absolutely not a quick effect. And I don't know whether he could get into more um, uh, Karakuri effects this turn, so maybe he cannot even capitalize he, he can, he on the Bure. He can special Bure. summon one from the deck when he summons Bure. Yes, true. And that should be able to use its effect, you're right. And then you can special summon the drawing monster from his deck and oh no the boring bro the drawing monster what Buraido. oh god this is this has been ages it absolutely has been what i'm interested in we are currently seeing one anti meta strategy with the worm deck versus a combo approach yeah. deck from Marcello. and i'm curious what we are going to get yeah. is there going to be another anti meta deck versus a meta deck Imagine. because i'm pretty sure that one of those has to be tangle plant right i'm quite oh, sure tangle know. plant is still in the pool May maybe it's not i don't know maybe it's gravekeeper versus tango uh, tg strike that could also be the case who knows who knows okay now we have nizamu on field my day has been made just now i'm so happy for you thank you and I appreciate that. He goes for the aggressive approach, which is interesting. Can he end this game right here, right now? Or is he going to give Alberto another turn? He can't end it. He attacked with Quick. Oh, you're right. He was in battle phase already. So why is he summoning so many monsters in attack position right because there? Because they changed to defense position when That's they get That's a attacked. pretty good point, my <laughs> friend. That's a good point. Oh, so and now it is Alberto's turn again. But this deck is not known for applying too much pressure. But maybe he can link away his two monsters and go into all creepers. I doubt that. <laughs> I, I doubt that, that for well. sure. We've been... Uh, we haven't had link monsters <gasps> being introduced to this just I yet. I think that Alberto has drawn... Honest. You're kidding. No, I've seen a ghost rare in his hand and I don't know what else it could be. If he has... On, I mean, still, those monsters will go into defense position. Same with Burai. Does Burai go into defense no. position? So that would be 2,500 points of damage, right? Yeah. Which would and be huge. That is, that is actually enough. I'm really bad at... That is enough. That is enough that indeed. Would be enough. Are we this going could to see be. the major upset? Alberto is trying not to smirk. Oh, he oh, oh, he's attacking over the Kuik, though. Oh, that was... I don't think he's going to have enough damage now. No, I Alberto. Don't think so <laughs> and now he can this is your last the, turn. the Xex into defense position with the strategist. Oh, oh, is he putting it into defense position when he was destroyed by battle? No, uh, the strategist that is being summoned, I will quickly get him up for you guys. Uh, Nishipachi uh, on summon uh, changes the position of monster. Oh, yeah. There it is. He's putting the Xax into defense position. And there's the handshake! Wow! 
And oh no, the Gen X ally is a darkness monster. That's why he couldn't <laughs> use Honest. And he didn't play Dark Honest. That's on him. Absolutely true. He should have gone with the Dark Honest, but he only had the normal Honest. And what a start to this little, nice, fun little section to our nice little September 2011 Time Wizard I hope tournament. We can continue these. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Marcello Barrio, uh, Barberio. Barberio, of course. <laughs> I, I wanted to say Il Bestio right after. Oh, yeah. He's going to be in the finals of this. And um, one of us will be facing him, but we're going to find out who's that going to be later on. Uh, we're still friends, right? Even if I beat sure. you, we're still friends, right? <laughs> sure, Basti. <laughs> sure we are. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. So um, what would you hope for as a deck? Because we are picking randomly right after this. I really love Agent Chaos oh. or even Monster Mash Agents. That was one of the coolest decks in history of Yu-Gi-Oh! Yeah. So I really hope I can get that. But I would be fine with anything, to be honest. Same, same, same. So I think we're going back over to the table, actually, to have a quick word from Ad. So head over there. What an exciting first game for this commentator mini tournament in the Time Wizard 2011 tournament. Guys, how does it feel so far? I mean, there was a clear winner there, but how do you feel? No, the match overall was great. Like playing uh, old format uh, brings back good memories, no? But uh, it was fun. Was that a deck you'd ever played before? No, not at all, honestly. Like I remember Worms back then playing against them, and this is the first time I played it. So it felt a little bit different, but Karaguri as well was yeah, one of these decks you used to play back then, uh, you know, a lot of Synchro Summons, uh, was a nice one. And Marcello, congratulations. So, how does it feel to win the first ever mini commentator semi-final? Amazing, probably the best achievement in Yu-Gi-Oh! in my <laughs> career, but yeah, it's, uh, no, it, it's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And what I was telling him is when I opened my hand, I thought it actually was Tengu, because uh, it was all spells and then the six card was the Katakuri and I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> this is where we are going, but yeah. I had a lot of fun, so I'm looking forward to commentating our German colleagues and then facing uh, the winner in the finals. Indeed, and we'll see which one of our commentators is going to be named Grandmaster of the entire Yu-Gi-Verse, which is apparently what we're giving the winner of this is the best title in all of Yu-Gi-Oh. Don't go anywhere, we've got plenty more feature matches coming up, and very shortly you'll see the next round of our mini commentator tournament. Don't go anywhere.
me to GX Midterm Paradox. In this class, there's just one rule. To make the grade, you first must do. Gather your friends, then clean their clocks. With four new decks, all in one box. Prove you're clever, like a fox. With Speed Tool GX Midterm Paradox. Available now. Over 100 cards per box. Each box sold separately. Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel, now available. Rated T for Teen.
Welcome back. We are now in the top cut of YCS Dortmund, the top 64. And as you guys know, it'll now go from top 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, and then the final. Very exciting. But to kick off our top 64, we have the following feature match in front of you. Hakan Yozgat versus Diego Ganzerli, the Italian champion and regular topper in YCS and other tournaments. This is going to be a very exciting way to kick off our top cut. Gentlemen, we're going to do a high roll to see who goes first. Who wants to roll the dice first? Diego, you're going to roll first. That is a nine. And that is a seven. So who wants to go first? Okay, Diego is going to be going first. So I'm going to hand you guys once again over to our Italian commentary duo who are going to take it away for this top 64 feature match. Guys, it's going to be very exciting. Thank you, Ed, and welcome to the top 64. We're finally here where it all matters. We are at the direct elimination phase, uh, and we are going to find out today, real soon, who the winner of YCS Dorman will be, and what a way to kick things off. Uh, if any of you watched our content in the past, you know Diego is now becoming uh, pretty used to the future match stage. Uh, of course, uh, the so-called flow wonder is God uh, had to represent again. Again, he won Italian national championship this year with Flowandries, which was his first ever top cut appearance, uh, and he has been on a roll. This guy is just unstoppable with Flowandries, and he has topped all events in a row: European Championship, and then back to back Utrecht, and now Dortmund. So he is just the <laughs> best Flowandries player, arguably around. And uh, when you were just witnessing him play, I think he plays the Dax to a level that no one else is at the moment. Uh, it seems as a very straightforward deck, uh, but the way he pilots it is just, uh, you know, il maestro <laughs> of the deck. So uh, on the other hand, though, Akan from France will play his best to stay in this match uh, with the most represented deck in Top Cut. Uh, later on, we will try to show you guys the deck breakdown for Top 64, but I can guarantee you Ishizu Tierleman basically around the 70 percent which is an insane number but maybe not as high as we could have expected yeah there are a lot of different decks actually in the top cut some of them we have already featured uh, this weekend such as madolce pendulums as yeah. well uh, there are a lot of spicy decks uh, issues with elements has been the most represented one still some of Flowandry's decks as well in the top cut which is very interesting and we will be seeing soon diego against Akan. I think our players are ready. Absolutely. So let's find out first and foremost who the winner of the match will be. Let's go to the table. And here they are, as mentioned, Diego on his flow under his deck, uh, adjusting it uh, after time and time again. Uh, but the usual cards are there, such as Dark Ruler, no more, a free off in the main deck. Uh, so an interesting choice, but he's also playing the Necro Valley, which we have seen from other decks. Winning the role is obviously super important. Let's see this. Uh, he gets the, to reveal the top three card, and the Robina is already there, which is great uh, stuff uh, from the Italian. We can basically see how Diego pretty much uh, um, has his lineup adjust uh, to the current format yep. his deck with some changes, as you mentioned, the Necro Valley being popular this weekend. Also, he's still holding on the Arpis Feather Duster in the main deck, yeah. which you've seen uh, in the last events. But as you can see on the screen, he's also playing a Metaverse, uh, which he hasn't done in the past at all. Uh, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, if we look at Akan deck uh, and, uh, for example, out to the Mystic Mine, uh, he's playing only the one copy of Artbeat in the main deck. Uh, so it's something to definitely pay attention to. But now we see the usual stuff from Diego. Great opening with the map plus Robina. And uh, in terms of interruption, uh, Isakan actually playing the Heralds in the main deck. Let's check this yeah. out. He is. So three Heralds, unfortunately, not really able to use them now. 
but maybe he will be able to later on uh, and uh, hear some finessing from Diego. He gets the statue. Great stuff. And I think it makes sense to be stick to the usual game plan from Diego, no? Like, you feel oh, sure. confident with a deck, Vondres is still very good. And here, once again, showing up strong. Uh, he actually goes for a different order than you would expect. Again, one of the reasons why Diego is so successful with the deck. Uh, he knows all the perfect interactions and how to play around cards. So what he's doing here is, uh, in case an herald comes down, he already has the statue on board. So if his opponent discards a Kelbeck or a, a Guido, then he cannot uh, really get punished by the element. Yeah. So it's uh, really, really well played by the Italian once again. Uh, just the, as I mentioned, the master, the master. of this deck. <laughs> so someone needs to stop him. <laughs> and I'm not sure that Akan will be the one to do it here, considering this impressive opening by Diego. Yeah, sets one, set two. And also activating this continuous spell. And now is. Wow, two face down cards. He might have uh, the metaverse yeah. I was, uh, you know, telling you guys about. Uh, of course, the, the one you should expect always is the Flow Wanderers and Dreaming Town. But outside of that, we'll see if he has an answer from Akan. This opening uh, is uh, really, really strong uh, and not easy to interact with. So let's see what Akan will try to do. He might even pick up his cards right away from my understanding. But now, yeah, yeah Akan has seen enough. Wow. Quick, quick game one. The opening was too strong from the Italian. And yeah, Diego. sometimes this is how it is. <laughs> Diego again going first, winning the title. Big, big deal. And he gets absolutely rewarded for it. Part of duality was essential there he picked up robina he really needed an engine card but with the map in hand to be fair any of the flow wanderers were good enough uh, and uh, yeah this was uh, almost uh, if you blinked uh, we might still be in the introduction for the match uh, no that's not the case diego is 1-0 already only one game away from advancing to top 32 so Huge start for this duel. Now, what do you think Akan is going to try and do to even the score going first? I mean, playing against Flo Wanderers has always been, I think, super difficult, especially because yep. there's not a specific side deck against the deck. I agree. Uh, looking at Hagan's side deck, I think like a very good one will be Forbidden Droplet. For sure. Because um, like, apart from that, there are not... Like, there are the... Some cars going when time is almost up, uh, not needed at the moment. Yeah, which also kind of surprised me, but it makes sense that he picked up his cars. He doesn't really have a way to push the game forward. But potentially, nine out of his uh, 15 cars are good against Flo Wanderers. Uh, them being uh, Droplet, as you mentioned, Dark Lure no more, and Twin Twisters. So all of these could come in. Of course, going first, they are slightly weaker. Yep. But like going second, they are really good. So if we ever go to game three, then uh, maybe Diego could be in trouble. On the end, instead, of course, already mentioned, he has Dark Lure, Mystic Mine, and Shifter, <sighs> which we, he tends I mean. to draw a little too much uh, <laughs> from what someone should usually do. But in the side deck, he has evenly matched. Uh, and also something from the past, uh, Dimensional Fissure, the one copy, which uh, honestly, I think it's a great addition, both going first and second. Yeah, we have seen some players also, also uh, playing Microcosmos, yep. which uh, back in the day was very popular as well. And I think it's a good interruption against the Chizoti elements. Also because Flowandries don't really need to play with the graveyard at all. No, I agree, and uh, it seems like that might uh, pay off. Uh, but as mentioned already, these guys are fighting for a spot in the top 32. It is already time for game two, so let's head back into the table. And here they are, Akan going first, uh, trying to set up his uh, tier element board uh, with maybe Stapelia in crime. Uh, so some tools that are better in this specific matchup. But let's see if uh, there is a shifter from Diego. 
and Merli is activated. No shifter from Diego, and these mills are actually really Ooh. strong from uh, Akan. Two names and the Mudora. Really good way to start things off in this game. Chu really needed that. Yeah, I think this is what you're really looking for, especially because, like, if Diego had the shifter here, would have been a lot of problems. Hopefully, for Akan, no shifter was activated, and now he gets to summon Kit Kalos. Uh, here, you can get a lot of different uh, cards uh, up for the crime, the art beat, which he plays one copy of. Uh, and of course, it just changes the dynamic significantly when you're up against a deck uh, such as Flowander is. Uh, and uh, let's see what his opening uh, will be, because uh, it's not obvious, you know, when you play against uh, such a unique deck. And I think also, given the percentages uh, of issues of the elements in the top cut, uh, you know that Flow Under is could be around, and uh, of course, it's, uh, maybe you will be more happy to pay <laughs> against a mirror match. Absolutely. But Diego is and here. To be fair, the as we will be able to show you guys uh, in the deck breakdown. Oh, we see as well a Kelbeck. So this opening is wow. really strong. And even Ooh, the Scream, the scream well. to set up a card. This is an insane opening by Akan. Absolutely great stuff uh, by the French player. Let's see if he searches for Crime or Suliak here. Both uh, devastating options. And it is the Crime. crime. Makes sense, uh, able to stop uh, even the evenly matched uh, or Dark Ruler, no more, uh, Mystic Mine, a lot of different options. Uh, and let's see these five mills as well. What is it gonna be? RP Feather Duster coming down from Diego, nothing too relevant outside of the same for Akan. Uh, which will have the option to shuffle back his own good cards, such as Perle Rhino and Twister, for example. That's also an option with these shufflers in uh, matchups, such as the Flow Under is one. But what I was saying is, when we will show you guys the deck breakdown, you'll be able to see that the team for these uh, top 64 is, as we predicted, join them or beat them. So either playing Ishizu tier or playing these decks uh, such as the one we have seen from Federico, from Dinka, from Erman, a lot of these uh, decks very different from each other, Madolce, Pendulum, uh, Naturia, all in top cut, uh, trying to our counter tier. So it's definitely going to be a long one. And I want to say that you might have some chances. Odds are with me this yeah, time. <laughs> this time you're not in a bad spot. So let's see. But now, as predicted, uh, we get to see why Diviner of the Herald is such a strong card in the deck. Uh, you can get it back with Elf, and then it guarantees a Baron as well as milling five more cards with the Agido. Great uh, start uh, by Akan. Nothing to say. And also, I think it would be relevant uh, if Diego would mill any of his uh, good cards uh, yeah, one of them uh, is obviously the statue. That's yeah. a one-off. Let's see what he mills. Uh, uh, another map. Uh, the Dreaming Town is relevant, uh, but it's actually potentially even good for Diego in the graveyard. Yeah. Uh, the rest, uh, nothing too relevant, really. While Akan has the option to use the Rhino, as well as, uh, of course, uh, shuffle back a couple of Twin Twisters uh, from his graveyard to the deck. And I think... Uh uh, we uh, didn't see any Dark Lurer no more being milled by Diego, which means he might be holding one. Yep. And also, uh, we saw an evilly matched being uh, sent to the graveyard, uh, which means uh, maybe Diego is holding one another. We will soon find out, still here, a very good stuff from Akan. Um, there's a reason why yeah. Shizu Tirlaments is the most represented one in the top cut. I think it is uh, one of the openings where we have seen the most cards getting sent to the graveyard. As you can see here, Kit Kalos was used to revive the Rhino. Then it milled five cards and then the Rhino sent the Shireen, the last name from the deck, to the graveyard. Uh, alongside uh, potentially the Suliak resolving and giving Akan a uh, Abnis maybe. Let's see which one he picks up. It's another Rhino. 
So now he has Baron uh, available to him uh, alongside Astapelia, for example, uh, which would be weak uh, to uh, the crime. So maybe he wants to end up uh, with uh, instead, uh, I would guess, uh, maybe another fusion because he needs a tier fusion for crime. So usually what you would go for is the Kaleido art, because uh, in this matchup, uh, Rul Kalos uh, might not be the best, I would say. But let's see. Yep, seems like uh, he's gonna resolve uh, and go for the Kaleido as expected. And you can see he sided the droplets as well, of course, uh, going uh, first. And yeah, here is Kaleido Heart, uh, nothing too surprising. Kaleido plus Baron, a strong opening with the crime on top. Uh, I really like uh, the chances here from Akan, but we have seen how unbothered Diego <laughs> appears to be. He has uh, fought back from even stronger openings than this. And without the Perle Rhino, actually, this is a big deal. Yeah. Because when you end with the Shuffers, you turn the Perle Rhino into another interruption. And not having opened it, uh, it's actually really bad for Akan. Because that's an auto Mystic Mine as well. We really have to see if Diego finds a way somehow to force uh, the Baron and the Crime. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but uh, we have seen very good stuff from him. Yeah, something we shouldn't forget about is that Diego milled the one copy of Dreaming Town, which is super relevant because if he gets to actually tribute summon a monster, then he can use the graveyard effect to turn Kaleido and Baron to face down position. But now maybe it will be shuffled back by Akan with this Mudora. Let's see if he even thinks about uh, that option or just uh, prioritizes his own card which I think uh, is debating uh, and he does yeah. so well played by Akan uh, recognizing the threat uh, from Dreaming Town it's also a really bad top deck uh, to give the Italian so might as well do it uh, and I think this is uh, a really nice recognition by the French player So he will set his crime and probably ends the turn with this board, which is really, really good if you ask me. And yeah, this is the opening. Does he have a second face down card? He is considering it, but maybe doesn't want to play into another evenly and he passes back. Tough field to fight back. Let's see what Diego will be able to do. It's not easy. Uh, no, for sure, you have two generic negations plus the Kaleido to deal with. Uh, so this is really not easy. Also, whenever the elf wants to activate on a Merli, you also get some meals. This duality, I think, will be ignored. Uh, we see an evenly matched picked up potentially, and it's right away chosen by the Italian. If he has another way to force out, you know, Baron or Crime, uh, this could be good. Otherwise, this would be and could be an almost as fast game as game one. And we might go to game three real soon. Let's see if the Italian can pull something up. He needs maybe Dark Ruler and Ooh. Prosperity is another nice way to continue. You always ignore this again. Because I think what you're really looking for here maybe is another copy of Evilly Matched and a Dark yeah, Ruler. I mean, that's yeah, <laughs> it's a, a lot it's of a stuff. Lot, it's a lot, but it's not impossible, especially by Diego, <laughs> who is usually <laughs> throwing above average hands. But to be fair, it's not just about getting lucky. It's about uh, really using the chances you're given. And I think Diego usually is able to just use those resources to his advantage and here we see dark ruler three dark rulers uh, from the prosperity alongside a mine i think he picks up one right away because basically the dark ruler forces out the crime because it's the only card you yep. can answer it to and then uh, yeah it's uh, gonna force uh, the french player to consider his option carefully yeah, I think this was really needed from Diego. He didn't have sure. one, and uh... so this uh, could be enough uh, from Diego. Let's see 
again whenever he wants to activate uh, this dark ruler then i can as actually the chance to go for a stapelia later on and now actually it is diego who instead gives the priority back to Akan, who wants to just mill five and uh, continue. I think uh, an interesting decision. He could have waited a little bit more here, but maybe wants to get rid of some cards from your opponent. Uh, let's see what he mills from the top. Uh, it's actually a pretty good meal, but it eats uh, the Dreaming Town once again. Ooh. But if I'm not mistaken, uh, the two copies of uh, the Ampen were milled. Yeah, I think uh, I think both of them. Yeah. And now again, uh, eating uh, even more. Uh, nothing too relevant here from the Italian. Will there be... Whew, it's all the names wow. from Akan, who is uh, overextending a little bit, though. You know there is an evenly matched and a dark ruler. If there is a way to force out this back row, you are in big trouble by overextending this much. Yeah. Of course, the double amp and uh, being sent to the graveyard, uh, uh, it's a thing. Uh, yeah, essentially, when you start things off like this, you can mill 20 cards, <laughs> which is a ridiculous amount. Half of your deck already in the graveyard. And as we were saying, not many decks are able to uh, continue playing with that many cards in the grave. But Akan uh, might not be interested in actually using his fusions. Let's see. Do you think he just forgo any of them? Wow! Ooh, so okay. Akan doesn't go for the tears and instead is hit by this Dark Ruler and he allows it! Uh, wow. wow! Okay. Dark Ruler resolves uh, surprisingly from uh, the French player who doesn't activate the crime and uh, pretty much uh, will be forced to do it on the evenly. Uh, really interesting uh, decision here from Akan. Would you have activated on the Dark Ruler instead? Yeah. I think so, and I am also really intrigued by the decision of using the Elf there if you then don't want a Fusion Summon. I am uh, honestly a little bit confused by that. Uh, not gonna lie, but let's see if uh, Diego will now use his chance. Uh, an option he has is maybe to go for a three plus uh, then the Tukan to get back the Empen this way around. So now, as we mentioned, Kikalos comes down. We might see uh, Stapelia, for example. That could be an easy way out of this game. But again, really risky, I, I have to say. Like, if you negate the Dark Ruler, I guess you don't force out the Battle Face right away, but... You are not even forced to use the elf. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, like he intentionally wanted to mill ten if that was possible, but then he forgo any of his uh, tier activations, uh, which makes me really question this play from Akan. And now he, he actually goes uh, for an Abnis. Wow. Yeah, um, this is definitely unusual lines from Akan who might want to play the long run instead of shutting his opponent out. But I think Diego is happy about uh, the outcome of this. Yeah, uh, yeah because like seeing how things uh, started, uh, they were looking very bad for Diego. Uh, and yeah, here we see the Mystic Mine coming down from the Italian. Wow. Yeah, so he will not be able to negate it anyhow. But yeah, evenly matched, Dark Ruler no more, and Mystic Mine. We said you should never take out Diego of the equation. He has what it takes with this deck to fight any kind of opening, and he just drew a really strong end when he will be able to use this three as expected and then the Tukan, which is the combo I was telling you guys about. So now he gains uh, some life points, uh, and with this 3 plus the Tukan, uh, he's essentially able to shut everything from his opponent and set up the Ampen. Yep. 
So he banishes the amp and gets it back uh, afterwards with the Tukan. Uh, and this is just uh, some teaching uh, masterclass uh, of Flow Wanderers uh, from uh, the Italian uh, uh, player. He's gonna check uh, his graveyard uh, to see if he has any effects. And as mentioned, now the Dreaming Town will activate, putting every single monster face down from Akan. What a turnaround. Well played by Diego, really. Once again, showing off uh, why he is this good with the deck. Uh, and now Akan has to find a solution. He even forgo to add. Uh, uh, Arbit yeah. with the Kid Kalos, which I think made a lot of sense, uh, and now he needs to pick up and out this Mystic Mine that's extremely annoying for him. Now I can really needs to find. Uh, okay, he had the air bit. Uh, still, uh, we have to give credit to Diego for the way he tried. He's trying his best to remain inside um, this game, which I think again started incredibly well. Absolutely, with all these skills, absolutely, uh, great stuff. Uh, and here, as you can see, uh, Akan just. Uh, being reminded that, that his effects are shut off from the Ampen. And now Akan is flipping his monsters up, uh, trying to find his way to go into a game three. But as you mentioned, never. Never easy. And are you actually surprised that he's playing uh, two copies of Kid Kalos? We haven't seen that. Yeah, usually. All weekend. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, usually now now it's it's become uh, more popular to play only one. Looks like he's more familiar uh, and playing with two copies, uh, which yeah. sometimes it can come up. Although I have to say, most of the times uh, one is more than enough. Still. Impressive field from a gun. Yeah, but once again, uh, we just see how good of a player Diego is. Uh, but this time with the art beat uh, that's being the MVP, it's obviously going to be an upfield battle. Let's see what he can do to stay in this game. Uh, art beat being, uh, I want to say, the most popular option as out Mystic Mine in the main deck for the tier deck. Uh, makes sense. It's searchable. Uh, it's also recyclable with the Mudora and Keldo, so it's uh, paying off uh, a lot, uh, and it's also not destroying the card. So we had seen some players using the beat cop combo, and as it doesn't destroy, it's also able to play around those. But yeah, now it seems uh, like uh, uh, the Ampen will activate its effect uh, that maybe Akan uh, forgot about. Uh, I don't necessarily know about that but okay now we get to see some uh, action resolving uh, Ampen of course known for the shutting down effect but we had seen plenty of time Diego using the other effect uh, which is uh, that if it battles an opponent monster you can banish one card from your hand uh, and essentially it has halving the opponent attack so still not over yet. And yeah, now the play will continue potentially in main phase two. Uh, and it seems as once again Diego was uh, trying his best to stay in this, but uh, I think might be a little too much uh, for the Italian uh, to fight back, uh, but never underestimate uh, uh, Diego, really don't. And I think he can actually summon back uh, one of the shifters if he wants, uh, and I think uh, Diego has seen enough, uh, so we are going to game three. 
What a match already, as we were saying, uh, top 64. Both of these guys playing for a chance to advance to the top 32 and claim the YCS title later on today. But Diego, again, really showing why you should not underestimate the Flowanderis deck was uh, almost uh, you know at a pinch from uh, clutching uh, an incredible chuo but at the very end uh, the one art bit uh, which wasn't searched uh, by akan was already in the end uh, and it shuts down the mystic mine giving him the win so now the score is even uh, one to one still plenty of time in the round but it will be diego going first uh, and what a side deck he has for going first uh, just go through it I mean, he's playing, as you mentioned, the Dimensional Fisher, which is yeah. amazing, along with the Arpis Featherstorm and Three Solemn Judgment. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's <laughs> just uh, a little too much, if you ask me. Arpi Featherstorm, an incredible card. We have seen a player like Emre deciding to side it alongside Trap Trick. Instead, Diego prioritized Solemn Judgment, and I think this will be a huge decision because, as we were seeing from Akan, he has in his side the cards such as Dark Ruler and Droplet and Twisters, which are all really yeah. good cards, but they all involve, in some ways, discarding another card, the Droplet and Twister, so Solemn Judgment is at least a plus one, and I think that would be the great great decision so i think if i had to guess this will come down to two things whether diego will play an opening and open playable because yeah. we know sometimes this deck can be bricky i've never seen diego brick with it i think but it can definitely happen and on the other end we shouldn't forget about a car we have yet not seen which is Herald of the orange light yeah that makes a difference honestly. because if he picks it up with a Kelbeck or an Aguido, and he plays five copies in total, you can start milling during your opponent on turn. So maybe that can be enough. Without further ado, though, our players are basically ready. So let's find out who will be the winner of the top 64 in the game three. And here they are for one of these players. This will be the last five cards they pick up for YCS Dormund. Let's see who will take it. Honestly, could really go either way. I like both players' chances. And let's see, first and foremost, if Diego opens a playable and going first with his deck. A lot of consistency cards and a lot of pot cards and prosperity. The best way to guarantee a flow under is Robina going first. I think we might be scared. Diego didn't have a single shifter throughout all the games. Yeah, beginnings. honestly, yeah. not a single shifter. Diego, <laughs> you. <laughs> what's going on? And here he has Ooh. both options, uh, Robina or Necrovalle, of course, uh, if he feels like it. But he picked up the duality. duality. Wow. Picking up the duality means he already has a playable end and he wants to prioritize maybe the RP Feather Storm or Solemn Judgment. And he does eat the Solemn Judgment, so that uh, should be his pick. Maybe the map as well could be a really good one uh, to play around the Herald of the Orange Light. Uh, that is my main consideration, but let's see what Diego decides to do. He obviously knows this deck way better than us. Not even gonna lie. Uh, this is tough, actually. Yeah. This is very tough. It's either one of the stage or the judgment, honestly. Because like, if he, did, if he doesn't want to... Yeah. yeah. That okay. was my guess. He already has a playable and He picks up the Solemn Judgment just in case uh, his opponent has one of those pesky going second cards. But now there is no protection from the Herald. So if there is an Herald of the Orange Light from Akan, this could be trouble. But there is the map. What a hand from Diego. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah, this is just a huge opening from the Italian. Nothing to say. Yeah. Gonna just banish the Robina, and this guarantees that there is a way to play around the Herald, which still can be quite annoying, I'm not gonna lie, but at least a little bit less than this. And 
The Tukan is also a really nice way because now you cannot really herald uh, the activation of either of the two. But there is an herald plus the Agido. So Ooh. let's see. I don't really necessarily like the ordering here from Akan, but let's see this five mils. Uh, it doesn't hit a single card with it. Oh no, there are no relevant mils from uh, Akan. But he might get an Avnis, which then gets him three more mils. I think that's the play here. Wow. Yeah. Something you don't really see often. Uh, he didn't mill any any Shizu cards or Tillman cards. Yeah. Still, the Herald with the Agido, uh, the one you were mentioning earlier, were there. But to be fair, the statue is a huge deal. Diego sending the statue from the top of the deck is absolutely brutal. So if it's true that it wasn't the best meal for Akan, it was definitely a really bad meal for Diego here. You can see him not happy with the situation. And now Akan has to get an Avnis for sure. So at the end of the day, the Herald is still paying off significantly for the French player. And he does get yeah. the Avnis, so let's see if this Avnis will actually mill something relevant. Uh, at the moment, uh, Diego will try his best to activate his Tukan, uh, and Akan, having a little bit of a fall here, will allow it to go through. And now we'll see, I would guess, uh, of course, as you usually would, the Eglen to get the Ampen, but the statue, obviously, was Yeah, a the big statue deal. hurts a lot. Yeah, yeah. Because then he milled the Dreaming Town again, right? I think so. Yeah. Also, the Dreaming Town is bad, really yeah. bad in the graveyard, you know? So, really unfortunate. Basically, all of the one offs, even the continue. And uh, this is why we get uh, a very unusual play here by Diego, once again showing why he's this good uh, with the deck. Uh, sending is three. But let's see if there is a response here from his opponent. Uh, Where do you activate this Avnis? Uh, I think you might as well yeah. do it here. What do you think? Yeah, I think you should be activating it here. Um, I think Akan is considering it. Uh, will make sense. Yeah, I think Akan has to... Oh, and he has oh, another yes, Herald! Another wow! Another Herald! Wow! That's crazy. Two Heralds might be the only way to stop... Uh, Diego, but now the game state is extremely simplified and solemn judgment is huge. I think uh, Diego is still in a really good spot uh, and uh, if he solemn judgments uh, the field spell uh, right now, I wouldn't even hate it uh, if I'm being honest with you. So definitely interesting uh, stuff uh, from uh, uh, Akan. Because Abnis felt like it could have been a safer pick to be fair. Yeah. And I think he, Diego is allowing Yeah, the... I think uh, we might see the Solemn Judgment uh, here. Yeah. And it does. Uh, solemn Judgment coming down from Diego to shut the Perle Rhino. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, and now if he has a normal summon, he has a second copy. Wow. Wow. And there is a handshake uh, right away. What a brutal way to go. It took a lot of effort to take down Diego. Let's go to the post-match discussion. What a match, honestly, and what a brutal way for Diego to go. We were mentioning <laughs> how good of a Flawandris player he is. Uh, he proved it throughout the entire match. Uh, but how can you really blame him? Uh, lost to two Herald, uh, so four fairies from the end, which is already almost impossible. And then double Perle Rhino against the Solemn. Wow. That was real, tr literally, I think, brutal. Uh, yeah. I mean, Diego fought with all his energies. I think also in game three, his end was good because, like, basically, reveal out of Power of Prosperity and took the duality, which yeah. means he, was, he had a lot of things going on. The statue was, of course, like being sent to the graveyard, hurt a lot. 
But then I think I can with the double herald and double pearl rain. I mean, it's uh, it's really not that kind of end where you can complain too much uh, about what happened. Uh, there was obviously the decision to pick up the solemn from Diego, uh, which uh, I cannot really blame because when you open with both map and the flow under his engine, you play around one inch up easily, uh, and he played around one of the herald yeah. as if it didn't happen. Uh, he was also really unlucky with the mills, which we gotta admit, because he was forced to go for a three since he milled both, uh, and not just both, but three important cars, uh, which were the uh, statue and then both the continue and the dreaming town. So that was, of course, really unfortunate for Diego. But we got to give uh, credits where credit is due. And Akan just uh, performed really well. In game one, he understood the situation and scooped up right away. Didn't even play a single card. And in game two, he just uh, proved that even though his opponent went for Dark Ruler, evenly matched, and Mystic Mine, which is, uh, I mean, a combo that I think uh, every <laughs> single tier loses to, by just setting up a good enough field with crime and searching the art bit, uh, or rather having it, otherwise he would have gone for it. He was guaranteed protection against it. He had the out to the Mystic Mine, uh, and he was able to win game two. And in game three, uh, I mean, it is what it is. Yeah, I mean, I feel sorry for Diego, but uh, honestly, I mean, I think uh, he, he did well. Also, this event, like topping uh, yeah. four events in a row, I mean, very it's, good stuff it's a lot him. it's a lot of stuff uh, you already won one event this year which was the italian national championship so you gotta give uh, uh, some titles to the other players i guess but congratulations to akan but without leaving you guys uh, we are now able to show you the top 64 for this event so let's bring it up on the screen and this is the list of name the first half already what a list of accomplished players uh, we can already Already see Esala, Chris LeBlanc, and Jesse Cotton all over from USA and Canada representing well. But again, Samir Bakar, European champion, Ericos Beck, Joshua Smith. I have, the list is just incredible. Zio Mandri, Federico Megozzi, Dean Kampfan. It's like how many of these players have already won an event. Even Dean Kabui with his Naturia deck made it to the top 64. Vladis, another, of course, great player and on the other side let's continue to the other half of the top cut uh, for you again <laughs> so many good names Diego which we just saw Gabriel Susi again another really good player and European champion uh, and you have uh, Emery which we saw on stream uh, Simon a lot of these guys uh, PL which we witnessed on stream on the bubble match uh, and again even Andrea so many good players on this list uh, so it's not much better than you can ask for a top 64 at this level and if I'm curious about something is a couple of things I gotta say one when we will show you the deck breakdown if uh, if uh, Alberto is powerful enough uh, to defeat uh, Ishizu Tears with this curse. Uh, and if one of these crazy Naturia, Madolce or Pendulum deck uh, might be able to make it at least to the finals, uh, I'm rooting for them for sure. But this was a pleasure to be with you for the top 64. We will be back soon with the top 32. But before we do that, uh, let's hear it from uh, Ed and the winner of top 64, Akan. Thank you, Marcello. Yes, I am here with Hakan, who's just won our top 64 feature match, now straight into the top 32. Congratulations. Are you feeling pretty good now that you've already made it into the next level of top cut? Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Glad to hear it. So let's talk a little bit about the plays that went on. Game one, Diego played that barrier statue of the Stormwind, and you just decided to scoop. What made you go straight into scooping from there? Uh, maybe he doesn't know my deck, so I didn't want to give the information. And also, I had nothing to do with uh, his build. OK, so it was just keeping the cards close to the chest and then getting straight into that game two, which then game two, you built a very reasonable field. You had Baron, Elf, you set the crime as well. There was the pop prosperity from Diego where he showed Mystic Mine and dark, three Dark Ruler no more. So that was quite revealing for you. What was going through your mind when you saw those cards? Uh, I didn't know if, uh, if he has uh, two Evenly or one. So that's why I did uh, Diviner to mill. Then I saw the second uh, Evenly on the graveyard, 
I knew he had only one, and then I kept uh, heartbeats to uh, in case of Mystic Mind. And then that was exactly what you did, because then there was the heartbeat to get rid of Mystic Mind, and then that led to a scoop. You got that next game, so then it was one apiece. We got into game three. You had a bit of a difficult mill hitting no tier cards. So when that happens, what's going through your mind? How do you deal with that in a game? Uh, I'm still confident because I have the second Herald. He doesn't know. It doesn't happen often. But uh, I know he already did uh, his extra normal. So if I Herald there, he cannot go furthermore. And I did top uh, the field spell and throw farming. So I knew he was going to solemn. I was looking on the top. And second uh, field was a good game. That was great, watching that moment. The crowd, I don't know how much you guys can hear with the headphones on. The crowd was going nuts with the solemn strain to the second field spell. And that was just, the handshake came out. You had it. Congratulations. That was a really, really exciting game to watch. Best of luck in the top 32. Your first feature match getting in there. So we'll be seeing what happens in that top 32 cut. But don't go anywhere because we're going to have more content for you before we come in to our top 32 feature match. Don't go anywhere. YCS Dortmund coverage still going. Welcome back to this, your mini commentator tournament, live from YCS Dortmund 2022. You've seen Marcello take the first round of this mini tournament, and now it's time for our wonderful German commentator team to have their 1v1 here. Remember, this is the Time Wizard 2011 format, best of one, 15 minutes on the clock. So two out of the four decks have been selected by our Italian team. Marcello has won that. So whoever wins this out of Sebastian and Leonard will be facing Marcello in the grand final to become the grand master of the Yu-Gi-Verse or whatever kind of title we've made up that has the word Yu-Gi-Verse in it. So gentlemen, I'd like to see a high roll to see who's going to be going first and then we'll be rolling to see which deck you're playing. That's an 11. That's a strong start for Leonard. Okay, that's, that's not, not looking good. <laughs> okay, so you're going to be going first, but now we need you to roll odd or even to pick one of these. That's odd, that's even. So let's see which one you get. That's even. So we have our deck selected. So that means Sebastian and Leonard are going to be dueling with this. Remember, they are not allowed to look at their cards. They have no idea what they're playing until they get their first hand. So I'm going to hand you guys over to the players of our previous round, Marcello and Alberto. Guys, take it away for this second round. And thank you, Ed, and welcome to round two of our mini tournament. As Ed uh, was saying, we are having a little bit of fun uh, here, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll soon find out who the best uh, player in the yu gi is. Uh, probably not, to be fair, but <laughs> we'll try our best. And uh, as we were saying, uh, of course, uh, we'll see which decks are remaining, which are both interesting for all of you watching, and especially for me, because I got to face the winner. So let's see what they are dealt with. Uh, I think Leonard with an 11, uh, just like you, of course, uh, is gonna go first. But let's see if that will not matter this time uh, or if it will. So let's go to the table. And here they are, ready to start this game one. So let's take a look at the decks. Uh, Okay, Leonard is having a, a little bit of uh, a laugh. Let's see. A lot of different decks uh, yeah. in this time wizard format. Uh, we oh, are so salt, yeah, salt beast. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one. Uh, we could be seeing, uh, yeah. Yeah, he has a 
I think the Dragon Ravine stuff. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, I think the deck should be with Dragon Ravine wow. inside. Uh, and also he has the weak condition. Like if you activate and resolve yep. the assault mold, activate. That's uh, huge. Yeah. So basically, this is a synchro turbo deck, maybe, and he does cards of consonants. <laughs> what a start! <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's yeah, a it, tough deck to upstart. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, I mean, I think if he wins and you go and face it, it's not gonna be easy. Huh? Not, not looking good for me. <laughs> Indeed, terraforming. Oh I my. think he's going to research Drango Ravine now. Let's see if yeah, he has it. This yeah. deck seems uh, a little too strong uh, going first, as you can see, Leonard <laughs> having a laugh. Uh, but of course, you gotta figure out uh, what to do. Uh, I do have some memories of this kind of deck back in the day, but essentially, as you mentioned, the idea is going uh, into some Dragoonity plays, uh -huh. which involves, as I will show up for you on the screen, uh, a synchro level play that's usually the Vajarana, mm -hmm. which turns into Stardust, yeah. and then uh, the one and only, the big boy, Stardust uh, Assault Mode, which uh, could be the key card in the deck, I'm afraid. Yeah, El Dioros, that were local. Eh, si, uh... el, el Dioros. <laughs> eh. one, another Upsir wow. Goblin, I mean, Every single one of us has uh, played Upster Goblin uh, in their first uh, turn. So, I mean, kind of Leonard uh, started, yeah, and now with... Uh, yeah. Now we see Phalanx uh, coming back and uh, probably going into Vajarana, as mentioned, uh, into Stardust and Stardust Dragon Assault Mode. Uh, and yeah, good start uh, by Leonard, uh, not really taking his time. He already knows the Dragonity a little bit, it seems. Uh, and, Here it comes. Uh, yeah. Start things off, uh, turboing uh, through. Maybe it's a little too strong. Uh, we'll see how this goes. And uh, Sebastian on 10,000 life points will try his best. Uh, let's find out what deck uh, his opponent is playing. Duality. And okay. duality already. <laughs> so interesting uh, dimensional prison. Ooh, and it's gadget. gadget. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> gadget. Nice. Uh, I love gadgets. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I love it. I really would have liked to have it. So regardless, it's a close one. Of course, yeah. uh, uh, it's quite annoying to deal with it, but I think, funny enough, uh, you can keep the Stardust. You don't need to go into the Assault Mode one. Because no, now, especially, it's not yeah. easy to play against gadgets because basically they play a lot of trap cards. Yeah. And I think this is what we're going to see soon. This is a tough one. Indeed. Oh, wow. Look at this opening. Three sack cards. Uh, and Leonard goes for it. Uh, interesting. I'm not sure if uh, this will be the correct line. You can wait. Uh, pretty much uh, turns the trap card into a plus one. Yeah. I mean, you can either wait or, uh, I mean, you can put pressure on your opponent, yeah. especially because like it's it's very difficult to get rid of this. This is uh, very wow. tough. Oh, and it's the heavy <laughs> storm off the top from Leonard. <laughs> this could be a quick one. Sebastian shaking his head, and no, oh, he does not have an answer. What an opening by Leonard. This could be a really, really quick one. Wow. I mean, yeah. Leonard having to discard a card for Dragon Raven. He still hasn't discarded a card. I'm sure our judge will pick it up on it. But yeah, he goes into the Vajrana and we'll continue on with a Synchro 8 play. And yeah, he's, uh, he's thinking about it because there is a second effect which essentially allows you to double the attack, I'm pretty sure. But let's see. I'll bring it up for you. Reborn. Oh, and Master Reborn! Uh, this is <laughs> absolutely insane. And uh, this doubles the attack of Ayarana, and this is enough uh, to seal the game. Uh, but if it wasn't for the Upstart Goblins, so. Yeah. Sebastian on 10,000 will be able to stay alive because this is uh, 8,800 damage, I think. Uh, or how big is the assault? Is it uh, 3,000 three, maybe? Three, 3k. Yeah, yeah, then 93. So 700 yeah. left for Sebastian. Uh, 
who has a really a tough time here figuring it out, uh, but yeah, you can see him shaking his head. Uh, it seems like Leonard opening was way, way too much. Uh, in here, a single green gadget uh, will do. Luckily for us, Leonard still had a couple cars up his sleeve, so it didn't matter all that much. But yeah, Leonard uh, in a controlling fashion. I'm scared, man. No, of course. I mean, give uh... me some tips. <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> Oh, but here oh, is a machine okay. fortress, uh, close one. At least they will be able to trade for the Stardust and put some pressure. I mean, for sure, Leonard started with uh, like the nuts. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. But also, Master Reborn, heavy store. Insane, like insane it was insane and, hand, honestly. And here, yeah, he can uh, potentially crush uh, yeah, and uh, crush. force, uh, or he can uh, just have a plus one attacking over the Raven. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he's debating. Uh, okay, in the end, last second, he just attacks over. Uh, and uh, you can see here the gadget uh, really is a weak point, but two face down cards. So Sebastian will try his best to stay in the game. Uh, again, uh, Leonard uh, might activate the Raven, but as to discard uh, a card uh, from previous turn as well. Uh, Now it's going to get very tough, especially because, like Sebastian, uh, I mean, he has to set cars, but uh, uh, here, like with double uh, double starters on the field, uh, it's getting very, very difficult indeed. I mean, this was the best star ever, honestly, because like uh, not only putting up uh, the starters on the field with the drop card itself is uh, honestly amazing, and uh, the deck itself is working out pretty well. I mean, uh, if I were Marcello. That would be very, very difficult to be playing against this deck next round. Uh, only left with 700 life points. Now he's going to activate another Dragon Ravine. Uh... And yeah. Now, after uh, a little bit of time, Sebastian picks it up uh, and the Zephyros as wow. well. Wow. Yeah, now Leonard is just discarding the car he didn't discard it the previous turn with yeah. Ravine. So they're yeah. just fixing uh, the, g the game. Is <laughs> <laughs> you can see Leonard <laughs> smiling at the camera. They've now just fixed the effects of the Raven. He will try his best, but Mirror Force gets flipped. Uh, Stardust will negate it. Is there another response? And there is the handshake. Uh, it is Leonard who takes the game and the match and advances to the finals. Uh, what a match. I'm scared. I wow. feel sorry for Sebastian, but wow. I think I feel even more sorry for you. For me, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Guys, send some help. What can I even do? I'll try my best. Just as a reminder, now we have been playing uh, 2011 September, actually, Time Wizard. And uh, now the finals uh, is set up. It will be Alberto and Sebastian doing the commentary for the final match between me and Leonard. Uh, but I seriously need some help <laughs> <laughs> if this is the opening from Leo. I don't know what can I do. Uh, I will uh, try my best to, to stay in this uh, and claim the title. Worst case scenario, I'm still the best Italian <laughs> at the tournament. So that's good enough for me. But yeah, without further ado, I think we can go back to Ed and our German team. Well, who saw that coming? An intense and swift decisive victory there for Leonard. So that means the final is going to be Leonard versus Marcello. Very exciting. Basti, let's talk a little bit about that. He took quite a devastating hit earlier that if it weren't for that 10,000 life points, probably would have knocked you down. How are you feeling? Yeah, he's an expert in this format for a reason, I would say. So uh, shout outs to him. He's definitely the better player and the heavy storm definitely hit me quite hard there, I have to say. It was the heaviest of storms, but commiserations, you fought valiantly. But I come over to you, Leonard. You dominated that round in your swift, decisive victory. How did that feel? And are you feeling confident about the next round, the final? So now that I have learned that you also have to discard a card if you want to add a Dragoonity monster, I don't feel that the deck is as good as I initially thought. However, I think that this is a really strong combo and Stardust Dragon Assault Mode is such a great card. 
Well, we'll see how it fares against Marcello in the final round. You'll be seeing that final very shortly, but don't go anywhere. We've got plenty more content and feature matches coming right up. But you'll be seeing who decides the final match and who gets crowned the Grand Master of the Yu-Gi-Verse very soon. Don't go anywhere. Four-player duels. Cross dual fields. Cross dual monsters.
Plus Dual Spells. Plus Dual Traps. Plus Dual Teams. Cross Dual Strategy. Cross Duel Fun! Cross Duel! Cross Duel for everyone! Cross Duel for the world! Friend or foe, four duelists cross wits. A new era of dueling, four player card battles. Cross Duel. Duelist face off on a crisscrossed battlefield. Summon monsters and set spell and trap cards to defeat your opponents. Simple, beginner friendly rules for any duelist. Will you work together or claw your own way to victory? Optimize your strategy in real time. Class with fellow duelists in a battle like never before. Yu-Gi-Oh! Cross Duel. Disappeared out of here. It was time to pay my dues. Never guessed that you'd be dressed in my clothes and in my shoes. Thought you were so dumb. You had it all under control. Now enough is enough. Gonna take back what you stole. Keep it up, cause now I'm back. Going in. Big brother, you're here, you're here.
Welcome back to the coverage of YCS Dortmund 2022. And we have another deck profile right here. And it's a deck that has gotten support very lately. And I'm here with Philip. How are you feeling, Philip? Yeah, I'm feeling quite good. I'm happy to present my deck, Naturia. It's a beautiful deck. It's a pretty old archetype, but it's gotten really, really good support. And I think it makes sense to speak about the new cards that were just released in Darkwing Blast. So go ahead, take it away. What's the first card you have for us? So a very important card we have in the new format is Naturia Carmelia. Carmelia itself is very good because it has three different effects, which makes it a starter card. It gives you the, uh, it gives you extenders, so it extends your combo, and it's, uh, it even gives you follow-up for the next turns, which makes the card pretty strong. Because on summon, you can just dump a card from your deck to the graveyard, and then you can search a card by the effect of Naturia Sacred Tree. Sacred Tree is really good because Sacred Tree is actually a card that profits off of your opponent sometimes because we know that Ishizu cards are a big thing in this meta game. And when your opponent is milling Sacred Trees for you, that's kind of nice, right? Yeah, it's a very good thing. I mean, it is not even once per turn, so you can even search multiple Naturia cards from your deck directly. That's really, really neat. So, good starter and extender basically does multiple things for the deck. Really cool. What's the next card you have for us? So, the next card, which is also a new card from Darkwing Blast, is Naturia Mole Cricket. Mole Cricket itself is very strong because it can, it can summon any Naturia monster from your deck to the field. And if your, if your opponent controls the monster with the highest attack on the board, you can even special summon two Naturia monsters from your deck. That is a pretty strong start. Just uh, for every archetype, that would be a pretty big boost, and it is very, very much so a big boost for Naturia. And also, it works together with Camellia, right? Because you could technically mill cards from Camellia instead, right? Yeah, the good thing is that, like, like I said, Carmelia itself as an extender has the effect that if you would tribute a Naturia monster, you can instead just send the top two cards of your deck to the graveyard, meaning you just get a free monster on the board. Pretty nice, pretty nice. So uh, there are more effects though for Mole Cricket, right? Yeah, Mole Cricket itself has another very interesting effect, because if you special summon a Naturia Synchro monster from your extra deck, or your opponent special summons any monster from his extra deck, you can just special summon Naturia Mole Cricket from the graveyard. <laughs> there it is again, that sounds pretty good. So Mole Cricket really the main extender you have now, right? Mole Cricket is just getting you more and more and get it, gets you fodder for Synchro summons. So uh, it's not a tuner, but it will be synchroed away very often, right? Yeah, the good thing is that Carmelia, in fact, is a tuner. And you might wonder now how you would get like two monsters on the board, which is because you only have one normal summon. Yeah. But there is another card from Darkwing Blast, which is, which is Naturia Blessing. Naturia Blessing has three effects, where, one, where, where the first one is the most important one, because Naturia Blessing is a quick spell card, which lets you special summon any Naturia monster from your hand or graveyard. The other two effects are that you could uh, Synchro Summon or Fusion Summon a monster in your opponent's turn or in your turn instead of a Special Summoning effect. But the first one is in fact the most important one. And there's also one big clause missing that a lot of other cards have. Blessing actually is not once per turn, right? It is not once per turn, but still it even doesn't requ require you to just Special Summon a Naturia monster from your extra deck. You just have to use a Naturia monster as Synchro material, but you can Special Summon any Synchro monster. That's really good. So the Synchro part of the deck, Synchro Engine, really, really got powered up by Naturia Blessing being released. Uh, but I know that there's one other card that usually is going to end up on the end board of the Naturia decks right now, right? And I, I see it right here, so let's talk about the last card. Yeah, the last card is pretty, uh, is pretty interesting because it is, in fact, a very old card. It is, it is Naturia Sunflower. And Sunflower itself has a very simple effect. You can just tribute, some, uh, tribute itself and another monster, Naturia monster to negate a mon uh, an opponent's monster effect. And this effect also is not once per turn, meaning as long as you can uh, let your Naturia Sunflower stay on a field, as example, by the effect of Carmelia. That's what I was thinking, because you don't even have to tribute monsters when you have Carmelia, so you're just milling cards and you're negating with Sunflower, right? Yeah, that's in fact a good strategy and you can even revive it with Naturia Blessing in your opponent's turn. That's really, really strong. I really see where this is going. So this looks like a pretty cool deck. What do you think is the biggest strength this deck has? What is the main selling point for it? Why would you play this? So a very big advantage of the deck nowadays is that you have like a very easy access to strong synchro monsters like Naturia Beast or Naturia Barkeon against trap matchups which already are very good boss monsters itself. But you can even like access other Synchro monsters as well, and you have a very good follow-up for the deck, which many decks nowadays potentially are lacking in. That's really, really true. And also what I really like is 
But all those cards are Earth cards. So Bestials, which are also a big thing right now, don't really work with this deck, deck right? right? Yeah, that's in fact true because like you have like closely only Earth monsters itself. So like all Bestials are in fact not very useful in a matchup. Yeah. Well, that almost sounds too good. What would you say is the biggest downside this deck has? What is maybe the side deck card you're feeling the most when you bring this deck into competition? Um, so there are a few things like Naturia itself is a deck which has to interact with, your, with the graveyard, yeah. meaning that cards like Dimension Shifter are very strong against the deck. Also cards like Carmelia, like I said, how strong it is with three different effects. One effect Veiler, a very old card, can negate all of them. Yeah. I do understand. Luckily, though, Effect Veiler isn't that popular right now, so maybe this is really a good pick for the event. And let's talk about the event in specific now. What would you personally say, as a Naturia fan, as a Naturia enthusiast, how many Naturia decks are we going to see in Top 64? So we know that there is big competition nowadays, so it is hard to tell how many it will do, but I believe in two to three players which might be able to take the deck to the top. Maybe even more than just top 64. Let's hope so. I can't wait to see Naturia in the featured match area. And that's why we're, uh, why we're going right back to the featured match table. Let's go back to live coverage of YCS Dortmund. Join Elemental Hero Neos for new adventures in Yu-Gi-Oh! Power of the Elements. New heroes, new strategies, new enemies, 100 new cards. Yu-Gi-Oh! Power of the Elements. Nine cards per pack, each pack sold separately.
The most important part of these YCS tournaments are you, the players. So we took to the hall to ask some of our YCS Dortmund duelists some very important questions. So how far did you have to travel to come here today? Uh, we come from Saint-Étienne, so we travelled about 10 uh, hours. So we are a bit tired this evening, but that's OK. That was, uh, we came for, uh, by car, and uh, so that's OK. I'm from Eastern Germany. We travelled like four hours to come here. Four. Four. Like this. <laughs> yeah. Like 80 kilometers. It's half an hour with a train. Uh, three and a half hours. Where did you come from? Uh, Luxembourg. Actually, it's uh, quite funny. I live in Bochum. It's a uh, close town from here. It took me only 15 minutes to, to travel here. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm from Italy originally. What deck do you think is going to top the event this weekend? I think uh, everybody expects uh, Thierry Chizu to, to be the most uh, representative deck uh, for this event, of course. I hope a lot of Florandri's decks tops because there are a lot of people in our locals that play the deck. And I think also Ishizu Tier will top a lot. Yeah. I personally hope uh, Mermail because I really like that match and uh, I like uh, the cards. But uh, I think Ishizu Tira have quite a relevant spot uh, today. I'm pretty sure it's Ishizu Tira, but I hope for a surprise. Probably the Tira Ishizu, which is the obvious choice. What would so, you like to see, Tom? Uh, Mermail, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> What decks are you afraid of coming up against this weekend? No one. Uh, I'm just here to have fun, so I'm not afraid. I just want to have fun, and that's it. I stopped playing till the COVID time was, and I really hope I don't face any decks that were released in the COVID time, because I need to read every card that was there. And I'm really, um, I'm really sad that I read, must read every card I really don't like to read. <laughs> yeah. I think there's only one deck in this current format, and it's Ishizu Tier, so... I think everyone else agrees me on that. So Ishizu Tier is another really strong deck, but also uh, Flanda or Flu is uh, pretty scary because you either lose or win. So there's nothing in between. <laughs> oh, the mind decks. And Flander maybe. But I think I got that covered. So we'll see. What is your favorite card in Yu-Gi-Oh? Uh, today I think it's Mystic Mind because it, I love when people become salty. <laughs> um, I think it's totally awesome. I really enjoy the decks you can play with the card like Paleozoic or now the Sprite deck. I, I really like the card. I personally think uh, Mermela Abyss Megalo because it's my favorite card. I started playing with it when I was smaller and yeah. Penguin Soldier. Why? Because it's a penguin. <laughs> and finally, what is your favorite memory from your time playing Yu-Gi-Oh? Uh, training with Pierre and his family. It's my favorite uh, moments uh, of, about Yu-Gi-Oh story. I remember when I was a kid uh, on the beach and we used to play with our cards in the sand and uh, we just buried the cards under the sand to hide them from each other. So sometimes when you come back in the evening, you pick up the card and you have a free card, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's from 2017, I think. I was at the, um, at the Nationals in Germany and I dropped X, uh, X3, <laughs> but uh, I managed to get top eight at the me uh, Mega Regional. Basically, every time I go to an event, where I see all my friends, it's a really good time, so I think every time uh, I travel. Um, I think a memory that is um, this weekend, one of my friends can't come over, so we made a special choice. We make a pillow of him, and um, to, to greet all the people, we, uh, we, want, we want to take photos over the whole weekend to make photos with, with him in the pillow, that it's like you, you are right, we were there. There's, no, there's a proof, there's a lot of pictures with you, and that's why we made the pillow. That's very sweet, so he's here with you in spirit. Yeah, he's here in my heart. Yeah. <laughs>
and also Alexander Schmidt. So this is going to be a very exciting duel. So gentlemen, can we do a dice roll to do a high roll to see who is going to go first? Eddie's going to be going first with a six. And that is a two. So who's going to go first? Eddie's going to be going first. Right, I'll hand you over to the wonderful German commentator team. Sebastian, Leonard, take it away for this top 32. Thank you very much, Ed. We are thrilled to feature our first featured match in the Top Cut oh, yes. this weekend. Eddie is a really well-known player in Germany. Second place at the German National Championships yep. in 2019. We featured him in that. He didn't have the best finals there, but maybe he yeah. comes back to finals this tournament and gets his revenge and, and finally gets yeah. his victory. He has been topping a absolutely. lot of events in the meantime. For real, absolutely wonderful. And he plays where it's a really interesting deck, but I don't want to give it away just yet. I would say let's first of all look at all the decks that actually made it to yeah. top 64. So let's have a look at the top cut breakdown of decks. Yes. You see the magical number 71% Ishizu Tielemans. Honestly, a little bit less than I expected. It's a lot, don't get me wrong, but I thought it would be even more than that. Yeah, 71% is really good. I mean, we are in a top 64 cut. Yes, indeed. So there are some more rogue decks slipping in at some point. Uh, we have Luanda Reese as the second most represented deck. 6% sprite is not a lot. And this also includes sprite tier elements. So Which maybe should be Chris LeBlanc, right? Because Chris LeBlanc, he yeah, is playing a couple playing of sprite cards. A few sprite so cards, So I think yes. that might even also belong to the She's a Tier yeah. category in some way. And we see 3% Runic. I'm pretty sure that is uh, actually going to be that Runic Mind strategy, which yeah. we also had on stream in our last round featured match for the Swiss rounds. And then we see 3% Madolce. And I can tell you 3% that actually equals 2. <laughs> and we had two in top 64. We're still having two players of the Madolce gang here in top 32. And one of them I can already spoil you, we're going to see here in this featured match. But let's also talk about the last decks. So Draco Slayer, 2%. If 3% is 2, then we have 1.5 Pendulum decks Indeed. because they are monsters and half spells. No, Absolutely. it is one Draco Slayer, one Naturi Runic who lost in yep. top 64. Dinkabui Draco Slayer sadly won. out of it. Yeah. Yep. Mekotzi, we have already seen him on the featured match. And then we have one Mystic Mine Burn who we, we have also already featured. Yep, I, I think, think he also yeah. lost in top 64 though. But there's still a couple of really cool decks in this tournament. One we have for this top 32 featured match now. So let's get over to the table and see what it is. There we go, game number one. Etienne Ita, one of the players who looks the coolest in the field. You could say he is the Vata of UBO players. <laughs> Definitely one of the most stylish dudes in here, and he also was stylish enough to win the die roll, going first here in this very important top 32 match. And as you can see, Alexander Schmidt on the bottom is bringing his Medolce deck, and he is really facing the matchup that he wants to see. Because this Medolce deck only is this popular in this tournament because it has a pretty favorable matchup yeah. versus the Ishizu Tillemans deck. So I think he would be happy to see it right here. But I don't know whether he's too happy about Etienne opening it up with Tillemans Scream and Instant Fusion right after. That is basically the best thing you can have. You can chain block the Kid Colors. However, you cannot oh. escape infinite impermanence with a chain block. Indeed, a card that wasn't super popular lately. How is he going to do with the free most though? Near That's Harold and a Merli. Merli at the end, though. So Merli can be activated. I don't think there are any further interruptions in the hand of Alexander, but this impermanent is really going to do a lot here. You know what is really interesting about the list of Alexander? He, as we see, decided to play infinite impermanence, but he completely disregarded all the bestials. He's not oh. playing a single bestial, and I think besides the Floanderies players we still have left in competition, he might be one of the only ones not running bestials, to be honest. So we have another Medolce player in the field, Herman Hansen, and he is running so many different yes. bestials. I have seen him play in the last round. Absolutely. And, I mean, Herman is paired versus Floanderies this round, so I think he would rather want to go without bestials as well. Yep, absolutely. 
So let's see where Etienne is getting here. He is bringing out Mudora with the fusion effect of Murley. Mudragon. Mudragon. Oh, <laughs> almost the same. Both level four. Oh, but not a whole lot more after that. Etienne sets one card, and it looks like this might be it for the turn. He's considering his X Ray options for a last time, but I could see him pass right here. No. He's oh, and Kid Colos gets destroyed because of the instant fusion you're in right, the end phase. And right. now we get to mill oh five more. Triple Mudora, Herald, and an Agido. And Agido can also activate the effect. We mill Sun League, Havnis, Rhino Heart, and another Havnis. So now we finally got to mill a card that he can use. And his end board will look a little bit better. Indeed it will. We saw Alexander pair his Medolches up with the... Venusils, we saw Venusils of the Missing Seedlings would have been his top deck, but it was milled by the effect of Akido there. Duckies, as I like to call it. Absolutely. So what we know now is that there is a Sullic in the GY for ATN, which means that most likely, because most players have cut the second Sullic, there is a crime or something else on the back row of ATN. So yeah. it will probably not be Sullic. You don't have to really play around that. I will tell you something though, Etienne Ita is not one of the persons cutting the second Salik, oh, really? and he is onto Salik, so it might still very well be Salik set there. Is he him. running a crime? He's also running crime, yeah. Okay, he's running good. three traps in total, absolutely. Would have surprised me, to be honest. Yeah. And he's also, um, yeah, I mean, it could also be a bluff. I mean, there could be triple tactic talents, but why would you not activate it? So it's rather unlikely. Really good point here. So. Oh, wait, how would he activate it? Oh, there were no monster Oh, it was impermanence. It could have played around that triple tactic talents, potentially. But first of all, we're going to see Kaleido oh, Heart coming down for it. Kaleido Heart honestly really smells like another Salik. Yep, most likely being Salik. Oh, but look at that first card that Alexander Schmidt has there in his hand, and it's got Shira Fenrir. We haven't seen a whole lot of this card from Darkwing Blast yet in this tournament, but Alexander included three copies of it into his main deck, and now he instantly starts his turn off with it. Kashira Fenrir is a highly anticipated card, and it has found its way into not too many main decks, but I think we are going to see more of this in the future. Absolutely. The Kashira archetype will get even more support in the future, and then Fenrir will be an absolute and staple. And we are going to go for Scream, and we are hitting double Merli, and I think now Reinhardt can just shuffle away the Fenrir. That could happen right here, but let's see. So he is triggering the Merli, and he's also triggering yeah. the Kaleidohard to shuffle away the Fenrir just before it could even activate this effect. So there's not just another one to replace it in the hand of Alexander Schmidt. So first thread gone for Eddie, and now he can fusion summon. I think he can actually even go for a roll colors, which is really strong against the Vernus Sylph engine because some of, or all of them want to special summon a monster with their discard effect. Yep, so, so it always negate would be a pretty good trade, trading two cards of your opponent yeah. for just one negate effect, and there it is, exactly. So Elements of Rule Colors hitting the board. It's going good for Eddie right now, even though we thought this end board of uh, Mudring, or the end phase board of Mudring. But there is another Kashtira wow. Fenrir already in the hand of Alexander, so the shuffle back wasn't that important. He had another one, anyways. It's coming back to the field, and just in case you don't know what this powerful card does, it could, on the attack declaration or when your opponent activates a monster effect, then banish one card oh, on the opponent's side he face is down. going to crime it. This is really good. I thought that Fenrir could only be summoned once this way, but this is that not, is not the clause on Fenrir. So we are shuffling back another Fenrir for Eddie. He is going to discard a Shiren, and this turn he can only, if he resolves the Shiren, of course he, he is does, going to. For sure. Does he play Dragstopelia, by the way? Some people have decided to cut it already. I will happily no, answer you, and it. there is a Dragstopelia in his extra deck, yes. There's also Time Thief Redo in his extra deck. So he definitely decided so on a couple of more options. Another Kid Colors, he is probably going to add some follow-up for him. And he is, yeah, he searched for, I think, Rhino Heart. And with the last effect that he can trigger, like, if he uses Roll Colors, he can summon back, or he can send away the Kaleido Heart, then activate the effect of Kaleido Heart, summon it back, and then Ooh. mill the Harveness to go into Dragostopelia. With but Andre, there the now is the first Vernusilp effect. It is the Vernusilp of the Awakening Forest. And we saw Eugen Hyde in his feature match also always opening the one-off. And it's the same for Alexander Schmidt. This is the Vernusilp you're only playing one copy of, and still you're always going to open it, apparently. And now the Agido effect kind of hurts Eddie because 
he has Mudoras. We have pl he has plenty of Mudoras oh, in yep. his GY. So he could actually use this effect if there were no cards, or two cards now, in the GY of Alexander. He could use the effect to just shuffle them back, which doesn't really work versus... Oh, but he does, as you Ooh. anticipated, yeah. trigger the rule colors, and which... now we are Triggers scooping. Alexander's scoop. He says <laughs> we cannot win this game one anymore. Etienne Ita is taking game number one over Alexander Schmidt and brings him one step closer to top 16. This was a really strong performance by Eddie. Highly, or just anticipating, okay, this Kid Colossus is going to be destroyed in the end phase, yeah. and I'm probably going to get something off of it. I have the crime set, I have my scream. If he tries to do something, I just get another three mils. And then Absolutely. he hit Agido, he got the Kaleido hard to his field, and this one was so crucial. I think in this particular situation, summoning out Kid Colors with instant fusion is actually even better than normal summoning it, or like <laughs> summon it on its normal sure. way. Because sure, destroying it in end phase when it got imprint was actually insane value for yeah. him. It was actually a very good thing. Otherwise, it would have just been sitting around there doing nothing. But with this moment, he was actually able to keep on fusion summoning. Kid Kalos is the best card to imperm. Of course, you are also playing around triple tactic talents with the impermanence. However, if it is summoned by instant fusion... Not really, yeah, not yeah. I good. know what you mean. But I actually really... Uh, anticipate one card that Alexander Schmidt is bringing in from his side deck. We haven't seen this at all this weekend, but I've heard a lot of people actually talking about this card prior to the event. And it is Silent Graveyard. And this is basically Dweller, this dweller as a quick spell. Yeah, without legs indeed, yeah. So this is just, uh, you can activate it as a quick spell in your opponent's turn. You could, if you want, even activate it on your turn one, yep. because Thielman decks tend to do stuff on your turn as well. And therefore, you could prevent it over there already if you start two, for example. But uh, this could just prevent a lot of play from his opponent, Etienne Ita, here. And he might very well be able to then capitalize on yep. that, performing his own combo, summon some of his power former Dolce Exceed monsters. That could definitely be the way to go. And looking through his side deck a little bit more, I see one very cool counter trap we yep. haven't seen at all for the whole tournament. I mean, of course, because it's a Modolce counter trap, who else would play it except Modolce players? But it's Modolce Knights. And yep. what do you think about Modolce Knights? It's kind of critical, We isn't have it? had a little discussion yeah. about this before, and Knights only can be activated if you have no cards in your graveyard. So there is a problem. As soon as Kelbeck and Agido activate their effects to mill five cards, you are going to have monsters in your graveyard. Yeah, I'll well, correct you. It's only no monsters, but still, you, you oh, got to yeah, get no, no monsters, monsters into your yes. graveyard uh, anyway. So I mean, it's, it's definitely It's the thing with most of the Modolce cards, like... Yeah, uh, the, yeah, the, the yeah, Tiaramasu, sure. that was the thing I was going Yeah, for. absolutely, it's 100% the same. So, it will be interesting to see whether even sides in Magidolcian Knights versus this matchup, because it's really dangerous, as we were just saying. Yeah. You can't really bank on it being the game winner immediately. And uh, I think we're going to find out very shortly what yeah. is going to be the game winner here in our Game 2 of Top 32. Players are ready, we are as well. So, back into the action we go, Top 32, Game Number 2. Also, one very interesting question, uh, not question, but something... Ask me anything. Yeah. What do you think about Grave Digger's Trap Hole? Because I wanted to say one very interesting card we saw being milled from Alexander Schmidt in Game 1 was Grave Digger's Trap Hole. And you just don't play this card on, alone, uh, on its own. You will always pair it up with Trap Tricks Raflasia to search out the Grave Digger's Trap Hole. How do you like it? This card is basically a called by the Grave. Somewhat is, but do you know what's really harsh Ooh, for Alexander Schmidt setting here? Setting two cards and passing. Eddie must love this because Madolce does not work like tier elements. You can't really do all your plays in your opponent's turn. You don't have the Madolce halfness that special summons out half your deck, extra deck. Oh, but there the is the silent, silent graveyard. graveyard for Alexander Schmidt. We were talking about it. Oh, but he also has Orange Light plus Caldo in hand. That could also be good. That is true, and now he does not have the Caldo in hand anymore. But he has double orange light, so it could still work out. What are we milling? We are milling the Salik. So that Salik cannot trigger after the Silent Graveyard resolving. And I don't think Etienne is going to do a whole lot here at all. Maybe he goes for some kind of next seed play when he has access to another level 4 monster. But besides that, he's not going to resolve any fusion effects here, so... I would think he's going to keep it very simple here. 
as his opponent did, to be fair, because his opponent just uh, also passed on two back row cards. But oh, he's not keeping it oh, simple. He goes for, for the back to back fusion, instant fusion. I think he's not going to summon out Kid Colossus. He might actually summon out Kid Colossus to get the plus one off of the summon effect. But he could also go for Mud Dragon and go for a rank four exceeds, which yeah, could true. be Time Thief Redoer, which I have seen him play. Nice he does play it. He does play it for sure. So he is looking through his extra deck. Oh, that was Kid Carlos. <laughs> Look, he's, yeah, considering. he's considering. He, he yeah. doesn't know yet. He doesn't know yet. Do I take the plus one from Kid Carlos or do I just go for a rank four instead? I he's mean, really going through it. Redula would be really strong because he can actually activate the effect on the opponent's turn, call I detach monsters and then trigger Shiren in his own GY. But that would heavily play into the orange light in the hand of Alexander and Schmidt. And the Keldo. <laughs> and the Keldo as well, you're right. The Keldo as well. So he goes with yeah. the Kid Carlos and, and there's the impermanence again. again from Alexander Schmidt. He's Eddie opened up the instant fusion back-to-back -back games, yeah. and now Alexander Schmidt also opened up something back-to-back. -back. How do you like the decision to keep infinite impermanence in this matchup going first? I like it. I mean, it is really good versus Kid Kalos, especially when you have Silent Graveyard at your opponent. Oh. Called by the Grave on Keldo is really interesting because it also disables your own Keldo, and now he is normal summoning Kelbeck. That is indeed true. <laughs> we go for a attack. bunch of damage. You cannot attack with Kid Colossus in case you were wondering why he did not instant fusion. So he's, you he's from just going that. to lose out on the Kid Colossus completely, right? Or is he going to link it away? I would assume he's not. He's probably rather going I, into the Redwell line that you were anticipating. He's just yeah. going to leave the Kid Colossus to itself. He is going for the Time Thief Redoer, and he will be able to attach a card from the opponent's deck in the standby phase. This is not going to be heralded because you could otherwise chain the Banish effect. So, oh, I think that was another spell card being picked up, and it's another another, another Silent oh Graveyard for so I, Alexander. I keep on saying Forbidden Graveyard. I know it's not forbidden. <laughs> so, standby phase, Time Thief yeah. Redoer, that's fine. Another monster coming. Oh. He wants to activate the effect to banish it. Wait, 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 Eddie, just slow down. <laughs> Let oh, your no. opponent respond. Oh, he's just oh. going to Silent Graveyard the effect. But he already activated... Wait, when did he do it? Because once the effect is activated, you cannot successfully chain the gravity. He should have heralded this, I'm pretty sure of that. So there's the Angeli now, still on top of the deck, but now coming underneath the Time Thief Redoer. Life points for Alexandra are going down and down and down. Only 4,700 before this attack, but Redoer doing even more damage to the life points now. Oh, and Eddie is going for a Zoo Slam, which makes a lot of sense. I think that he also has maybe a Sullyk set, so he can actually trigger this. And now we're going to see Werner oh. Silve Duckies. <laughs> Vanusil of the Misting Ceilings being activated, discarding the last monster card. I think this was the reason why he wanted to keep the monster yeah. in the hand over the spell card, because every Vernusil top deck is then able to do something at least. So he's resolving the Vernusil of the Misting Ceilings, can now search for any Earth Fairy in his deck and afterwards even reborn one monster from the graveyard. Look, he searches for the Angeli. It's so strong that Vernusil and Madolce work so well together that you can just search out Angeli here. It's so, so good. Now the Vernusov of the Misty Seedlings is summoned to the defense position. I cannot imagine that Alexander is going to play out the Angeli here. I think he's just looking for a defensive option because one Zeus effect would just get rid of everything and then you don't have any plays at all. Yeah, but the thing is, Etienne can still use the Zeus effect on his opponent on his own turn then. Yeah. Oh, oh but there is, is the Angeli and, and there can, can be only, only one. be one now. What? That is a really rough time for Alexander <laughs> Schmidt. We are clearing the rest of the board here. Etienne Ita having Zeus still on board with Alexander Schmidt being on 2,300 life points. So this is a pretty good scenario for him. Oh, what is happening now? I thought there's nothing happening anymore for Alexander, but... Angeli has to be destroyed to be sent to the deck, if that is even the case for Angeli. He's just going to attack, and we have the game. Eddie advances to top 16 of the YCS Dortmund.
What a game. We wanted to showcase you how good Madolce is versus the best matchup it can get versus the deck <sighs> that is preparing for. But Etienne Ita just swiftly won 2 0, even versus that, that was matchup. A really quick win and a really decisive one. Absolutely. Eddie really playing out his heart there in the first turn getting the five mils in the end phase because the instant fusion destroyed the kid colors that was imperm negated absolutely double imperm both games for alexander and double instant fusion Don't wasn't enough that. absolutely when you compare those two cards opening them for I'd both players i will go with instant fusion every day of the week as well so we have our first contestant for top 16 already ready being etienne ita and we gotta say we lost quite a few germans in top yep. 64. we were going through the tables and German lost, German lost, German lost. A lot of the Italians actually were successful, I yeah. saw that. Also, I gotta say, we still have Americans left in the tournament. Yeah. So uh, I've heard we actually have the pairings for top 32 ready. So why don't we look into it to see who's still left in the tournament? There we have them, top 32. Up there we have Vincenzo versus Vlad Vladis Baranovskis. And let me tell you something, shout outs to you who are who was first up the Swiss yeah. in Utrecht, again first up the Swiss here in Dortmund. Undefeated and then twice. Going, uh, going 10 0, or no, 12 0 both times, and then getting paired up versus Vladis Baranovskis, who just took him out in top 64. So Vladis being still in. Absolutely. Then we have uh, Pierluigi Sorrentini versus Jordan Gallagher right after. Another British player performing Jordan very, very Gallagher strong. Gallagher is a machine. He oh, has yes. just been topping and topping and topping lately. He is topping them all. Then we have Vincenzo versus Elia. As I told you, a lot of Italians actually yeah. are still in. So maybe and this time <laughs> the Italians are coming for us. Vincenzo is named Vincenzo Flu, but he's not playing Flu on Ruiz, I can tell you that much. <laughs> yeah, but maybe the Italians are coming for us this time, yeah. because the Germans won in Utrecht, and the British yeah. people in the hands of Marcus Patel won Euros, so maybe this time it is finally time for the Italians to take one YCS again. Don't rule out the French players. Absolutely, well. they are also still in competition. Then up there, see, we still have the chance that we have a back-to-back -back European YCS champion, Joshua Schmidt, still yeah. in top 32, now facing Tiziano Vinci up there. Another Italian player. Yeah, and then we have Stiliadis versus Fabio Padovani. Yeah. No, it sounds like Stiliadis sounds Greek. Yes, absolutely. He's probably Greek. Against another Italian player. Then we have Nico Temla versus Enzo Duval. And then Kostadin versus Dennis Hager. So you see a couple of Germans still in, yeah. but the number is drastically drastically reduced. There we have him, Jesse Cotton. This guy cannot say to cannot say that he would go back to back because this guy actually would go back to back to back on second places. Yeah. <laughs> this guy was second in Niagara Falls. He was second and passed Dina just last week, but maybe he can go further this week here in Dortmund. And the winner of that match is going to play versus the winner of Erikos Beck versus Anthony Lopez, two bigger names in the community as well. This is going to be such an exciting match for sure and the next oh. pairing is also crazy we see gabriel susi former european champion versus pascal keem of course engage into engage into engage pascal keem he won it all with sky I strikers <laughs> yeah with sky strikers uh, 2019 in london and then up there we have christopher leblanc still in and then also our match we just had yeah. alexander schmidt versus etienne ita so, Christopher LeBlanc, I mean, he won Minneapolis not too long ago, and he's that now a four-time YCS champion, so that yeah, would be pretty cool absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Then we have Federico Mecozzi, who is running the Draco Slayer Pendulum, last man standing oh, yeah. for this deck. And we have Herman Hansen on Madolce versus Mario Argiro on Flu Wanderies. Indeed he is. Yep. But we have a very clear winner for our top 32 featured match, and he's ready for his winner interview. So, at please ask Eddie all the questions. <laughs> Thank you, Basti. Yes, I am joined by Eddie, who's just won the top 32 feature match. Congratulations, you've made it quite far already. How are you feeling? I'm actually feeling so great right now. Like, this is my hometown and I really want to take it far, so, yeah. I'm happy. It's pretty cool, going to be taking, possibly taking home the hometown crown. That might be a cool thing to have. We'll see what happens in the next coming matches. So you were just talking to me before we came on camera about this matchup, that you were slightly worried about it when you went in. Talk to us a bit about that. I mean, this matchup can be quite difficult. Um, they have like, they play the Ishizu package as well, so it's really hard for me if they go first uh, to play with my graveyard effects. So it kind of, I was a bit scared of it, plus I've only played the matchup once. So I, I was just a bit iffy about it, but like, um, I think if we didn't break game two, um, it might have been quite the interesting match still. Yeah. 
Well, lucky for you, he did. But let's go through the two quick games because this might be one of the quickest ever feature matches that we had. It was about 16 minutes, which is actually pretty good. So you could, you could take that home at the very least. So game one, yeah, the instant fusion was hit by the imperm, so a slightly dodgy start, but pretty good because you still managed to build a very good field with great extensions. And then Alexander scooped. So in that initial moment when your instant fusion gets hit, what are you thinking? How are you thinking, right, how do I deal with this? So my thought process at that point was I could either try to keep on playing, um, but I have the counter trap already, so I definitely have plays on his turn. So I actually just decided, like, it was a bit of a dodgy situation because I knew he was playing the deck, so I obviously didn't want to discard the Kelvec that I had in hand for the counter trap. So I couldn't normal summon the Sheeran. So actually I had to hit with the... Um, with the mill of Kit Kalos, I had to hit one of the names, otherwise my end board is just um, the Mud Dragon Pass. But I, I took the chance and it worked out, so that was pretty, pretty chill. Pretty chill indeed. It did work out for you. And then in game two, like you said, seemed like he kind of bricked, wasn't able to establish a field. You were playing very considered with every move. You got that Zeus on the field and that was just it. So when you realized that he didn't have anything, again, how were you trying to stay composed in those moments? Um, I mean, for me, it was really just trying to not lose my cool, trying to not make a mistake now out of, like, well, sheer stupidity, basically. So I was just focused on what's the optimal line for me still here? Um, what, what, what do I want to, how do I want to play this out to have, like, maximum? Because I also had the, there can only be one, so I knew that I'm kind of safe, so I just needed to go for a small play and have it as a backup. Excellent. Well, congratulations again. Are you feeling confident for these final few matches? I mean... I'm feeling confident I haven't lost any matches today so far. I lost uh, round three and round nine yesterday. Um, both were due to my misplays, so as long as I play well, I think I can make it pretty far. Well, you were, like we said, you were super composed throughout a pressure-filled kind of situation. Being put on the feature match is a lot of pressure for a lot of people, but you were able to keep your calm, you managed to play each thing that you needed to, and you won two games to zero. So it's clearly going to go well for you. I hope the rest of this tournament goes well for you. We might be seeing you again on that feature stage if the rest of these matches do go well. But stick around, guys. This is going to be a very exciting top 16 from here on out. And it's going to be a great YCS Dortmund. Don't go anywhere. We've got the next match coming very soon. But before that, probably another quiz. Stick around.
And here we are. So I promised a quiz, and this is indeed that quiz. So you guys saw what happened between Leonard and Sebastian earlier. This is the specialist quiz where each of our commentators have picked a selection of five different archetypes where there will be two questions each. Let's just quickly review the archetypes you guys have picked. Marcello, you have Zodiac, Necroz, Sky Striker, True Draco, and Paleozoic. Alberto, you too have Paleozoic, Necroz, Spiral, True Draco, Lightsworn, and Wind Up. Does this sound right to both of you, at least? Yes? Good. So, what I want to do is I want to do a quick rock, paper, scissors to see which of you is going to be going first. Okay? Right, ready? One, two, three, go. Okay, Marcello, you are going to be going first. Are you ready, sir? Oh, good shake of the hand. I suppose it is a competition at the end of the day. Once we know what happens, the next quiz we do, we're going to be revealing the scores to each of the competitors because the Germans know their score, but the Italians don't. So therefore, they won't know where they rank in the standings just yet. How exciting is this? We get to have a thrilling time coming up with our own mini competitions here while the main event still goes on. This is exciting stuff. Let's start with your questions, Marcello. Your first question on Zodiac. Name all 12 of the Zodiac Monsters. <laughs> okay, so, um, so Rat Pier. No, I'll go from the extra deck. Borbo, Amerkong, Tiger Mortar, Dryden't, uh, Broadbull, Chakanine. Um, so then we go to the monster, I already said Rat Pier, Whiptail, Thoroughblade, uh, uh, Ram Ram. Uh, then uh, uh, Bunny Blast, uh, uh, and uh, the last one, uh, right? I named 11, if I'm correct. Uh, no. <laughs> no, the last one. It's a monster, I know. Oh, my God, no. This was a tough question, to be fair. All 10 in one go. Uh, yeah, I, I remember the last one is a monster as well, but I, I, I think I, yeah. I give up on the last, yeah. Cataroost. Yeah. It was a good job, though. You got, I think, almost all of them there. That was 11. Did you say Dryden't? Yeah. Okay, then, yeah, that was 11. My so, point. not bad. So, unfortunately, no point there. But we move on to your next Zodiac one. Which Zodiac monster appears in Zodiac Barrage? Okay. Well, there's, sorry, there's more than one. Which monsters, I should say, appear in Zodiac Barrage? Um, I think... Uh, Broadbull and uh, I think it's free. Broadbull, I, I'll say just Broadbull, Borbo, and Dryden. It's incorrect, I'm afraid. We've got Borbo, Ram Ram, and Bunny Blast all appear on Zodiac Barrage. These are quite tough questions when you're put on the spot. Trust me, some of the people in the chat are like, these are easy. Not when you're put on the spot, they're not. Your brain forgets everything about Yu Gi Oh when you're in these situations, especially with a camera and lights in front of you and my microphone in your face. So we move on to the next question. Question three Marcello, your Necroz question. Name the Necroz monster with the highest level. Um, okay, so I know the highest attack is Necroz Sophia, so I'm, I think. Uh, I'm thinking between Necro Sophia and Necro Zara um, Baseir. Um, it should be Sophia still, so I'm going for Sophia. Or, yeah. Correct! Okay, that's your first point. So there you go. You got your Zodiacs not quite right, but you got your Necros bang on so far. Now it's time for your second Necros question. What colors are Shurit strategist of the Necros eyes? Ooh. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> I'll just go with the uh, hope that it matches the original monster, so some uh, sweet blue eyes. It's two colors. Okay. Uh, <laughs> blue, and then a little bit of uh, yellow. Just. I'm afraid it's red and blue, so no point there on your necros. You got one of them. But now we move on to Sky Striker. Which three-digit code appears in the background of Sky Striker Mobilize Engage? <laughs> okay. Um, wow. Uh, <laughs> um, let's go with uh, some binary, I don't know, zero, 010, zero, just for the sake of it. You were frighteningly close. It's zero, zero, zero. 
So you were two digits out of three. I will say there were two of these questions for the Germans, and these are hard questions because it's background detail that you almost don't notice. So well done for getting two out of three there. Do we move on to you? Absolutely, but don't worry. There's still plenty more chance. By the way, you've got to keep score for Marcello. So at the moment, you've got one point. Is that right? Okay, one point. So your next question. Name three Sky Striker quick play spell cards. Okay, so I'll name Widow Anchor, Shark Cannon, and Eagle Booster. Yep, those are correct. I just had to double check there against my answers. That is three of them. So congrats, that's your second point. So two for Marcello there. Now we move on to your true Draco questions. Okay. Are you feeling confident? Yes. Okay, slightly longer question here. What are the three effects of true Draco heritage? Okay, so um, the one effect is that you can gain an additional uh, uh, summon, so an additional tribute summon in the turn. The other one is when this card is offered as tribute, so sent to the graveyard essentially by a card effect, you can destroy a spell and trap on the field. And the third is you can draw cards up to the number of different, uh, so spell, trap, monster that were sent to the graveyard this turn for true Drakers. That is correct. Okay, so that's three points for you. True Draco is quite your strong point here, so we'll give you another True Draco question. Name the first booster pack in which you would find Ignis Heat, the True Draco Warrior card, in the TCG. Now that is quite a difficult one. Do you think you know, though? <laughs> Not really. I gotta say that was. Uh, it's kind of my weakness, uh, if I have to be honest. Uh, um, so I'm thinking about it because so we got Zodiac and then it was pretty much the... I'm trying to think of the... No, but I, I really cannot. Uh, some over... Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to try and guess it. You might as well. You might as well take a guess. <laughs> Phantom of Darkness. <laughs> it's, I'm afraid not. It was Maximum... Oh, I've lost it now. Maximum Drive. Drive as well. Yeah. Drive maximum Overdrive. Over, yeah. yeah. There we go. Right, so we move on to the next question. Oh, sorry, Maximum Crisis. What have I got written here? I was reading the wrong answer. Sorry, that was my mistake. Ignore what you just heard. Okay, so we move on to your Paleozoic questions. How many Paleozoic trap cards are there? Okay, um, give me one moment. I think it could be eight alongside shoe, X, Y, Z, and a link. Uh, should I go through them real quick? Just uh, If you want, if it helps. So, pop spell and trap, put face down, banish one, add back. Uh, no, I don't want to waste too much time, so I'll, I'll say eight. Just try. You're correct. Is that third or fourth point? That was your fourth, okay, you've got four. So we move on to, I believe, your final question, your last one on Paleozoics. Name all the stats of the Paleozoic trap cards when they're summoned as monsters. So we need their attribute, their type, oh, okay. their level, their attack and their defense. So they are level two, water, aqua, and it's uh, 1,200 attack and zero defense. Correct! So that is five points for Marcello on his specialist quiz, I'd say. That's a pretty admirable score. So, we're going to move on to Alberto. Now, how confident do you feel? By the look on your face, not that confident. Not confident at all, honestly. <laughs> no? Okay, well, let's see. Let's go again through what you are going through. You're doing Paleozoics, Necros, Spiral, True Draco, Light Swan, and Wind Up. Uh -huh. Do you have any preference on which you'd like to start with? No, then let's just go from the start. Question one for Alberto. How much attack does Paleozoic Opabinia have? Zero. Correct! One point to Alberto. Remember to keep score for Alberto, because I'll forget. Your second Paleozoic question. How many colors are in Paleozoic Canadia's eyes? Let me read that again. That was too different. That was misspelled. What color are Paleozoic Canadia's eyes? There we go. Like purple? It's green, I'm afraid. So that is no points there. Your next question is on your Necroz ones. Yeah. What effect do all Necroz ritual spells share? Basically, you get to banish them from the graveyard alongside a Necroz card to add the, the one Necroz spell from the deck to the end. So basically, if you, but you cannot add themselves. So basically, add one from a different name. 
Correct. That's what I've got written down here, so we'll take it. So how many points is that for Alberto? Two points? Right, let's see what happens with your second Necros. What are the four types of Necros monsters? That was not a good look on his face of, <laughs> are you serious? Four types. Four types. <laughs> So like, you mean like ritual monsters? No, this I mean like, monsters. yeah, monster uh, types. Um, I would go with warriors, dragons, uh, warrior dragons, uh, spellcaster, and the fourth one is. <laughs> I don't know. I'll pass on the fourth one. I think this this three I get them, but uh, the fourth one. You've got to take a stab, because otherwise you lose anyway, so you might as well take a guess. Okay. Um, fairy. I don't know. It was Psychic was the last one, but you got three out of four of them, so that was an admirable effort. So we move on to your spiral questions. Which monsters appear, which monster, singular, appears on spiral gear utility wire? Uh... The, the master plan? I'm afraid not. It's spiral tough. So we move on to your second spiral question. Name all three spiral mission cards. Uh, spiral mission rescue, uh, utility wire, and uh, the other one, I think it's a spell. Utility wire is not one of them. Because it's not a mission. Uh, rescue... Um, Utility wire would I would go for, and then the third one. <laughs> I don't remember the name. Not two out of three. I don't want to guess. I don't remember it. So the answers were spiral mission assault, spiral mission recapture, and spiral mission rescue, okay. which is one of the ones that you did get. So no points there. So we move on to your true Draco questions. What color is Masterpiece, the true Draco Slaying King's shield? Can you feel the tension in the air? Like, I don't know, blue. It's gold, I'm afraid, or gold and white. So no oh. points there, Alberto. Oh. So now your next true Draco question. What color armor is Dynamite Knight, the true Draco fighter, wearing? What color armor? Uh, green. Correct. There we go. Your third point secured in the bag. You still have your two Light Swan questions and your two Wind Up questions to go. So let's go with your Light Swan one. How many level three Light Swan monsters are there? Requires a lot of time to think on these. These are quite hard questions. Do you at home know off the top of your head in front of a camera with lights and a microphone in your face that maybe you should come on this quiz? Alberto? Two. The answer is five, I'm afraid. Well, your next Light Sworn question. <laughs> what is the defense of Shire Light Sworn Spirit? Like 1,000? 1,400, I'm afraid. So no points there on Light Swan. So we move on to your last two questions, your wind-up questions. What is the effect of wind-up shark? Uh, you reveal it from the end if you control a wind-up monster to special summon it. Repeat that again. So you can special summon it from the end. I don't know if, it was, if you have to control a monster or a wind-up car, but it's a monster. Right? Yeah. I, I'm, I don't think I can give this to you. So basically, when a wind-up monster is normal or special summoned to your oh, side of the okay. field, you could special summon this card from your hand. Once per turn, you can activate one of these effects, increase the level by one until the end phase, or reduce the level by the end phase. So I'm afraid I can't give you that, so we're on to your last question. Your wind-up question, which wind-up monster has the highest attack? Uh, wind-up Zimains. I would go for, I don't know. She'll have like 2,300 or something, yeah. I have written here, wind up Arsenal Zen Mao. Ah, oh, Zen Mayo, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Zen Mayo, I've, I've read things. 
I've only ever heard it written down. So how many points was that for Alberto? Just three. <laughs> I thought, didn't he get four? Was no, it three? No. Okay, so three. three and you got five. No, so wait, I you got five. five. <laughs> Sorry, giving you the points away. Okay, so that's three and five. Now remember, I'm not revealing how many the German commentators gave to these guys. We'll be covering that in our next quiz, revealing who has got the most points, because there might be a winner. You never know. You never know how well they performed, because actually some of these questions are quite hard. So stick around because we've got more content and your top 16 coming very soon.
Four-player duels. Cross dual fields. Cross dual monsters. Cross dual spells. Dual traps. Cross dual teams. Cross dual strategy. Cross dual fun. Cross dual. Cross dual for everyone. Cross dual for the world. Friend or foe. Four duelists cross wits. A new era of dueling. Four player card battles. Cross dual. Duelist face off on a crisscrossed battlefield. Summon monsters and set spell and trap cards to defeat your opponents. Simple, beginner friendly rules for any duelist. Will you work together or claw your own way to victory? Optimize your strategy in real time. Class with fellow duelists in a battle like never before. Yu-Gi-Oh! Cross Duel. What cards do you think really help in the meta right now? Uh, also Mystic Mind, because uh, I think it's still un uh, underrated. Uh, people uh, are prepared for uh, Tier Chizu. We also see some Mystic Mind in those decks, but uh, today I've, I've trained with some, some opponents and they, they weren't prepared for Mystic Mind. So I'm, I'm kind of surprised because uh, we saw uh, at Pasadena it's still very strong. I mean, a lot of people will play Shizu tier, so I think Dimension Shifter is good. And for the mirror match, I think Drella is a really good card, Abyss Drella. There are a lot of good cards, I think. Uh, but I think a Mystic Mind should be a really good card in the format right now. Yeah, it's, I think it can, can help people to stall out games and uh, maybe to win them in the end without uh, committing uh, too much resources. Well, the Bistage for sure, they are the perfect answer for the uh, Ishizu tier, but um, also everything they can uh, interact with the graveyard like uh, Shifter. Pl playing the meta and obviously Shifter, everything that's against the grave basically, the Bistage, Bell, Skullmeister, Soul Drain, everything that just removes cards from the grave that doesn't let the effects go through.
Join Elemental Hero Neos for new adventures in Yu-Gi-Oh! Power of the Elements. New heroes, new strategies, new enemies. 100 new cards. Yu-Gi-Oh! Power of the Elements. Nine cards per pack, each pack sold separately.
Welcome back, duelists. We are here in the top 16 feature match here at YCS Dortmund 2022. Very exciting as we head ever closer to seeing who's going to be taking home that Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series title. In front of me, I have two very exceptional duelists who are going to make for a fantastic game. Two French competitors, both European champions and world championship players. This is going to be a match of incredibly high skill. So it's going to be interesting to see exactly what happens. We have Gabriel Soucy and Samir Bakar. This is going to be excellent. So let's waste no more time getting into this. Gentlemen, can we do a high roll on the dice to see who wants to go first? Who would like to roll first? Sam is going to roll first. That is an eight. And that is a 10. So who wants to go first? You're going to go first. Gabrielle's going to be going first. This is very exciting. Only four more rounds remain of this top cut. So this is going to be a very exciting top 16 match. I'm going to hand you over to our wonderful German commentators once again, who are going to take you through this match. Leonard, Sebastian, take it away. Thank you so much once again, Ed. What a matchup we have here for top 16. Those are not only both European champions, but in the European Championship final of 2019, they were even opponents. Gabriel Susi beat Samir Bakar in the finals back in the day with a Salomon Great mirror match. And now they're about to play another mirror match and maybe it is revenge time for Samir Bakar. He wants to take yet another title this time. This is not a final already, this is just the just the just, top 16 match, uh, but matchup. what a matchup we just had to feature this. Absolutely. Also giving some crowd to the French community, yeah, which is French also very successful. Has been rising and rising. The numbers have been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. French Bonjour. national championship this year was Shout insanely out. big. Very, very thankful for all the French players. But let's see, first of all, who's also still left in competition. Let's see what the top 16 pairings are. There we have them. You see, Vlad is still going strong, playing now versus Pierluigi Sorrentino. Then we have Vincenzo versus Camin Avalon. Avalon I'm, so, I'm very sorry. So we see multiple Italians still in competition. Then up there, still in the tournament, Joshua Schmidt. I don't know, did we ever have that at a European event, going back to back in YCS champions? I don't know just quite yet. To be but honest. it would be very impressive yeah. with such big tournaments because Utrecht was insanely big. Yeah. And now Dortmund is the biggest, European, uh, the biggest European YCS we ever had. So that would be really, really impressive. But now he has to overcome Fabio um, Padovani first. And then we have Enzo Dival versus Dennis Hager as well in top 16. And now that we have another matchup that is crazy. We were so close to featuring this Jesse Cotton versus Erikos back. And wow. right under that Susi versus Bakar as you have already seen. Jesse Cotton with such a crazy performance over the last couple of events. And um, there we have Philip Nihus, actually a good friend of mine. He defeated Christopher LeBlanc now in top 32, still moving on. So he definitely is a contender as well now after beating <laughs> Dinka Bui and Christopher LeBlanc. And he is playing versus Etienne Ita, who is a good friend of mine. So uh, crazy matchup quite as the well. Rivalry here. And then down yeah. there, we still have last man standing Mikotzi still in there with the Draco Slayer deck facing the Floundery strategy of Mario Aguirre who took out Herman Hansen. Mario Aguirre also was very successful in Utrecht already coming for another top here. Very, very good stats from Possibly him as well. Possibly for the win. Maybe this time for the win as well. And the players are ready. We have such a fantastic matchup. We want to see a French battle here in the featured match area. So let's get into this top 16 match between Samir Baka and Gabriel Susi. So guys, it has been a while since we have seen an Ishizo Tielemans mirror match on this stream. I think it was maybe only the first round I'm so pretty far. sure it was, yeah. And so. this, is, this is going to be a highly skillful one, because the first one of Dennis versus LeBlanc was really intense as well. So I, I can't imagine how nice this is going to be. Those guys definitely have played a couple of mirror matches over the course of the tournament and it's time for another. Gabriel Susi winning the die roll and therefore starting it off with Mudora Effect discarding the Kelback. And now the question is, 
do you want to mill in this mirror I mean, match? He has to mill. If he starts like this, it means that he does not have any other plays ready here. And he's milling Mudora and Keldo and Scream and Agido. And on the other hand, Samir wow. also milling the Scream and he also milled Mudora and Keldo. So he has multiple interruptions already on turn zero for himself and in turn one of Gabriel. So this could turn out to be quite strong. And Samir wants to mill more. He says, yep, I want to trigger my Agido for sure as well. Wow, and this is actually quite... This is confusing me because, I mean, maybe his hand is not the best as well, but with this setup, with getting like a free Keldo and Modora, I wouldn't want to trigger Agido because it only gives Gabriel the chance to get into some plays. Because yeah. like, this looked like, like a desperation start from Gabriel. Absolutely, it definitely looks like that. And also... I'm pretty sure that Gabriel Susi is probably on triple tactic talents. And I mean, there's no need right now for Sami yeah. Baka to actually resolve monster facts. Um, I mean, there is a Shiren and Rhino Heart that are being Yeah, low. okay, so you're probably going to resolve either Mudora or the Caldo at some point. You're definitely right. And when I'm checking the list of Gabriel Susi, I actually see that he's not on triple tactic talents. Ooh. Nearly everybody is on this card, but Gabriel Susi has decided to not run it. That's a very, very, very interesting decision by him. He, on the other hand, decided to really max out on the Ishizu package. He is playing triple Agido, he's playing triple Kalbeck, and of course, triple Kaldo and Mudara as well. So all the 12 Ishizu monsters are being played. So let's see how well that turns out in the mirror match. I here. think Agido was the first one to trigger, or like, yeah, Chainlink won. So Zamir is giving Gabriel some cards into his deck that are bad mills. He gave him back a Perlerino. Yep, indeed. And Herald of the Orange Light. <laughs> and so we are still those, milling. There's another Reinhardt Hoffness. Hoffness Look, now Gabriel also has a wow. Shuffler and he had other multiple names. names. And wow. This is now kind of backfiring. Also, we are seeing <laughs> Do you triple see Hoffness. Triple Hoffness on the side of Samir Baka. He wants to mill Tielemann's names here, but he certainly didn't want to mill all of them at once, being the same even. I mean, he can recycle them, and he's going to force his opponent to activate Mudora, probably on this. Gabriel also milled two Rhino Hearts, which can't trigger anymore. However, this is still a valuable resource in the GY, so you can always access the Kaleido Heart. Yep, indeed, indeed. And he just, he also milled another Kaldo, speaking of Samir, so yeah. he can use that Kaldo now freely, and he still has one left for the opponent's, or for his own turn, rather. So the Shizu cards could really come in handy here for the grind game and we know this matchup tends to be very grindy we've seen games that are taking like 30 minutes or something just grinding back and forth you look at the tables you see both players have a graveyard of 30 to 40 cards already including the extra deck of course and it's really going until the last card in the deck basically yeah. that can definitely happen in this matchup and I mean, it's, it makes sense, right? Because you can recycle all of the resources all the time so you're going through your stuff multiple times and you just have to outgrind your opponent in the long run we are seeing a fusion summon already. No Mudora used from Gabriel, so the Kid Colors can actually resolve on Samir's behalf. And the Havnil on Gabriel's side will also resolve, so they are not even stopping the opponent from fusion summoning with the Kaldo and the Mudora that they both have available. That's kind of interesting. Maybe that's kind of a <laughs> French agreement. They said, yeah, we're going to trigger all of our mill effects and also we're not going to use our shufflers. On the other hand, no, Samir already used the Mudora effect. So that's definitely not happening here. But yeah. He has Crime in hand, by the way, the card that is still not <laughs> flipped face down, so we can still see that he has it in his hand. Yeah, okay, but now. now he did it. But look, oh, Sami Baka only running a single copy of Super Polymerization in his main deck, he and he has it. managed to draw it in his opening hand, and that could be a really huge factory in the mirror match. He also has one pot of prosperity. Indeed, indeed. Also what? one Triple Tactics talent. He really likes his one-ups here in this list. That is really interesting. I mean, my, it kind of makes sense to the point where some of the cards are hard ones per turn. Super Polymerization is it, however, Super Polymerization is a big investment. Yeah, and I mean, Triple Tactic Talons also being once yeah. per turn, Pot of Prosperity also. So yeah. it's actually quite logical if you think about it. You never want to see two of them, so why play multiple of it? Just play one of them and uh, go for other good cards that are also very good one-offs such as Super Polymerization or Pot of Prosperity. I kind of like it. And now at this point, Havniss is activated as a chain to the Kid Kalos of Samir, and we are going to see the Mudora of Gabriel being changed 
chain to targeting two Kaldos and a Havnus as well. So now Samir will have the opportunity to chain one of the Kaldos as well to take away some resources. Oh, but oh, there's Herald of the Orange it. Light from Samir on the Havnus effect. I mean, no, now, no, 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 this is on the uh, Mudora effect. Oh, of course, yeah, you're right. But I think now we understand yeah. why Gabriel let the fusion effect resolve because he won it that Sami has a monster on board yeah. to activate the effects of Van triggering his Hafnas in hand. And yeah, we see that Gabriel is just milling one of his orange lights. And I think that Gabriel still has the Merly effect open. First of all, it's going to be Sami resolving an effect. Yes, he is resolving the Kid Colossus effect, I am pretty sure of that. If the Merly activates, then there is still a Keldo. I mean, there is a reason why Samir protected the Keldos in his GY with the Heralds of Orange Light. Obviously, Certainly. Herald discarding Herald is not the optimal play, but when you gotta go for it, you gotta go for it. For sure. But it's actually quite funny, because we see he has a one-off Super Polarization. He only runs two Herald of Orange Light, so he really <laughs> just drew these small percentages of his deck. And uh, I think he drew them in quite timely manner, so I would say this could definitely be the cards winning this matchup here, that Herald of, Herald of Orange Light and also that Super Palomization specifically. And now it comes down to the preparation of the players, because if you are drawing an unlikely hand like that, the chances are that you haven't really play-tested a lot with this, with this combination, with this exact combination of cards. That might very well be true, but I would say Sami Baka went to the World Championship and he has been in the European Championship final two times already, so this guy probably is prepared for everything that comes his way. And I mean, Gabriel Susi also <laughs> being quite accomplished, I would say. So, actually, to bring up a topic that we discussed yesterday, three monsters on board of Gabriel, no normal summon. <laughs> true, true. He doesn't even need a normal summon. And now he has searched for the Rhino Heart that can be normal summoned. Now, let's just quickly take out the graveyard out of the monster zone. <laughs> I mean, it's just to, so that you can course. see it a little bit better. But I mean, the normal summon of Rhino Hut will be quite crucial here because that normal summon will provide him a second level 4 body on the field. He does not even necessarily have to normal summon, by the way. He could also just uh, special summon oh. out there the Kid Kalos. Samir searched for the crime and now discards it. So, what does this tell us about his decklist? Because you would search the Sullig instead, right? I guess so, yeah, because there's no banished element monsters he could add back with the crime right there. So, kind of an interesting move. He, he must have, I mean, he would still just rather discard the Salik if you have the Salik hard draw in your hand, right? It's definitely of somewhat of an interesting decision. And now there is a Magna Mood on the Shiren that was sent to the GY with a Rhino Heart. At this point, we don't even know which turn it, whose turn it is anymore. <laughs> it is still turn number one of this game number one, Gabriel Susi still in the driver's seat, and I think if Gabriel Susi is able to set up a Dweller here, this might very well be the best setup he could ask for. Okay, so let's take Mental But there's a Magna wow, Mood on Magna Sami's Mood side as, as well. Well, this is so good, it provides an extra body for the next turn, and provides a Dries Worm in the end phase, or a Serenir, if he wants to have it. And of course, he's triggering the effect to search an end phase. You don't want to miss out on that. And I've seen that a lot over the course of this weekend when watching Ishizu Teal players play. I mean, you are still not going to resolve your own Telemans sure. effect, but you are just getting that Bistil body on board, specifically Magna Mood being exceptionally well, yeah. because you can just search for another Bistil, exactly. it replaces itself on the hand, so you much rather want to have your Bistil resolving than your opponent's. Yeah, and if your opponent also announced the Magna Mood, he will just summon it to replace itself, so... This is an interesting point, and I think definitely the right decision. Yep, oh, so triple tri Perlerino, Hafn, and Salik milled. Salik doing a lot more than crime in the GY. And Serenir can also trigger if there are cards like Branded in High Spirits. And uh, talking about Branded in High Spirits, yeah, Samir is actually citing the card. Yeah, yeah, he's citing in the Branded in High Spirits package. I honestly have never seen this in any T Elements Ishizu list. But uh, he made the decision and he's sitting here in top 16, so it can't no. be too bad to bring in the Blazing Cartesia and the Brendan and High Spirits. I mean, it plays around the uh, Bestials. It does indeed, it does. So I could very well see this coming in here for game two, but let's first of all stay in this game number one. We just resolved the middle effect yeah. of Kit Carlos. This is complicated enough for us. Indeed, yeah. And I think we also 
resolve the sand effect of Saronir sending the Druid Swarm to the graveyard and searching for the Hafnis with the Salik. And I think he already used the Hafnis GY effect, right? So he cannot trigger it to go into another fusion summon. And now we are just going to summon Abyss Dweller. That's what we're doing. Dweller actually already activated. So this turn, Samir will not be able to use effects from his GY anymore. He can, however, chain Kaldor to it. Do you think he should do that? Oh. I mean, there are no cards right now in Gabriel's GY that really do anything. So I think you just rather keep the resources. Probably, yeah. So he decided to not... I mean, I mean you can chain it to send back the Mudora, actually, so your opponent doesn't have it for the next turn. Also, the Mudora was already used, so this kind of makes sense. I would definitely chain yeah, it to Yeah, yeah, for sure. There is the Mudora, because Gabriel actually decided here to Ooh. not have the Mudora, but... Uh, do not detach the Chiron and rather detach the Mudora. No. So that was quite interesting because it gave Sami the option to even chain his Keldo here targeting the no. Mudora. That tells me a little bit that Gabriel probably wanted that, right? Because he, yeah. he actually actively decided on detaching the Mudora here. So we are sending back Crime at this point. Honestly, he could have searched for a Salik, first of all. So. That might have been a little misstep. Maybe he didn't think the turn would get this far, but we are seeing something really interesting. The Kit Colors is being sent back to the extra deck. Usually you would think this is a valuable resource for Gabriel, but also this is a valuable resource for... I mean, it's also a valuable resource in the GY because you can summon Rule Colors with Kit Colors and now you can't anymore. So no Rule Colors yeah, for Gabriel. Honestly, time. I would have thought that Samia maybe once that actually to happen because super polymerization on Abyss Dweller and Grill Colors yes. could be quite handy. And we know he has the super polymerization, but still he decided against it. And I mean, we on the other hand know that he has Kit Colors on his field already. So he could yeah. just use his own Kit Colors and the Dweller to make a fusion summon with the super polymerization anyway. So he definitely has an out of the Dweller sitting on the field there. No, it has to be a Kit Colors uh, and a Telemans monster to the Grill Colors. He can just go for. Uh, Muddy Mud Dragon with Rhino Heart? Um, oh yeah, you're right. But wait, can't he, can't he Super Poly evade the Abyss, Abyss Dweller in this situation? Yeah, with Rhino Heart together. Oh yeah, I, I mean, that's also yeah. quite good. Not gonna lie, that's also kind of nice. And, uh, and if you like take away the Roll Colors and the Dweller, the Roll Colors just comes back to the field immediately and can afterwards send something else from the field, so... I think it was the right choice to deny the Roll Colors and then bank on having the Super Poly for Rhino Heart and Dweller. Yep, but I don't think the Rhino Heart necessarily is going to stay on the board. Gabriel could play around the Super Poly here by just taking that Rhino Heart from the field and use it to go into his Kaleido Heart. And that Kaleido Heart obviously cannot be used as a fusion material, so that would play around the Super Polymerization that Sami has in his hand. But I'm sure that Gabriel Susi and Sami Baka are pretty close. So yeah. Gabriel probably knows that he only runs one Super Polymerization in the main deck. So playing around a singular copy of a card in the opponent's main deck is kind of rough, I would say. It definitely is a tough choice. Now we are seeing Garura on Ooh. field. And we are linking it away together with the Hovness. So this looks to me like he is going to summon on Dark. I mean, he wasn't able to summon out his yeah. own Magna Mood, but now he might be able to summon out the Magna Mood from Samir. Is there? Oh, there is not even a Magna Mood. Nope, and I think that Samir would have shuffled it away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that would have been a heads up play. I mean, the Magna Mood is still on the board, yeah, yeah, of course. So he's summoning back the Hafnis, and that. Let me just double check on the deck list of Gabriel Susi. Is he trying to get into Sprint here, or does he want to go for. Elf. I think he used all of his element effects at this point. Yeah, I think Murley is not open anymore, so Sprite Sprint would be kind of weird. So it most, li it most likely has to be the uh, Sprite Elf line he's targeting here. Yep, we're linking away the Dark and probably the Huffness of our opponent. <laughs> I mean, otherwise he could just get rid of the Huffness with some card effect and then Gabriel would profit off of that. Although, I mean, Sami would profit off of that because it's his Huffness. But yeah, we see the Sprite Elf. So the end board of Gabriel looks like it's supposed to be the Dweller plus Sprite Elf Pass. And oh, he's he has not yet for the Merly, or has he? I don't think he has. Ooh, oh, there's a Caldo, the Caldo and the Agito. And crime and crime again. 
not too useful in this situation. Can't add back anything. Nothing has been banished yet on the side of Gabriel because the Magna Mood was chained to his, his own Shiren. If Samir gets to mill a crime, then he can actually add back a Shiren. Yep, that is now absolutely true. But add back effect of crime comes up more often than you would yeah. think, to be honest. With all the bestials around, that is actually quite a common scenario to have a Tillman's monster in your banished pile. So that is certainly something that happens a lot. Oh, look, he is getting rid of the Rhino Heart. So maybe he is playing around Super Poly here. What is he going to summon, though? He is it going is to sprite summon sprint. Oh, a sprite, a sprite Sprint. A sprite to Sprint. And we are milling this another is, uh, early. really interesting. Also, it has not played around the Abyss Dweller yet because there is a Rhino Heart on the side of Samir. True, that's right. But by the looks of it, he hasn't triggered the Merle yet. Look, wow. he is resolving Merle's effect. So the players have it quite easy because they are just marking which effects yeah. have been used already. And Gabriel certainly knew that there is a Merle still open. And now he goes for the Fusion Summon via the effect of the Elements Merle to summon out his Kaleido Heart right here. And now we are paying attention if he gets to send away the Kid Colors or does he play around the Super Polymerization and goes into the Rhino Art. This is a game-breaking decision possibly at this moment. It is really. So Gabriel thinking about it. <laughs> he knows that if he leaves that Rhino Heart on board, he could get punished by that one of Super Polymerization in the main deck, which we know that is in the hand of Sami Baka. But maybe he still cannot afford to play around it because there's so much other stuff that could and be there and there is the Kid Kalos. Away Kid Kalos because Kid Kalos, leaving Kid Kalos on the field is so dangerous as well. It really is indeed. Also this Rhino Heart came back via its own effect so it will be banished once it's fusion summoned away and he has to discard the last card in his hand. I mean he will draw one for turn but this will leave Samir on so few resources. Yeah so even if he has Super Poly here, which he has, it might still not be a winning position, yeah. right? It's kind of interesting here. On the other hand, the board of Gabriel doesn't do too much. Like, the Sprite Sprint not really triggering the bounce effect very often in the Elements deck. The Sprite Elf, on the other hand, kind of nice to reborn the Murley, I would say that. But look, there is another card in the hand of Sami. He has a Druid's Wall now yeah. as well because he resolved Magna Mood's effect on field. So that would be a handy discard or something that could target a hit with Murley. So he definitely has some options here. And I think he has Diviner of the Herald in hand as well, which could be a pretty decent normal summon after resolving Super Polymerization. You can just send a Mudora and then go into Baron de Fleur. This is really interesting because then he can actually pop the Kaleido Heart, and when Kaleido Heart tries to summon itself back, you can just go for Drew's Womb. Yep, that is indeed true. So, it's going over to Samir Baka. Oh no, he wants to think an end phase. Maybe he instantly summons out the Drew's Womb here. Oh, this could mean that we are going to see some Eternal Lady. But no, he draws for turn, and he draws a Shiren for turn, and he instantly grabs the Super Polymerization yeah. in draw phase. We are getting rid of that Abyss Dweller, discarding the Shiren, using our own yeah. Rhino Heart, as you said, and the Dweller from Gabriel Susi to go into the Muddy Mud Dragon right there. Muddy or Mud, Mud Dragon, Dragon of the Swamp, I'm sorry. Really strong. If there is, I mean, we know that Gabriel can't have crime. I think he milled it. So if he calls Dark immediately, he is going to get away without getting sullied at all if he only summons Dark Monsters. That's true, it's such a comfortable situation to start everything off by having a Mud Ring of the Swamp on board already. This is protecting your play so much versus the specific interruption that the T-Element stack is providing um, the... Sullied. <laughs> I was just losing my mind for a second. But now, we have the normal summon following it up of the Diviner. And oh, this looked like a spell to me. Which Ooh. spell could it be on Gabriel's side? Basti, can you check for us? Could it be Heartbeat? Could it be Heartbeat? Yeah, he's main decking one copy of Tillman's Heartbeat. As you should. I'm, ki I'm kind of liking it too. We saw quite a few Mystic yeah, Mind decks. it really decks helps you versus there. these rogue matchups. Okay, now we are seeing a preemptive Keldo, if I'm not mistaken. So what are you... Oh, she, he is going to try and send away or shuffle to the deck Keldo. Yeah, I mean, and he more just, resources. He just wants to 
prevent Gabriel from interrupting him. So he preemptively tries to bait out the shuffler that Gabriel has and therefore he will be free to play after that is resolving because Gabriel now is forced to chain his Keldo, which he's just doing right there. Oh, maybe not. Yeah, you have to. You have to. Why would you not, Gabriel? And he's going for his own graveyard. What is he recovering for himself? What is he going to put back to the deck for his opponent? There's a Rhino Heart being put back. Fair enough. Maybe he has another tier limit name in his hand, so the mill of a Rhino Heart would be quite handy. So we're checking the opponent's grave, of course, again. This is an intense game one. Absolutely is. And that Abbas Wallum not being able to resolve its effect really is doing damage here for. Gabriel, because Sami now on his side might very well be able to set up an Abyss Dweller, and it's pretty likely then there to stick. So I think we're chaining Sprite Elf to uh, special summon out Murley. Yeah, by the looks of it, that's a play. And we know that Sami has the Druid Swarm, but we also know that Gabriel still has a Magna move that he couldn't resolve last turn, so there are a couple of things uh, being able to change chain here. And the thing here is, though, well, you don't want to resolve the fusion effect, but you rather want to resolve the mill effect of Murley. So just banishing it isn't that is the true. Best. And Druid's Worm is chained to this Murley, and now even the body, because it is Samir's turn. He is going for proactive plays. This body can be so useful to him. Does he run? Does Samir play Wallow or yes, Beatrice? Yes, we yes, see Wallow, Wallow, founder of the Drudge Dragons. This might be something that comes up here. One of the new rank 6 XYZs introduced in Darkwing Blast. And such a powerful one it is. Yeah, and Mudora is being sent to the GY by the Herald. So there is no Kelbeck, no Agido action right here. Understandable because it looks for Gabriel as if his field was in a kind of locked position. Now we are just casually changing decks. This is not how this works, guys. We will have to... <laughs> Wait, wh whose deck is whose? I, th I think the red ones are for <laughs> some year, right? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah. It's all good now. It's all good. They found their decks again, they are smiling as well. It's great to see that both of them yeah. are super concentrated. They're really focused and zoomed in, uh, zoomed in, but still they're friends and they are enjoying playing this super cool feature match together. Yeah, and it is a game, so they are supposed to have fun with it. Absolutely so. So he's now getting rid of his own dragon. But he's getting a negate card. for it instead, which is the Baron. And you were this one about. is really important. I think there's only a Magna Mood at the. Oh, we are going for the Volo. Now we are checking the GY of Gabriel. And this one is really important. This is why he actually activated the Keldo at the start of the turn, because he doesn't want to resolve this wallow effect so are there any crazy spells like triple tactic talents that you can set to your side or do you just want to special summon out a monster i mean you, can he set pearl rhino because honestly pearl should be able to set pearl rhino pearl rhino could be really good we know that pearl rhino is really strong in the mirror match so getting access to that here is a really really good option i think sami should certainly consider it Crime could also be cool, I guess. He is also able to special summon out a Magna Mood and then again search for another Druid's Worm or add it back to the hand in the G end phase. No, oh, but oh, maybe oh, we, we just want to go for a Zeus for line. A Zeus. We are running into the Kaleido Art for a little bit of damage because that Wallow is only on 2400 attack points. So now the big question is does he run Gaia Dragon Thunder Charger? <laughs> Uh, I can tell you, extra, expi extra space is a little bit tight no, it is, in Teal and Mincy Shizu. Therefore, he didn't find space for that. I have to disappoint you. But, of course, he's running the Dweller and much rather relevant to this situation, he's running the Zeus, of and course. This makes... Okay, so now the Rhino Heart got destroyed. You mean the Kaleido Heart, but... Yeah, Kaleido Heart. That's an interesting thing. Why did that happen? What did we miss? He was just running over the Wallow, uh, running over it with wo Wallow, right? So that's really interesting. How many defense points does Kaleido Heart have? Should be at it's 3k. Three three yeah, it's 3k, 3k. So for sure it has 3k oh, defense. Oh, 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 no, no. Wallow gets attack points. I'm sorry, I forgot that. The first sentence, once you control gain 100 attack and defense for each card in your opponent's GY. Wow, okay, so Wallow certainly was big enough to run over the Kaleido Heart. Something that Sami Baka would never forget. He really knew the first sentence of Wallow, contrary to us. He, he and read his cards. He actually was able yes. to run over the Kaleido Heart, and now he can activate 
the effect of Wallow. And I mean, that was really heads up there by Samir. He got rid of the T Elements monsters on the board of Gabriel. So a potential Salik there is not going to do any damage anymore. Yeah. That is true, and now Wallow can activate the effect. What can you summon? You can summon Abyss Dweller, however, with no materials, this does not seem too nah. strong. He can summon a Sprite Elf into the main monster zone, which can be good. Oh, Magna Moon oh, is being so he activated. was actually going after a monster, I'm quite sure. He was going after a dark monster in the graveyard of Gabriel Susi, and Gabriel Susi says, nope, I much rather want to take that monster out. I know. He's going after the Diviner in his opponent's graveyard. Interesting. I mean, the Wallow still hasn't detached, right? So yeah. he's not even using the effect of Wallow just yet. So let's see what does this Magna mood do. And does Samir actually care about that? I mean, I, I don't really see why he would care. It could be that Samir just wants to summon back a level 2 body being the Murley, maybe and then he would have access to Elf, and then bringing back Diviner of the Herald would be quite a cool play. But he already used Diviner of the Herald this turn. That's what I was thinking. And also he already summoned out the only Synchro Monster in his extra deck being the Baron, so that Diviner doesn't seem like a card he would need here ever. Also now the Magna Mood can be destroyed by Baron de Fleur and then special summoned to the... Oh, he actually... Used the effect on field, so you could also just negate this right now yeah. if you want. Ooh, and Havness is activated. And Havness is such a great counter to Baron de Fleur because when you negate the effect, then you are just going to destroy it and trigger Where it. Where is the Havness? Oh, We're Kalbeck, hitting Kalbeck, Chiron, Chiron. and Pearl Reno. Wow. What a comeback now. This could definitely be the start of a comeback here for Gabriel Susi. What a grindy game. Still only turn number two of this game right here in top 16. And... Sami is checking. He has Shufflers, contrarian to Gabriel. Yeah. He has that Mudora, so every Tielemans name that got milled there, and it was only one for Gabriel, is getting denied. That Chiron is being put back, but Gabriel Susi milled Kalbeck as well, so he and might get to another Tielemans name right here. I think he might have gone for a Kalbeck chain one, Chiron chain link two, so at least the Kalbeck is chain blocked from the Baron de Fleur. That's probably what happened. Or didn't he use the effect of Baron, maybe? And that was the reason why the Halfness even could come onto the field? I think he activated the effect to pop Magna Mood. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That's also true. That is definitely true. So, we are shuffling back a couple of cards, and now that mill from Kalbeck is going to be really important here for Gabriel Susi. On the other end, Samir Baka could also be the one profiting off of it, because his deck is also having a couple of really cool cards he could mill. So let's see what yeah. that mill five on both sides will be bringing for that. Samir Baka has not resolved a single tournament effect in his GY on his own turn. So, we are milling. I'm looking at Chiron, the cards Havnes, of Gabriel. Kaldo, Chiron, Mudora, and Agido as Aguido. well. Wow, and two Polarinos on the side of Sami. And but this also, is not a card you want to mill. But he has milled two names as well. The thing was, yeah, exactly. with two names, those two names get, mid, get met with the uh, good old Mudoro that was milled by Gabriel Susi there. So, not really being the best. And I mean, he baited out a Keldo early on, right? So Mudora for Gabriel is still left here in this turn, so he can definitely chain the Mudora to the effects that are being activated by Sami here. This is a really complicated turn. I mean, you will go for one of those two effects. You can't really go for both. Keep in mind, the negation of Baron should still be in play there, and Wallow also has not activated anything. It's crazy to even think of the fact that he hasn't activated the effect of Wallow yet. <laughs> like, that effect is so strong, and you just rather want to take a little bit of a gamble and let his opponent do a little bit more, just before even using the effect of Wallow. On the other hand, I like it. You let your opponent do everything, you're watching him, and then at the end you can make the best decision by already knowing all the stuff that is in circulation for your opponent. So, we see Sami is triggering the Shiren. What is Gabriel triggering? Of course, Samir being the one to trigger things first because he's a turn player right here. But what is being triggered by Gabriel? I think that Gabriel or that Samir has used both of his shufflers, right? The Keldo at the start of the turn and mid-turn he went for the Medora effect. So actually, 
Gabriel can activate Shiren and Merli. That looks like it is very much one true. Chain. That usually is not possible with this deck. And it looks like, even though a super powerful super polymerization came down for Samir, Gabriel might still be in a spot to win this game right here. That could be another crazy turn of events. And I think, yeah, I think he tipped on both of them. I think he kind of wants to resolve them both. Also, do you think he's going to resolve Agido as well? Agido, I think that at this point he wants to simplify the game state a bit. <laughs> yeah, simplify that. Um, <laughs> kind of a tough task, I would say. So he does not activate Shiren. I don't know if this is because he activated the Shiren before. I think this is actually a possibility. And oh, I forgot that Wallow is a quick effect, right? Ooh, he is indeed activating the effect of Wallow here. Oh, and he only uses the effect to detach one, which is, again, shuffle back one card from either player's GY. And we have yet another shuffler, but it's an Exceeds monster. Yeah, Wallow just being another bestial, basically, or another copy of Mudora, but for only one card. Kind of crazy. Wallow really coming in handy in this meta game, and that's why a lot of people are even running it over the uh, Beatrice, and I mean, you would think that Beatrice is better because it actually makes you trigger some of the Tielemans names that you could send with it, but Wallo also super powerful as we just see here. I am still myself not sure if I like Wallo or Beatrice better. I mean, Beatrice can actually save you when you are out of place. It's a tough call, seriously. It's I think not they an both do decision. different jobs. Yeah. Preferably, I would put both into my deck, but there are yeah. so many other things yeah. you would have to put in your deck, as we see on the deck lists. I mean, Samir, he, he's playing the Wallow. He didn't even have space to put in Time Thief Redoer, yeah. and we've seen Time Thief Redoer putting in fantastic work over the course of the tournament already, so already making some sacrifices by putting in that Wallow. So it's definitely rather impossible to run Wallow and Beatrice. I mean, I myself am a, not a big fan of Diviner, so I would actually cut the Baron, and then I would have one more space, but I think it would go to Redoer instead of two rank six, because you never go for more than one rank six. Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, of course, you also don't summon four rank fours, but... Yeah, but cool news for you. Gabriel Susi also isn't a big fan of the good old Diviner of Herald. He runs none in his main deck. Does he run the Baron de Fleur, I think? Yeah, he does, actually. So he is a big fan of having two level 4 monsters plus Herald of the Orange Light. That is certainly true. So, I think we've resolved all the chains that we had to resolve, so it is probably going to be back on Samir after this. The only question I'm asking myself is, is Wallow once per turn? Because Otherwise, he still has another shuffle from the GY open. That's a very good question. If it's not, you can still summon Zeus over it. That certainly is a possibility because he has attacked with Wallow already. He ran over the Kaleido Hut very early on in the turn. And here we are now in main phase two with the possibility to go for the Zeus as well. All of a sudden, this looks really good for Gabriel, by the way. Yeah, and I mean, Wallow for sure is uh, only once per turn, I just double checked. But it almost looks like he passed it back over to Gabriel, right? Because Gabriel really actively is checking his graveyard there. So he actually keeps the GY interruption effect of Wallow over Azus. I can understand that because he has the Baron de Fleur on field. This is not something you want to yeah, send away. Yeah, look at that. It is the turn of Gabriel Susi again. Normal summoning wow. the Mudora. And now the end board or the breaking board of Samir Baka doesn't look that oppressive anymore. He has the Wallow. Okay, that's like a bestial. And then he has the Baron de Fleur. But Gabriel has a couple of options to do to go for stuff. I think the Baron de Fleur still has the negate open. So we are going for a link to summon here into Dark, the Dark Charmer. And we are also now resolving Mudora. Okay, we're recycling resources here. We're trying to get back one Shiren, one Halfness, trying to maximize the chances of milling good Tielemans names, trying to up the number of names possible to be hit by mill effects. 
And Sami does not look too happy about this. I mean, his GUI is filled with cards, but are any of them shufflers? I think he has banished like all of those already. Yeah. I mean, he, we are at, I think, four shufflers banished already. In the beginning, I was like, Really, really thinking that Samir is going to have. There's a Keldo. Oh, yeah, there is a Keldo. That he's going to have a longer breath in this because he was starting yeah. to mill a lot of shufflers right from the beginning. But Gabriel was able to just shuffle back some of his shufflers because he was using one and then afterwards he could just shuffle back the others. So that was definitely something working very well for Gabriel here. But yeah, very, very, very intense situation. How is Gabriel going to solve this little puzzle that Samir Baka gave him here? We are using the effect of Keldo, trying to shuffle back our own Hafnes and our Druid Swarm. And now he's considering some cards from his opponent too. Why not shuffle back the Abyss Driller from, uh, Abyss Dweller from Gabriel Susi as well? That yeah, would be a good, good possibility, right? <laughs> Just give idea. him another Abyss Dweller. But it's interesting, Gabriel actually has not decided to shuffle back his Abyss Dweller because he could do that himself. I mean, he probably doesn't see a line where he could end up with two level monster, two level four monsters on the board this turn. And when you're not using it this turn, you're probably not going to use it at all during this true. game anymore. Because I think in this turn or in the next one, the game will be decided if Samir Bak has oh three Mudoras used by Gabriel. No Mudoras left for Gabriel, so that means if Samir gets another turn, he will be free from Mudoras. And is there any Caldos in there? At first sight, I didn't see any Caldos. And we have already played about 37 minutes in this game one. This might be a time factoring game again. 4,900 life points on Gabriel's side in game one and 8,000 on Samir's side. So he is looking relatively healthy. But I think, I think that he, he just negated ran... the dark, right? Or did he crash? I, th I think he. I mean, we're, we're writing down life points, so I would be thinking that Gabriel just ran into one of the monsters of Samir just to trigger the graveyard effect of dark. Don't you I, want to activate it before? Yeah, but look, he is searching. He is searching. So, I mean, it is in the graveyard, so it certainly got destroyed. But we're not sure whether it was by battle or by card effect. But look, yeah, it Gabriel lost battle. life points. He just crashed into the Baron, so there's no battle phase anymore for Gabriel. And he's searching himself in Hafnis. And there is a sprite into sprint on the field, and it does not really do too much. There is no battle phase for Gabriel anymore this turn. I mean, what? Okay, so he did not crash into the Wallow. That would enable him to go for a Zeus play on his own, by the way. That's true, but the Wallow is probably quite big, isn't it? Because then, there are a lot of cards in the but graveyard. But it boosts of the Baron as well, I think. Oh, does it boost all monsters of monsters? Monsters you control gain 100 oh, attack and defense for each card in your opponent's GUI. Fair enough. But now we are milling for Shiren, and we're hitting Scream, Solik, and Rhino Heart. So. Can he activate those effects? And he Samir will. just sits there. I think he has no cards left in hand, so he really is relying on but on the floor and Waldo being good enough to win in the game here. We also don't know exactly that he hasn't used the Baron de Fleur effect because when you don't I mean when you can't listen to the players talking, then you might not really see one of those gestures with yeah. all of those effects resolving. And now we are seeing the Harvin is being shuffled back. Yeah, Wallow is activated in response to the effect of Tuleman's Huffness and it will be preventing another fusion summon. And it's crazy in this mirror match, right? With all those Ishizus, with all those Bestials, this, this Tuleman's part of the deck is not even really thriving anymore because all those fusion summons are being denied Oh, constantly. and Gabriel picks up his cards. I think Samir won this one. Wallow and Baron de Fleur are too good to be beaten by Gabriel Susi, so we are going to see a game too. Wow, it is 1-0 for Samir Bakar. That super polymerization really was yeah, the clutch. turning point in this match. He got rid of the opponent's Abyss Dweller and therefore was free to play for the whole game. So Samir Bakar is on his way to get revenge from Gabriel Susi after losing the finals of the European Championship in 2019. He might make it to the top eight. We are seeing a quick look around the oh, crowd yeah. here people are enjoying the featured match as well as we do yeah exactly so let's check on the side deck we said it earlier sami yes. bakar actually is siding in the brendan high spirits package is that something you would want to side in going second i can't see it but i don't necessarily would say it's a crazy big impact for your your deck there 
So I'm thinking about what it does apart from playing around bestials, because when you activate it and discard or send to the GY yeah. your tier limit card, then you don't have a monster on the field, so the bestials aren't quick effects yet. True, true. That's right. I like it. I like it. But some other cards that are definitely going to come in here are Ghost Sister and Spooky Dogwood. He really wants to see those close to time. That's definitely something he wants to get there. And then also, he's bringing in another copy of Super Polymerization. We're going one. one by one. Yeah, He's yeah. making uh, the amount of Super Polymerization in his main deck double from game two on now. And uh, maybe he's going to see it again. And then what do we have there? He's also going to double the amount of Triple Tactics talent. Maybe in, in main game deck. three he would bring two more copies of those. Who knows? I don't know where they should come from, but maybe. And also, we saw it in our top 32 matchup that our Medolce player was on Impermanence. And Sami Baka also is bringing in Triple infer Infinite Impermanence even. One card that he actually wants to side in thrice. So he values I mean, it a lot. The card is incredibly strong if the monster is not summoned by impermanence. Uh, instant fusion. Yep, yep, we saw that in top 32. That wasn't the best outcome. But let's see what's there for Gabriel Susi. What can he bring in here going first? Ghost Reaver and Winter Cherries, certainly only a going second card because you want to have less monsters than your opponent. Gabriel is on some interesting cards there. Go ahead. What, what is coming to your mind there? So first of all, he's playing Skullmark Ladybug, which is a card that was previously used because it gains sure. 1,000 life points instead of the 500 just from Scattershot. Yep, However, yep. it's not as consistent. You really have to hard draw or hard mill it. Yep, yep. Because it can't be sprites printed away. That is true, that is true. Also, uh, he has Psy, 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 Psy Frame here Gamma. Do you think that is ever coming in going first? I mean, there are a couple of effects that are only activating in a graveyard or in the hand while you have no monsters on board. But do you want to take the risk of having a card in your hand that you cannot use at all after you try to establish your board, after you started establishing your board? It's no. rough, right? Not really. I yeah. would not bring but this. But one card that might be good is there can be only one. But I think that is a card that you would much rather want to side in versus the flow on the restack. You want to have that. It's actually pretty good going first or going second versus Flounder Reese. But he's not facing Flounder Reese right here. He's playing the mirror match, therefore, there can be only one not really a card, I think. I mean, you good. rarely want to side Floodgates in the mirror match, yeah. apart from cards like Summon Limit, maybe, that really limit your opponent only yep, yep. after you set up your board. So uh, I think that Gaga Cowboy might be a card that he brings, uh, sure. Skullmark Ladybug and Super Polymerization. Oh, he's even siding three of them. So he, after this game, I he could have know. more I than his opponent. I think you want to, we are really close to timeout. So I think yeah. you really want to go for cards that let you play instead of cards that stop your opponent from playing. Absolutely, yeah, you might be right about that. But we are going to see all the decisions that were made when the players are ready for the next game. I think besides that, there's nothing like insane in their side decks. Kind of standard, kind of stuff we have seen yeah. already. So no extraordinary cool stuff that they brought to the featured match. I mean, they probably just tried to build a very consistent list. For that, for that big of a tournament, you also really want to have a consistent list. Sebastian. Yes, please. Which spicy card would you like to see? Oh, I see that the players are getting ready for the game. So let's keep that question for game number two of the top 16 featured match. So, Sebastian, to get back to my question, which side deck card, which spicy card in this format would you have liked to see in a featured match? Hmm, interesting question. I really want to see Silent Graveyard, but we saw that in the last featured match from Alexander Schmidt. So, besides that, I don't really know whether there's anything crazy I want to see. Is there anything you want to see specifically? I mean, we have seen so many diverse side decks this weekend. I think it's really hard to pick one card that we haven't seen yet. So, I'm that also. is true. So, we are starting it off for oh, Gabriel Susi whiffed. with the Shiren discarding the Rhino Heart. But after that, nothing coming. Can he even trigger the Rhino Heart? Oh, yes, he, he can. absolutely can, discarding the Telemans Merly to summon out the Rhino Heart. And he just, just immediately summons it. I mean, okay, yeah, that won't be a bestial. Yep, on the water you monster. cannot bestial that. And is, there are no bestials in the opening hand of Samir. I can guarantee you that there were a lot of spell cards. But all those spell cards are not going to do anything one minute before hitting the timeout mark. So it looks like Gabriel might be quite free to play here. 
So it looks like we might see a game three if Gabriel manages to go for a Gaga -ga Cowboy at some point in this turn. We're going for the Kid Colors first. Kid Colors with the Merle and... It's so funny how different, they, uh, how different games can turn out to be, yeah. right? Because in game one, we, de we actually didn't even really see any fusion summons at the beginning because they were stopped so heavily by all the Kaldos, by all the Mudoras, by all the Bistials. Yeah. And now Gabriel is just starting off quite fresh. He already has performed two fusion summons, so it looks a lot brighter for him. And Sami cannot really interrupt him at all, at all so far. And he calls Earth on the Muddy Mud Dragon. <laughs> uh, the Mudring of the Swarm and now goes for the damage of fate, dealing 800 damage Ooh, close the before crowd time loves this goes. It. The crowd loves it. Now timeout is being called. We see the tea on the table and Samir Bakar is screaming, but looks like that is the game sealer here for Gabriel. Timeout is being called. So we are talking to the judges, but I think the situation is quite clear. Samir being on 7,200 life points. And that should mean that we have a game two winner being Gabriel Susi here. And, and yes, they indeed, they're the packing cards their cards. Absolutely FTK'd in game two, if you want indeed, to say Indeed, so. indeed. So, as you guys should know, in top cut, in single elimination, there's no draws. In Swiss, this would be a very easy draw. But how would we get both of them into top eight? That's not possible. So We want to do it. We want it to have a top so nine, cool. but it's impossible. We will have a sudden death here. Both players having won one game now will bring them to a third. No siding. No siding allowed. And also, it's not the usual procedure that the loser of this last match decides who will be going first or second. We will actually have to roll the die to see who will be having the pleasure to go first here. Yeah. Or do you think you want to go first or second here? What is, the, what is your preference in this specific matchup? Do you think going first here is good? I think it is, right? I think going first is always good. You can go for a Dweller, you can maybe get a card to the GY that deals some damage. Yeah. And I mean, Samir is really in the driver's seat here, right? If he starts the game, then he can set up a board, which is impressive enough to beat Gabriel. So we are going I mean, to see that. Yes, soon. on the one hand, but on the other hand, Samir Baka has just decided to go second. So yeah, his main true. deck might be tailored a lot more towards going second. And therefore, he could struggle a little bit when he has to face the situation of going first here. So it will be really interesting to see quick shuffling. And we only had the shuffling process and no side taking. And therefore, the players are already ready. So we go into game three of this top 16 feature match right now. Will be interesting to see who will be the one going first here. <laughs> they're casually waiting for the sign to start the duel. And yeah, look, they're, I think they're with the hand signal, signalizing, yep, we gotta roll a die again. And that's what's happening. I think they already did, by the way. I have looked at the screen Ooh. while you were uh, still talking to the crowd. I was getting distracted by the dice roll, and I think that. I can't remember who won. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you guys. Story, Thanks for the story, Leo. I'm not going to lie to you guys, but someone won the die roll. So we will have someone who will start the game. Perfect commentary here by my co-commentator, <laughs> so Leonard König. So we see Terra forming, and oh, there oh. is the spooky dogwood for Samir Baka. I mean, even if he is going first, that's kind of a cool card because it will just stop one turn completely. But yes, Samir Baka is going to go first, starting it all off with the Terra forming here for the almighty. Pearl Rhino. And this is the first time we haven't seen Pearl Rhino milled. This is, I think, the most milled card in the featured matches we have seen this weekend. I would certainly agree we did see that a lot. Which is the Tillman's monster we need here? I think he, he was considering Huffness, but when you go for Huffness, you already have a couple other names. So yeah, you would need a starter here in this scenario, and therefore we go for the Rhino Heart. And instead. I think he has the Shiren in hand already, so there are already some extenders. Let's try to find the hand of Gabriel. Let's there is Shiren being activated. Gabriel not doing anything against that. I mean, for example, oh, now Gabriel that he's started. going second, he definitely didn't bring in the Gammas that you would that usually want to bring in. And oh. Scream and Mudora are being milled. Mudora would be a great mill if he did discard one already, so Kaldo would be the preferred Ishizu card from Magnificent Maven at this point. However, he can still 
go for the Telemann Scream effect to fetch another trap card from the deck to the hand. And it is solid because most of the time when you're going second, you're going to side, side out, out the crime. That happens a lot for sure. He still has the spooky dog wood in hand. That's really because Gabriel cannot afford to give his opponent more life points. So this will yeah. really be a turn skipping card. I think the spooky dog wood in this specific situation might actually even act similar like a maxi for yeah. his opponent because he really doesn't want to summon a whole bunch of monsters when the effect of spooky darkwood is applying so it's kind of a similar um reaction that might be forced from his opponent there with the spooky darkwood so shiren is activated are we going to see a bestial card here shiren now in defense position in the spell trap zone no, i'm just kidding obviously can it resolve it looks like it resolves it seems like gabriel gabriel gave the okay yeah, it definitely looked like it. So, yep. yep. And now we're taking the Rhino Heart away, and we are going to summon out good old Kid Kalos. Yep, there we have her, Kid Kalos using the effect on summon. Gabriel nodding once more, letting Samia play here quite freely, searching for the Merli, and we know when there's Kid Kalos on the field and Merli in the hand, the most likely thing to happen next is the special summon of Merli and the tribute of Kid Kalos being able to mill eight now while your opponent can't mill anything. So you're really getting ahead in oh, resources. We... Ooh, there is he Brandon in high spirits actually being sided and going second for him. This is a card that he can actually add back in the end phase this turn. So I don't know if this means that he's, I mean, it probably means that he's going to activate both of those, Merle and the Havnes, Shiren the only one that has triggered so far. Yeah, absolutely. So apparently no response from Gabi Susi. He doesn't really want to do anything. Maybe he cannot do anything. Maybe he has no options in his hand. He really might be sitting there with a full combo hand, Gabi Susi, because he had to side for going first last yeah. game, and now he might have sided out all the going second cards, and that could really, really be hurtful for him here. We gotta see. So God, Samir really still considering which effects he wants to trigger here. Also, we see that he hit an Caldo as well, so he now has the combination of Mudara and Caldo in his graveyard. Oh, and but there is a callback from Gabriel. To bounce the Shiren. I mean, you usually don't want to do that, but probably just wants to get rid of one of the level 4 monsters on board, to be honest. He just wants to avoid Dweller by all costs. Oh, look at how angry this Kalbeck is being summoned in attack position already, and I think we are going to see a roll calls now. That is very, very likely what's going to happen. Yep, he's looking for it. Indeed, Tillemans, roll Carlos hitting the field. So, now we are going to resolve the Merli. Merli can now decide, do I want to go into a Mud Dragon or... That's most likely that going looks to be like Dragon. Oh. Can't go into Garuba with the Rhino Heart, so... He's double checking, but yeah, I think he's definitely going to go into the Mud Dragon here. That seems very, very likely. Oh, he wants to use... Okay, we are going for Kaleido Heart instead. Oh, that is also really good play to now shuffle away the Kalbeck because there is already a monster on bottom Gabriel's side so not giving his opponent any level 4 bodies either. And I mean Samia knows most likely that Gabriel Susi is siding in triple super polymerization and even though he was going first last game maybe there's a chance he sided those in so you rather want to play around the super polymerization and this board is successfully doing so. That is indeed true and now we are having the Pearl Rhino popped the Kalbeck instead of the Rhino Heart, which kind of makes sense. He already resolved the stream, otherwise you would shuffle back the Kalbeck and pop your Kaleido Heart, special summon it back and send screen. And looks like after setting ah, one card, we're we going go. to the end phase. We are adding back Brandon and High Spirits. So turn number one of this sudden death here in our top 16 feature match, Game 3, is ended. And it's going over to Gabriel Susi to have his first turn as well. And we are going to see if Gabriel is going to have something to combat this spooky dogwood. A card that gains so many life points in one turn. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah, indeed. 
Just in case some of the viewers don't really know how this Southern Death works, could you maybe quickly explain how we are actually going to do that? Or maybe I could actually also take it over. We have the turn zero for Samir that just happened. And then we're going to have three extra turns being passed back and forth. And uh, that is going to be the first extra turn right here, right now for Gabriel Susi. And then after that, there's still going to be two more turns. And after the end, or in the end phase of turn number three, extra turn number three, we're going to compare the life points and see who has more. Wow, and this is such a great mill for Shiren, hitting the Caldo and hitting the Havnis and discarding the Merli. So he can actually, I mean, he heavily plays into Dogwood, right? I mean, he could just be activating Ghost Sister and Spooky Dogwood here, yeah. yeah. He could have actually, actually done it on the Shiren as well. Yeah, I mean, that's what I thought, but looks like he's, I mean, he can still do it on the Shiren, right? Of course, the, the Shiren effect is still resolving. No, no, the Shiren is on the field when the cards are milled. It happens at the same time. Yeah, exactly. But, but still, you, you no, couldn't you, react you to it yet. So if, if you want to use the Spooky Dog Wood, then you are going to use it now. You use it when the Shiren is now, still. No? Let's just double read the Spooky Dog Wood. Can just activate it. Whenever. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. I, I thought it really relies on being a monster, oh, on, no, no, on no. having a monster on the field. But you could just not do that. You're right. But maybe Samia wants to keep the spooky dogwood for the last and final turn of the match, and then Gabriel could just have no way to come yeah. back into the game when there is the effect of spooky dogwood applying, and that could really be uh, the ending of it. And Samia tries to just win this turn right now with his t element cards or maybe survive this turn with his t element cards rather and that could also be a quite smart move maybe he also wants to so show some dominance saying i can win without using the spooky dogwood i won with only my t element monsters on the field that is potentially true we see that he has Caldo in Graveyard now as well. So Sami has Caldo and Mudora at the moment, and now Gabriel has Caldo himself. And the double Hafner is obviously not the greatest. We saw Sami Mill triple Hafner in game one, still being able to take the victory there. But let's see how Gabriel can do stuff here with the double Hafner Mill in this situation. I think he only announced the Hafner. Oh, you think he didn't announce the Murley? That is very much true. I mean, he knows there's Caldo, so you probably don't want to activate two effects, you're right. So I think Caldo targeted both the Hafnesses? I mean, makes sense, right? Because you do want to give your opponent some bad mills, and when you are yeah. giving him more Hafness to mill when that card is already resolved, I do really understand why you would do that. Now, the Magnamud was targeted by Samir himself, and now I think that the both Mudoras are being targeted as well. Okay, so this is not the banished pile, this is just the targeted cards for the Ishizu Shufflers. And now we are resolving the entire situation. Merli is in the GY, not being activated. Makes sense to rather activate Hafnis than Merli, because you can always access Merli through Sprite Sprint. But I think once again, Samir Bacha There is actually... still a card, Samir. <laughs> I think once again, so, oh look, and he reveals the Ghost Sister in Spooky Darkwood. He revealed basically to Gabriel that there's one in his deck, but unfortunately enough for Gabriel, there's another one in his hand. But yeah, wait, I think we saw that there's Diviner of the Herald in the hand of Samir. It does look like it a little bit, and I think that once again shows us that Diviner is not really the greatest in this deck. A lot of people have decided to cut this card now, and I think this might be a pretty easy cut going forward, because you have very powerful yeah. normal summons in this deck, and just adding this as a normal summon is not really great. I've seen multiple matches over the course of this weekend where the t -Elements player would be popping off, would be doing a combo, and then he would just pass with the Diviner in yeah, hand, and uh, that is just something you can't use. I mean, you can use it if you have a Herald of Orange Light as well in your hand, but that's a very rare occurrence. That is true, and there is the normal summon of Keldo, the Sacred Protector, and this this may be just going to be a Baguska Pass. That could also be true. Baguska Pass would maybe t make this game go a whole lot longer, to be honest. I really don't think it would, because you just need some effects that get Caldo into the GY or Mudora, and then you can shuffle back your own cards and oh. pop the Baguska via Pearl Rhino. Absolutely true. But Sami is considering to do something right here. 
Yep. Oh, he's using the Salik. Oh, Salik absolutely makes sense. And he is tributing his own Rukos. This is not the card you target. He ca targets the Sacred Protector. And this also makes sense because Kaldo... No, Kaldo was activated this turn because otherwise he could chain it as well so we are tributing the roll colors and roll colors will now be able to special summon itself back and the rhino heart can shuffle the shiren back because a t element card monster was sent to the gy via card effect that is true indeed so gabriel is thinking whether he could have a response for that but that is not going to be the case we are resolving and of course because the good old rule colors was fanned to the graveyard by a card effect. We are going to reborn it once again. Now it cannot use its effect anymore because it's not fusion summon anymore. Still a pretty big beater left on the field. And there's a set one and pass from Gabriel Susi. So that oh, is, is definitely not impressive. Gabriel. Samir now has two big monsters on board, only facing the Caldo of Gabriel Susi. And he also still has the Ghost Sisters and Spooky Dogwood in his hand. So even if he cannot end it this turn, he has a very good backup plan to then just sit on that Ghost Sister and Spooky Dogwood in the follow up turn. The attacks deal so much damage. These fusion monsters are even boosted by Pearl Rhino's first effect, I think, actually. No, by the second effect. Yeah. We and are taking damage. Gabriel Susi so far only had to take one loss in this entire tournament, but it looks like Samir Baka might be able oh, to. And in the battle phase, we are going to activate it. Branded in high spirits, we are discarding the Shiren. This looks like there is going to be one more effect. Nope, not at all. Oh, is there? Did he forget to side in? What did happened there? I mean, he has no real colors left in extra deck, so maybe that's why he cannot oh, resolve yes, the Brandon High problem. Spirits. Oh, yes, that is the problem, yes, exactly. That has to be the problem here. Yep, so he cannot activate the Brandon High Spirits, but oh. still, it is game, and Sami Abaka takes it! France wins over France, and we still have a very, very competent competitor for France now in top eight, being Sami Abaka, who overcomes Gabriel Susi in a Long and crueling match going for all three games, but ultimately, even though he lost the die roll at the beginning, he comes out on top. He actually took it away from Gabriel. He actually got the revenge for yeah. the European Championship Finals in 2019, and I think he is really happy about how this wow. game went down. What a long and this game, game one was absolutely insane. The other two matches or the other two games were a bit quick. Quicker, yeah. But this quicker. first game over like 40 minutes, it was absolutely insane. He broke the board and there were so many comebacks. And after all, the attack boost of Wallow was basically the deciding factor. But honestly, that was one of the deciding factors. But I think super polarization was the beginning yeah. of it all like super polarization was the card that enabled him to break the whole board in the first place also gabriel had a really bad start he had to send i think kalbeck or agido yeah it was kalbeck as think. the first thing and then had to mill his opponent as well and obviously he's going to profit from that yeah for sure but when we see that super polarization is so good in the mirror match and you're playing mirror matches all day long because there are so many successful ishizu tillman's players why would you only run one of it in the main deck? Like, don't you think this is a card you always want to see? Are you a fan of only playing one of it? Or would you max out on it rather? I think it is kind of cool to only play one. I mean, there are some power spell sets you don't want to see too often, like triple tactic talents. I mean, the super polymerization is, I think, not hard once per turn. No. However, it is still, as I said earlier, a big investment discarding a card and then having to possibly also use monsters from your field. But guys, we have a special treat for you. We have a new deck breakdown that we oh. want to show you guys. Let's see it. Top 16 breakdown. The number of total Ishizu Tielemans decks has risen 81% as we just saw in the match. But there's still 13% Fluanderies in there and also 6% Draco Slayer. Translating that into real numbers, that means we still have two Fluanderies players being left in competition and also the one Draco Slayer player with Federico Mikotzi is still going strong in the tournament. And I said it earlier, Draco Slayer is the deck that can actually take this event away from Ishizu Tier Elements. And so you know what I said at the beginning of the day? It's going to be full underies. We both still have our rogue pick and left yeah. in the tournament. And let me tell you something on top of all of that. Fluanda Reese is playing Draco Slayers right now in top 16. I think they may already be done, but... Uh, we don't know. Maybe one knocked out the other already. 
So that is certainly going to be a very interesting question. I mean, um, it's probably, if I would see the matchup in the first place, would be very, very much favored towards the Draco Slayer deck. Yes, and that is because there are many wind monsters, of oh, course, yeah. in the Draco oh, yeah. Slayer deck, so you can actually out the barrier statue. Yep. Also, Magic Spectre Bunbuku is a neat little card. It cannot be targeted and it cannot be destroyed via card effect, so I think the only thing stopping Bunbuku from attacking over the statue <laughs> is the trap card effect and the GY that when your opponent, uh, when you tribute summon another monster, then you can book all the monsters of your opponent. So you would have to use that in the main phase over Bumbuku, and then your opponent can possibly special I mean, summon another monster. This honestly, yeah, that many sounds conditions. quite bad. Yeah. yeah, because you are just booking a Bumbuku, which yeah. sounds like I'm making that up. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> also, the new Magic Spectre card, which does not have Magic Spectre in the name. However, the first sentence is, sorry, this card is always treated as a Magic Spectre card. It says that when you are summoning it, you can search for a field spell and then discard a yep. card. And you know which field spell is really good against Fluanderies? Zombie, Zombie World. World. And that is definitely a card that every uh, single one of the Draco Slayer players is bringing. Absolutely. In the main deck, they are usually going for Necro Valley because they are prepared for Ishizu tier. And that is the best field spell versus Ishizu Absolutely. tier. And I mean, in the side deck, they then may even bring multiple options. But Zombie World certainly the option versus this deck. So I'm quite sure that's like going into game two and going into game three going to be a hard thing for the Flanderese deck because even if you only have that going second, it's still such a big problem for the Flanderese strategy because we saw that before. People were even siding in. There can be only one going second versus yeah. this deck. If you are able to establish like a permanent effect that stops this deck from playing, it's left there with not a whole lot. They, they can only kick with Empton. And at some point, you will find a way to get rid of the Empton. Indeed, so it might turn out to be quite harsh. And uh, that will be really interesting to see whether Federico Mikazzi won that. As we say, we would be expecting him to win it, but there can always be some bricky hands. I mean, maybe of he course. just has no access to nothing. But uh, judging by his performance so far, I would say that his deck is built pretty consistently. And I mean, we had a quick peek at his deck list already. It looks yeah. great. So I would hope that he could make it into and top eight. We also have something else for you guys. We have oh. calculated the brackets of two special players. Ooh. And if both of these players continue to win, we might actually have a Joshua Schmidt versus Jesse Cotton finale because both of these players were still playing in top 16. Again, we don't know if they won their matches or if they lost, but those were quite... That in could be a final. Tens of it, like Beck versus Cotton is a really huge match. Yeah, I mean, Jesse Cotton would have to defeat Erikos Beck first, which is a well, very, very, very strong and well-known player from the Greek community. Let's not disregard the Greek people, because we just, never honored, we just honored the French community by having that French mirror match here in our featured match. Uh, but there's also still a Greek player in there, which is quite accomplished and had success in the past. But somebody that had success in the past, but also just had success in this featured match, is Samir Baka. So, Ed, please interview our top eight contestant, Samir Baka, now. Welcome, guys. Yes, I am here with somebody who's just won that top 16 bout to get into the top eight. Just so you know what's going to happen, we're going to have a quick talk about the duel that you've just seen. Then we're going to have a quick rotating door interview with your top eight. Samir, first of all, congratulations. Talk to us about that game, because it's very difficult to be going up against the mirror matchup. Do you know what to play test for in time? Because we imagine we're going to see a lot of that. Is that extra ruling, the extra few turns, something that you've play tested for? Or are you just having to sort of wing it as it goes? Oh, uh, I little understand. Uh, uh, I much play testing. I, uh, I sleep uh, three hours, uh, three nights just for playing, just for good play testing for this event. And, uh, I really want to sleep after this event. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, you deserve it by this point. Although top eight, so you've done incredibly well. Just going through this, the, I mean, each turn lasts a millennium. So those kind of post-match extra time things yeah. takes a long old time, but you still manage to do it. When it comes into those moments, do you think there's anything else that you can do other than just make sure you side in the right cards and just play each moment? There's a lot of interaction between all the cards, so are you having to just make sure you make no mistakes at all, or is it more than that? Yes, because uh, the first player missed token and uh, he has lost the game, and uh, Kalbeck, Aguido, the game is really crazy. And uh, me, uh, I didn't use the name during my turn, except during the end phase, because the same situation. I didn't want my opening to proc the chair element. It's uh, the game of Mirage match. 
It's a really, really, really difficult. Or it's a reason uh, much time for playing uh, on Gab's team. And then in the last game, you had the spooky dogwood in hand. So you had a couple of options, and then you ended up taking it. So congratulations, you're in the top eight. Really hope that the rest of the tournament goes well for you. Thank you so much for having this post-match interview with us. I'm going to uh, usher you off this way, because we're now going to get into our revolving door. So first up, we've got Pierluigi Sorrentino. Come on up. How are you doing? You're in the top eight. How are you feeling about it? Uh, pretty excited. Yeah. Hope I can make it all the way. It's been a long old couple of days. We're now quite late on the second day. How are you feeling? Uh, no, adrenaline is kicking in. Yeah? Yeah. That top cut adrenaline. Well, best of luck for all of the next, the next couple of matches that you guys have got coming up. It's going to be very exciting. I'm going to let you usher off into your next game. Best of luck. Right, next up, we've got Vincenzo Orofino. Come on up, Vincenzo. Welcome. How are you feeling? I'm fine. Yeah? Yeah, kind of tired, but I know I'm... I'm going to have to play my friend in top eight, so I'm fine yeah. even if I lose. It's... Have you play tested against your friend before? Yeah, yeah, a lot. So you're feeling confident? Mm, I think it's a bit better, actually. <laughs> well, that's very humble of you. Well, I hope it goes well. Best of luck in these top things. You've done incredibly well to get to this point. You're now officially topped YCS Dortmund 2022. Any final words for people before you go into these final matches? Uh, hard work pays off. Hard work pays off. There you go. Thank you very much. Best of luck in your games. I'll usher you off this way. Next up, we've got Joshua Schmidt. Joshua, hello. Last time we saw you was at YCS Utrecht lifting up that trophy. How are you feeling at the top eight in YCS Dortmund? Uh, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, I'm also nervous because that is that would be an incredible story to, to win two in a row, but there's still uh, three tough opponents ahead, so I'm trying to do my best and uh, happy either way. But it certainly are. Now, bear in mind, the game has changed a little bit since Utrecht. How are you dealing with the new meta? Uh, I have tried to beat Ishizu here, but I have joined them at this point because um, I haven't figured out a better way than doing that. But I do like the deck. I like the mirror match, so I'm, I'm happy with it. So. Yeah. Excellent. Well, best of luck to you. Maybe we'll be seeing two back-to-back -back YCS wins. Who knows? But we'll find out in the next couple of games. Thank you very much, Joshua. I'll usher you this way as well. Next up, we've got Enzo Duval. Come on up, Enzo. Now, how are you feeling this far into the weekend? Uh, exhausted. I would imagine so. It's been a long couple of days. It was like a 12 to 14 hour day of dueling yesterday. You've made it all the way to the top eight. What are you feeling going into these games? How are you composing yourself? Uh, I mean, it's quite uh, it's a, a, a quite challenging format, but uh, it's fine. I mean, it's only Joshua Schmidt, so I'm gonna do it. Thanks to my French friends, uh, Jamal Afizi. So I, I think I'm prepared. I think you're prepared. Well, hopefully you are. Best of luck in those games. Perhaps we'll be seeing you towards the final. Wish you all the luck in the world. I'll usher you this way as well. Thank you very much for our chat. Right next up, we got Eric Osbeck. Come on up, sir. Now, how are you feeling this far into the weekend? I'm feeling very well and hungry for the tournament. Excellent. That's what we like to hear. Someone who's keen to get into this final. Now, you've made top eight, an amazing achievement. How are you dealing with the format? Are you finding it fairly good? Are you managing it? Or have you got your head around it all? I love the format. In general, in general I love tier zero formats because I like playing mirror matches. So I'm very happy with the format right now. So you're prepared for more mirror matches in these final couple of games then? Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens. Hopefully, we'll see you on one of those finals. I'll usher you this way. Best of luck in your next games. Hope it all goes well. Next up, we've only got a couple more. We've got Eddie Eater. Come on up, Eddie. We saw you only a couple of matches ago. Now, how are you feeling after getting that next win? I mean, I feel great. I'm not going to lie. Um, yeah, I'm really hyped. I, I got way further than I wanted to, so now I'm just you know, taking it as it comes. I mean, a top eight at YCS Dortmund, that's always a good achievement. You never know, though. You've got this far. There's always the chance you can get into the final, perhaps even take home that trophy. Any thoughts that you're trying to just keep as you go into these final games? I just want to stay focused. I mean, at this point, you know, if I win, I win. If I lose, I lose. But I want to just play my best game. That's that's humbling. So hopefully you'll do very well. I wish you all the best of luck in your upcoming games. I will also usher you off so you can get ready for those final couple of rounds. Best of luck to you, sir. And finally, we have Mario Aguiro. Come on over, sir. Now, how are you feeling? Uh, really happy because this top is unexpected, but uh, I'm, I'm really confident now. Excellent. Now, how have you been finding the format? Have you been managing it all right? Have you had some luck, do you think? Or have you generally been playing quite well against what you've been going up against? Uh, I played quite well, but uh, I, I was expecting a lot of the Arishizu, but I faced everything like Exosister, Sky Striker, uh, uh, Naturia. So it was a really nice experience. To... You've had a nice cocktail of different yeah. decks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is the, the uh, epiphing of Yu-Gi-Oh! 
Excellent. Well, hopefully you'll have a good, clean sail through these next couple of rounds. May not be the same level of variety that you've had throughout the rest of the tournament, yeah. but I wish you the best of luck. I hope it goes well. I will also usher you off so you can prepare for your next rounds. Thank you very much, Mario. And goodness me, that is our top eight. You have now met all of them. You've heard some of their keen words of advice for all, the, all of the mindset that you've got to have for this. Very, very exciting to see what happens. Don't go anywhere because we've got top eight, top four, and then our final coming up very, very soon.
Hello again, and welcome back to your coverage of the Yu-Gi-Oh! Championships live from Dortmund. We are now into the top eight of our Top Cut tournament here, and we've just met all of the players, but let's have a feature match with just two of them. So on my right, we have Mario Argyro, and on my left, we have Eddie Eater. And this is going to be another very exciting game as we head towards that final. Gentlemen, we need to do a high roll to see which one of you is going to be going first. So who's going to go first? Eddie's going to give us the first roll. That is a seven. And Mario has gone for an eight. So Mario, you're going to go first. Mario is going to be going first. And with that, I'm going to hand you guys over to Marcello and Alberto, a wonderful Italian commentary duo, who are going to take you through this amazing top eight bout. Guys, take it away. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the top eight of YCS Dortmund 2022. Only three more matches remaining to find out who the winner will be and what a remaining lineup we had. As Ed mentioned, we were able to go uh, through all of them uh, one by one and uh, what a list of players. And uh, honestly, now we decided to pick this one because we have to <laughs> test uh, Alberto's powers uh, because uh, at the end of the day, after we went through the deck breakdown for the top cut, 72% uh, was Ishizu Tierleman. And in our top eight, uh, out of the eight decks, uh, seven of them are Ishizu tier element. And there is one lone survivor, which is Mario Argiro and his Flow Wonder is deck. So he is your only hope to actually break the course, <laughs> uh, or rather the opposite thing. Uh, so we'll, of course, find out uh, who that will be. Unfortunately, and I want to mention it, uh, it was going to be either Mario or uh, Federico because yeah. they had to clash in an all-Italian top 16 match uh, between Draco Slayer and Flo Wanderis. Uh, in game three at the end, Mario took it. Uh, but regardless, we would have had these uh, seven issues here against one lonely deck. Uh, and in this case, it will be Flo Wanderis. Uh, we had seen this matchup a couple of times in the past, but as we have mentioned already, in Diego. Yeah. Probably the best player in the world of Luander is, is a dear friend and teammate of Mario. So they play together. They have the same exact deck list. So I'm sure he's doing something right. And let's hope for him and for everyone else supporting the deck that he will do well. But I don't want to keep you guys waiting all too long. Our players are ready. Let's find out who will be the winner of game one. And here they are, Mario, I believe, won the die roll, which is a huge deal in this matchup. Uh, gonna go first and try to set up his field, uh, of course, hoping to hit uh, the dimension shifter. Let's see if he has what it takes. Uh, I see already a pot of duality and uh, maybe a Robina. And, and a shifter for sure. <laughs> yeah, and here <laughs> it is. Uh, what a better way to start the top eight than with the shifter from Mario right away. Nice stuff, actually, from Mario. Uh, we didn't get the chance to see the shifter being played by Diego in, during the top 64, but maybe he, he will get the revenge. revenge. <laughs> Ooh, and Mario, with an interesting choice, actually decides to pick up the statue right away. I think uh, he already had Art Robina, and now we actually get to see Etienne revealing a bestial, but he cannot summon it, of course. And this gives a huge information to Mario. Also has Necro Necrovalley. Wow, yeah, he has Necrovalley in hand, which means that if he activates it now, he plays around the bestial from his opponent. Uh, and uh, he decides not to go for it, uh, which uh, is an interesting choice. Uh, I think it would have made a lot of sense uh, from uh, uh, Mario to prevent it, uh, but uh, let's see what he has in mind. Definitely an interesting inclusion, as we mentioned already for Diego, they are playing Metaverse as well. But uh, here, the only thing that would make sense is if he wants to search the map uh, right here yeah. with the Ampen, I would guess. So let's see if that is the case. 
because if he goes for the Dreaming Town, I think then it was always going to be better to go for Necrovalley right, right away. Right? Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, this is not the case, and Mario picks up the Dreaming Town, which could be a little bit of a mistake from the Italian if he goes for Necrovalley this turn. Let's see. Maybe he just wants to keep it because he knows with Shifter resolved uh, his opponent will not access the graveyard and this is the case so Mario does not go for Necrovalle and in the end phase uh, his opponent will be able to resolve uh, the Magna to get uh, maybe the Druid Swarm yeah. or another of his bestial monsters. Yeah, I'm kind of skeptic about uh, the missed activation of Necrovalley, I have to admit. Yeah, because in that spot, I think uh, maybe it's the safest solution, right? You just for go sure. for it and... Uh, anyway, looks like Mario uh, fails it and... Uh, Edeyan should not be making many moves uh, given that he's under Dimension Shifter. Absolutely. No, it does make sense to not want to activate it, but the thing is, once Etienne reveals to you the bestial, I think you activate it yeah. just for that reason. But let's see if it will be relevant uh, right here. Of course it is in terms of uh, not summoning uh, the statue. And now we get to see an instant fusion uh, from uh, Etienne. Really good card to pick up, of course. We have mentioned it plenty of times already. What do you think is he going for? Uh, it's an interesting uh, position here because he knows the Dreaming Town uh, plus the Cloandry's engine is there, which means he has to find a way to push for the amp and uh, without accessing his graveyard. So let's first of all check his extra deck uh, to see, for example, which rank 6 play he has. Uh, uh, I think Beatrice, uh, yeah, and yeah. he does not play the Wallow. So he has the Beatrice, but he also has uh, the Zeus, which could be an interesting uh, idea. Uh, alongside, of course, uh, going for Maguska. Yeah. Yeah, I think Maguska yeah. is very annoying against uh, Flow and Race. Absolutely. It is one of those cards where even against uh, uh, Dimension Shifter, it's one of the solutions against a lot of these matchups, uh, uh, even against the Pendulum one, that we, which we're talking about. And here we get to see actually a nice move uh, from Etian, uh, going for the one copy of Artbeat uh, to play around the Dreaming Town, forcing Mario to go for the statue if he feels like it, uh, and then attacking over the fragile little monster. So. <laughs> Let's see if that will be the case here. He also has terraforming, so if it wasn't for the shifter, yeah. what a dream end from Etiana. Yeah, and yeah, here, here uh, we see the Perle Rhino. Yeah, it's just correct to put some pressure on Mario, no? Yeah, would you have liked uh, the activation uh, right away of the art beat, or do you think it's correct to just wait? And I think you can wait here. Okay. Yeah, you can wait. It's because, uh, like at the moment, Mario, uh, apart from the amp, and uh, yeah, at the end knows that he has the, mm -hmm. the his, his set card. So I think it's it's okay to to keep the heart beat. And I think here. It is actually Mario who pulled the trigger and decides to go right away for this Dreaming Town. Uh, there won't be an answer apparently from Etian. Uh, he doesn't even make him waste the art pit here. And he will be able to get a few of his things back. Uh, Yeah, and here there's the usual stuff uh, we also seen in, in the top 64 match of Diego mm -hmm. with Diego and Rubina. This we is could what see a uh, Tucan, which would be cute uh, here. And yeah, this is what's happening. Uh, he gets back uh, the Dreaming Town uh, that was banished by Shifter, and then he's able to go for Apex Avian uh, just to shut down another interruption from his opponent uh, and get back uh, the Tucan uh, potentially instead. He goes for just the Eglen uh, and yeah, gives his deck back to his opponent for a shuffle. 
Uh, this is still somewhat risky, I gotta say. Because if we see a normal summon, uh, for example, of uh, another bestial here, we could get into the Zeus. Uh, you, of course, have the Apex, uh, but you can still get a little bit of an annoying uh, presence on board. So, not the end of the world for Etian, I gotta say. Yeah. And I really think him back to that Necro Valley, which is costing him a little bit here. Maybe some. A little bit of a team border radar. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see if uh, it will cost him. Uh, team borders. This, uh. Let's see if Etienne uh, might be holding uh, another bestial or. Yeah, oh, I mean, uh, yeah, he just goes to the battle phase, uh, gets rid of it uh, in main phase two, might go for Boygen. Let's see what he decides to do. A lot of options available uh, for Etienne. Is he just passing? Whoa. No, it is ah, doing okay. what I was no, saying. So he goes for the play I was mentioning, which is essentially a normal summon. And now he has access to Beatrice if he feels like that a good play. He didn't go for the Beatrice, uh, so he cannot go for the Zeus essentially yeah. uh, beforehand. But now. Mario is just asking for some translation uh, and uh, at the moment uh, will be clarified that the sharing gets to resolve uh, and maybe he goes for a Baguska afterwards. Let's see if he has access to another four. Wow, and actually Ooh. surprisingly, Mario goes for Apex uh, on the Sheyrin. Do you like that? I know, uh, the thing is that I'm wondering what Mario was afraid of in this situation uh, with the Shirin being activated. I mm -hmm. think Etienne was forcing Mario to activate the Apex. Mm -hmm. But honestly, I would have not activated it. Yeah, because he's still under Shifter and he already normal summoned. So it's not like he can uh, instantly go into the Baguska. And now we get to see the Beatrice eat the field uh, as expected. Really strong card. It was back in 2015, it is now also really, really good. Um, and when you make it um, by not discarding a Burning Abyss, it's even better because you can use the effect right away. Yeah. Of course, not really useful now, but next turn it will be able to activate. So face down, most likely the art beat, which we know of. Yeah. And uh, now the play is back to Mario. And actually we see an activation right away in the draw phase. Could be because he knows of the Necro Valley, maybe. Let's see. Yeah, I think this move from Median is correct, uh, anyways, just to prevent you know any situation. Yeah, and this is uh, actually a pretty nice uh, sequence of play by doing this. Uh, is guaranteed to add both an Abnis and to resolve a fusion summon. So great stuff uh, by Etienne, uh, and again, uh, that one Necro Valley misstep. Uh, let's hope it's not gonna cost Mario too much in this game. And yeah, here, as expected, we get to see the Avnis. Uh, we will resolve uh, the Fusion Summon. Of course, everything is summoned to defense position, as you can imagine. But now the really good thing is that Perle Rhino also will be able to trigger and destroy the Empen. So a lot of advantage, I would say, going on uh, by Etienne, who seems to be knowing uh, what he is doing. Even the Mad Dragon is quite annoying. And yeah, Perle Rhino will activate, uh, getting rid of the Empen. Uh, very nice sequence of play from Etienne, kiting back, fighting back against the shifter, but now plays back to Mario, and I saw the one metaverse, I believe, Ooh. which could be really interesting going on, because we know the one art bit is face down at the moment, but that is only out to Mystic Mine at all in main, or at least main deck, yeah. yeah. I don't know, I'm still thinking about the Necro Valley not being activated from Mario very first turn, no? Yeah, now he has it, uh, but it seems like it's a little too late. Uh, the Beatrice uh, and the other TL cards already resolved, uh, so not exactly what you would wish for. But that's why we get to see instead a normal summon being chained with the Rubina. No response from Etienne, who will uh, hope to get some really good meals with this Avni. So yeah. I'm uh, once again concerned by this Necro Valley not coming down. 
I mean, he knows that there is the, the art bit, but yeah. you, you have to force it at some point. So uh, his goal is probably to get rid of it uh, here. But it's not an easy task. And now Etienne again going to try his best. Um, we knew that there were a uh, statue in the end. Yeah. And now he will get uh, to the three, I think. Yeah. And here Mario is going, I guess, for the apex. Oh, he also has the rides up. Yeah, he also has the rides up. But does he have access to another summon this turn? I don't think so. He does not, and he has to be careful uh, because he cannot target some of these cars due to Mad Dragon protection effect. So this is not the easiest uh, play. Let's see what he wants to do. Maybe get him rid of the art bit uh, with the rides up. He could also try and clean some of this board. And yeah, let's see if there is a response from Etienne. So what he's doing is he's targeted the art pit to get on top. This way he knows that his opponent doesn't have an art pit right away. And he's actually getting rid of his own card. And here comes down Necro Valley. But it seems like it's a little late at the moment. With the Metaverse face down though, he has access to Mystic Mine whenever he feels like that could be good. Let's see. Plays back to Etienne, and now the situation seems uh, a lot more stable than it was just a couple of uh, turns ago. So it could go either way, really. Yeah. Uh, really, because like uh, Mario uh, starting things off, uh, let's say, kind of okay. Um, I'm still thinking about, you know, that Apex being activated on the Shireen. Because uh, now with the Beatrice online, um, it's not easy to deal with this, especially because there is a lot of stuff going on from Etienne, although the Necro Valley is on the field. And think here just to make sure uh, all the effects. Uh, <laughs> indeed, is asking for a translation. You don't want to mess. Uh, anything yeah absolutely because uh, as i was saying when ed asked me which is my favorite uh, field spell of the game uh, i i told him that necro valley has changed the text so many times throughout the year so you want to make sure you know exactly what it does at the moment but just as i brought it for you guys on the screen the most recent text is that the cards in the graveyard cannot be banished and it negates any effect that would move a card to the graveyard to a different place so this is really strong card against tier so now the play is back to Etienne who is resolving this Beatrice uh, uh, interesting decision because he knew the art pit was on the top of the deck and by doing this instead it obviously randomizes his deck but he sends the crime which will activate one of the effects which uh, are not super common but thanks to the shifter are now relevant which is essentially gonna get back uh, the banish sharing and is he playing just the one of uh, uh, Kit Kalos in the actual deck? Can we check? Yeah. Yes. So if he needs to access it, he would need to put it back with the crime, which he didn't. So it's actually tough to get to the art pit uh, like this now. And we go for an XYZ summon into the Zeus, maybe, but instead, Baguska in the extra monster zone. Interesting decision here by Etienne. Yeah, this is something that we don't see quite often. Uh, yeah, but it's such a strong yeah. card in this specific matchup. But definitely an interesting uh, choice uh, to just uh, play it. Uh, in the extra monster zone. Wow. And uh, he goes even for the normal summon, switch it to defense. You can see Marius uh, being a little <laughs> confused about what's going on. Wondering why he decided to summon the Baguska. 
in the extra monster zone if there's a specific reason for it. Uh, it's uh, definitely an interesting decision and this is even more surprising. Uh, Mario going uh, for the Dream in Town. So gonna activate uh, just uh, the Robina. Let's see. Interesting stuff. Uh, now Mario picks up his card, uh, hoping to get something going. Uh, he already had the Mystic Mine option, yeah. which honestly looked uh, promising. But now he picks up Ooh. a really good uh, card uh, for this specific situation. You can see Etienne shaking his head a little bit. It is uh, the one and only. And now, yeah, he's going to get rid of the Baguska for the amp and, and a good uh, crowd. Round of applause from the crowd. The, the Unexplored wins a really, really sick card. Uh, so well played by Mario with the Dreaming Town, I gotta say. Yeah. But this was the card that brought him to the top eight, actually. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, and this is not even that great. Uh, you go for the Soliac, but thanks to Necrovalle, the tier in your graveyard cannot resolve. And now we get to see the effect to put back a few of these uh, useless Flowanderies to get some more draws uh, and he actually sends back the Raiza too. As you mentioned, this was the way he won in the top 16 against Federico, clutching an RP Feather Storm, which we know it's extremely powerful and he picks up set rotation, not that useful at the moment, uh, but definitely a card that could pay some uh, uh, value in this yeah. match, especially after siding. And I think uh, here uh, with the Necro Valley and the Unexplored wins, Mario. It's definitely a tough spot. Uh, maybe let's take a look real quick at uh, the side deck from Etienne because I want to see if he has some option from timeout. Uh, uh, not too much, I gotta say. He only has the Scarry shot, uh, but of course that gotta be considered because uh, we are almost at 20 minutes down and uh, he, he has to consider whether he wants to try and stay in this game or he might uh, just uh, be done with it. So, normal summon from Etienne. Uh, Mario not really caring too much about it, uh, but uh, we might see again a negation from the Suliak and I think play is back to Mario once again. Essentially, the only line of defense at the moment is this Suliak from Etian, but hardly gonna be enough. And Prosperity comes down from Mario, who is in extreme control of this game one in top eight. And let's see what he picks up. Actually, Quick Spell could be a really good option to play around the Suliak. Uh, and yeah, it's probably gonna be the best, yeah. exactly, yeah. Makes sense, uh, now he has a way to play around the Saliak from his opponent, uh, and that's all really he needed. I think uh, soon enough uh, we are gonna see Etian uh, pick up uh, his cards, unless Mario just makes uh, a huge misstep. And yeah, here we see the Robina and Etienne, as expected, picks up his cards. Game one goes to Mario. That really was an incredible game one. Both players had their chance to advance. It seems as if the opening from Mario was really, really strong, but then a little bit of a weird decision there with the Necro Valley not being activated on turn one. He might have shut down his opponent completely, but then he kept his composure. He's not used to playing on stream, we no. gotta admit, but he still recovered, kept his calm, used the Raiza to shuffle back the heartbeat, and then from from then on, it was really an easy, easy way to this win in game one. But the clutch card, I gotta say, was at the very least the wins uh, to get rid of Baguska, which uh, is just so, yeah, so strong. Yeah, that was incredible. Uh, I mean, I think Mario really Kabumba. wants to see this card uh, as often as he can. Arriva Bomba. Like, uh, and arriva uh, for real. Arriva. <laughs> <laughs> and in this case, he arrived for real. So now game one goes to Mario. So we can take a look at their side decks. Uh, what do you think uh, is Etienne going to try and do to win this game two?
So looking at his side deck, he has twin twisters, which uh, right. I fair think uh, it's uh, more than fair. And uh, we saw Mario playing in the top, in the top previously, yeah. and uh, one of the most annoying cards, which unfortunately Tian is not playing, is Zombie Ward, yeah. uh, which uh, we saw like Federico, like everybody, like in the top cut is one of these annoying cards against Flo Andres. Of course, he's not playing Zombie yeah. Ward now. But the card that is <laughs> going to side in is Twin Twisters. And there is one card which might be even better than Zombie Ward, yep. which is three copies of There Can Only Be this one. one. There Can Be Only One. It's uh, <laughs> such a strong card against Flo Wonder. He's both going first and second. He's playing three copies, and Mario has only a couple tools to get rid of these annoying continuous trap card. Uh, alongside it, uh, basically, Etienne just adds the call by the grave to try and hit the shifter, which really won Mario game one. Uh, and on the other end, uh, the Italian, just like Diego, same decklist, card by card. Uh, he's playing a lot of cards for going second, Mystic Mind, Dark Ruler, and he just adds evenly matched uh, alongside maybe the Cosmic, if he knows about there can be. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, if he doesn't, then I'm even skeptic that he would put it in. But outside of that, he has the one dimensional fissure. Will we see it? Uh, I'm not sure, but our players are ready. So let's find out who will be the winner of game two. Here they are, so Etienne going first in this game two. Let's see if he can put up a board. Good round of applause from the crowd supporting their friend. So let's see. Good start already with the Berle Rhino. Great, great. You can set up a Shuffler with a tier card in the graveyard, and basically that acts as an out to Mystic Mine, which surely be on the mind of Etienne when going through his deck. But we don't see a dimension shifter from Mario, so I'm sure he will be a sigh of relief from the German player already. Who is sprinting through this combo? Yeah, especially because I think if he had the chance to watch uh, previously our uh, top 64 future matches, he might know Mario is playing Diego's same list, being the same team, and uh, there are the Ghost Sisters in the side deck. Absolutely. You might be seeing a Game 3 happening. Yeah. Spooky Dogwood is in the side deck of Mario, so if we ever get to a Game 3 with a few minutes remaining, then that could come in handy, but for now, still plenty of time left for this top eight match. Uh, and uh, we gotta say for both of these players, or at least for Mario, this is their best performance ever, which means uh, it's not easy to compete uh, once you are in the top eight of, by the way, yeah. the biggest ever single European event of all time. So this is uh, huge. And look at these meals mm. from uh, Etienne, uh, eating uh, really well, uh, at least a couple of names uh, with the Saliak, uh, able to search an Avnis potentially and of course the Merli. So nice setup. Let's see which combo he thinks it's the best for this uh, specific matchup. We have seen with Diego how when you focus yourself on Ishizu card like Agido and Kelbeck, uh, it's actually quite annoying for Flo Andres. So especially because like if you get this the, the, your statue milled uh, you're in trouble yeah, because that's, basically uh, it's tough. a very tough one uh, we got to see basically the agido in action uh, uh, and there was at least uh, 15 to 20 cars being milled in uh, the top cut match and here we see even another Garura, which could get him a draw. Now he's gonna mill eight. Uh, let's see if he eats any of these Agidos or Kelbeck. He's gonna mill the top eight cards of his deck. Another Saliak, not really the greatest at the moment. Uh, kind of a whiff, but the final Diviner is actually pretty clutch uh, to guarantee a Baron potentially with a uh, elf play. So I think Diviner was one of the best mills at the very end, saving these atrocious eight mills but he could just uh, you know continue to yeah. extend his field but the diviner makes ton of a difference you can get five more mills guarantee a baron which is great in this matchup so 
great, great stuff. Yeah, here, without the end. Divine, it would have been, uh, let's say, a weak meal, but... Yeah. Uh, but I mean, no. here he has already a lot of stuff going on. Uh, mind that he shouldn't overextend too much. Uh, we mentioned it. Three copies of Mystic Mind, three copies <laughs> of Evenly Matched, three copies of Dark Ruler, no more. All of these cards are in the deck from Mario. So if you overextend, you can get punished significantly. We saw it even in the top 16 against Federico, where he opened double Evenly Matched plus a negation. Yeah. And that could cost you the game if you play recklessly. But I'm sure Etienne, as mentioned, as the Diviner, which means uh, he actually goes uh, for another Shuffler instead of milling five. Interesting. Ooh, okay, this is something that uh, we haven't seen uh, previously in our future match in which uh, you wanted the Flow Under is uh, to mill more cards. Yeah. This is not the case. He's going for the Baron, sets one, and looks like. Uh, that is it. Uh, so Mario picks up a card. Uh, it is a pot of duality. Does he have what it takes to fight this impressive opening uh, from the German player? Let's see. And uh, he does start things off with duality. I don't think Etienne is interested in involving with it. But he has so many good cards and he actually Ooh. negates with Baron the pot of duality. Wow, brave move. I really did not see that coming, but I guess uh, he doesn't want to face uh, the Dark Ruler. So, gonna mill three and he gets Ooh. both the Kelbeck and the Aguido. That's huge. Gonna mill 10 cards off the deck. Uh, what a jackpot here by the German player. And yeah, 10 cards are getting milled. Let's see who they are. I see a scream. Shireen, uh, crime, uh, so kind of a mid uh, mill, and yeah, nothing too relevant uh, for the Italian. Yeah, I think honestly, Mario was pretty happy with his mills. Yeah. Uh, while uh, from Etienne, uh, they could have been better. He has one fusion summon and essentially one uh, add which might not even resolve if uh, crime was milled and then maybe the Salik is face down. Yeah. Let's see. Also, good information from Mario that uh, at the end, uh, milled, uh, there can only be one. So, he yeah. might be holding... He knows it. The worst case scenario, if he loses this game, uh, he has to prepare for it in game three. So, I saw a trap card from Mario. Yeah. So, that hmm. could be a sneaky, evenly matched, you know? Could be. He milled one, so... Yeah. But, uh, why Let's not? Let's see. If we hear the dread... Uh, enter battle phase from Mario and he actually goes for a shuffler interesting this will basically guarantee that he gets to add one of these maybe crime it's the one he wants to add yeah looks like it and maybe a twin twister I would say or maybe just another name. Let's see what he wants to put back in the deck. It okay. is the Shireen. And now he shuffles free back. And essentially the Kid Carlos can get him the crime he just put back. Or maybe something else. Yeah. He gonna mill once again. Trying to mill five. Let's see what they are. And it's Merli plus Avnis. So Ooh. really good mills by Etienne. Oh, though we have to mention. With the crime in grave, we know that the face down is not crime. He's overextending so much. If there is an evenly matched from Mario, this game could be over in the blink of an eye. And, and there it is. it is, evenly matched from Mario already. That's what I was Oof. saying. Negating part of duality was actually so brave from Etienne. But you know, the braveness and foolishness of men are a thin line. And so we'll see at the end of this game whether it was a correct or too extreme decision. And we have to guess that uh, the last card ATN is holding uh, must be a copy of There Can Be Only One. Now Mario, let's see Barbit, if, yeah. if he saw that coming. Face down could be the art beat uh, at the moment and not really interested in having any of it. Uh, so, yeah, just continue with his plays, but I'm still shocked by this. Uh, and it is actually that there can be. Wow. He had it.
Uh, this is a good one yeah. because I don't think Mario will say it coming honestly when no siding way. in. No yeah. way. And this is such a strong card against uh, the Flu Under his deck. Uh, but with the wins on the field, keep in mind that that could be a way to out this card. It's really, really, really strong. But there is a few options because you can actually set potentially. So uh, let's see what this will involve uh, if. Uh, uh, the, he's, I think he's talking to the yeah. judges about potentially setting it uh, from the field uh, and this is actually what's gonna happen. Uh, let's see. Well played by the Italian getting rid of the Durkan B by setting it. This is exactly what I was saying with the unexplored wins. Uh, I think fantastic play and now the normal summon enables some combos from Mario, so Etienne will need to play really carefully with this Shireen. And he just Ooh, sets he one passes. and passes back to his opponent. Wow. What a shock. Yeah, we didn't see that coming, honestly. And here's and another it's a one. second copy. Wow. <laughs> Crazy stuff uh, here. Mario is using the effect to draw one card, but I don't think he ever sided in the Cosmic Yeah, Sigourn. I would be shocked if he did, so he's probably just gonna rely on this Empen and hope that his opponent doesn't pick up uh, any way to play the game. And yeah, play is back to Etienne. Uh, really, really crazy game two here in the top eight. Uh, but now the Rhino comes down. Uh, Mario is cut off from activating his field spell. And I think uh, this was a really good way for Etienne to win game two, potentially. What a shock, but honestly, Really lucky to pick up two yeah. copies of yeah. the trap card, yeah. for sure. Uh, without the other one uh, being uh, drawn, I think uh, we will not see uh, the situation here. Oh, uh, no way. The game would have been over right there. So, of course, now it's uh, really just a matter of time. It's pretty easy for Etienne to find enough damage, uh, plays well around the Empen uh, using uh, the and now it will spin it back to the deck, which at the same time gives an out to Mario. Yeah. We got to keep that in mind, but I think he doesn't have that much time at the moment. So this will be tough for the Italian. Let's see. Now deal some damage to Mario, and uh, this there can only be one. Uh, I think this is literally shutting down Mario's strategy which thought that okay I got rid of the first one then this other one I think it, it's going to be very difficult yeah. to get rid of and you can see here Mario thinking about it maybe the mystic mine it is mystic mine for Mario still in this game completely and maybe if there are no outs, uh, this could be a tough one. But here we see some shuffling back. We knew that there was a Twin Twister in the graveyard, so Mario cannot rely too much on Mystic Mine. Well played by Etienne here, recognizing what he needs to do. And he shuffled back even the, there can be only one. Why not? Just in case you need one more. Why not? And yeah, here goes the Perle Rhino. Just gonna try and thin his deck as much as possible. And yeah, play is back uh, to Mario. This will be a quick one. Who finds the out first? Uh, actually, a pretty nice one. If it might add to bet on one of them, it would probably be at the end. Just because, as you mentioned, uh, it could be the case that Mario didn't even bring those yeah. in. Uh, but yeah, he is gonna at least have this effect to draw and keep changing his hand. I think he drew another of the flow underies. So yeah, play is back to Etienne who picks up. Uh, let's see, we can't quite see the card that he just drew, but so many good outs. Yeah, and play is just back to Mario <laughs> again, who picks up the Feather Duster. Wait, this could actually <laughs> change so much. Feather Duster is picked up by wow. Mario, and there it goes. <laughs> he actually kept that in. 
crazy. And this can change the game completely. He doesn't really need much to OTK. Wow, keeping the Feather Duster. Really, really good decision there by Mario. Didn't see it coming. And this could be the end of the game that is going. Just keep on being surprised. The game that keeps on giving. Let's see if he manages uh, now with the Robina. Yeah. He has the unexplored wins, uh, which, which he can get rid of a lot of cars from his opponent. Uh, playing with fire, though, because he needs to be careful about his own Mystic Mine. Yeah. Uh, you really don't want to lose to your own card right there. And we see the Herald from uh, Etienne here, which is actually kind of annoying. Uh, discarding a Kelbeck that cannot be activated. But if Mario has the map in his hand, this could be. But I saw it's just double shifter and dark ruler in the end from Mario, which now basically will pass his turn back to Etienne, who is really, really capable in keeping his odds as live as possible. Yeah, I don't think Mario has uh, used it, so let's see this draw from Etienne. Does he finally pick up an out of his own, or is he just gonna wait? Uh, I think he goes for maybe a Baguska here to stall the game even longer, and yeah, there he goes. He was afraid of dying in the previous turn, so why not guarantee a Baguska? Which, by the way, is a mandatory effect, yeah. which even under Mystic Mine detaches. So that's interesting to know. And I saw Mario picking up a Cosmic Cyclone, which so means he even that, add uh, those. Yeah. yeah. Now we can use the Unexplored Winds, but wow, he actually Ooh. goes for the statue. Really bold play here by Mario, who just wants to add some of these uh, birds back from the banished pile. Interesting. And now he actually sends back one to pick up a draw. What is it gonna be? I couldn't quite tell, but Mario sets a card that might even be a bluff and play is back to Etienne, who, as we mentioned, needs to detach one from Baguska. Still did not pick up the Twister. Yes, Scream and a bunch of monsters. And we gotta keep in mind that there are only seven minutes remaining in the clock. And Mario is ahead, even though if by just 300 life points, this game could also be over in time. And if not, we might see one of our first sudden match death matches we have ever seen, which would be pretty cool, if yeah. you ask me. And this prosperity here uh, can be devastating. Let's see what Mario picks up. A lot of choice, a lot of choices from here. Um, I think, okay, he gets the field spell. Pretty good pickup. Uh, and we know that he has the Dark Ruler in hand. And here Ooh. he comes, Dark Ruler from Mario with the map as well. This could be over right here. He cannot, of course, deal life points damage to his opponent, but he can get rid of the whole field. And this is huge from the Italian player again, finding a way this deck just doesn't want to give up. <laughs> and the hopes of you know, all of you supporting Alberto's <laughs> little bet <laughs> might just be there. So great, great pickup by Mario here. And as expected, he now gets rid of a couple of his opponent cards, resolves the amp and so much advantage coming from the Italian player. Wow. He was able to basically wait. Uh, unfortunately, Etienne didn't find any of his twin twister out of his deck. And uh, now Mario is clearing Etienne's field. Mario in his hand picking up uh, that field was like Ora Basta. And he activated <laughs> the Dark Ruler and was done with it. And enough Mystic Mine for the day. I just want to get these things going. 
again, reminder, he cannot deal damage to his opponent uh, due to the Dark Ruler, but look at this field, impressive stuff from Mario. Is there hope for Etienne or could this be the end of this top 8 match? Uh, definitely seems really tough for Etienne to fight back. Uh, is he gonna try his best with this cream? Doesn't really accomplish much at the moment. Uh, this seems like it could be over real soon. So hang on tight and don't leave this match. Uh, you could be missing the end. And wow, the heartbeat actually getting sent to the graveyard. Not what you want to see here from Etienne. At least he gets to add one from the graveyard back. Uh, but I don't think uh, this uh, matters all that much. Uh, with Baguska already gone. Uh, you see here Mario even uh, almost BMing, we could say. Yeah, this seems like it's gonna be Flo Wonder is advancing, and there goes the handshake. What a match, honestly, from the right start. It seems as if it was going to be a very tense battle. Maybe not so much in game one, although we got to mention that it was still quite back and yep. forth. Uh, but Shifter and then Necro Valley were just too much and shut down the duel right away. But this game, too, was so back and forth. It was incredible, honestly. I think because, like, for a moment we wow. thought that ATN uh, was able, basically, to get the game, especially because he had a lot of things going on in the graveyard with the Keldo, yeah. a lot of good meals, especially he started with three different names, actually, two tier elements and then the Keldo absolutely, in the graveyard. Absolutely, absolutely. And then there was a There Can Only Be One when we said, maybe Mario didn't side in the Cosmic Cyclones, which could have made sense, honestly. Absolutely. But then... He uh, picked up, uh, not Cosmic, but Arby <laughs> Feather <laughs> Duster, <laughs> which was even better. Uh, and uh, yeah, that was just what he needed. But for the entirety of Game 2, we really couldn't quite tell who was going to win it. Uh, it. For so many different moments, it seems as if one of the two was in advantage uh, at the very beginning uh, with the strong opening uh, from Etienne. Then, I have to be honest with you, the decision of negating part of duality with Baron, yeah. I think, costed him the match because if he just waited for the evenly match, then that was over. But yeah, afterward, we get to see the evenly matched. It seems as if the game is over, but then uh, there can be only one uh, their face up uh, from Etienne. Mario finding again the, the only chance of getting rid of the one copy and Etienne hitting him with the second copy what a crazy match and then again mario with the mystic mine and then finally after a long hard fought duel where basically it turned into this weird top deck in war where if either of the shoe was gonna pick up the out to either mystic mine for etienne or there can be for mario they were gonna win the game as you mentioned he picked up the rp fighter duster he was actually stopped, we gotta be honest, yeah. by the Herald from Etienne. But then he couldn't quite come up with a strong enough field. He went for Baguska and he got punished by Dark Ruler No More, plus a top deck field spell, which was clutch because Mario risked losing to his own Mystic Mine. Instead, he was able to pick up the map and Ripristino. La Verità in this <laughs> one match. But yeah, congratulations to both uh, for really putting out a show. And uh, at the very end, uh, we're still uh, kind of happy for the two of them. Uh, really huge show competing and getting to the top eight. It's a huge achievement in such an event. But hope is not lost, you know? <laughs> hope is not lost because uh, the remaining decks, we don't quite know the players yet. We know that they're going to be really good, that I can assure you. Yeah. But it's going to be Mario against the free Ishizu tier element decks. Can he be able, will he be able to beat them and actually claim the title? Funny enough, the finals were actually an Ishizu tier mirror match back at last weekend in Pasadena. Yeah. But right before that, uh, when Chris LeBanc won, it was again Fluandris. So it is a deck that can and is capable of getting there. And we just saw it. Yeah. Chu O. Chu O. I mean, the victory. deck is still very annoying to play against. And especially, like, uh, 
I think this deck uh, built in this way, also with the Necrovalli, the addition yep. of Metaverse, getting you also the Mystic Mine on the line, and going first, you have the Arpis Feather Storm, which Absolutely. are incredible, honestly. I think I would be scared uh, if uh, I was to play Mario in the top four. So. And to be honest, I gotta say, this was also arguably one of the most important matches of the day because now Mario and whoever is gonna join him is basically guaranteed a copy of the new prize card, another verse dragon. Of course, still need to win that third and fourth place, but. We all know that Mario and whoever advances actually want to have a look at this beautiful trophy. Still early, still early. We got one more match for you before going to the finals and it will be the top four. But before we do that, thank you for being with us. This was the top eight of YCS Dorman. We have Ed ready with Mario for the winner interview. Thank you, Marcello. Yes, I am joined by Mario right now. The winner of our top eight feature match, Flu Under Ease versus the Ishizu Tailments, which we've seen quite a lot in this. First of all, Mario, congratulations to you. How does it feel? You're now into the top four. Thank you so much. It's, uh, I feel amazing and uh, it's my first top four in a big tournament. So I... First ever one? First, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, uh, no, it's the second feature I won. And it's the first time that they got top four in a big event, yeah. That's very exciting. Well, congratulations. That's already an achievement in itself. Perhaps you'll take it one step further, get into those finals, maybe even win it. Still a possibility at this point. Now, I will say, out of everyone else in the top eight, you're the only deck that's not Ishizu tier. So there were a lot of people that were rooting for you just based on the fact that they don't want to see pure mirror matches for the rest of this. How does that make you feel being sort of the one unique deck that's now up there compared to the rest of this competition. Yes, it's true that is uh, the only deck remain except for Ishizu Tehara, but uh, for one there is is not so loved because it has a lot of cards that uh, uh, really, I, I hate myself, my deck. So, <laughs> so but it's, uh, I feel really nice about this because I tested a lot with my friends and uh, um, together, we, we build a really strong uh, list, as you can see again in the future match against the Teare Shizu. It's gone incredibly well for you. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's not the most loved deck in the world, but frankly, everyone's sort of getting a little bit angry about yeah, yeah, seeing yeah. the amount of Ishizu tier. So maybe we'll see you in the final. Maybe we'll see another <laughs> Flu versus Ishizu, but who yeah. knows? We'll see. Let's talk quickly about the game. There was a shifter straight off the bat for you in game one. So that was obviously very helpful. Yeah. You managed to remove the Baguska with the unexplored wins and the Stry. Prosperity meant you could play against the Saliek and then he scooped. So how are you feeling in the first game? I, well, I, I am really amazed because I think that I played really well, really well in order to resolve Necro Valley because I know that he has the out set. It. So I use Raiza and then activate Necro Valley with the trap. But obviously that shifter in the first turn was really strong because my list is strong, but it's not so consistent. A lot of cards against the Arishizu, so you can brick when you start, and that start was good. You had a couple of very good times where you just basically had what you needed to respond to almost everything that came up. So game two, a big evenly matched from you. There was a couple of moments where, you know, there was some, there can only be one back to back that you had to deal with. Mystic Mind from you though, the Harpy's Feather Duster, which wiped the Pellerino and the There Can Only Be One. The Dark Ruler No More, swap mine out for map attributed the Baguska away, he couldn't play, so he surrendered. So that was basically game two. So you were having to keep quite composed and work through every single thing that he was putting up against you. What was going through your mind in game two? I was really sure about that ruling uh, to set Empen and the tribute the, there can be, because I know that uh, set a big, a big one is still considered a, a tribute summon. So wins let, let that. But I, if... Uh, he got the counter on the first uh, turn, uh, he will won, but uh, that heavily resolved and the game was normalized, e equalized. And after that, uh, Air Duster was really amazing.
It was really amazing. It was a great moment and a great duel in general. So congratulations to you for getting into the top four. We're going to be seeing those very shortly, so I will be allowing you to go off and get mentally prepared for that semi-final. But thank you very much, you guys, for watching this top eight. We will be back very soon with another quick feature match before we get into that final. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. Welcome back to your coverage of YCS Dortmund. We're now into the top four, basically the semi-final of this here tournament. And we've got a very exciting one. Joshua Schmidt, winner of YCS Utrecht versus Vincenzo Orofino. This is going to be a very exciting semi-final to see who's going to make it into that final round to take home that Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship title. Always exciting to see what happens. Currently, we've got these guys shuffling. Guys, if you don't mind me interrupting you while you shuffle, if we could do a dice roll to see who's going to go first. So that's a 10 for Joshua. 
And that is a nine for Vincenzo. Joshua is going to go first. Joshua Schmidt, our previous YCS champion, is going to be going first. So I'm going to hand you one more time over to our German commentary team. It's going to be their last commentary match for this tournament. So it's going to be a good one. Guys, over to you. One more time, thank you so much, Ed. The Italian co-casters of us are going to do a fantastic job in the finals later on, and we are here for the semi-final. Honestly, I'm kind of excited. I mean, wow. I'm extremely excited because the last semi-finals we had was That's extremely insane. high. Utrecht, Antwerp, they were amazing, so I Indeed can't wait for were. this one. And I mean, the stage has been set by Joshua Schmidt himself. This guy just won YCS Utrecht one month ago, and he's sitting here again in the top four. I mean, what a story is that? Can Maybe going back to back. Is he unbeatable by now? Is he becoming a legend with this tournament? We are about to see. He is very close to legend status. Let's see how he can do here because he will be opening this game as he won the die roll. Top four is starting right here, right now. And he is being challenged by Vincenzo Orofino, who is an established player by now. We have heard from uh, from him for the first time in the remote oh, tournaments, yes. and he was really successful. I mean, there. He, he made his name there because he won one of the invitationals, if I remember correctly. Definitely an accomplished player, and definitely the Italians are showing up this tournament. We have uh, Marco also being in the semi-finals alongside Vincenzo. So two Italians, and then one German, Joshua, and oh. one. Greek player with Eriko's back and as we said Joshua starting things off here with Shiron effect and he's trying to resolve half this in great but there's Drury's bomb instantly by Vincenzo and his list is actually packed with bestials. He's not just running a small pack, he's running triple Drury's bomb, triple Magnamut and triple Saronir. So his chances of seeing bestials are very high. So it is really good for Vincenzo that he has probably dodged a lot of Luandri's plays. This matchup would be unfavorable. And Joshua is milling two more Mudoras. He doesn't need that many Mudoras. And the one Telemann name he hit was Havnis. And that is one that was already activated this turn. Yeah. So no more fusion summons by but now. But there's instant, instant fusion. fusion is being activated. The Germans in these featured matches always seem to have instant fusion. Indeed. 1,000 life points for uh, Kid Colors is a pretty decent trade. And I think I'll Joshua... Take this. We'll Every take day it. of the week, yeah. Yep, there we have it. There is the kid colors. But I mean, he's running nine bestials, speaking of Vincenzo. So there's a pretty good chance he just has another one. And whatever kid colors might be sending here might get hit by that. On the other hand, he could also just search for something like Salik to go for the defensive route, maybe. But we are about to see Joshua is one more time going for his graveyard. And he's also holding his hands, uh, holding his deck in his hands. So. We are going to see which effect of Kit Carlos he's going to use. Is he going to send to the graveyard or is he going to search? And he's searching. He he's searching, searching for Tillman Scream and this might signal that he has Primeval Planet Perlerino. Indeed, there's a neat combo where you pop your own Scream to then get another trap card to your hand. I like that a lot because he could have just searched for a trap card here. But if he has Perlerino, he can just go the other way around and he will get to a trap card anyways. So Kid Colors is activated and Havnus is special summoned from the GY. We have milled this earlier with a Merle, I think. So Okay, now. there's one Pearler I know. <laughs> oh, we hit Kalbeck, but I don't think we're using it here. But we also hit the Shiren and Shiren and Merle are not activated in this game already. So I think that you can actually use both of them because there are no shufflers in the GY of Vincenzo. Nope, there's basically nothing in the graveyard of Vincenzo. So, absolutely. No reason also for Joshua to actually start milling here for both players because that just makes Vincenzo start his place, but wow. he has another Magna Mood. As I was saying, he's really relying on those bestials. And Joshua now, having so many Mudoras, has to respond here. He doesn't want that Magna Mood to hit the field. Yeah. And it will stay in hand because Joshua is just chaining right there. Yeah, you don't want to give your opponent the Magnamut on the field because Magnamut replaces itself in the end phase and that would just mean a plus one for Vincenzo. Also, you don't want half of your deck banished already. So if you're having three Mudora in your GY, I guess it is safe to say that you can use one here. Yep, absolutely. That is definitely not a waste. And 
carefully both players keep on noticing on the sheet of paper there what kind of effects they have already used. Definitely in this mirror match, quite, quite important because you yeah. don't want to miss out on anything. You don't want to use any effects twice. Oh, and oh, look! Our chain blocking the sprite sprint with Scream, so we can or we are not chain blocking it. Maybe he went for chain link two yeah. uh, sprite That's sprint. What it looked like. So we are sending the Merly, of course. This is the last name that he has not activated yet. So let's see if Vincenzo has a Serenir as well. We are about to oh, see. Oh, Salik milled and one more monster card, which I think might be a Bastille. Let's see. Joshua still is not done here. Oh, and Vincenzo is tippy-tapping <laughs> on the board. He is considering if he has to have something that he can activate here. And, and is this actually Saranir? Is this Saranir? No, no, it's Kelbeck! It is the Kelbeck! So, Vincenzo going second, really starting with a very interactive hand in the opponent's turn. He has the double bestial plus Kelbeck as interruptions for his opponent. Really, really strong stuff here for him. Giving that Shiren back to the hand, robbing Joshua of, of one of the level 4 bodies you could potentially turn into yeah, a dweller. Exactly. Usually you would think you want to bounce the Link monster because it goes into the extra deck and, and isn't another resource in hand of Joshua, but you really want to deny him the Abyss Dweller, which is so important in the mirror match. That's true. Vincenzo, of course, knows what he's doing here being in top 4. They have played mirror matches all day long, so they are definitely experts in that by now. And still there is a Merli, and Merli now does not want to go for a Mud Dragon here. He can just safely go into the Roll Colossus, which is a interruption on the opponent's turn. Yep. And I think he there should still is. resolve Salik, right? So he, so he can get a Halfness, or did he already fetch one? Did he? Oh yeah, he did know the Salik, you're right. There is the Salik in the graveyard, but apparently he did not trigger it. So... Or he already searched one. I mean, we can't really see the entire picture there. Yeah, you're right. Might absolutely be true. But it's an interesting decision by Vincenzo that he went for the Druid's Boom first and then for the Magna Mood after, because, uh, quite frankly, resolving the Magna Mood on board probably is more important. And he just decided to go the other way around with it and went for the Druid's Boom first. But I mean, having Drew's Boom on the field on the other end is also pretty insane because this can yeah. uh, give you the chance to trigger its graveyard effect. Therefore, it's both options are decent, I would say. And I am still interested as to why Joshua went for the Tealman Scream Search with Kit Colors because so far this card has not done too much. Yeah, you're right. You were thinking that he might have Pearl Rhino, but by now I would be pretty safe mm -hmm. in saying that he does not have Pearl Rhino. Maybe he thinks in the mirror match Scream is just too good because it will also give you a save mill on your opponent's turn when he's summoning monsters. So you don't really need to rely on hitting with Halfness or something because you can just resolve a Scream and mill cards anyways. So Vincenzo has, appears to have drawn a card already because he is on four cards in hand with Kalbeck and Ruiz that make six. And now we are in his main phase one. He normal summons Mudora, which is an Ooh. odd play. And this opens up Joshua to activate him and Scream. But he doesn't do it. And now Vincenzo, maybe before doing any other play, starts his turn off with an Abyss Dweller. That is what is happening. And that could shut down all the interruptions that Joshua potentially has in the graveyard. We know that he has multiple Mudoras, and those might just get shut down. But yeah, Joshua is pointing towards the Scream. And yes, he wants to mill three cards on the Summon of Dweller. And he hits Agido. Agido. And none of those will be able to activate because Duella will resolve before they have the option to activate in a new chain. Yeah, of course. It's also a quick effect, so just unsummon the Dweller being chain link number one. And look, Vincenzo just going for battle phase, running over the Sprite Sprint with the Abyss Dweller. Wait, he actually crashed it. He forgot about the Scream. He crashed his Dweller into the Sprite no. Sprint, forgetting about the attack loss because of Tealman's Scream. This can't Vincenzo, be real. Vincenzo, no, you just gave away the Abyss Dweller. This is you, huge for Joshua. You gave away one of the most important resources in the mirror match. It's insane. You rather want to, you always want to have Abyss Dweller on the board and you just gifted it to your opponent by running into the Sprite Sprint. This can't be made up. Joshua Smith, 
by his pure appearance there at the future yes, match table. Yes, I was gonna say that. Is this the famous Joshua Schmidt aura where your opponent is just intimidated by you sitting that down? That must be the case. And I mean, now we understand why he searched for Tillman's scream, right? Because of he totally he has it. foreseen that. That was absolutely the case. Joshua Schmidt has uh, perfect information and has foreseen yeah. all of that. So, absolutely marvelous by him to go for the scream there. So, Perlo Rhino is now going to search. I mean, Vincenzo still is in a pretty decent spot, right? He, I mean, okay, he gave away his. Abyss Dweller, which is a valuable resource. However, oh, yeah. this turn, the Abyss Dweller is still active. It is. And he now, contrary to Joshua, has Pearl Rhino on board. And we are activating Shiron. There's not really anything that could stop that there from Joshua. So, I mean, okay, he could have actually chained the Rokalos to negate that, but he decided not yes. to. Wow, Scream and a another Rhino. No, Shiron and Shiren. Scream. Wow. And the Rhino art was discarded, right? So there's definitely plenty of stuff. Joshua on a small Abyssal package, but still packing in triple Druid's Woman, and triple Magma Mood, so the potential on his side for Bestials is also quite big. So now we are seeing not a window for Mudora and Agido, and uh, Mudora and Kaldo, because Dweller is still active. Yeah. Know? So uh, this is actually going to be a big fusion party for Vincenzo, and he was able to chain block the Shiren if he even activated it. I did not see that. Yeah, we're searching and for the Sully. He can pop the roll colors, and it won't be able to summon itself back. That could be the case here. Yep, we are indeed using the Shiren as well, and that is going to bring out the good old Kid Colors, and as you say, he's starting a fusion party, and also, he has Mudora in Graveyard already, so he could yeah. basically shuffle back all the shufflers in Joshua's Graveyard, and he would have no winner to respond to that because of that Abyss Dweller that resolved early on. Luckily, he activated before atta before attacking, right? True. Imagine he would have just crashed into it. That would have been crazy, that crazy. painful, but why did he even go into battle phase this early? Good question. Uh, this is what I keep thinking of the entire time, because I, I don't think there was a reason for it, because he couldn't beat over Rulkolos anyways. He had the Dweller active. Very good you question indeed. Beat over, I mean, there was a, a lot of potential to OTK this turn. Yeah, indeed, indeed. But he rather just got his Dweller <laughs> under the <laughs> wheels of that Sprite Sprint. And yep, but he's still going. And I mean, to be fair, Joshua, doesn't have a whole lot of cards in his hand, so his comeback potential isn't that great here. So even though, as you were already saying, he gave away his Abyss Dweller, I think chances for Vincenzo are quite decent in this game still. Yeah, I mean, he searched for more follow-up. This turn he will put up a big board, and he also has the Magna Mood in hand. It's Can we check hand, the extra right. deck of Vincenzo Orofino we to see absolutely. which uh, rank 6 exceeds he's he running? He's running both, both. Of them. and he, he is running Time Thief Redo. He has found a lot of space in his extra deck. Wow. And he is running Dracostopelia. I wonder what he cut. That's a good question, but let's focus on what's happening here. We had the big milling play. We had the mill eight. We milled a bunch of... Oh, we milled a bunch of actual... Um, Bestials, and now he can freely activate the effect of Kelbeck as well because all the stuff that Joshua is milling here is not going to be crazily important because Abyss Dweller is still applying here. And he also has not used any of his shufflers, so the more shufflers he get, the better his position will be because at the end of the turn he can just say, okay, affect Keldo or Mudora and shuffle back all of your graveyard interactions yep, yep. and uh, pass turn, basically. I mean, you will ideally summon more monsters. By yeah, but that's such a fortune here for Vincenzo that the Abyss Dweller resolved, so all the resources in Yosha's graveyard aren't able to use their effects. And I can totally understand why everybody is summoning Abyss Dweller yeah. and is just trying everything in their first turn. Even if it is the only monster left on the end board, they really wanted to beat the Abyss Dweller, and yeah, it's showing why that's so important here in this match already. Oh, and now we are also getting rid of the Tierleman Scream with the Kaleido Heart. Vincenzo is really clearing this entire board. Yep, we are also recycling the Kid Colors back to the extra deck. That's also really good. And now we are questioning. Did we did even we shuffle cut in between? Already, yes, apparently we did. 
And there comes the Kaleido Heart. Yeah, and this one is going to get rid of the Shadow Nine, I'm pretty sure of that. How many cards does Joshua actually have in his hand? Because we haven't seen those at all in this turn, and I think he has a Havnus. And I also wonder why he did not activate Tielemann's Scream on the Modora Normal Summon, because that looked like the perfect timing to do so. Like maybe you can get a Dragostopedia on board as well. Yeah, absolutely so. Because when, his when your opponent is already summoning the Dweller, as we saw, he can activate on the Summon of Dweller yeah. the quick effect, and so everything you would mill with Scream would not be very helpful anymore. So, we now have the Kaleido Heart on board. And no card on board for Joshua Schmidt. It turns out opening double Bestial plus Kalbeck is really good in the mirror match. And you know what? Mudora is probably going to put back the Dweller to the extra deck, so he lost the Dweller, but he's probably going to get it back anyways here because he could easily recycle it there, and he now would have two level four monsters back on the board. So, the mistake of running into the Sprite Sprint might actually not even be important at all because look right there he is taking his Abyss Dweller back to the extra deck. It was all planned from the start. He just wanted to give Joshua the illusion that he was ahead, that he was basically throwing this game but nope Vincenzo doesn't. He still ends up on Dweller. Yeah it's just a showcase of extra class. Exactly. He just took an extra step to show everybody how competent he is, how comfortable he feels in this game even though he just gave away one body. Yeah, now there is the Mud Dragon of the Swarm, and there's Shiren, meaning we have access to Dweller already. And, I mean, not only that he takes away all the resources in Joshua's graveyard, those are bad draws if you're in a disadvantageous position. That is absolutely true. By the way, shall I tell you something really interesting about the list of Joshua Schmidt? Always, please. I can tell you why he didn't set up Scream in the first turn at all. Oh no, why he didn't set up Crime in the he's first turn at all. He's not running Crime. He's only siding one copy of Tielemann's Crime. He's not even playing in the main deck. And I think I haven't seen a single Tielemann's list all weekend long that didn't main deck Tielemann's Crime. Really interesting. I mean, in this position, it looks like it was a big mistake to not bring Crime. But, I mean, it has worked for him so far. I mean, yeah, absolutely. So, he's going for the Abyss Dweller again, of the course. The Abitante del Abisso. Yep, and Joshua faces quite a lot here. There's still Kaleido Heart on board. We know there's still Magma Mood in hand. There's Abyss Dweller on board now. Are we also going into Sprite Elfia maybe to have access for for a reborn of our Merli in our opponent's turn? No, oh, we, we are going go. for the Magna Mood and we want to set up either Beatrice or Wallow. Those are re oh, we're also getting rid of a Merle, which is also a valuable resource. Now Magna Mood is going to replace itself in the end phase, and we are going to exceed summon again. I love it when decks can do everything. And there he is again, one of our favorite cards, maybe the best card from Darkwing Blast. Wallow, founder of the Drudge Dragons, being summoned here, and it's capable of actually just using one of his opponent's cards. But for now, he just wants it as another interruption, because as we know, yeah. it is a quick effect to just shuffle back one card from your opponent's graveyard as well. So, basically an extra bestial, and by resolving the on-field effect of bestial, Magna would be also going to replace that for another bestial in the end phase. Yup. Is, is, he, is he giving away the information that he's running Sauron here? No, no, he's not. He's still only going with the Druid's Wolf. I love Wallow because you can set up so many cool plays with special summoning monsters from your opponent's graveyard or setting cool cards like Triple Tactic Talents and immediately activating them, but nobody seems to do it. Yep, and in the draw phase, we are resolving Abyss Dweller, and that is successfully resolving, and the crowd is loving it. The crowd is shearing Vincenzo Orofino on here. And Joshua packs up his cards. This game one goes to Vincenzo Rofino and the Italians in the crowd are cheering. Yep, I said it earlier, maybe this now is the time for Team Italy, for the Italian Yu-Gi-Oh! community to fight back because it was the UK winning the yep. European Championship. Then we had Joshua Schmidt from Germany taking it in Utrecht and we now have two Italians left in competition here at YCS Dortmund. And it would be bittersweet because it is our home turf YCS for the German community, and then taking it by an Italian would be quite hard. But 
I mean, the community is strong, they are playing very good, so I would definitely, it would be a deserved win for sure. Yes, absolutely. Also, I'm kind of sad. I mean, I was banking on one Italian to win the event. I wanted Mick Gotzi to oh, win it yeah, with right. the Draco Slayer Pendulum deck. However, he was eliminated in the top 16 against Blue Wanderers, of which we thought it was a good matchup. Yeah, absolutely. But still, that round is run the Reese player is still going strong in yeah. the tournament. He's in that top four he currently. also won the last featured match versus Ishizu Tierlemans, and I can already tell you he is going to face a lot more Ishizu Tierlemans if he continues to win this because he is actually the only Fluwanderese player with seven tier Shizu decks. Yeah. So now, going first for Joshua Schmidt, we just Ooh. talked about it. There's Tierlemans' crime in his side deck. Do you think that is coming in now? Because yes. he brushed certainly always bring this yes. in when he's going first, right? There's no other chance. I think so. Yeah. Then also, of course, Caught by the Grave, pretty yes. easy contestant to come yes. in going first as well. All right. Even though I like this card a bit more going second because like the hand interaction of his opponents are monsters that are not discarded to the GY. It's bestials. They're activating in hand and then you have one more card in your hand that you can't play with. The thing though is when you go second, your opponent already has set up some shufflers and that could always dodge the uh, called by the great. Therefore, I'm not totally in love with it. But let's see what else is there to come. We see Triple Tactics Talent coming in for Joshua Schmidt. Yes. Most likely is going to yes. come in, I'm pretty sure. And now, for the going second options, on Vincenzo's side, there might be Ghost Bell coming in. He's not main making any Herald of the Orange Light, so those might very well come in as well. And then also Triple Tactics Talent on his side. And we see that the players are ready for this game number two. So let's not have them wait any longer. Let's go into game number two of here of our top four match. Game two of the semi-finals starting. The crowd is absolutely massive in this room here. We are ready to see this battle. The players are going to get the okay. Another fist bump. Vincenzo dominating game one with Magnamut, with Druish Worm, and with Kelbeck. And good follow-up in form of terraforming. And yep. even more cards. So now we have terraforming on Joshua's side. And this is already much better than the last side. This time he does have the terraforming for the Pearl the Rhino. So looks like he might be getting off to a real, real good start. But again, if Vincenzo has a hand packed full out of uh, bestial monsters, it will be still a hard time for Joshua. Absolutely, all the bestial cards are really strong, but we might actually also see triple tactic talents in the hand of Joshua Schmidt, and this would be a almost blowout for Vincenzo if he has triple tactic talents plus follow-up. Yep, Shiren is using its effect, discarding Caldo, and we're hitting Havnes, Havnes Merli. and another Havnes. So the thing is, do you now activate all of these effects? Do you activate Merli and Havnes? I think Merli usually is the effect you don't want to use very early because you have yeah. the chance to send it later on in the combo with Sprint. Uh, obviously, if you only use one of those, then you will activate oh. Havnes, but there is a good chance. Oh, there was a thumbs up from Vincenzo. Joshua is actually allowed to resolve those, and I think we are very likely to see a Kid Colors plus Guru on board. That is maybe what is happening here. Actual fusion summons, what is, what is this? Yep, game one that wasn't really possible for Joshua, but now Vincenzo nods his hat, allows him to do what he wants. There is Garura and Kid Colors, as you were thinking. And Kid Colors now, of course, activating its effect. Vincenzo and checking what his hand. Having in Vincenzo's hand there, he is Ooh. activating the Havnis, so there is another hand interaction as to be expected. We are making Druid Swoom, we are making Ghost Bell, oh, and we are making Pelerino! It is not a hit from the Havnis. This is not helping him at all. We no. see that he's also one of the players that runs Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion. A popular card for sure. Yep, it has risen in popularity a bit lately, but he's not bringing it in the main deck, he's only running it in a side deck, but three copies of it, so he definitely values it quite a bit. So now we are cutting the deck again. I have not quite seen what Joshua has added oh. to itself. Was it Scream again? I mean, this time he has Pelerino, so he could actually pop the Scream to search for a crime or Salik. Now Rhino Heart is Normal Summoned, and we only have one more name left. Normal Summon Rhino Heart. And we will go with Chaining 1 Scream, Chaining 2 Rhino Heart. Look, he really values his Scream a lot more than the other yeah. effects. He's never chain blocking the monster effects. He rather wants to chain block the Scream, actually. He I always mean, he, wants the Scream to resolve. He is really trying to hit the Mudora here. 
And he yeah. is getting the and Modora. And the Salik as well. I hope for him that he has a crime in his deck. And Saronir is But there is the now. Saronir now for Vincenzo hitting the Shiren. Well that played. Joshua Milt. Really well played by Vincenzo by announcing Merle and Havnes. Joshua basically said, if you have a bestial, that's okay with me. I will summon my Kid Colors, but now we are going to see. Okay, so this is interesting. Joshua actually decided to use Caldo to shuffle back Salik and Chiron and of course also the Druid Swarm of his opponent. But that means that the Saronir stays in hand. Of course you don't give your opponent the body. Yeah. However, he will have Saronir in hand for the next turn. That is absolutely true. And Saronir as a body on board, it's the weakest of the bestials yeah. because Magna Moon on the field very obviously oh. gives you another bestial in the end phase. Druid Swarm is dangerous because if you send it to the graveyard in any way, it will trigger and pop a card on your side of the field. But Saronir doesn't really do anything. And now we are seeing a new chain link, maybe starting with Primeval Planet Pal Rhino to pop the Tealman Scream. He just shuffled back the Salik and he's pointing to the Scream. Yeah, that must be. It's the target of Pearl Rhino. Can't imagine any other way because yep. he already used the middle effect of Scream. And yep, we are popping our own Scream to search for either Salik or the crime that he probably has sighted in here. By the way, there is no target for Dark in the graveyard of Vincenzo. So what do you do with this board here? I mean, we have now... I mean, okay, you also have the Kid Colors effect from the field now. Kind of forgot about that. Yeah, Not absolutely. Yeah, we can still just go for a lot more mills here with Kid Colors, first of all. Yeah. And then afterwards, we can just look what else is there. And if he gets away into Murley with the Kid Colors, then you have a level 2 body, and I think we're just going to see a Sprite Elf play, most likely. I mean, we are probably going to see a Dweller if the Kid Colors resolves to summon back the Shiren. That is also a good way, yeah, for sure. Dweller, decent card this format. So, we are announcing Kid Colors here. And Not really too much you want to mill. You want to hit another Caldo because you don't have yours in your graveyard anymore. Yep. You don't look forward to milling Agidos or Kelbax because I don't think we can afford ourselves to mill more cards here for our opponent. And there... Oh, Mudora. there is Mudora and Caldo. Caldo. There we go. That's a good mill for Joshua. He gets both shufflers as he wanted to. <laughs> Vincenzo asked Joshua, Kelbax effect? And Joshua was just smiling. Nope, I'm not going to use this one now. <laughs> Such a fun atmosphere here in the top four of YCS Dortmund, biggest YCS championship we've ever had here in Europe. Oh, he's actually using his own Magna Mood now on Magna Mood in the graveyard. And it just makes sense. He can set up a Wardle or a Beatrice, whatever he runs, with the Garura. Detaching will give him a draw, and he gets rid of his own Magna Mood in the grave, so his opponent cannot access it via Dark in the next turn. Yeah, and I'll tell you what. He also is on both Beatrice and Wallow. The cards are just too good. Absolutely. And there it is. It is the Beatrice. We're ending on a rank 4 and the rank 6 here. And that's a pretty good combination because the one, the rank 4, the Abyss Dweller, disables your opponent from playing. And the other, Beatrice, enables you to play on your opponent's turn. Plus, you get a draw. Yep, that's also kind of nice. So this Hound is on the field is looking kind of sad, not going to lie. Trying to help Vincenzo overcome Joshua's powerful first turn, but not being helpful at all. So, Vincenzo draws for turn. It looked like a trap to me, which wouldn't be too powerful going second. But let's see, what can he bring? What does he have? So, we know that Joshua has the Salik, right? Yep, that should be Salik set. And he also searched with Magna Mood, so there's also a known bestial in the hand of Joshua. Look, we resolved the Abyss Dweller and we instantly after also want to resolve the Beatrice. I'm quite sure we want to make sure to get Tillman's body onto the board here, yeah. so our Salik is live. So we just want to really quickly go into, yeah, go into the Rhino Heart Sand and tr trigger it in the graveyard. Immediately going into Rhino Heart, the big commitment, as I like to call it, because if you just send one of the Dark Tier Elements, then you will get one Fusion Summon, but Rhino Heart most of the time actually gives you two Fusion Summons already. And I mean, the good thing with Rhino Heart is it doesn't lose to one Bestial, and yes. I think that's just the safer route. You're calling it the big commitment, I'm calling it the safe route, to yeah. be honest. Fair enough. So Murley is going to get banished by Serenir. I think that Joshua is going to let this one slide. Yep, yep, that's how it is. Saronir hitting the board. 
Both players knew about that Saron here because it tried to summon itself to the field last turn, but it was denied by Joshua. And we have the Havness here, so how is this going to play out? Do we see a Magnamut or a Druid's Womb from the hand of Vincenzo? No, he's actually just going to go for the Havness, and this might actually result in a pop already with the... Or he could also go for Rotos, but scooping. no! 17 minutes for Game 3 now, Vincenzo versus Joshua. This is the deal for game number two. Joshua Schmidt equalizes it. It is now 1-1 between him and Vincenzo Orofino. And we are going to see a dramatic game number three between those two really strong players. Joshua being able to start both times. Let's see if this is going to change something in game three because Vincenzo will be able to open the game for the first time. In the first game, he had one Bistial, then he had a second one, and yes. then he had the callback as well. That stopped Joshua from doing basically anything. There you have seen our lovely crowd. Oh, These guys yeah. are being amazing all the time, by the way. For sure. In game two, Vincenzo just had a halfness and it didn't do it anything. It wasn't enough. And I, I kind of can see something happen here for Vincenzo. He's running such a big package of Biss deals. Do you think he's going to side out any going first? Because if he's not, he might actually clock a little bit on them. Because if you have so many Biss deals, your actual gameplay does get stopped a little bit I, because I know. there's so many level 6 monsters you can do nothing with normally. It depends on what he sides in. He might go for triple tactic talents. Yeah, He might sure. want to keep actually the ghost spell in instead of one of the bestials because I see that. I you see can that. protect yourself from your opponent's bestials. Sure. And I, I, I think there is a, some space for it. And he's also citing Herald of the Orange Light, and I think that this is for rogue matchups. I do believe so this as well. This is to counter shifter. Yeah, I don't think this is coming in, especially not going first here versus Joshua Schmidt in the mirror match in the semi-finals of this tournament. Don't believe that is going to help him at all here. Nope. And I, don't also, I also don't think he's bringing in triple copies of Zombie World, to be honest. That's just not the matchup you want to have it for. It so, can help, but you don't really want to play it. Uh, it is for the flu. He, he no. wants to face flu in the finals. No. Maybe um, that is what's going to happen. Maybe we're going to have an all-Italian finals flu versus the good old Ishizu tier deck. That is probably something that could very well happen. Also something that good could old very well happen is that we're going to start this game number three because players are shuffled up and we can say for the last time for us that we're going to go into a game number three. Let's go for the third game of top four right now. Give it up, guys. There we have them drawing their opening hands and Vincenzo praying that it has to be a good one. I like that oh, they're we changing are seeing up. triple tactic talents already, and this is 50% a good sign, 50% a bad sign. <laughs> I mean, 80% a good sign, and it is a good sign because he also has the Rhino Heart, and he can actually pop off now. Oh, and if Joshua but activates instant anything, halfness. instant halfness we see by Caldo is strong. Caldo and Mudora are decent. It's not what you want to have, but it is okay. And Vincenzo can now generate a big advantage with the triple tactic talents. Looking at the opponent's hand, if he is able to play through Mudora and Caldo. That is absolutely true. So let's see what he's sending here. This effect is probably not going to resolve as there are I am really Mudora sure. and Caldo on the side of Joshua. So we are... Which one is he going to activate, Caldo or Mordora? Is he just going to take the top one? Quick. I think it doesn't really matter. I think he would go for Mordora, but it really does the same as we all know. But rather the interesting question is, is he going to shuffle back anything else? Is he going to shuffle back his own Druiswurm there or not? I don't think Druiswurm is necessary to be shuffled back. I don't believe so either. So, let's see. That talent is going to be good, but what else is he going to do? So far he hasn't activated the Huffness even. <laughs> Now, Vincenzo, I like what he's... Oh, oh, he did not activate the Hafnis at all. Just not using the Hafnis. Now he using wants to the go effect for of Mudora. first. Oh, very heads up play by Vincenzo. He wants to deny Joshua the access to his shufflers. Now he would be able to activate Grave Digger's Trap with Mudora the Sword Oracle. However, this is not a card he's running in his main deck. Yeah, not Grave Digger's, but a Grave Keeper's Trap, I of course. Switching those up. <laughs> no worries, no worries. But really good. You can see that Vincenzo has tested this matchup a bunch. If you just summon Dweller, first of all, and put your opponent on Dweller, you You're can good. just 
Yeah, you're just good. Your opponent cannot use any of his shufflers, and you can then that at some point just shuffle it back with your own shufflers. Okay, so now another interesting move. He is actually using Caldo immediately on the discard of Kalbeck, so it could not even trigger at all. That's true. Even if Vincenzo wanted to, and this means that Joshua oh. thinks that maybe Vincenzo does not really have place to go into. And I think at this point, you have to go for a play like this, because if he has an amazing hand, then you're going to have the shorter end of the stick anyway. True, true. And you know what? He did shuffle back to Druis Womb, but first of all, he's going to use the talents, and his talents going to be used to draw two cards. It wow. is indeed. We are drawing for Hafnis and Druis Womb, if I saw correctly. And those are not the two cards you want to see. You can easily go for a Dweller here, of course, all the time. This is going to at least buy you one turn if your opponent does not have a huge answer to it. And you have the Hafnis, which is also a really strong card. Yep. I think he heard your words. I think he will be going for the Abyss Dweller right there. Having but a quick double check with his cards in hand. This is still not the board you want to go for. Not really. It's not the greatest. It didn't look too great that Joshua only milked the Shufflers and no Tielemant names, but the Shufflers really did enough here. So we are considering to go for a Time Thief Redo. Oh. He's not even well to go into the Dweller here, but I think you have to go for Dweller because Redoer doesn't seem like it's enough. I feel like Dweller just gives you more of an edge here in the mirror match, but let's see what he decides on. Vincenzo might think with his three cards in hand that this is the only play, the only card that can make him play. I mean, he can use it immediately on the Rhino Heart and then activate the Rhino Heart in the graveyard. Oh, yes, he is going for it. But true. There is still Mudora in the graveyard. That's true. Mudora could just answer that. Maybe Vincenzo just forgot about the Mudora. Well, let's see. He is detaching the Rhino Heart indeed. Keep in mind, there was no Dweller result this turn. Mudora is still a massive threat, and now he will activate the Rhino Heart. Joshua can consider to shuffle this one back already because it would be a level 4 body on board, and he will target the Mudora as well. He's just going to take all of the cards <laughs> and shuffle them into the deck. He does not even care about it. Just, just take all of them. Yep, you have three cards in the graveyard. Take them all and put them back into your deck. No and now graveyards. Vincenzo no graveyards. only has Hafnis in hand, right? And he passes he on the Redua. Passes on Do you want to Redua? attach now? Joshua Schmidt is not even going to be dwellered. And Redua attaches something. And it is a Kalbeck. This is not the worst that could have happened to him. But still, it's only a Redoer. That's the only thing Joshua Schmidt has to face here in game number three of oh, this. And there will, of course, be also Bistials. I think that Rhino Heart is... Wow, another Modora mill. Rhino Heart was discarded for Shiren. Shiren did not hit any Tillemans names. Maybe Joshua does not have anything to discard for the Rhino Heart. But then I'm wondering. No, of course he, he has something does to discard have for something. the Rhino Heart. This cannot be Bestial, guys. Keep in mind, Rhino Heart is a water monster, but he only also has a water monster to discard it. And Hafnis is being chained to this. Let's see, what is he hitting with Hafnis? Really important here for Vincenzo. Talents, Mudora, oh, and another only Mudora. A double Mudora. It is only a Mudora. And now Joshua is absolutely in the driver's seat. There are no further interruptions for Vincenzo. Maybe a bestial. Yep, only the Mudora he can use only once and then the bestial. I think we saw a bestial in his hand, but still that is maybe not enough here for Joshua. I mean, he has to have something, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure he has a Bisti. He drew, yeah. drew his one for turn, I'm pretty sure. Oh, with the Talon, I mean. So, what is going to be the play here for Joshua Schmidt? Could you, could you see? Oh, he milled the Hafnis, first of yeah. all, with the Rhino Heart. Okay. So, Hafnis will most likely be activated and Mudora can be chained. However, Joshua, if he has enough cards in hand to actually play on after not activating this, oh, Kalbeck is activated. But there's Kalbeck, first of all. And this is most likely going to banish the Rhino Heart. That is certainly what's going to happen. There was a card hitting the graveyard, and now that also gives him the chance to use his Mudora. He chains the Mudora to Kelbeck, of course, trying to shuffle back the Hafnis, so no fusion summoning happening for Joshua yet, I would say, because there's still some chance for him. Oh, and there is Mudo uh, Mudora. Herald of the Orange Light. Herald. Wow, and this actually ensures that the... Oh, Druid's Womb comes onto the Hafnis. That is still an answer to the Hafnis, but Mudora is just not going to shuffle back the other stuff. 
are the most important thing here was the yeah. halfness. So Druze Worm takes care of that. Really good for Vincenzo. Actually, Vincenzo. adding back the Shiren to the hand instead of banishing the Rhino Heart. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Kalbeck casually discarded to the graveyard, thinking that this is a normal hand interaction. No, Kalbeck is just better. Yep. And let's see what happens next. Does Joshua have the options to really go into stuff here? There's no Dark Monster in the graveyard no, of that's Vincenzo. What I was thinking, but he has a battle phase. He can just attack over Havnes and then go into Dark. Yes, that's this what, is he's, what doing. he's going for. He is running over the Havnes, also running over the Kalbeck with his Havnes himself. And now there is a Dark Monster in the graveyard. Kalbeck summoned in attack position. And that means that we can... Oh, yeah, right. He could have not even summoned... Uh, ran over the Kalbeck, interestingly enough. So there is Dark being summoned. There is now Halfness in the graveyard. Ooh. Yeah, and he, he just said, I'm going to take Halfness and go into the Sprite Sprint fair because enough, Dark is enough. a link to... He is going to send a Merly to the grave. Really, really good stuff here from Joshua. He can finally go into a fusion summon here in this game number three. We haven't seen a single one so far in game number three, but now the Merly will be resolving to actually give him access to his Kid Kalos. And there is also a Rhino Heart already in the grave. Keep in mind, he only has used Havnis so far, so he might be able to go into two more fusion summons. First of all, the Kid Kalos, and yes. then actually might go for the Kaleido Heart. The only thing not really going well for him is that he has used his battle phase already. What can you do? Sometimes a little bit of a downside, but still it looks like Joshua might very well be capable here to overcome this disadvantage of going second in game number three. It is looking nice for Joshua. Also, he's 100 life points ahead already, yeah. so we're getting closer to time, of course. Six and a half minutes left, roughly. This attack position callback was not it. Not really, especially because Kalbeck just has more defense points than attack points. And we are summoning back the Rhino Heart, Milling, Caldo, Rhino Heart, Kalbeck, Kalbeck, and, and another Pearl Rhino. Rhino. So no Shiren hit. We have already used the effect of Rhino Heart before. But I mean, getting shufflers with the Caldos yeah. certainly can't hurt. So that's definitely not the worst to happen for him here. Did he trigger Kalbeck? For a second or four, he triggered Kalbeck, but I don't think he's going Kalbeck. to do that either. So he has apparently used both effects, I think. So maybe it would have actually been better to immediately send a Shiren to the grave if he does not have anything to play on from this point on. To go for Kaleido Heart immediately and get rid of the Druid Swarm at least, because the Time Thief Redoer would only dodge. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You don't want to target it. And now Mudora is going to shuffle back the Huffness and the opponent's Mudora. And he also has two cards in hand left. So there's actually quite something he can do. The only thing keeping him from popping off now is Sprite wow, Sprint but not being able to link to be linked away. But he does just set one card afterwards, and I think that Joshua Schmidt might be done with his turn here. And yes, he's going to pass it over to Vincenzo Orofino, who now has a Druid Swarm on board. And he also has Time Thief Redoer being able to just get another card, but oh, he starts it all Salik off with the Salik immediately here. activated, but now I'm thinking, why did he not immediately go for Kaleido Heart? Discarding the Shiren, special summoning the, Kal the Rhino Heart back, triggering itself and the Shiren, of course. We're still in draw phase, and therefore the Time Thief Redoer hasn't done anything yet. Yeah. I mean, it, it plays around a Bistiel, right? Plays That's around true. the top deck Bistiel. Yep, yep, absolutely. So we are going for Rule Colors and we are going to send another card with Rhino Heart. That is indeed true. Wow, this is really intense. This is A. Tielemann's name, of course. We can't really see which one it is. Might be Merly. It looks like Merly a little bit, yeah. No, it's Halfness, actually. It is Halfness. Oh, it is Halfness. Okay. So, and we are taking the Rhino Heart from the field. And I think he will have to, if he wants to go for a Kaleido Heart, have to take the... Oh, we are going for a Kid Kalos. And this one could actually also search for a Havnis or something else. Now, we are milling this time the Merly and Drugstopelia. No, we are going for the Kaleido Heart. Yes, now he found his we way are. into Kaleido Heart. And this one is for sure going to get rid of the Druid's Room or trying to go for the Redo. But, I mean... Be aware that now that Rule Colors on board is the only interruption that he has left because he already used yeah. the Salik and he's now using the effect of Kaleido Heart. So if Vincenzo has found his way into something good here, he might be able to come back from here. He might be able to go for something. 
Also, isn't there just a Zeus line available to Vincenzo immediately? Because he could just run over the Sprite Sprint and then Zeus yes. could be something. And now we are attaching the Shiren, which would usually be bad. However, he does not have to detach the Shiren for effect. The thing with Zeus, though, is that, yeah, he is running over the Sprite yeah. Sprint. But with Zeus, the thing is, you don't yeah. really want to send the Kid, uh, the, uh, Kid Kalos. Rule Coloss and Kaleido Heart and the Salik. So all of these cards, yeah, sending they would all of these trigger. cards. Would indeed, be bad. indeed, indeed. But still he is going for the Zeus. And he I think it is his only play, detaching both of his cards to then wow. wipe the board entirely, triggering the Rule Colors, the Kaleido Heart and the Salik. So Joshua just getting all the pluses, all the searches, all the summon backs here. And it's back in it, look, it looks good for Joshua. It looks good. Absolutely. He's down on life points, so he has to hurry, but he's definitely not too bad here in card advantage. So basically the only thing he did was getting rid of this Sonic that was already used this turn and giving Joshua another card in hand. I don't know if Zeus did the job here, but what else could he have done? Yeah, there wasn't a whole lot he could do. I mean, he at least has a 3k defense body now. Oh, and he activates talents. Triple Tactic Talents. That makes Draw a lot of sense. To a strong and he's drawing per rhino. rhino. He can keep on playing here. And there's only two minutes left on the clock, so he could keep on playing here for a while, to be honest. Let's see what Vincenzo can still do here. Joshua shaking his head. He at some point had to use a wow. monster effect in the main phase. Merly milling so good. He hits the Caldo, but there are still two interruptions in Joshua's graveyard being Caldo and Mudora. Yep, but looks like we are just going to resolve the effects for Vincenzo first of all. That is the Scream resolving, searching out the Salik. Now, Caldo is preemptively going to attack the shufflers of Joshua Schmidt here. There, there you see it, Mudora and Caldo grabbing the graveyard. What else is there to and shuffle back? this is going to be quick. Kaldo and Mudora are maybe going to be chained. Also the crime. That triple tactic talents. Now I fully understand the yeah. Zeus because that triggered Absolutely. the monster effects of Joshua so he could actually use the talents. Marvelously played by Vincenzo. And he's ahead of life ones. This is going to be really tight. There comes the Pearl oh, Rhino. Rhino. What? The crowd is going wild. They love it what Vincenzo is pulling off here. Because now he can actually search for the Havnus and I think at this point he could just does he just pass here? What else does he have in hand? No, he goes for a Link 2 at this point. He can just take away the Zeus and the Merli. He can go into Sprite Sprint immediately and send a Merli from the deck to the graveyard. Then he can actually Fusion Summon. And both of these monsters have used their resummon effect already. He will have to negate the Merli with the Roll Coloss. Yes, that's what, ha what is happening. He uses Roll Colors on the Merli. Vincenzo chains his Halfness in hand, so... That is still going to mill free. He mills a talent. Is he hitting Magnamut. anything? No, he's oh, hitting the Keldo. the Keldo. He is passing. There are 10 seconds on the clock. 15, in fact. Now, does he have to pass the turn onto this? Because then the Kaleido Heart can actually attack over the Sprite Sprint. It's going to be very tight here. He's passing it over. It's Joshua's turn. Are we going to the battle phase? Are we announcing battle phase? He, I think he announced the battle phase. That is the going players to be... are discussing. Joshua is not happy about this. This is going to be really, really tight. It will all depend on whether we are already in the battle phase or not. And it doesn't look like by the face of Joshua Schmidt that this is going to be battle phase already. So I think we're going to have to talk about this for a little bit. So maybe for a second we should just come back to us because it's not really going to help uh, watching the players and the judges there and we will just keep talking a little yeah. bit about what is going on there right now. This is an intense situation because it looks like there is a Salik set. We have the Hafnis in defense position. Yes. However, there is a Sprite Sprint in the attack position. So if we are staying that Joshua can enter the battle phase. Yep. What's going to happen here? Salik will be activated onto the Roll Colors. Can possibly sure. be activated onto the Roll Colors. Hafnis will be tributed. Okay. So Havnus will try to activate the effect. Yep. Roll Coloss cannot negate that of because course. it is negated. Yep. And we are shuffling back some cards, summoning monster in defense position, and Pearl Rhino can pop the sprint, so he cannot take damage. So this there might actually There is a even... line for him to protect himself. Yep. Yeah. I was thinking, does he have any way to get rid of his own sprint? But you described it perfectly. There is actually a line to protect himself from damage. So I don't really see 
when we're not in battle phase, how this is turning out to be a loss for Vincenzo or Affinity. Yeah, even if we go into the battle phase, I think he can summon out fusion monsters in defense position by negating the roll coloss yep, and yep. popping his own sprint. Absolutely. But it really is coming down to the final stages here. Nobody wants to go out, of course, in top four, especially not Joshua Schmidt, who's on a back-to-back -back mission here Absolutely. in this tournament. So he really is fighting until the last moment yeah. here, of course. And I can understand that I would ask the judges too, like, can For I have sure. this? I, I'm trying to say battle phase. These situations are sometimes hard. And, and of course, uh, to the viewers at home that maybe have never attended such a big tournament, there's always a judge being at the table here yeah. in our featured match area. So there's instantly somebody that would be responsible for the situation and that has seen the whole situation. And of course, multiple thousands of people at home have also <laughs> watched the situations, but the judge is responsible in their situation there specifically. And, and um, those decisions are quite hard to make. I mean, it is, it is a daily job for a judge to decide yep. these hard decisions in these timeout situations. And I mean, at the end of the day, it is the judge's decision. Maybe a head judge will be called. That's what I was say. Uh, what I was about to say. You always, as a player, if you get the answer from a judge, from a regular judge call, have the option to also appeal yeah. to a head judge. Very important. And I'm Keep that in mind. Pretty sure guys. that that is just happening right now. That's yeah. why we have to take a little bit of time here. The head judge is also going to have a look at the situation. I mean. We are in the final stages of the tournament, so we got to make important decisions right here. So we should get the uh, head judges over Absolutely. because they are the ones that are running the tournament. They are the real important judges. I mean, every single judge in the hall is important, of course, but Absolutely. they are the ones having the final word for every yeah. decision that is uh, causing debates, of course. Also, the judges have had long days. It is, it is a hard work. You have to be on point with your mind all the time. So if you have ever meet a judge at a tournament, be respectful, guys. Yeah. Even though you don't like the decisions sometimes, those decisions are hard to make for everyone. For real, shout outs to the judge community Absolutely. for running the biggest YCS we ever had in Europe. I mean, you need a lot of judges and sometimes they even had to work extra this weekend because yeah. we had so many people. They had to run extra kilometers all weekend long. So definitely appreciate Great the job, hard guys. work of the judges. I mean. We ourselves actually came from the judging community before we joined the commentary booth. That so is true. we know how that job feels. We know that from time to time it can be quite stressful, but it's really a fun job as well, for sure. So at home, Absolutely. if you maybe want to get into judging, definitely don't be it afraid. Is definitely a apply. really good idea. But let's go into the analysis of this game. Sure, a let's bit go. more. So Joshua has had a draw for turn. Yep. Imagine he drew a bestial. That would, that be would really, change really the good. entire situation of this battle phase scenario because if this was a bestial that he drew and, and he is no playing multiple summon, copies, right? there's no fusion summon, there's nothing to be popped. I mean, of course, there are On Keldo. The, that's what I was thinking. There's also yeah. Keldo and Mudora in his GY. So, Ooh, I mean, this, this is a main phase scenario. You have to think about the main phase, right? Because but you can actually go for Keldo and Modora before the main phase of, uh, before the battle phase of Joshua, if you are Vincenzo, and then you would want to target both of these monsters before your opponent goes into the battle phase, and then try to send the Havnus. So this is a difficult it scenario. It is a really, really difficult one, and I'm really happy that I'm not the head judge. And I think every single player in the hall can be happy that I wasn't the head judge for yeah. this event. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely true. <laughs> I think I'm situated quite well here in the casting booth yeah. and uh, I think you are busted. Thank you very much my friend. So um, we still have a little bit of time and uh, I think because I can already tell you they are going to have a little bit deeper analysis about the situation in the back of with the judges in particular so head judge and the judges at the table are talking a little bit further about it so I think it would be a pretty neat idea to actually uh, go on a little break or what do you think maybe? I think that this is quite a good idea, Busty. Yeah, I think we're going to go on to a short break. And as soon as we have news regarding all of that, we will be coming back with the live action. So Stay just tuned. give us a couple of minutes. And then when action is resuming and when we have a decision to announce, you will hear from us.
are again. The appeal is over, so we have a decision and we can fully explain you the situation again. You know what the discussion was about. Was Joshua Schmidt able to enter his battle phase? Because he basically just drew for turn and then wanted to go into the battle phase as quickly as possible. But there were some actions that Vincenzo could perform. So the actual appeal decision was. There were only two seconds on the clock when Joshua drew his card. So Vincenzo was allowed to make a play and Joshua will not enter the battle phase. So the game ends in the draw or the standby phase. I don't really know which one it is. But Vincenzo Orofino enters the finale of the YCS Dortmund 2022. Vincenzo Orofino plays for Italy in the finals. Very good run again by Joshua Schmidt, ending up here in top four. I mean, this guy, he was in top eight in Antwerpen. He was in Utrecht, of course, our winner. The winner and now yeah. he's in top four. He's crossing all of these stages, you know? Finals, top four, top eight. He really is doing it all. What's he going to do next, top 16? Wow, that would be <laughs> so fantastic for him, I would say, yeah. But that is the decision. So Vincenzo Orfino, definitely deserved winner and definitely one of the deserved finalists for this. I'm really hyped to see, he, see who he's going to face because it's either going to be versus his Italian friend in a match versus Luanda Reese or he's going to play Ericos back and his Ishizu Tillman strategy for a mirror match. Yeah, we don't know that yet. That is absolutely well, true. We have seen both players wander around the venue here and both of them looked really happy. I, I mean, mean it is be. a big accomplishment to get top four on a YCS. So I wouldn't be too sad if I lost that one as well, absolutely. even though you want to win. But we have no idea who won. That is indeed true. Yeah, but I think we can say some last words for ourselves because those yeah. will be our last moments in the casting booth. It was a long weekend. And YCS Dortmund. Yeah, it was a long weekend for us. But at the end of the day, and this is the end of our working day, we are still just two guys that love Yu-Gi-Oh! and we enjoyed every single second of it. We were really having the time of our life once again. Thank you for tuning in. Thank Asti, you for... It was a pleasure, as always, my friend. Thank you for being with me. And it really, really was such a fun time once more. And I cannot wait to sit down in the yeah. viewers' area to just watch the final as a spectator, to be honest. Actually, we and should get us some seats saved because they are free right now. So we are going to a little break, give the players some time to breathe through and you will see the finals soon.
and welcome back. You're joining us for more coverage here at YCS Dortmund 2022, nearing the end of our event, which is always very exciting. But because we still have some unfinished business between the commentators, we have another quiz. You guys have seen the quick fire one. We've done three different styles of quiz, traditional quiz, expert quiz, and of course, our quick fire tennis style quiz. Oh, that's a good point. I forgot we're meant to go through who won the quiz points. Yeah. So, we do that now? we're going to do that right now. Remember, we have the specialist quiz. We're going to go one by one. So, Marcello, you had five points. Alberto, you had three points. Basti, you had five points. Which means in third place, was Alberto, joint second were Marcello and Basti, which means the winner of the Oracle of the Yugiverse goes to Leonard Koenig. Yes, how do you feel, Leonard? How does it feel? Uh, thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad, for all the Yu-Gi-Oh! knowledge you gave me. Uh, this is the best moment of my entire life. Thank you. How many did he guess right? How many? Seven. He had a total of seven points, Impressive. which is all you needed to win. So that's what it comes down to. So that means Leonard is our oracle of the Yu-Gi-Verse. Currently, the Germans are winning in the quick fire quiz qu question card game quiz questionnaire. And so we're going to see what happens here. I have a tiebreaker because obviously whoever wins this round, if, if you guys win, then it's one apiece. So I'll need the tiebreaker question. So are we ready? Are we ready to do some quick fire quizzing? Remember, we need to do a quick rock, paper, scissors to see who starts. So gentlemen, are they ready? One, two, three, go. One, two, three, go. One, two, three, go. No one wants to give up. No one wants to give up. One, two, three, go. Okay, the Italians get to start. Now, we need to make sure that we have our adjudicator so that we are ready with this. As long as we've got our adjudicator, we can start this. We have five questions. Technically, we have six, but the five will have to go down to a tiebreaker if we are needed. So. I can tell you that the first quickfire question is going to be name a water attribute monster. Go. Uh, Rhino Heart. Kid Colors. Swap Frog. Um. Is water? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, sw a Swap Frog? Right. Swap Frog's not water? Yeah. Oh, Kid Kalos is not water? Did you say Kid Kalos? Yeah. Oh no. Okay, so the Italians get their first point there because of a small brave My brain turned off and I went, yep, yeah, that's definitely a water monster. Already got a point. Mate, yeah, you're dub, that's you. Yeah, guys, a round of applause to Alberto, finally scoring himself a point against the ropes. This is the kind of thing we like to see. But now I'm going to hand it, you're going to start this one, guys. Name a card that inflicts effect damage. Sunflare Dragon. Cauldron of the Old. Red Resonator. No, it doesn't. It gains. Woo! Oh, that's two points for the Italians because of another fart from our oracle of the Yu-Gi-Verse, Leonard Koenig, just there. Slightly embarrassing, but this could mean we end up getting down to the tiebreaker. Not to put any pressure on you guys, but if they get one more point, they win. And then it, and then it comes down to the tiebreaker. So yeah, let's, let's see what happens. So I'm going to start this one with you. Quite a fun one, this one, I think. Name a structure deck that was released in the TCG. Go. Starter deck Yugi. Is that a structure deck? Yeah. Uh, Rocket Revolt. Starter deck Kaiba. Starter deck Joey. Starter deck Pegasus. <laughs> um, Soul Burner. Um, this Dark War structure deck. That's not released in the TCG. What? Yeah. The, the, the previous one. What's your name? <laughs> this guy. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Oh, okay, so that's a point for the Germans there. It could go either way at this point. Right, are we ready? So, it's your turn to start. Name Toon Monsters, go. Toon, Blue Eyes, White Dragon. Toon. Toon, T-O-O-N. Ah, Toon, okay. Toon, uh, what did you say? Blue Eyes. Okay. Toon, uh, Gemini Elf. Toon Ancient Gear Golem. Toon Cyber Dragon. Toon Blacklaster Soldier. Toon uh, 
Dark Magician. I didn't say Dark Magician. I didn't say? Okay, two in red, uh, red eyes, Dark Dragon. Red eyes, Black Dragon. Okay. <laughs> Toon uh, uh, Mermaid Arches. Toon Mask Sorcerer. Toon Goblin uh, Attack Force. Toon Harpy. Toon Summon Skull. Toon... <laughs> Time! Okay, so that means the Italians have won this round because they managed to get three out of five. So that means Germany won, Italy won. So because this is going to be the last, one of the last times we're all together before the big final moment of the tournament, I'm going to have to put it down to a tiebreaker. Ooh, can you feel the tension in the room? So I want both teams to nominate the one person that's going to take part in this round. So you can have your advantage. Who wants to do it? Whoa, almost dropped the card with the question. I would have given it away. I, I would do it. Yeah, Basti's going to do it against Marcello. <laughs> Alberto, are you going to do it? OK, if you're sure you self-nominated yourself, that's what we believe, self-belief. Here we go. Right. Your redemption arc begins now, Alberto. Right, guys, your tiebreaker question. Whoever gets this wins this quiz and therefore wins YCS Dortmund. Name a card with blue in its name. Blue Eyes White Dragon. Toon Blue Eyes White Dragon. <laughs> Alberto, no. Ultimate Eyes Black Dragon. That doesn't have the word blue in it. <laughs> Ultimate Eyes. What? Ultimate Eyes Blue. Ah, oh, no, that's right. No, it's right. No, it doesn't have blue. Because it's ultimate eyes black. No, it doesn't have it. Blue eyes ultimate dragon. Okay. To add some tension, I'll allow it. Go. Yeah, we, we have to stick with the same archetype for this one. Blue eyes uh, alternative dragon. Blue whale. <laughs> Blue whale. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> is that allowed? That took a second to process there, and I went blue whale. <laughs> There's no card. Our adjudicator has raised the thumb like a gladiator, and that's a no. Like a Roman emperor. Sprite blue. Sprite, Sprite blue. blue. I wanted to say it, but I'm the quiz master. I'm not allowed to go, you know, one we've seen a lot this weekend and at other tournaments. Well, that means the Germans have won yet again at the quick fire quiz, quiz, card quiz, questionnaire quiz. There. A, a nice but abrupt name for all of this. Guys, we still have more coverage to come because the Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series of Dortmund is not yet over. So stick around because there's plenty more coming your way before we come to the end of our night. Stick around.
Welcome back. We're here with even more coverage. We're just holding on for an extra few seconds before we get into more of our feature match coverages. So, guess it seems like we have to do even more quizzing to keep you guys at home occupied while things get ready behind the scenes. So, we've done our major quizzes. Right now in front of me, I have six questions that are a, sort of a mixture of relatively easy, or at least they seem easy, until you're put on the spot with them. So what we'll do is we'll do the rotating answers where you guys swap... Uh, no, we'll do the one where you get to confer. Yeah, the Teams one, where you guys get to confer, and then you get to answer, and we'll see who wins this. And I may have to break out a tie-breaking question if people get three apiece. So, are we ready, gentlemen? So let's do a rock, paper, scissors to see who starts. Ready? Ready? One, two, three, go! The rocks again. Ready? One, two, three, go! Paper again. Okay, rock, two, three, go! Okay, right, the Germans will be starting. Remember, you guys can confer, so I'll be asking it to you first. If you can't answer it, it'll be passed over to you. Question one. What is the name of the monster in the artwork of the card, Infinite Impermanence? Cyber Dragon Infinity. Very good, a nice easy one to kick off with and another easy one for you guys. Question one for you. Which normal monster has this card text? What this creature lacks in size, it makes up for in defense when battling in the prairie. It's easy, huh? Very easy, yeah. Uh... <laughs> we'll see what people think. This is a classic card that many of you from the anime will recognize if you've watched the classic, classic. <laughs> Do you know the answer? Okay, well, the Germans definitely know the answer, so let's see what happens here. Do the Italians know? We're about to find out. I get a feeling that they have no idea. Right. We're thinking about 2000 Defense Giant Soldier, but it must stones, not be that. Yeah, made of stone. No. I'm afraid not, so I'm going to pass this over to the Germans. This is Beaver Warrior. Correct! It is Beaver Warrior, a classic original Yu-Gi-Oh! anime series card that we've seen played in those original Yu-Gi-Oh! structure decks. So, that means we go back to you guys for the third question. Two points to you, no points to you. It's okay, you can still pull it back, don't worry. Which two items are featured on the card, D-Spell? Now, you guys remember? Got it? You can discuss. Yep, D-Spell. You guys know this one. There's a little bit of steam, a little bit of purple smoke coming out of what? Well, we know the answer, and you guys at home know the answer. But do they know the answer when they're being put on the spot? We're about to find out. Now, the Italians seem like they may or may not know. But bear in mind, if these guys get more than three, it's all over for the Italians. Right, Germans, what is your answer? We will go with can and key. Can and key. I'm afraid I can't accept that, so I'm going to hand this over to you guys. What is your answer? For me, it's lock. I mean, we have different... Uh, Marcello has a different idea, but I will go with lock and key. Correct! So that is one point to the Italians, and that's still two points to you guys. So, it's now your guys' turn. Slightly harder question, see if you can recognize this one. Who is being mistakenly arrested on the card, mistaken arrest. You're going to have to picture the card in your mind. It's like one of those ones like Tour Guide of the Underworld that has other cards in it. But can you remember what that card is? What is that little bit of artwork that's featuring on there? Sangan. Is correct! So that means we're at two apiece. This is exciting, genuine tension. This is always good. Keeps things moving. So two apiece, which means now we come over to you for your question. Question five. How many goblins appear on the artwork of the card Goblin Attack Force? Now, this card throws me back to some of the old Game Boy Advance games. Used to see it a lot. I can still picture it now, and Torrential Tribute and all those other things. The summoning of <laughs> Torrential Tribute still gives me PTSD to this day. Basti, what are we thinking? We believe it's eight. It is indeed eight! So that means it's three apiece. So you guys have to get this right to tie. If you don't, it passes over to them and they may take it to win. So the final question, potentially, maybe, almost probably certainly not at this point, is what color is magical scientist's hair? 
Got to think about it. Got to think about it. This is the moment. If I didn't have the answer written down, I'm not entirely certain I would know this off the top of my head. But luckily, I don't have to, because I'm the quiz master. I have all of this stuff written down. So ultimately, it doesn't matter. So what do they think it is? What color is magical scientist's hair? There's some intensity going on here. There's some hand gestures, some Italian hand gestures. Okay, Alberto, Marcello, what is your answer? Green. I'm afraid that is incorrect. So I'm going to pass this over to the Germans. Basti, what is your team's answer? Blue. Is incorrect. It's purple. It's purple. So that means we have to go to a tiebreaker question, which I don't have written down. We win, we win. No, do you? No, it's a tiebreaker. You guys had uh, two, three apiece. They all thought you had three. Oh no, I suppose you're right. You technically win. Yeah, you win. You want to hear the question? No, it's too late. You, you want the tiebreaker? Fine. We're, ge we're generating some tension here. I'm going to pull up a fresh question right now. That's how fresh this is. Okay. Now, which one to go for? Okay, so your question is, which monster has the following card text? A wicked dragon that taps into the dark forces to execute a powerful attack. Oh, these are good. These are good classics. We've slightly messed up on terms of things. Okay. Leo thinks he knows Red Eyes Black Dragon. It's incorrect. Can we read one more Would you like to hear it one more time? Okay. A wicked dragon that taps into dark forces to execute a powerful attack. We're going to find out if they know the answer, or I may have to generate another question. It's a good thing I got this phone out, I'll tell you that. Otherwise, we may have had a problem. And by the looks of it, it seems that we may have been able to get things going. We're going to go for a Curse of Dragon. Is correct! So the Italians got it, Curse of Dragon. It was the classic Yugi card. Yugi. That was all you. My first ever pulled card in my first pack ever. Well, there we go. Marcello I mean, takes it there for the Italians. We'll call that a tiebreaker. Possibly slightly unfair on you guys, but you've had your wins today. So we'll give this to the Italians. Congratulations, guys. Don't go anywhere because I think we've got ourselves another feature match coming right up.
Well, well, well. I wonder what time it is. Well, it's time to do. That's right. We are now here in the YCS Dortmund finals, and this is going to be a duel to remember. We have Mario Argyro versus Vincenzo Orofino, and this is going to be one to remember. It's all come down to this. 2,580 duelists all taking part, working their way through 12 rounds of Swiss, working their way through a top 64 cut all the way to this moment right here between these two exceptional duelists. So let's not waste any more time. Whoever wins this is going to be taking home that Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series title. Gentlemen, can we please do a high roll to see who is going to be going first? Vincenzo has rolled a 10. Mario? Mario has rolled a 3. Vincenzo, are you going to go first? Vincenzo is going to go first. So, with that being said, I'm going to hand you over to our wonderful Italian commentators for the last time today, the last match that we're going to be doing for you, presenting you with this coverage. So let me say it now. My friends, it's time to duel. Bum, ba -da -bum, ba -da -bum, bum, 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 bum. Welcome <laughs> to Italy, and it's all about Italy in this final, baby. So... <laughs> You can hear the crowd going crazy because uh, this is uh, Italy. We just conquered uh, Germany and YCS Dortmund and what a final. Uh, we have the privilege to commentate for you guys. Uh, Mario against Vincenzo. We cannot be more proud than this. What a final show off uh, between two of the best Italian players around. And not only that, uh, still we have the chance to claim the winner. And still, among all odds, uh, maybe you bring this bad luck to the table because it's Flo Wanderies against Ishizu Tier Elements. Uh, the deck that was represented at 72% in the final still has a chance to be eliminated, just like it was a YCS. Minneapolis uh, the final once again will it be able to win this time for Flo Wanderies or is it gonna be once again the tier elements uh, honestly without further ado I don't want to waste time talking about their decks uh, let's go to the table and find out the winner of game one And here they are, uh, it is uh, Loro Più Fino Nel Mondo against <laughs> Uno Pezzo. We'll see who will prevail at the very end. Uh, but it is uh, Vincenzo who opens the die roll. Uh, and let's see if he gets uh, to orofinize uh, his opponent. <laughs> <laughs> and start things well uh, right here. Let's see if there will be a dimension shifter from Mario. We've all been waiting for this moment uh, and it's just this one final match. Uh, if uh, a YCS Utrecht, both players, uh, Joshua and Dinka, already had a YCS win under their belt uh, for one of these guys, which will be a first time YCS champion nonetheless. Uh, let's see who will bring the trophy back to Italy. And there we start. Uh, we do not see the Ooh. shifter. No shifter here from Mario. And Vincenzo is going to mill three oh, Kelbeck and the Mudora. the Kelbeck as well. Good stuff. Now extra five. And the barrier as well from the top of the deck uh, being sent to the graveyard. Wow. With double scream and rhino. What a start from Vincenzo. Very good stuff from him That's now. He's going to Fusion Salmon. We'll soon see and Kit Kalos being Salmon from Vincenzo. As you mentioned, the statue being milled by Mario, I think it's super relevant as we saw. Absolutely. You only play one of them and it's almost impossible to get it back to your deck, which means Vincenzo will now have a huge chance to use some of these effects and he knows a little bit of his opponent deck list. He knows that these cards are not there, there are no more interruptions, uh, but he will need to still play carefully. And 
let's take a look at his decklist. What is he playing? We know that he tested with another player, El Pengue, who is, uh, again, one of his testing partners for the event. Unfortunately, missed out in the final rounds. But he does have the crime in the main deck, which is super relevant alongside Arbit and Suliak. And this means that he can set up all of them going first. And this is probably what we are going to see here. I think it makes sense, especially because uh, he knows uh, Mario uh, is playing uh, Necrovalli along with and his rotation. Uh, good stuff here from Vincenzo. Great, great setup, as you mentioned. He's able to get both trap cards uh, right away, which is huge. And yeah, here even more Mills. Uh, you can see Mario smiling a little bit. Uh, what is it gonna be? Really looking forward to get Aguido and any of the other names. It's uh, really well, but no Aguido at the very end. Uh, but he will be able to get to all of these free fusion summons this turn. Huge start uh, by Vincenzo. But I think with this setup already, uh, <coughs> you cannot complain at all. Now uh, he's going for another fusion salmon. We'll soon see in the the Drago Stabella being salmon. Here it is. Absolutely gonna uh, boot up one of the best cards for this matchup. He knows what he's up against, uh, of course. Uh, and to be honest, you're also happy to see that he milled uh, Mystic Mine and Dark Ruler. There are a few cards that you don't have to worry about at the moment. Uh, but yeah, Stapelia just so strong against uh, Flow Wonder is for a variety of reasons. And here we get to actually consider what to do. Mario might just uh, yeah, cut his deck because he's going to draw into the Garuda. And yeah. He does, so looking for uh, probably the art beat uh, could be one of the cards he is looking for, but let's see what he goes for. Taking his time, okay. and it does open up with the Saronir. He is playing, by the way, all nine copies of the Bestials in the main deck. Makes a lot of sense why he was able to defeat this many mirror matches and make it all the way to the finals. Yeah, I think he's one of the few players actually who went for the full Bestial package and side decking the Herald of Orange Giant. Absolutely, yeah. So did the other way around, which was not super popular this weekend, but super paying Make off. Make a lot of sense. Yeah. It was the same as what I was saying. I also liked with nine bestials and the ghost spells, at least in the side deck. And I think it's paying off really well. And now Vincenzo going for the Beatrice can send a few amount of useful cards from your deck, especially with this matchup. And this, you can see, is a pretty good start against the deck from Mario, trying to play around as many cards as possible and still ending up with a draw on top of them all. Great stuff by Vincenzo. He gets to send the Merle with Beatrice, and I think this is a very good setup. Uh, yeah, he draws one. another card, which is the Rhino, and sets both Suliak and Crime. Play is over from Vincenzo. Can Mario pull this one off uh, with his uh, Maybe Dark Ruler, Mystic Mine, he needs a lot to fight back. Does he have it? Let's find out real soon. It's back to Mario, who is now for the first time able to play a card in this final match. But Vincenzo actually pulling the trigger, playing around Dark Ruler with this Beatrice and doesn't want to waste time around and is considering whether to send an additional name. And he does, so activates it right away to send the Abnis, uh, and this will allow him to go for another play, maybe the Mud Dragon, maybe the Kid Kalos to get the Art Beat, I think would be a really nice play. Yeah. And I think that is what we are going for right here for Vincenzo, and it is. So well played by Vincenzo, he sets up the Art Beat, which means even in case that Mystic Mine comes down, he has the out for it. 
I mean, very well played by him. Uh, with Absolutely. this setup, also the Grime and the Saldiak, uh, the Stabelli itself, uh, I think there's a lot of things going on. Let's see if Mario finds his own way to come back. Pot of Prosperity, a great uh, card to start things off here. Gonna try and fish for the Dark Ruler no more. Let's see if he gets it. He does get Dark Ruler, but there is the Crime face down, of course. But still, it could be a really good way to force it out uh, right here from Mario. But what an opening from Gincenzo. Even the Shuffler plus the Field Spell is just an additional pop. Uh, really impressive stuff by him. Even though he's uh, really young, by the way, this yeah, is something I, that we should mention. Yeah, yeah, super young. I don't. I think it's uh, around 18. I don't know if he's even 18. I mean, actually. yeah, probably he's uh, definitely at least half the age of El Pengue. So <laughs> that's really, really a matter of time. And now again, a part of duality, Necro Valley, a really nice one, and another Dark Ruler, though. This could be huge. Let's see. He picks up uh, the Necro Valley instead from the top of the deck. We know that there is an art beat in the end. But well, let's see if this will be enough uh, for Mario to have a chance in this game. And here comes down Necro Valley. Can Vincenzo use one of the shuffers uh, alongside the Rhino? I think this is the correct line uh, and he will go for it. Uh, really liking this play by Vincenzo. Using his resources to the fullest of their capabilities uh, and make a lot of sets. Yeah, considering to shuffle back something, definitely not the stage you that can stay there the entire match. Uh, but yeah, he picks up uh, a few useful cards, a nice ultimate, I think, terraforming. And now he will be able to destroy with the effect of Perle Rhino. Such a huge setup as mentioned by Vincenzo. We know that Mario has the Dark Lurer, but with the grime being set yeah. from Vincenzo... It's really tough because uh, there is also the Saliak face down uh, and the evenly matched are only in the side deck from Mario, not being mained this time around. Uh, Tough, tough stuff here for Mario. Let's see. And now Mario goes with the wins and uh, Vincenzo is thinking if... Okay, he goes to mill three, nothing special being milled yep so here as mentioned one of the cars that pretty much guaranteed the top four and then the final for mario was this unexplored wins and now we see the three coming down from mario really a weak one to start things off but when you get milled it is one of the plus sides uh, where you can banish your own uh, flow under in the graveyard and we are gonna see actually the stapelia being used uh, to which, though, Mario replies uh, pretty convincingly. Let's see if there is going to be a response uh, by Vincenzo. Because this could actually be huge for him. It looks like Vincenzo is allowing it. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> so Mario is going to resolve right here his quick spell. So now he will gain 500 life points, uh, gets uh, to the eagle and then uh, we'll resolve this three by banishing the Robina from the grave and summoning uh, now is just added monster which is pretty pretty good at the moment and this is what's going on right here and it does so now he will be able to activate uh, potentially both the three and the Robina but the Saliek coming down from Vincenzo we knew about it it's gonna shut it down this time for real and now it's up to Mario to find an additional summon, but with the crime on top, uh, I think uh, Vincenzo has done a fantastic job uh, keeping his opponent away from this. And yeah, this is what's happening right now. Just to make things easier, Vincenzo gonna go into the Kaleido art, uh, getting rid of the unexplored wins. 
He doesn't want to risk his opponent drawing some cards. Of course, he went for the Prosperity, so he couldn't access that effect this turn. But uh, still a really annoying card to be left on the field. Uh, but there is the map. So this means that I think uh, Vincenzo will be forced to use the crime on the map. Yeah. Yeah, I think he will be forced to activate it on that spot because otherwise uh, he's going to risk it. But uh, yeah, terraforming here, good one for Mario. Absolutely. But uh, if he has a monster in hand, uh, and I would be shocked if that wasn't the case, uh, the element crime can just stop this map. Uh, and uh, if that's the case, then I wonder whether Vincenzo would have used it uh, right away. Because if you then use the Dark Ruler, I think you are in a really good spot. Yeah. Vincenzo considering his options, uh, and at the very end will activate the crime to negate the map. In the meantime, we have just been informed that Joshua Smith won his third and fourth place match in the blink of an eye. So he's guaranteed his own copy of another verse dragon. And a third place is definitely a huge achievement nonetheless. But now play is back to Vincenzo, who does not want a third place. He wants to take it all home for himself and Italy. And he's just moments away from clearing this game one. And I think uh, Mario has seen enough. Uh, he picks up his cards and is Vincenzo winning game one. What a start of this final match. Uh, Vincenzo showcasing why he made it this far. If uh, you had any doubt, uh, not only did he kick out the last uh, YCS champion, Joshua Smith, in his top four match, uh, but is now only one game away for being crowned YCS champion at such a young age. What a beautiful final we're witnessing. Uh, but Mario really couldn't do much about it. Yeah. That's the old truth. Uh, still, congratulations on how Vincenzo played it out. But I want to mention just a little thing. By what we uh, witnessed, I think it's pretty obvious that if Mario would have activated Dark Ruler right away, the crime would, would have, have been, been Yeah, exactly. And if yeah. you think about it, at the end of that turn, Mario still had the Dark Ruler in his hand. Mm -hmm. And he never used it. And he lost to the crime because of the field spell. I'm not saying that he would have won, because still he gets uh, to just clear the whole board, which is very difficult. Uh, but he has some chances in that game one. So maybe, just maybe, Diego uh, would have played it out a little different. And we could have asked him that afterwards. But now it's time to keep your composure. You're still in this match. Uh, and honestly, when Mario goes first, uh, I got to give uh, just the odds on his side. He has so much stuff. Uh, just mention his yeah, side. Yeah, we have seen him siding him. The Arpis Featherstone, which is completely yeah. like shutting down opponent strategy. Also in the top four, we have seen him activating him and winning with it. Yeah. And also the three copies of Solemn Judgment as well. Also the Dimensional Fisher. Which we have still not yet seen. Uh, but if there is uh, one key thing to mention is how when going into this event, Vincenzo expected a lot of mirror matches and prepared really well for them. We can't say the same thing for Flo One, there is maybe, but there is one key strategy to his success. He does not play additional copies of uh, you know, spell and trap removal, but he has three copies of Zombie Word alongside two copies of Necro Word Banshee to just search it. So essentially, he has access to Zombie Word very, very easily. So Mario will have a tough time and might be forced to side in those Cosmic Cyclone even when going first. But our players are ready. Let's find out uh, who the winner of Game 2 will be. And here they are, of course, Mario looking for some of his uh, flow under his monsters, while Vincenzo really looking to pick up maybe an Herald of the Orange Light. Uh, and he does! So Vincenzo has the Herald of the Orange Light in his hand. 
So he has the option to negate a summon from Mario. Let's see if the opening from Mario is weak. Ooh, Ooh. and we see the shifter. Duality with the shifter, very, very good wait, start. Because there is the Herald. And Mario knows it because Vincenzo... Mario knows it and wait for your claps. We might see an Herald coming down from Vincenzo, but he allows it, wow. What do you do here? You just keep it and uh, wait for Mario to normal summon. Because now the problem <laughs> is that you cannot even exactly. activate it under shifter. So I'm really confused on why Vincenzo thought that it was not a good play here. And uh, you can see Vincenzo just uh, not happy about that one. I'm really surprised that he uh, didn't activate it. Wow. Because basically here you just let Mario play alone. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think you get the chance to use it again later on. Oh, that's the thing, exactly. Because now basically Mario is able to set up his field, search for his uh, flow under his cards. <sighs> of course the shifter is a huge problem that uh, Vincenzo has to face. And also I think he will have this card the Mudora, just in case. Yeah, not that it's particularly useful in this matchup, but at least he would have stopped the shifter. But there is no statue, by the way, from Mario. Just a couple of face down, actually free with the Solemn. Uh, and play is back to Vincenzo, who picks up uh, yet another tier element monster. I think he might just uh, end his turn uh, without doing much. Uh, let's see. He has the Perle Rhino, I think. Yeah. yeah. I don't think Mario really cares about uh, that one. Uh, so we might see, for example, an Avnis uh, picked up uh, if he doesn't have already one copy and just a pass. Because, yeah, looking yeah. at his hand, uh, he has, as mentioned, the Herald, but it didn't go for it. That's really surprising. And, yeah, it does go for the Avnis, uh, which, of course, Mario is going to keep uh, attention to and uh, we'll try to play around it whenever he can. And I think uh, he might just pass back to him. Yeah, he could pass, yeah. Let's see. Vincenzo, considering his options, uh, might just go to the end phase here. And that could mean that we need to be very careful when playing uh, from Mario perspective in the next turn. And yeah, I think uh, that was it. So Ma Vincenzo tries to enter the end phase, but Mario is having none of that. Uh, he wants to keep on playing. Uh, he has the option to go for a Toucan afterwards or even for a statue. And uh, he has the Apex Avian in the deck uh, to just negate any card from the tier element player. Because here, once again, being in the end phase, he cannot activate the Herald. So. Yeah, good for Mario. I think uh, at the very end, Vincenzo probably should have gone for the Herald. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm really confused as to why he didn't go for it at the very last second. Because the Mudora engrave would have been huge with the Perle Rhino just to pop some stuff. But instead, the Shifter loop is coming. Uh, and Shifter is going to be used again during the next turn with this play from Mario. Shifter goes to the top and he's just gonna shifter him again the next turn, which is huge for Vincenzo. And yeah, just a face down monster play is back to Mario, who will just shifter again. But the Herald this time. I'm concerned, actually, because basically if you didn't activate the Herald before, yeah. why would you do it now, <laughs> yeah, it's, no? Yeah, it's definitely pointless. Uh, I agree with you. And I'm still giving a lot of chances to Mario, but the Avnis is there, so let's see if this Avnis will be able to activate any time soon. Uh, we have to be careful, and of course Mario is playing around that. Yeah. And now we could see the Avnis. Uh, let's see these mills. Uh, is there a response from Mario? 
he could have prevented this way way earlier i would say but now hopefully he doesn't get too punished for it uh, uh does he have maybe a feather storm he could use it seems like it would be a little wasted i think he only has solemn and the quick spell yeah <clears throat> which then as i mentioned uh, uh maybe a little risky Let's see the mills. Uh, it's Rhino, Rhino Art, and Necro Banshee, which could be huge. Uh, wow. This is a good mill. This is huge. But uh, if Mario has the Apex, uh, he can now prevent this from resolving. Uh, so let's see if he finds this line. Uh, He's gonna read it, check the graveyard, and resolve his normal summon. I think Apex has to be the choice here, potentially. Just shutting down the Necro Banshee. Definitely gonna come down to this one. And he does, so Mario finds the line I was talking about. He goes for the Apex uh, just to prevent uh, the Banshee from being uh, able to shut down uh, his plays entirely. So Vincenzo instead is going to opt for the Rhino and then chain the Banshee, forcing the negation from the Apex. Uh, all really smooth by both Italian players. But now I give the edge once again to Mario. But I think uh, Vincenzo is doing his best to stay in this. Uh, and uh, if Mario would have summoned earlier on his Apex yeah. or even just a statue, this could uh, not happen. So a really, really interesting choice. Uh, and maybe at the very end, uh, the decision to use this orange light later on might pay out. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> he had a plan. Absolutely. It's working. And yeah, he goes uh, now right away into the Kaleido and he's gonna be able to put back the Ampen into the deck potentially. Let's see if this is his final decision. Yep, that's gonna be banished. Uh, the two Merli are down. He's gonna then cut 